The Iliad by Homer Translated by Alexander Pope Introduction Skepticism is as much the result of knowledge as knowledge is of skepticism. To be content with what we at present know is, for the most part, to shut our ears against conviction, since, from the very gradual character of our education, we must continually forget and emancipate ourselves from knowledge previously acquired. We must set aside old notions and embrace fresh ones, and, as we learn, we must be daily unlearning something which it has cost us no small labor and anxiety to acquire. And this difficulty attaches itself more closely to an age in which progress has gained a strong ascendancy over prejudice, and in which persons and things are, day by day, finding their real level in lieu of their conventional value. The same principles which have swept away traditional abuses, and which are making rapid havoc among the revenues of sinecurists, and stripping the thin, tawdry veil from attractive superstitions, are working as actively in literature as in society. The credulity of one writer, or the partiality of another, finds as powerful a touchstone and as wholesome a chastisement in the healthy skepticism of a temperate class of antagonists as the dreams of conservatism or the impostures of pluralist sinecures in the church. History and tradition, whether of ancient or comparatively recent times, are subjected to very different handling from that which the indulgence or credulity of former ages could allow. Mere statements are jealously watched, and the motives of the writer form as important an ingredient in the analysis of his history as the facts he records. Probability is a powerful and troublesome test, and it is by this troublesome standard that a large portion of historical evidence is sifted. Consistency is no less pertinacious and exacting in its demands. In brief, to write a history, we must know more than mere facts. Human nature, viewed under an induction of extended experience, is the best help to the criticism of human history. Historical characters can only be estimated by the standard which human experience, whether actual or traditionary, has furnished. To form correct views of individuals, we must regard them as forming parts of a great whole. We must measure them by their relation to the mass of beings by whom they are surrounded, and, in contemplating the incidents in their lives, or condition which tradition has handed down to us, we must rather consider the general bearing of the whole narrative than the respective probability of its details. It is unfortunate for us that, of some of the greatest men, we know least and talk most. Homer, Socrates, and Shakespeare have perhaps contributed more to the intellectual enlightenment of mankind than any other three writers who could be named, and yet, the history of all three has given rise to a boundless ocean of discussion, which has left us little save the option of choosing which theory or theories we will follow. The personality of Shakespeare is, perhaps, the only thing in which critics will allow us to believe without controversy, but upon everything else, even down to the authorship of plays, there is more or less of doubt and uncertainty. Of Socrates, we know as little as the contradictions of Plato and Xenophon will allow us to know. He was one of the dramatis personae in two dramas, as unlike in principles as in style. He appears as the enunciator of opinions as different in their tone as those of the writers who have handed them down. When we have read Plato, or Xenophon, we think we know something of Socrates. When we have fairly read and examined both, we feel convinced that we are something worse than ignorant. It has been an easy and a popular expedient of late years to deny the personal or real existence of men and things whose life and condition were too much for our belief. This system, which has often comforted the religious skeptic and substituted the consolations of Strauss for those of the New Testament, has been of incalculable value to the historical theorists of the last and present centuries. To question the existence of Alexander the Great would be a more excusable act than to believe in that of Romulus. To deny a fact related in Herodotus, because it is inconsistent with a theory developed from an Assyrian inscription which no two scholars read in the same way, is more pardonable than to believe in the good-natured old king whom the elegant pen of Florian has idealized, Numa Pompilius. Skepticism has attained its culminating point with respect to Homer, and the state of our Homeric knowledge 
may be described as a free permission to believe any theory, provided we throw overboard all written tradition concerning the author or authors of the Iliad and Odyssey. What few authorities exist on the subject are summarily dismissed, although the arguments appear to run in a circle. This cannot be true because it is not true, and that is not true because it cannot be true. Such seems to be the style in which testimony upon testimony, statement upon statement, is consigned to denial and oblivion. It is, however, unfortunate that the professed biographies of Homer are partly forgeries, partly freaks of ingenuity and imagination, in which truth is the requisite most wanting. Before taking a brief review of the Homeric theory in its present conditions, some notice must be taken of the treatise on the life of Homer which has been attributed to Herodotus. According to this document, the city of Cumae in Aeolia was, at an early period, the seat of frequent immigrations from various parts of Greece. Among the immigrants was Monopolis, the son of Ithagenes. Although poor, he married, and the result of the union was a girl named Crithius. The girl was left an orphan at an early age under the guardianship of Kleenax of Argos. It is to the indiscretion of this maiden that we are indebted for so much happiness— Homer was the first fruit of her juvenile frailty, and received the name of Melisigenes from having been born near the river Melis in Boeotia, whither Crithius had been transported in order to save her reputation. At this time, continues our narrative, there lived at Smyrna a man named Phemius, a teacher of literature and music, who, not being married, engaged Crithius to manage his household and spin the flax he received as the price of his scholastic labors. So satisfactory was her performance of this task, and so modest her conduct, that he made proposals of marriage, declaring himself, as a further inducement, willing to adopt her son, who, he asserted, would become a clever man if he were carefully brought up. They were married. Careful cultivation ripened the talents which nature had bestowed, and Melisigenes soon surpassed his schoolfellows in every attainment, and when older rivaled his preceptor in wisdom." Themius died, leaving him sole heir to his property, and his mother soon followed. Melisigenes carried on his adopted father's school with great success, exciting the admiration not only of the inhabitants of Smyrna, but also of the strangers whom the trade carried on there, especially in the exportation of corn attracted to that city. Among these visitors, one Mentes from Lucatia, the modern Santa Mara, who evinced a knowledge and intelligence rarely found in those times, persuaded Melisigenes to close his school and accompany him on his travels. He promised not only to pay his expenses, but to furnish him with a further stipend, urging that, while he was yet young, it was fitting that he should see with his own eyes the countries and cities which might hereafter be the subjects of his discourses. Melisigenes consented, and set out with his patron, examining all the curiosities of the countries they visited, and informing himself of everything by interrogating those whom he met. We may also suppose that he wrote memoirs of all that he deemed worthy of preservation. Having set sail from Tyrrhenia and Iberia, they reached Ithaca. Here Melisigenes, who had already suffered in his eyes, became much worse, and Mentes, who was about to leave for Leucadia, left him to the medical superintendence of a friend of his named Mentor, the son of Alcinor. Under his hospitable and intelligent host, Melisigenes rapidly became acquainted with the legends respecting Ulysses, which afterwards formed the subject of the Odyssey. The inhabitants of Ithaca assert that it was here that Melisigenes became blind, but the Colophomans make their city the seat of that misfortune. He then returned to Smyrna, where he applied himself to the study of poetry. But poverty soon drove him to Cumae. Having passed over the Hermian plain, he arrived at Neontecos, the new wall, a colony of Cumae. Here his misfortunes and poetical talent gained him the friendship of one Tychius, an armorer. And up to my time, continued the author, the inhabitants showed the place where he used to sit when giving a recitation of his verses, and they greatly honored the spot. Here also a poplar grew, which they said had sprung up ever since Melisigenes arrived. But poverty still drove him on, and he went by way of Larissa, as being the most convenient road. Here, the Cumans say, he composed an epitaph on Gordius, king of Phrygia, which has, however, and with greater probability, been attributed to Cleobulus of Lindus. Arriving at Cumae, he frequented the conversations of the old men, and delighted all by the charms of his poetry. Encouraged by this favorable reception, he declared that, 
If they would allow him a public maintenance, he would render their city most gloriously renowned. They avowed their willingness to support him in the measure he proposed, and procured him an audience in the council. Having made this speech, with the purport of which our author has forgotten to acquaint us, he retired, and left them to debate respecting the answer to be given to his proposal. The greater part of the assembly seemed favorable to the poet's demand, but one man observed that, quote, if they were to feed homers, they would be encumbered with a multitude of useless people, end quote. From this circumstance, says the writer, Melissigenes acquired the name of Homer, for the Cumans call blind men homers. With a love of economy, which shows how similar the world has always been in its treatment of literary men, the pension was denied, and the poet vented his disappointment in a wish that Cumoa might never produce a poet capable of giving it renown and glory. At Phocea, Homer was destined to experience another literary distress. One, Thestorides, who aimed at the reputation of poetical genius, kept Homer in his own house and allowed him a pittance on condition of the verses of the poet passing in his name. Having collected sufficient poetry to be profitable, Thestorides, like some would-be literary publishers, neglected the man whose brains he had sucked and left him. At his departure, Homer is said to have observed, O oh, Thestorides, of the many things hidden from the knowledge of man, nothing is more unintelligible than the human heart. Homer continued his career of difficulty and distress until some Chian merchants, struck by the similarity of the verses they heard him recite, acquainted him with the fact that Thestorides was pursuing a profitable livelihood by the recital of the very same poems. This at once determined him to set out for Chios. No vessel happened then to be setting sail thither, but he found one ready to start for Erythrae, a town of Ionia which faces that island, and he prevailed upon the seamen to allow him to accompany them. Having embarked, he invoked a favorable wind, and prayed that he might be able to expose the imposture of Thestorides, who by his breach of hospitality had drawn down the wrath of Jove the hospitable. At Erythrae, Homer fortunately met with a person who had known him in Phocoa, by whose assistance he at length, after some difficulty, reached the little hamlet of Pythis. Here he met with an adventure which we will continue in the words of our author, quote, Having set out from Pythis, Homer went on, attracted by the cries of some goats that were pasturing. The dogs barked on his approach, and he cried out. Glaucus, for that was the name of the goatherd, heard his voice, ran up quickly, called off his dogs, and drove them away from Homer. For some time he stood wondering how a blind man should have reached such a place alone, and what could be his design in coming. He then went up to him and inquired who he was, and how he had come to desolate places and untrodden spots, and of what he stood in need. Homer, by recounting to him the whole history of his misfortunes, moved him with compassion, and he took him and led him to his cot, and having lit a fire, bade him sup. The dogs, instead of eating, kept barking at the stranger according to their usual habit. Whereupon Homer addressed Glaucus thus, O Glaucus, my friend, prithee, attend to my behest. First give the dogs their supper at the doors of the hut, for so it is better, since whilst they watch, nor thief nor wild beast will approach the fold. Glaucus was pleased with the advice, and marvelled at its author. Having finished supper, they banqueted afresh on conversation, Homer narrating his wanderings, and telling of the cities he had visited. At length they retired to rest, but on the following morning Glaucus resolved to go to his master and acquaint him with his meeting with Homer. Having left the goats in charge of a fellow servant, he left Homer at home, promising to return quickly. Having arrived at Bolissus, a place near the farm, and finding his mate, he told him the whole story respecting Homer and his journey. He paid little attention to what he said, and blamed Glaucus for his stupidity in taking in and feeding maimed and enfeebled persons. However, he bade him bring the stranger to him. Glaucus told Homer what had taken place, and bade him follow him, assuring him that good fortune would be the result. Conversation soon showed that the stranger was a man of such cleverness and general knowledge, and that Kean persuaded him to remain, and to undertake the charge of his children. Besides the satisfaction of driving the impostor Thestorides from the island, Homer enjoyed considerable success as a teacher. In the town of Chios he established a school where he taught the precepts of poetry. To this day, says Chandler, the most curious remain is that which has been named without reason the school of Homer. It is on the coast at some distance from the city, northward, and appears to have been an open temple of Cybele, formed on the top of a rock. The shape is oval, and in the centre is the image of the goddess, the head and an arm wanting. 
She is represented as usual sitting. The chair has a lion carved on each side and on the back. The area is bounded by a low rim or seat and about five yards over. The hole is hewn out of the mountain, is rude, indistinct, and probably of the most remote antiquity. So successful was this school that Homer realized a considerable fortune. He married and had two daughters, one of whom died single, the other married a Chian. The following passage betrays the same tendency to connect the personages of the poems with the history of the poet, which has already been mentioned. In his poetical compositions, Homer displays great gratitude towards Mentor of Ithaca in the Odyssey, whose name he has inserted in his poem as the companion of Ulysses, in return for the care taken of him when afflicted with blindness. He also testifies his gratitude to Themius, who had given him both sustenance and instruction. His celebrity continued to increase, and many persons advised him to visit Greece, whither his reputation had now extended. Having, it is said, made some additions to his poems calculated to please the vanity of the Athenians, of whose city he had hitherto made no mention, he set out for Samos. Here, being recognized by a Samian, who had met with him in Chios, he was handsomely received, and invited to join in celebrating the Apaturian festival. He recited some verses which gave great satisfaction, and by singing the Aresion at the new moon festivals, he earned a subsistence visiting the houses of the rich, with whose children he was very popular. In the spring he sailed for Athens, and arrived at the island of Eos, now Eno, where he fell extremely ill and died. It is said that his death arose from vexation at not having been able to unravel an enigma proposed by some fisherman's children. Such is, in brief, the substance of the earliest life of Homer we possess, and so broad are the evidences of its historical worthlessness that it is scarcely necessary to point them out in detail. Let us now consider some of the opinions to which a persevering, patient, and learned, but by no means consistent, series of investigations has led. In doing so, I profess to bring forward statements not to vouch for their reasonableness or probability. Homer appeared. The history of this poet and his works is lost in doubtful obscurity, as is the history of many of the first minds who have done honor to humanity because they rose amidst darkness." The majestic stream of his song, blessing, and fertilizing flows like the Nile through many lands and nations, and like the sources of the Nile, its fountains will ever remain concealed. Such are the words in which one of the most judicious German critics has eloquently described the uncertainty in which the whole of the Homeric question is involved. With no less truth and feeling he proceeds. It seems here of chief importance to expect no more than the nature of things makes possible— if the period of tradition and history is the region of twilight, we should not expect in it perfect light. The creations of genius always seem like miracles, because they are, for the most part, created far out of the reach of observation. If we were in possession of all the historical testimonies, we never could wholly explain the origin of the Iliad and the Odyssey, for their origin, in all essential points, must have remained the secret of the poet." From this criticism, which shows as much insight into the depths of human nature as into the minute wire drawings of scholastic investigation, let us pass on to the main question at issue. Was Homer an individual, or were the Iliad and Odyssey the result of an ingenious arrangement of fragments by earlier poets? Well, has Lander remarked, some tell us there were twenty Homers, some deny that there was ever one, it were idle and foolish to shake the contents of a vase in order to let them settle at last. We are perpetually laboring to destroy our delights, our composure, our devotion to superior power. Of all the animals on earth, we least know what is good for us. My opinion is that what is best for us is our admiration of good. No man living venerates Homer more than I do. But, greatly as we admire this generous enthusiasm, which rests contented with the poetry on which its best impulses had been nurtured and fostered, without seeking to destroy the vividness of first impressions by minute analysis, our editorial office compels us to give some attention to the doubts and difficulties with which the Homeric question is beset, and to treat our reader for a brief period to prefer his judgment to his imagination, and to condescend to dry details." Before, however, entering into particulars respecting the question of this unity of the Homeric poems, at least of the Iliad, 
I must express my sympathy with the sentiments expressed in the following remarks. We cannot but think the universal admiration of its unity by the better, the poetic age of Greece, almost conclusive testimony to its original composition. It was not till the age of the grammarians that its primitive integrity was called in question, nor is it injustice to assert that the minute and analytical spirit of a grammarian is not the best qualification for the profound feeling, the comprehensive conception of an harmonious whole. The most exquisite anatomist may be no judge of the symmetry of the human frame, and we would take the opinion of Chantre or Westmacott on the proportions and general beauty of a form rather than that of a Mr. Brodie or Sir Astley Cooper. There is some truth though some malicious exaggeration, in the lines of Pope. The critic eye, that microscope of wit, sees hairs and pores, examines bit by bit how parts relate to parts, or they to whole. The body's harmony, the beaming soul, are things which Custer, Berman, Wass, shall see, when man's whole frame is obvious to a flea. Long was the time which elapsed before anyone dreamt of questioning the unity of the authorship of the Homeric poems. The grave and cautious Thucydides quoted without hesitation the hymn to Apollo, the authenticity of which has been already disclaimed by modern critics. Longinus, in an oft-quoted passage, merely expressed an opinion touching the comparative inferiority of the Odyssey to the Iliad, and, among a mass of ancient authors whose very names it would be tedious to detail, no suspicion of the personal non-existence of Homer ever arose. So far, the voice of antiquity seems to be in favor of our early ideas on the subject. Let us now see what are the discoveries to which more modern investigations lay claim. At the end of the seventeenth century, doubts had begun to awaken on the subject, and we find Bentley remarking that Homer wrote a sequel of songs and rhapsodies to be sung by himself for small comings and good cheer at festivals and other days of merriment. These loose songs were not collected together in the form of an epic poem till about Pesistratus's time, about five hundred years after. Two French writers, Hedelin and Perrault, avowed a similar scepticism on the subject, but it is in the Scienza Nuova of Battista Vico that we first meet with the germ of the theory, subsequently defended by Wolfe with so much learning and acuteness. Indeed, it is with the Wolfian theory that we have chiefly to deal— and with the following bold hypotheses, which we will detail in the words of Grote. Half a century ago, the acute and valuable prolegomena of F. A. Wolf, turning to account the Venetian Scolia, which had then been recently published, first opened philosophical discussion as to the history of the Homeric text. A considerable part of that dissertation, though by no means the whole, is employed in vindicating the position previously announced by Bentley, amongst others, that the separate constituent portions of the Iliad and Odyssey had not been cemented together into any compact body and unchangeable order until the days of Pesistratus in the sixth century before Christ. As a step towards that conclusion, Wolfe maintained that no written copies of either poem could be shown to have existed during the earlier times to which their composition is referred, and that without writing neither the perfect symmetry of so complicated a work could have been originally conceived by any poet, nor, if realized by him, transmitted with assurance to posterity. The absence of easy and convenient writing, such as must be indispensably supposed for long manuscripts among the early Greeks, was thus one of the points in Wolfe's case against the primitive integrity of the Iliad and Odyssey. By Nietzsche and other leading opponents of Wolfe, the connection of the one with the other seems to have been accepted as he originally put it, and it has been considered incumbent on those who defended the ancient aggregate character of the Iliad and Odyssey to maintain that they were written poems from the beginning. To me it appears that the architectonic functions ascribed by Wolfe to Pesistratus and his associates in reference to the Homeric poems are nowise admissible, but much would undoubtedly be gained towards that view of the question if it could be shown that, in order to controvert it, we were driven to the necessity of admitting long written poems in the ninth century before the Christian era. Few things, in my opinion, can be more improbable, and Mr. Payne Knight, opposed as he is to the Wolfian hypothesis, admits this no less than Wolf himself. The traces of writing in Greece, even in the seventh century before the Christian era, are exceedingly trifling. 
We have no remaining inscription earlier than the 40th Olympiad, and the early inscriptions are rude and unskillfully executed. Nor can we even assure ourselves whether Archilochus, Simonides of Amorgus, Calanus, Tertius, Xanthus, and the other early elegiac and lyric poets committed their compositions to writing, or at what time the practice of doing so became familiar. The first positive ground which authorizes us to presume the existence of a manuscript of Homer is in the famous ordinance of Solon with regard to the rhapsodies at the Panathenaea, but for what length of time previously manuscripts had existed we are unable to say. Those who maintain that the Homeric poems to have been written from the beginning rest their case not upon positive proofs, nor yet upon the existing habits of society with regard to poetry, for they admit generally that the Iliad and Odyssey were not read, but recited and heard, but upon the supposed necessity that there must have been manuscripts to ensure the preservation of the poems, the unassisted memory of reciters being neither sufficient nor trustworthy." But here we only escape a smaller difficulty by running into a greater, for the existence of trained bards, gifted with extraordinary memory, is far less astonishing than that of long manuscripts, in an age essentially non-reading and non-writing, and when even suitable instruments and materials for the process are not obvious. Moreover, there is a strong positive reason for believing that the bard was under no necessity of refreshing his memory by consulting a manuscript, for if such had been the fact— Blindness would have been a disqualification for the profession, which we know that it was not, as well from the example of Demodocus in the Odyssey, as from that of the blind bard of Chios in the hymn to the Delian Apollo, whom Thucydides, as well as the general tenor of Grecian legend, identifies with Homer himself. The author of that hymn, be he who he may, could never have described a blind man as attaining the utmost perfection in his art, if he had been conscious that the memory of the bard was only maintained by constant reference to the manuscript in his chest. The loss of the de Gamma, that crux of critics, that quicksand upon which even the acumen of Bentley was shipwrecked, seems to prove beyond a doubt that the pronunciation of the Greek language had undergone a considerable change. Now it is certainly difficult to suppose that the Homeric poems could have suffered by this change had written copies been preserved, if Chaucer's poetry, for instance, had not been written, it could only have come down to us in a softened form more like the effeminate version of Dryden than the rough, quaint, noble original. At what period, continues Grote, these poems, or indeed any other Greek poems, first began to be written, must be matter of conjecture, though there is ground for assurance that it was before the time of Solon. If in the absence of evidence we may venture upon naming any more determinate period, the question at once suggests itself. What were the purposes which, in that state of society, a manuscript at its first commencement must have been intended to answer? For whom was a written Iliad necessary? Not for the rhapsodes, for with them it was not only planted in the memory, but also interwoven with the feelings, and conceived in conjunction with all those flexions and intonations of voice, pauses, and other oral artifices which were required for emphatic delivery, and which the naked manuscript could never reproduce. Not for the general public. They were accustomed to receive it with its rhapsodic delivery, and with its accompaniments of a solemn and crowded festival. The only persons for whom the written Iliad would be suitable would be a select few, studious and curious men, a class of readers capable of analyzing the complicated emotions which they had experienced as hearers in the crowd, and who would, on perusing the written words, realize in their imaginations a sensible portion of the impression communicated by the reciter. Incredible as the statement may seem in an age like the present, there is in all early societies, and there was in early Greece, a time when no such reading class existed. If we could discover at what time such a class first began to be formed, we should be able to make a guess at the time when the old epic poems were first committed to writing. Now, the period which may with the greatest probability be fixed upon as having first witnessed the formation even of the narrowest reading class in Greece is in the middle of the seventh century before the Christian era, B.C. 660 to B.C. 630, the age of Terpander, Calanus, Archilochus, Simonides of Amorgus, etc., I ground this supposition on the change then operated in the character and tendencies of Grecian poetry and music, 
the elegiac and the iambic measures, having been introduced as rivals to the primitive hexameter, and poetical compositions having been transferred from the epical past to the affairs of present and real life. Such a change was important at a time when poetry was the only known mode of publication, to use a modern phrase not altogether suitable, yet the nearest approaching to the sense. It argued a new way of looking at the old epical treasures of the people, as well as a thirst for new poetical effect, and the men who stood forward in it may well be considered as desirous to study and competent to criticize, from their own individual point of view, the written words of the Homeric Rhapsodies, just as we are told that Calinus both noticed and eulogized the Thebaeus as the production of Homer. There seems therefore ground for conjecturing that, for the use of this newly formed and important but very narrow class, manuscripts of the Homeric poems and other old epics, the Thebaeus and the Cypria, as well as the Iliad and the Odyssey, began to be compiled towards the middle of the seventh century, and the opening of Egypt to Grecian commerce, which took place about the same period, would furnish increased facilities for obtaining the requisite papyrus to write upon. A reading class, when once formed, would doubtless slowly increase, and the number of manuscripts along with it, so that, before the time of Solon, fifty years afterwards, both readers and manuscripts, though still comparatively few, might have attained a certain recognized authority and formed a tribunal of reference against the carelessness of individual rhapsodes. But even Pesistratus has not been suffered to remain in possession of the credit, and we cannot help feeling the force of the following observations. There are several incidental circumstances which, in our opinion, throw some suspicion over the whole history of the Pesistratid compilation, at least over the theory that the Iliad was cast into its present stately and harmonious form by the directions of the Athenian ruler. If the great poets, who flourished at the bright period of Grecian songs, of which, alas, we have inherited little more than the fame, and the faint echo if Stesichorus, Anacreon and Simonides were employed in the noble task of compiling the Iliad and Odyssey, so much must have been done to arrange, to connect, to harmonize, that it is almost incredible that stronger marks of Athenian manufacture should not remain. Whatever occasional anomalies may be detected, anomalies which no doubt arise out of our own ignorance of the language of the Homeric age, however the irregular use of the Dagama may have perplexed our Bentleys, to whom the name of Helen is said to have caused as much disquiet and distress as the fair one herself among the heroes of her age. However, Mr. Knight may have failed in reducing the Homeric language to its primitive form. However, finally, the Attic dialogue may not have assumed all its more marked and distinguishing characteristics. Still, it is difficult to suppose that the language, particularly in the joinings and transitions and connecting parts, should not more clearly betray the incongruity between the more ancient and modern forms of expression." It is not quite in character with such a period to imitate an antique style, in order to piece out an imperfect poem in the character of the original, as Sir Walter Scott has done in his continuation of Sir Tristram. If, however, not even such faint and indistinct traces of Athenian compilation are discoverable in the language of the poems, the total absence of Athenian national feeling is perhaps no less worthy of observation." In later, and it may fairly be suspected in earlier times, the Athenians were more than ordinarily jealous of the fame of their ancestors. But, amid all the traditions of the glories of early Greece embodied in the Iliad, the Athenians play a most subordinate and insignificant part. Even the few passages which relate to their ancestors, Mr. Knight suspects to be interpolations. It is possible, indeed, that in its leading outline the Iliad may be true to historic fact, that in the great maritime expedition of western Greece against the rival Laomedontidae, the chieftain of Thessaly, from his valour and the number of his forces, may have been the most important ally of the Peloponnesian sovereign. The preeminent value of the ancient poetry on the Trojan War may thus have forced the national feeling of the Athenians to yield to their taste. The songs which spoke of their own great ancestor were, no doubt, of far inferior sublimity and popularity, or, at first sight, a Thessiad would have been much more likely to have emanated from an Athenian synod of compilers of ancient song than an Achilleid or an Olysseid. Could France have given birth to a Tasso, Tancred would have been the hero of the Jerusalem. 
If, however, the Homeric ballads, as they are sometimes called, which related the wrath of Achilles with all its direful consequences, were so far superior to the rest of the poetic cycle as to admit no rivalry, it is still surprising that throughout the whole poem the Kalida Jactura should never betray the workmanship of an Athenian hand, and that the national spirit of a race, who have at a later period not inaptly been compared to our self-admiring neighbors, the French, should submit with lofty self-denial to the almost total exclusion of their own ancestors, or, at least to the questionable dignity of only having produced a leader tolerably skilled in the military tactics of his age. To return to the Wolfian theory— while it is to be confessed that Wolfe's objections to the primitive integrity of the Iliad and Odyssey have never been wholly got over, we cannot help discovering that they have failed to enlighten us as to any substantial point, and that the difficulties with which the whole subject is beset are rather augmented than otherwise if we admit his hypothesis. Nor is Lachman's modification of his theory any better. He divides the first twenty-two books of the Iliad into sixteen different songs, and treats as ridiculous the belief that their amalgamation into one regular poem belongs to a period earlier than the age of Pesistratus. This, as Grote observes, explains the gaps and contradictions in the narrative, but it explains nothing else. Moreover, we find no contradictions warranting this belief, and the so-called sixteen poets concur in getting rid of the following leading men in the first battle after the secession of Achilles. Elephenor, chief of the Euboans, Typolemus of the Rhodians, Pandarus of the Lycians, Odius of the Halizonians, Peros and Acamus of the Thracians. None of these heroes again make their appearance, and we can but agree with Colonel Muir that it seems strange that any number of independent poets should have so harmoniously dispensed with the services of all six in the sequel. The discrepancy by which Palamenes, who is represented as dead in the fifth book, weeps at his son's funeral in the thirteenth, can only be regarded as the result of an interpolation. Grote, although not very distinct in stating his own opinions on the subjects, has done much to clearly show the incongruity of the Wolfian theory and of Lachman's modifications with the character of Pesistratus. But he has also shown, and we think with equal success, that the two questions relative to the primitive unity of these poems, or supposing that impossible, the unison of these parts by Pesistratus, and not before his time, are essentially distinct. In short, a man may believe the Iliad to have been put together out of pre-existing songs without recognizing the age of Pesistratus as the period of its first compilation. The friends or literary employees of Pesistratus must have found an Iliad that was already ancient, and the silence of the Alexandrian critics respecting the Pesistratic recension goes far to prove that, among the numerous manuscripts they examined, this was either wanting or thought unworthy of attention. Moreover, he continues, the whole tenor of the poems themselves confirms what is here remarked. There is nothing, either in the Iliad or Odyssey, which savors of modernism, applying that term to the age of Pesistratus, nothing which brings to our view the alterations brought about by two centuries in the Greek language, the coin money, the habits of writing and reading, the despotisms and republican governments, the close military array, the improved construction of ships, the amphicatronic convocations, the mutual frequentation of religious festivals, the oriental and Egyptian veins of religion, etc., familiar to the latter epoch. These alterations, Anomacritus and the other literary friend of Pesistratus could hardly have failed to notice, even without design, had they then for the first time undertaken the task of piecing together many self-existent epics into one large aggregate. Everything in the two great Homeric poems, both in substance and in language, belongs to an age two or three centuries earlier than Pesistratus. Indeed, even the interpolations, or those passages which on the best grounds are pronounced to be such, betray no trace of the sixth century before Christ, and may well have been heard by Archilochus and Calenus, in some cases even by Arctinus and Hesiod, as genuine Homeric matter. As far as the evidences on the case, as well internal as external, enable us to judge, we seem warranted in believing that the Iliad and Odyssey were recited substantially as they now stand, always allowing for patial divergences of text and interpolations, in 776 B.C., our first trustworthy mark of Grecian time, and this ancient date, let it be added, 
as it is the best authenticated fact, so it is also the most important attribute of the Homeric poems, considered in reference to Grecian history, for they thus afford us an insight into the anti-historical character of the Greeks, enabling us to trace the subsequent forward march of the nation, and to seize instructive contrasts between their former and their later condition. On the whole, I am inclined to believe that the labors of Pesistratus were wholly of an editorial character, although I must confess that I can lay down nothing respecting the extent of his labors. At the same time, so far from believing that the composition or primary arrangement of these poems in their present form was the work of Pesistratus, I am rather persuaded that the fine taste and elegant mind of that Athenian would lead him to preserve an ancient and traditional order of the poems rather than to patch and reconstruct them according to a fanciful hypothesis. I will not repeat the many discussions respecting whether the poems were written or not, or whether the art of writing was known in the time of their reputed author. Suffice it to say that the more we read, the less satisfied we are upon either subject." I cannot, however, help thinking that the story which attributes the preservation of these poems to Lysurgis is little else than a version of the same story as that of Pesistratus, while its historical probability must be measured by that of many others relating to the Spartan Confucius. I will conclude this sketch of the Homeric theories with an attempt, made by an ingenious friend, to unite them into something like consistency. It is as follows. No doubt the common soldiers of that age had, like the common sailors of some fifty years ago, someone qualified to discourse in excellent music among them. Many of these, like those of the Negroes in the United States, were extemporaneous and elusive to events passing around them. But what was passing around them? The grand events of a spirit-stirring war, occurrences likely to impress themselves as the missiles had done upon their memory besides which a retentive memory was deemed a virtue of the first water, and was cultivated accordingly in those ancient times. Ballads at first, and down to the beginning of the war with Troy, were merely recitations with an intonation, then followed a species of recitative, probably with an intoned burden. Tune next followed, as it aided the memory considerably. It was at this period, about four hundred years after the war, that a poet flourished of the name of Belisigenes or Moanides, but most probably the former. He saw that these ballads might be made of great utility to his purpose of writing a poem on the social position of Hellas, and, as a collection, he published these lays, connecting them by a tale of his own. This poem now exists under the title of the Odyssey. The author, however, did not affix his own name to the poem, which, in fact, was, great part of it, remodeled from the archaic dialect of Crete, in which tongue the ballads were found by him. He, therefore, called it the poem of Homeros, or the collector, but this is rather a proof of his modesty and talent than of his mere drudging arrangement of other people's ideas, for, as Grote has finally observed, arguing for the unity of authorship, a great poet might have recast pre-existing separate songs into one comprehensive whole, but no mere arrangers or compilers would be competent to do so. While employed on the wild legend of Odysseus, he met with a ballad recording the quarrel of Achilles and Agamemnon. His noble mind seized the hint that there presented itself, and the Achilles grew under his hand. Unity of design, however, caused him to publish the poem under the same pseudonym as his former work, and the disjointed lays of the ancient bards were joined together, like those relating to the Cid, into a chronicle history named the Iliad. Melisigenes knew that the poem was destined to be a blasting one, and so it has proved. But first, the poems were destined to undergo many vicissitudes and corruptions by the people who took to singing them in the streets, assemblies, and agoras. However, Solon first, and then Pisistratus, and afterwards Aristoteles and others revised the poems and restored the works of Melisigenes, Homeros, to their original integrity in a great measure. Having thus given some general notion of the strange theories which have developed themselves respecting this most interesting subject, I must still express my conviction as to the unity of the authorship of the Homeric poems. To deny that many corruptions and interpolations disfigure them, 
and that the intrusive hand of the poor tasters may here and there have inflicted a wound more serious than the negligence of the copyist would be an absurd and captious assumption. But it is to a higher criticism that we must appeal if we would either understand or enjoy these poems. In maintaining the authenticity and personality of their one author, be he Homer or Melisigenes, quo cunuc nomine vocare eum josfaque sit, I feel conscious that, while the whole weight of historical evidence is against the hypothesis which would assign these great works to a plurality of authors, the most powerful internal evidence, and that which springs from the deepest and most immediate impulse of the soul, also speaks eloquently to the contrary. The minutia of verbal criticism I am far from seeking to despise. Indeed, considering the character of some of my own books, such an attempt would be gross inconsistency. But while I appreciate its importance in a philological view, I am inclined to set little store on its aesthetic value, especially in poetry. Three parts of the emendations made upon poets are mere alterations, some of which, had they been suggested to the author by his Mecenas or Africanus, he would probably have adopted. Moreover, those who are most exact in laying down rules of verbal criticism and interpretation are often least competent to carry out their own precepts. Grammarians are not poets by profession, but may be so per accidens. I do not at this moment remember two emendations on Homer calculated to substantially improve the poetry of a passage, although a mass of remarks from Herodotus down to Lowe have given us the history of a thousand minute points, without which our Greek knowledge would be gloomy and jejune. But it is not on words only that grammarians, mere grammarians, will exercise their elaborate and often tiresome ingenuity. Binding down an heroic or dramatic poet to the block upon which they have previously dissected his words and sentences, they proceed to use the axe and the pruning knife by wholesale, and inconsistent in everything but their wish to make out a case of unlawful affiliation, they cut out book after book, passage after passage, till the author is reduced to a collection of fragments, or till those who fancy they possessed the works of some great man find that they have been put off with a vile counterfeit got up at second hand. If we compare the theories of Knight, Wolf, Lockman, and others, we shall feel better satisfied of the utter uncertainty of criticism than of the apocryphal position of Homer. One rejects what another considers the turning point of his theory— one cuts a supposed knot by expunging what another would explain by omitting something else. Nor is this morbid species of sagacity by any means to be looked upon as a literary novelty. Just as Lipsius, a scholar of no ordinary skill, seems to revel in the imaginary discovery that the tragedies attributed to Seneca are by four different authors. Now, I will venture to assert that these tragedies are so uniform not only in their borrowed phraseology— a phraseology with which writers like Bothius and Saxo Grammaticus were more charmed than ourselves in their freedom from real poetry, and last but not least, in an ultra-refined and consistent abandonment of good taste, that few writers of the present day would question the capabilities of the same gentleman, be he Seneca or not, to produce not only these but a great many more equally bad. With equal sagacity, Father Hardwin astonished the world with the startling announcement that the Aeneid of Virgil and the satires of Horace were literary deceptions. Now, without wishing to say one word of disrespect against the industry and learning, nay, the refined acuteness which scholars like Wolfe have bestowed upon this subject, I must express my fears that many of our modern Homeric theories will become matter for the surprise and entertainment rather than the instruction of posterity." nor can I help thinking that the literary history of more recent times will account for many points of difficulty in the transmission of the Iliad and Odyssey to a period so remote from that of their first creation. I have already expressed my belief that the labors of Pesistratus were of a purely editorial character, and there seems no more reason why corrupt and imperfect editions of Homer may not have been abroad in his day than that the poems of Valerius Flaccus and Tibullus should have given so much trouble to Polgio, Scaliger, and others. But after all, the main fault in all the Homeric theories is that they demand too great a sacrifice of those feelings to which poetry most powerfully appeals and which are its most fitting judges." The ingenuity which has sought to rob us of the name and existence of Homer does too much violence to that inward emotion which makes our whole soul yearn with love and admiration for the blind bard of Chios. 
To believe the author of the Iliad, a mere compiler, is to degrade the powers of human invention, to elevate analytical judgment at the expense of the most ennobling impulses of the soul, and to forget the ocean in the contemplation of a polypus. There is a Catholicity, so to speak, in the very name of Homer. Our faith in the author of the Iliad may be a mistaken one, but as yet nobody has taught us better. While, however, I look upon the belief in Homer as one that has nature herself for its mainspring, while I can join with old Ennius in believing in Homer as the ghost, who, like some patron saint, hovers round the bed of the poet, and even bestows rare gifts from that wealth of imagination which a host of imitators could not exhaust, still, I am far from wishing to deny that the author of these great poems found a rich fund of tradition— a well-stocked mythical storehouse from whence he might derive both subject and embellishment. But it is one thing to use existing romances in the embellishment of a poem, another to patch up the poem itself from such materials. What consistency of style and execution can be hoped for from such an attempt, or rather what bad taste and tedium will not be the infallible result? A blending of popular legends— and a free use of the songs of other bards, are features perfectly consistent with poetical originality. In fact, the most original writer is still drawing upon outward impressions, nay, even his own thoughts are a kind of secondary agent which support and feed the impulses of imagination. But unless there be some grand pervading principle, some invisible yet most distinctly stamped archetypus of the great whole, a poem like the Iliad can never come to the birth. Traditions, the most picturesque episodes, the most pathetic local associations, teeming with the thoughts of gods and great men, may crowd in one mighty vision, or reveal themselves in more substantial forms to the mind of the poet. But, except the power to create a grand whole, to which these shall be but as details and embellishments, be present, we shall have not but a scrap-book, a parterre filled with flowers and weeds strangling each other in their wild redundancy." we shall have a centre of rags and tatters which will require little acuteness to detect. Sensible as I am of the difficulty of disproving a negative, and aware as I must be of the weighty grounds there are for opposing my belief, it still seems to me that the Homeric question is one that is reserved for a higher criticism than it has often obtained. We are not by nature intended to know all things, still less to compass the powers by which the greatest blessings of life have been placed at our disposal. Were faith no virtue, then we might indeed wonder why God willed our ignorance on any matter. But we are too well taught the contrary lesson, and it seems as though our faith should be especially tried, touching the men and the events which have wrought most influence upon the condition of humanity. And there is a kind of sacredness, attached to the memory of the great and the good, which seems to bid us repulse the scepticism which would allegorize their existence into a pleasing apologue, and measure the giants of intellect by an homeopathic dynamiter. Long and habitual reading of Homer appears to familiarize our thoughts even to his incongruities, or rather, if we read in a right spirit and with a heartfelt appreciation, we are too much dazzled too deeply wrapped in admiration of the whole to dwell upon the minute spots which mere analysis can discover. In reading an heroic poem, we must transform ourselves into heroes of the time being. We, in imagination, must fight over the same battles, woo the same loves, burn with the same sense of injury as an Achilles or a Hector. And if we can but attain this degree of enthusiasm, unless enthusiasm will scarcely suffice for the reading of Homer— we shall feel that the poems of Homer are not only the work of one writer, but of the greatest writer that ever touched the hearts of men by the power of song. And it was this supposed unity of authorship which gave these poems their powerful influence over the minds of the men of old. Heron, who is evidently little disposed in favor of modern theories, finally observes, It was Homer who formed the character of the Greek nation. No poet has ever, as a poet, exercised a similar influence over his countrymen. Prophets, lawgivers, and sages have formed the character of other nations. It was reserved to a poet to form that of the Greeks. This is a feature in their character which was not wholly erased, even in the period of their degeneracy. When lawgivers and sages appeared in Greece, the work of the poet 
had already been accomplished, and they paid homage to his superior genius. He held up before his nation the mirror, in which they were to behold the world of gods and heroes no less than of feeble mortals, and to behold them reflected with purity and truth. His poems are founded on the first feeling of human nature, on the love of children, wife, and country, on that passion which outweighs all others, the love of glory. His songs were poured forth from a breast which sympathized with all the feelings of man, and therefore they enter, and will continue to enter, every breast which cherishes the same sympathies. If it is granted to his immortal spirit, from another heaven than any of which he dreamed on earth, to look down on his race, to see the nations, from the fields of Asia to the forests of Hersonea, performing pilgrimages to the fountain which his magic wand caused to flow, if it is permitted to him to view the vast assemblage of grand, of elevated, of glorious productions which had been called into being by means of his songs, wherever his immortal spirit may reside, this alone would suffice to complete his happiness. Can we contemplate that ancient monument on which the apotheosis of Homer is depictured, and not feel how much of pleasing association, how much that appeals most forcibly and most distinctly to our minds, is lost by the admittance of any theory but our old tradition? The more we read, and the more we think, think as becomes the readers of Homer, the more rooted becomes the conviction that the father of poetry gave us this rich inheritance whole and entire. Whatever were the means of its preservation, let us rather be thankful for the treasury of taste and eloquence thus laid open to our use, than seek to make it a mere center around which to drive a series of theories whose wildness is only equaled by their inconsistency with each other. As the hymns and some other poems usually ascribed to Homer are not included in Pope's translation, I will content myself with a brief account of the battle of the frogs and mice from the pen of a writer who has done it full justice. This poem, says Coleridge, is a short mock heroic of ancient date. The text varies in different editions and is obviously disturbed and corrupt to a great degree. It is commonly said to have been a juvenile essay of Homer's genius. Others have attributed it to the same Pagraeus mentioned above, and whose reputation for humor seems to have invited the appropriation of any piece of ancient wit, the author of which was uncertain. So little did the Greeks, before the age of the Ptolemies, know or care about that department of criticism employed in determining the genuineness of ancient writings. As to this little poem being a youthful prelusion of Homer, it seems sufficient to say that from the beginning to the end it is a plain and palpable parody not only of the general spirit, but of the numerous passages of the Iliad itself, and even if no such intention to parody were discernible in it, the objection would still remain that to suppose a work of mere burlesque to be the primary effort of poetry in a simple age, seems to reverse that order in the development of national taste, which the history of every other people in Europe, and of many in Asia, has almost ascertained to be a law of the human mind. It is in a state of society much more refined and permanent than that described in the Iliad, that any popularity would attend such a ridicule of war, and the gods as is contained in this poem." and the fact of there having existed three other poems of the same kind, attributed for aught we can see with as much reason to Homer, is a strong inducement to believe that none of them were of the Homeric age. Knight infers from the usage of the word deltos, writing tablet, instead of diphthera, skin, which according to Herod was the material employed by the Asiatic Greeks for that purpose, that this poem was another offspring of Attic ingenuity, and generally that the familiar mention of the cock is a strong argument against so ancient a date for its composition. Having thus given a brief account of the poems comprised in Pope's design, I will now proceed to make a few remarks on his translation, and on my own purpose in the present edition. Pope was not a Grecian. His whole education had been irregular, and his earliest acquaintance with the poet was through the version of Ogilby, it is not too much to say that his whole work bears the impress of a disposition to be satisfied with the general sense rather than to dive deeply into the minute and delicate features of language. Hence his whole work is to be looked upon rather as an elegant paraphrase than a translation. There are to be sure certain conventional anecdotes which prove that Pope consulted various friends whose classical attainments were sounder than his own during the undertaking, but it is probable that these examinations were the result rather of the contradictory versions already existing than of a desire to make a perfect 
transcript of the original. And in those days what is called literal translation was less cultivated than at present. If something like the general sense could be decorated with the easy gracefulness of a practiced poet— if the charms of metrical cadence and a pleasing fluency could be made consistent with a fair interpretation of the poet's meaning, his words were less jealously sought for, and those who could read so good a poem as Pope's Iliad had fair reason to be satisfied. It would be absurd, therefore, to test Pope's translation by our own advancing knowledge of the original text. We must be content to look at it as a most delightful work in itself, a work which is as much a part of English literature as Homer himself is of Greek. We must not be torn from our kindly association with the old Iliad, that once was our most cherished companion, or our most looked-for prize, merely because Butman, Lowe, and Little have made us so much more accurate as to amphicupilon being an adjective and not a substantive. Far be it from us to defend the faults of Pope, especially when we think of Chapman's fine, bold, rough old English. Far be it from us to hold up his translation as what a translation of Homer might be. But we can still dismiss Pope's Iliad to the hands of our readers with the consciousness that they must have read a very great number of books before they have read its fellow. As to the notes accompanying the present volume— They are drawn up without pretension, and mainly with the view of helping the general reader. Having thus little time since translated all the works of Homer for another publisher, I might have brought a large amount of accumulated matter, sometimes of a critical character, to bear upon the text. But Pope's version was no field for such a display, and my purpose was to touch briefly on antiquarian or mythological allusions, to notice occasionally some departures from the original, and to give a few parallel passages from our English Homer, Milton. In the latter task I cannot pretend a novelty, but I trust that my other annotations, while utterly disclaiming high scholastic views, will be found to convey as much as is wanted, at least as far as the necessary limits of these volumes could be expected to admit. To write a commentary on Homer is not my present aim, but if I have made Pope's translation a little more entertaining and instructive to a mass of miscellaneous readers, I shall consider my wishes satisfactorily accomplished. Theodore Alois Buckley, Christ Church The end of the introduction to the Alexander Pope translation of Homer's The Iliad Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Pope's Preface to the Iliad of Homer. Homer is universally allowed to have had the greatest invention of any writer whatever. The praise of judgment Virgil has justly contested with him, and others may have their pretensions as to particular excellences. But his invention remains yet unrivaled. Nor is it a wonder if he has ever been acknowledged the greatest of poets, who most excelled in that which is the very foundation of poetry. It is the invention that, in different degrees, distinguishes all great geniuses. The utmost stretch of human study, learning, and industry, which masters everything else, can never attain to this. It furnishes art, with all her materials, and without a judgment itself, can, at best, but steal wisely, for art is only like a prudent steward that lives on managing the riches of nature. Whatever praises may be given to works of judgment, there is not even a single beauty in them to which the invention must not contribute, as in the most regular gardens, art can only reduce beauties of nature to more regularity, and such a figure which the common eye may better take in, and is therefore more entertained with. And perhaps the reason why common critics are inclined to prefer a judicious and methodical genius to a great and fruitful one is because they find it easier for themselves to pursue their observations through a uniform and bounded walk of art than to comprehend the vast and various extent of nature. Our author's work is a wild paradise where, If we cannot see all the beauties so distinctly as in an ordered garden, it is only because the number of them is infinitely greater. It is like a copious nursery which contains the seeds and first productions of every kind, out of which those who followed him 
have but selected some particular plants, each according to his fancy, to cultivate and beautify. If some things are too luxuriant, it is owing to the richness of the soil, and if others are not arrived to perfection or maturity, it is only because they are overrun and oppressed by those of a stronger nature. It is to the strength of this amazing invention we are to attribute that unequaled fire and rapture which is so forcible in Homer, that no man of a true poetical spirit is master of himself while he reads him. What he writes is of the most animated nature imaginable. Everything moves, everything lives, and is put in action. If a council be called, or a battle fought, you are not coldly informed of what was said or done as from a third person. The reader is hurried out of himself by the force of the poet's imagination, and turns in one place to a hearer, in another to a spectator. The course of his verses resembles that of the army he describes. Hoid ar isan Jose te puri kiton pasa nemoito. They pour along like a fire that sweeps the whole earth before it. It is, however, remarkable that his fancy, which is everywhere vigorous, is not discovered immediately at the beginning of his poem in its fullest splendor. It grows in the progress both upon himself and others, and becomes on fire like a chariot wheel by its own rapidity. Exact disposition, just thought, correct elocution, polished numbers, may have been found in a thousand, but this poetic fire, this the vida vi animi, in a very few. Even in works where all those are imperfect or neglected, this can overpower criticism and make us admire even while we disapprove. Nay, where this appears, though attended with absurdities, it brightens all the rubbish about it till we see nothing but its own splendor. This fire is discerned in Virgil, but discerned as through a glass reflected from Homer, more shining than fierce, but everywhere equal and constant. In Lucan and Statius, it bursts out in sudden, short, and interrupted flashes. In Milton, it glows like a furnace kept up to an uncommon ardor by the force of art. In Shakespeare, it strikes before we are aware, like an accidental fire from heaven. But in Homer, and in him only, it burns everywhere clearly, and everywhere irresistibly. I shall here endeavor to show how this vast invention exerts itself in a manner superior to that of any poet through all the main constituent parts of his work, as it is the great and peculiar characteristic which distinguishes him from all other authors. This strong and ruling faculty was like a powerful star which, in the violence of its course, drew all things within its vortex. It seemed not enough to have taken in the whole circle of arts and the whole compass of nature to supply his maxims and reflections, all the inward passions and affections of mankind to furnish his characters, and all the outward forms and images of things for his descriptions. But wanting yet an ampler sphere to expatiate in, he opened a new and boundless walk for his imagination and created a world for himself in the invention of fable. That which Aristotle calls the soul of poetry was first breathed into it by Homer. I shall begin with considering him in his part as it is naturally the first, and I speak of it both as it means the design of a poem and as it is taken for fiction. Fable may be divided into the probable, the allegorical, and the marvelous. The probable fable is the recital of such actions as, though they did not happen, yet might, in the common course of nature, or of such as, though they did, become fables by the additional episodes and manner of telling them. Of this sort is the main story of an epic poem, the return of Ulysses, the settlement of the Trojans in Italy, or the like. That of the Iliad is the anger of Achilles, the most short and single subject that ever was chosen by any poet. Yet this he has supplied with a vaster variety of incidents and events, and crowded with a greater number of counsels, speeches, battles, and episodes of all kind, that are to be found even in those poems whose schemes are of the utmost latitude and irregularity. The action is hurried on with the most vehement spirit, and its whole duration employs not so much as fifty days. Virgil, for want of so warm a genius, aided himself by taking in a more extensive subject, as well as a greater length of time, and contracting the design of both Homer's poems into one, which is yet but a fourth part as large as his. 
The other epic poets have used the same practice, but generally carried it so far as to superinduce a multiplicity of fables, destroy the unity of action, and lose their readers in an unreasonable length of time. Nor is it only in the main design that they have been unable to add to his invention, but they have followed him in every episode and part of story. If he has given a regular catalogue of an army, they all draw up their forces in the same order. If he has funeral games for Patroclus, Virgil has the same for Anchises, and Statius, rather than omit them, destroys the unity of his actions for those of Archimorus. If Ulysses visits the Shades, the Aeneas of Virgil and Scipio of Silius are sent after him. If he be detained from his return by the allurement of Calypso, so is Aeneas by Dido, and Rinaldo by Armida. If Achilles be absent from the army on the score of a quarrel through half the poem, Rinaldo must absent himself just as long on the like account. If he gives his hero a suit of celestial armor, Virgil and Tasso make the same present to theirs. Virgil has not only observed this close imitation of Homer, but where he had not led the way supplied the want from other Greek authors. Thus, the story of Sinon and the taking of Troy was copied, says Macrobius, almost word for word from Pisander, as the loves of Dido and Aeneas are taken from those of Medea and Jason in Apollonius, and several others in the same manner. To proceed to the allegorical fable, if we reflect upon those innumerable knowledges, those secrets of nature and physical philosophy which Homer is generally supposed to have wrapped up in his allegories, what a new and ample scene of wonder may this consideration afford us! How fertile will that imagination appear which is able to clothe all the properties of elements, the qualifications of the mind, the virtues and vices in forms and persons, and to introduce them into actions agreeable to the nature of the things they shadowed. This is a field in which no succeeding poets could dispute with Homer, and whatever commendations have been allowed them on this head are by no means for their invention in having enlarged his circle, but for their judgment in having contracted it. For when the mode of learning changed in the following ages, and science was delivered in a plainer manner, it then became as reasonable in the more modern poets to lay it aside as it was in Homer to make use of it. And perhaps it was no unhappy circumstance for Virgil that there was not in his time that demand upon him of so great an invention as might be capable of furnishing all those allegorical parts of a poem. The marvellous fable includes whatever is supernatural, and especially the machines of the gods. If Homer was not the first who introduced the deities, as Herodotus imagines, into the religion of Greece. He seems the first who brought them into a system of machinery for poetry, and such a one as makes its greatest importance and dignity. For we find those authors who have been offended at the literal notion of the gods constantly laying their accusation against Homer as the chief support of it. But whatever cause there might be to blame his machines in a philosophical or religious view— they are so perfect in the poetic that mankind have been ever since contented to follow them. None have been able to enlarge the sphere of poetry beyond the limits he has set. Every attempt of this nature has proved unsuccessful, and after all the various changes of times and religions, his gods continue to this day the gods of poetry. We come now to the characters of his persons, and here we shall find no author has ever drawn so many with so visible and surprising a variety, or given us such lively and affecting impressions of them. Every one has something so singularly his own, that no painter could have distinguished them more by their features than the poet has by their manners. Nothing can be more exact than the distinctions he has observed in the different degrees of virtues and vices." The single quality of courage is wonderfully diversified in the several characters of the Iliad. That of Achilles is furious and intractable, that of Diomede forward, yet listening to advice, and subject to command, that of Ajax is heavy and self-confiding, of Hector active and vigilant. The courage of Agamemnon is inspirited by love of empire and ambition, that of Menelaus mixed with softness and tenderness for his people." We find in Idomeneus a plain, direct soldier, in Sarpedon a gallant and generous one. Nor is this judicious and astonishing diversity to be found only in the principal quality which constitutes the main of each character, but even in the under parts of it, to which he takes care to give a tincture of that principal one. 
For example, the main characters of Ulysses and Nesta consist in wisdom, and they are distinct in this that the wisdom of one is artificial and various, of the other natural, open, and regular. But they have besides characters of courage, and this quality also takes a different turn in each from the difference of his prudence, for one in the war depends still upon caution, the other upon experience. It would be endless to produce instances of these kinds. The characters of Virgil are far from striking us in this open manner. They lie, in a great degree, hidden and undistinguished, and, where they are marked, most evidently, affect us not in proportion to those of Homer. His characters of valor are much alike. Even that of Turnus seems no way peculiar, but, as it is, in a superior degree. And we see nothing that differences the courage of Menestheus from that of Sergestus, Cloanthus, or the rest. In like manner it may be remarked of Statius' heroes that an air of impetuosity runs through them all. The same horrid and savage courage appears in his Capanius, Tadius, Hippomedon, etc. They have a parity of character which makes them seem brothers of one family. I believe when the reader is led into this tract of reflection, if he will pursue it through the epic and tragic writers, he will be convinced how infinitely superior in this point the invention of Homer was to that of all others. The speeches are to be considered as they flow from the characters, being perfect or defective as they agree or disagree with the manners of those who utter them. As there is more variety of characters in the Iliad, so there is of speeches than in any other poem. Everything in it has manner as Aristotle expresses it, that is, everything is acted or spoken. It is hardly credible, in a work of such length, how small a number of lines are employed in narration. In Virgil, the dramatic part is less in proportion to the narrative, and the speeches often consist of general reflections or thoughts, which might be equally just in any person's mouth upon the same occasion. As many of his persons have no apparent characters, so many of his speeches escape being applied and judged by the rule of propriety. We oftener think of the author himself when we read Virgil than when we are engaged in Homer, all which are the effects of a colder invention that interests us less in the action described. Homer makes us hearers, and Virgil leaves us readers. If, in the next place, we take a view of the sentiments, the same presiding faculty is eminent in the sublimity and spirit of his thoughts. Longinus has given his opinion that it was in this part Homer principally excelled. What were alone sufficient to prove the grandeur and excellence of his sentiments in general is that they have so remarkable a parity with those of the Scripture. Duport, in his Nomologia Homerica, has collected innumerable instances of this sort, and it is with justice an excellent modern writer allows that if Virgil has not so many thoughts that are low and vulgar, he has not so many that are sublime and noble and that the Roman author seldom rises into very astonishing sentiments where he is not fired by the Iliad. If we observe his descriptions, images, and similes, we shall find the invention still predominant. To what else can we ascribe that vast comprehension of images of every sort, where we see each circumstance of art and individual of nature summoned together by the extent and fecundity of his imagination to which all things, in their various views, presented themselves in an instant, and had their impressions taken off to perfection at a heat. Nay, he not only gives us the full prospects of things, but several unexpected peculiarities and side-views, unobserved by any painter but Homer. Nothing is so surprising as the descriptions of his battles, which take up no less than half the Iliad, and are supplied with so vast a variety of incidents, that no one bears a likeness to another, such different kinds of deaths, that no two heroes are wounded in the same manner, and such a profusion of noble ideas that every battle rises above the last in greatness, horror, and confusion. It is certain there is not near that number of images and descriptions in any epic poet, though every one has assisted himself with a great quantity out of him, and it is evident of Virgil especially that he has scarce any comparisons which are not drawn from his master. If we descend from hence to the expression, we see the bright imagination of Homer shining out in the most enlivened forms of it. We acknowledge him the father of poetical diction, the first who taught that language of the gods to men. His expression is like the colouring of some great masters, which discovers itself to be laid on boldly and executed with rapidity. It is indeed the strongest and most glowing imaginable, and touched with the greatest spirit. 
Aristotle had reason to say he was the only poet who had found out living words. There are in him more daring figures and metaphors than in any good author whatever. An arrow is impatient to be on the wing, a weapon thirsts to drink the blood of an enemy, and the like, yet his expression is never too big for the sense, but justly great in proportion to it. It is the sentiment that swells and fills out the diction, which rises with it, and forms itself about it, for in the same degree that a thought is warmer, an expression will be brighter, as that is more strong, this will become more perspicuous, like glass in the furnace, which grows to a greater magnitude and refines to a greater clearness, only as the breath within is more powerful and the heat more intense. To throw his language more out of prose, Homer seems to have affected the compound epithets. This was a sort of composition peculiarly proper to poetry, not only as it heightened the diction, but as it assisted and filled the numbers with greater sound and pomp, and likewise conduced in some measure to thicken the images. On this last consideration I cannot but attribute these also to the fruitfulness of his invention, since, as he has managed them, they are a sort of supernumerary pictures of the persons or things to which they were joined. We see the motion of Hector's plumes in the epithet Corathylus, the landscape of Mount Neritus, the landscape of Mount Neritus and that of Anosiphilos, and so of others which particular images could not have been insisted upon so long as to express them in a description, though but of a single line, without diverting the reader too much from their principal action or figure. As a metaphor is a short simile, one of these epithets is a short description. Lastly, if we consider his versification, we shall be sensible what a share of praise is due to his invention in that also. He was not satisfied with his language as he found it settled in any one part of Greece— but searched through its different dialects with this particular view. To beautify and perfect his numbers, he considered these as they had a greater mixture of vowels or consonants, and accordingly employed them as the verse required either a greater smoothness or strength. What he most affected was the Ionic, which has a peculiar sweetness from its never using contractions, and from its custom of resolving the diphthongs into two syllables, so as to make the words open themselves with a more spreading and sonorous fluency. With this he mingled the Attic contractions, the broader Doric, and the feebler Iolic, which often rejects its aspirate, or takes off its accent, and completed this variety by altering some letters with the license of poetry. Thus his measures, instead of being fetters to his sense, were always in readiness to run along with the warmth of his rapture, and even to give a further representation of his notions in the correspondence of their sounds to what they signified." Out of all these he has derived that harmony which makes us confess he had not only the richest head, but the finest ear in the world. This is so great a truth that whoever will but consult the tune of his verses, even without understanding them, with the same sort of diligence as we daily see practiced in the case of Italian operas, will find more sweetness, variety, and majesty of sound than in any other language of poetry. The beauty of his numbers is allowed by the critics to be copied, but faintly by Virgil himself, though they are so just as to ascribe it to the nature of the Latin tongue. Indeed, the Greek has some advantages both from the natural sound of its words and the turn and cadence of its verse, which agree with the genius of no other language. Virgil was very sensible of this, and used the utmost diligence in working up a more intractable language to whatsoever graces it was capable of, and, in particular, never failed to bring the sound of his line to a beautiful agreement with its sense. If the Grecian poet has not been so frequently celebrated on this account as the Roman, the only reason is that fewer critics have understood one language than the other. Dionysius of Halicarnassus has pointed out many of our author's beauties in this kind in his treatise of the composition of words. It suffices at present to observe of his numbers that they flow with so much ease as to make one imagine Homer had no other care than to transcribe as fast as the muses dictated, and at the same time with so much force and inspiriting vigor that they awaken and raise us like the sound of a trumpet. They roll along as a plentiful river, always in motion and always full, while we are borne away by a tide of verse, the most rapid and yet the most smooth imaginable. Thus, on whatever side we contemplate Homer, what principally strikes us is his invention. It is that which forms the character of each part of his work, and accordingly we find it to have made his fable more extensive and copious than any other, his manners more lively and strongly marked, 
his speeches more affecting and transported, his sentiments more warm and sublime, his images and descriptions more full and animated, his expression more raised and daring, and his numbers more rapid and various. I hope in what has been said of Virgil with regard to any of these heads I have no way derogated from his character. Nothing is more absurd or endless than the common method of comparing eminent writers by an opposition of particular passages in them, and forming a judgment from thence of their merit upon the whole. We ought to have a certain knowledge of the principal character and distinguishing excellence of each. It is in that we are to consider him, and in proportion to his degree in that we are to admire him. No author or man ever excelled all the world in more than one faculty, and as Homer has done this in invention, Virgil has in judgment. Not that we are to think that Homer wanted judgment, because Virgil had it in a more eminent degree, or that Virgil wanted invention because Homer possessed a larger share of it. Each of these great authors had more of both than perhaps any man besides, and are only said to have less in comparison with one another. Homer was the greater genius, Virgil the better artist. In one we most admire the man, in the other the work. Homer hurries and transports us with a commanding impetuosity. Virgil leads us with an attractive majesty. Homer scatters with a generous profusion. Virgil bestows with a careful magnificence. Homer, like the Nile, pours out his riches with a boundless overflow. Virgil, like a river in its banks, with a gentle and constant stream. When we behold their battles, methinks the two poets resemble the heroes they celebrate. Homer, boundless and resistless as Achilles, bears all before him and shines more and more as the tumult increases. Virgil, calmly, daring like Aeneas, appears undisturbed in the midst of the action, disposes all about him, and conquers with tranquillity. And when we look upon their machines, Homer seems like his own Jupiter in his terrors, shaking Olympus, scattering his lightnings, and firing the heavens. Virgil, like the same power in his benevolence, counselling with the gods, laying plans for empires, and regularly ordering his whole creation. But after all, it is with great parts, as with great virtues, they naturally border on some imperfection, and it is often hard to distinguish exactly where the virtue ends or the fault begins. As prudence may sometimes sink to suspicion, so may a great judgment decline to coldness, and as magnanimity may run up to profusion or extravagance, so may a great invention to redundancy or wildness. If we look upon Homer in this view, we shall perceive the chief objections against him to proceed from so noble a cause as the excess of this faculty. Among these we may reckon some of his marvellous fictions, upon which so much criticism has been spent, as surpassing all the bounds of probability. Perhaps it may be with great and superior souls as with gigantic bodies, which, exerting themselves with unusual strength, exceed what is commonly thought the due proportion of parts, to become miracles in the whole, and like the old heroes of that make, commit something near extravagance amidst a series of glorious and inimitable performances. Thus Homer has his speaking horses, and Virgil his myrtles distilling blood, where the latter has not so much as contrived the easy intervention of a deity to save the probability. It is owing to the same vast invention that his similes have been thought too exuberant and full of circumstances. The force of this faculty is seen in nothing more than in its inability to confine itself to that single circumstance upon which the comparison is grounded. It runs out into embellishments of additional images which, however, are so managed as not to overpower the main one. His similes are like pictures, where the principal figure has not only its proportion given agreeable to the original, but is also set off with occasional ornaments and prospects. The same will account for his manner of heaping a number of comparisons together in one breath, when his fancy suggested to him at once so many various and correspondent images. The reader will easily extend this observation to more objections of the same kind. If there are others which seem rather to charge him with a defect or narrowness of genius than an excess of it, those seeming defects will be found upon examination to proceed wholly from the nature of the times he lived in. Such are his grosser representations of the gods and the vicious and imperfect manners of his heroes. But I must here speak a word of the latter, as it is a point generally carried into extremes both by the censurers and defenders of Homer. It must be a strange partiality to antiquity to think with Madame Dacier, that those times and manners are so much the more excellent as they are more contrary to ours. 
Who can be so prejudiced in their favour as to magnify the felicity of those ages when a spirit of revenge and cruelty joined with the practice of rapine and robbery reigned through the world, when no mercy was shown but for the sake of lucre, where the greatest princes were put to the sword, and their wives and daughters made slaves and concubines? On the other side, I would not be so delicate as those modern critics who are shocked at the servile offices and mean employments in which we sometimes see the heroes of Homer engaged. There is a pleasure in taking a view of that simplicity in opposition to the luxury of succeeding ages, in beholding monarchs without their gods, princes tending their flocks, and princesses drawing water from the springs. When we read Homer, we ought to reflect that we are reading the most ancient author in the heathen world, and those who consider him in this light will double their pleasure in the perusal of him. Let them think they are growing acquainted with nations and peoples that are now no more, that they are stepping almost three thousand years back into the remotest antiquity, and entertaining themselves with a clear and surprising vision of things nowhere else to be found, the only true mirror of that ancient world. By this means alone their greatest obstacles will vanish, and what usually creates their dislike will become a satisfaction. This consideration may further serve to answer for the constant use of the same epithets to his gods and heroes, such as the far-darting Phoebus, the blue-eyed Pallas, the swift-footed Achilles, etc., which some have censured as impertinent and tediously repeated. Those of the gods depended upon the powers and offices then believed to belong to them, and had contracted a weight and veneration from the rites and solemn devotions in which they were used. They were a sort of attributes with which it was a matter of religion to salute them on all occasions, and which it was an irreverence to omit. As for the epithets of great men, Monsieur Beaulieu is of opinion that they were in the nature of surnames and repeated as such, for the Greeks, having no names derived from their fathers, were obliged to add some other distinction of each person, either naming his parents expressly or his place of birth, profession, or the like, as Alexander the son of Philip, Herodotus of Halicarnassus, Diogenes the Cynic, and so forth. Homer, therefore, complying with the custom of his country, used such distinctive additions as better agreed with poetry. And, indeed, we have something parallel to these in modern times, such as the names of Harold Herfoot, Edmund Ironside, Edward Longshanks, Edward the Black Prince, and so forth. If yet this be thought to account better for the propriety than for the repetition, I shall add a further conjecture. Hesiod, dividing the world into its different ages, has placed a fourth age between the brazen and the iron one, of heroes distinct from other men, a divine race who fought at Thebes and Troy, are called demigods, and live by the care of Jupiter in the islands of the blessed. Now among the divine honours which were paid them, they might have this also in common with the gods, not to be mentioned without the solemnity of an epithet, and such as might be acceptable to them by celebrating their families, actions, or qualities." What other cavils have been raised against Homer, or such as hardly deserve a reply, but will yet be taken notice of as they occur in the course of the work? Many have been occasioned by an injudicious endeavour to exalt Virgil, which is much the same as if one should think to raise the superstructure by undermining the foundation. One would imagine, by the whole course of their parallels, that these critics never so much as heard of Homer's having written first, a consideration which whoever compares these two poets ought to have always in his eye." Some accuse him for the same things which they overlook or praise in the other, as when they prefer the fable and moral of the Aeneas to those of the Iliad, for the same reason which they might set the Odyssey above the Aeneas, as that the hero is a wiser man, and the action of the one more beneficial to his country than that of the other, or else they blame him for not doing what he never designed, as because Achilles is not as good and perfect a prince as Aeneas, when the very moral of his poem required a contrary character." It is thus that Rapin judges in his comparison of Homer and Virgil. Others select those particular passages of Homer which are not so laboured as some that Virgil drew out of them. This is the whole management of Scaliger in his poetics. Others quarrel with what they take for low and mean expressions, sometimes through a false delicacy and refinement, oftener from an ignorance of the graces of the original, and then triumph in the awkwardness of their own translations." This is the conduct of Perol in his parallels. Lastly, there are others who, pretending to a fairer proceeding, distinguish between the personal merit of Homer and that of his work. But when they come to assign the causes of the great reputation of the Iliad, they found it upon the ignorance of his times, 
and the prejudice of those that followed, and in pursuance of this principle they make those accidents, such as the contention of the cities, etc., to be the causes of his fame, which were in reality the consequences of his merit. The same might as well be said of Virgil, or any great author whose general character will infallibly raise many casual additions to their reputation. This is the method of Monsieur de Lamont, who yet confesses upon the whole that, in whatever age Homer had lived, he must have been the greatest poet of his nation, and that he may be said in his sense to be the master even of those who surpassed him. In all these objections we see nothing that contradicts his title to the honour of the chief invention, and as long as this, which is indeed the characteristic of poetry itself, remains unequalled by his followers, he still continues superior to them. A cooler judgment may commit fewer faults, and be more approved in the eyes of one sort of critics, but that warmth of fancy will carry the loudest and most universal applauses which holds the heart of a reader under the strongest enchantment. Homer not only appears the inventor of poetry, but excels all the inventors of other arts in this, that he has swallowed up the honour of those who succeeded him. What he has done admitted no increase, it only left room for contraction or regulation. He showed all the stretch of fancy at once, and if he has failed in some of his flights, it was but because he attempted everything. A work of this kind seems like a mighty tree, which rises from the most vigorous seed, is improved with industry, flourishes, and produces the finest fruit. Nature and art conspire to raise it, pleasure and profit join to make it valuable, and they who find the justest faults have only said that a few branches which run luxuriant through a richness of nature might be lopped into form to give it a more regular appearance. Having now spoken of the beauties and defects of the original, it remains to treat of the translation with the same view to the chief characteristic. As far as that it's seen in the main parts of the poem, such as the fable, manners, and sentiments, no translator can prejudice it but by willful omissions or contractions. As it also breaks out in every particular image, description, and simile, whoever lessens or too much softens those takes off from this chief character. It is the first grand duty of an interpreter to give his author entire and unmaimed, and for the rest the diction and versification only are his proper province, since these must be his own, but the others he is to take as he finds them. It should then be considered what methods may afford some equivalent in our language for the graces of these in the Greek. It is certain that no literal translation can be just to an excellent original in a superior language, but it is a great mistake to imagine, as many have done, that a rash paraphrase can make amends for this general defect, which is no less in danger to lose the spirit of an ancient by deviating into the modern manners of expression. If there be sometimes a darkness, there is often a light in antiquity which nothing better preserves than a version almost literal. I know no liberties one ought to take, but those which are necessary to transfusing the spirit of the original and supporting the poetical style of the translation— and, I will venture to say, there have not been more men misled in former times by a servile, dull adherence to the letter than have been deluded in ours by a chimerical, insolent hope of raising and improving their author. It is not to be doubted that the fire of the poem is what a translator should principally regard, as it is most likely to expire in his managing. However, it is his safest way to be content with preserving this to his utmost in the whole, without endeavouring to be more than he finds his author is in any particular place. It is a great secret in writing to know when to be plain, and when poetical and figurative, and it is what Homer will teach us if we will but follow modestly in his footsteps. Where his diction is bold and lofty, let us raise ours as high as we can." But where his is plain and humble, we ought not to be deterred from imitating him by the fear of incurring the censure of a mere English critic. Nothing that belongs to Homer seems to have been more commonly mistaken than the just pitch of his style. Some of his translators, having swelled into Faustian in a proud confidence of the sublime, others sunk into flatness in a cold and timorous notion of simplicity. Methinks I see these different followers of Homer, some sweating and straining after him by violent leaps and bounds, the certain signs of false metal, others slowly and servilely creeping in his train, while the poet himself is all the time proceeding with an unaffected and equal majesty before them. However, of the two extremes, one could sooner pardon frenzy than frigidity. No author is to be envied for such commendations as he may gain by that character of style which his friends must agree together to call simplicity, and the rest of the world will call dullness. 
There is a graceful and dignified simplicity, as well as a bold and sordid one, which differ as much from each other as the air of a plain man from that of a sloven. It is one thing to be tricked up, and another not to be dressed at all. Simplicity is the mean between ostentation and rusticity. This pure and noble simplicity is nowhere in such perfection as in the Scripture and our author. One may affirm, with all respect to the inspired writings, that the Divine Spirit made use of no other words but what were intelligible and common to men at that time, and in that part of the world. And, as Homer is the author nearest to those, his style must, of course, bear a greater resemblance to the sacred books than that of any other writer. This consideration, together with what has been observed of the parity of some of his thoughts, may, methinks, induce a translator, on the one hand, to give in to several of those general phrases and manners of expression which have attained a veneration even in our language from being used in the Old Testament, as, on the other, to avoid those which have been appropriated to the divinity and in a manner consigned to mystery and religion. For a further preservation of this air of simplicity— a particular care should be taken to express with all plainness those moral sentences and proverbial speeches which are so numerous in this poet. They have something venerable, and, as I may say, oracular, in that unadorned gravity and shortness with which they are delivered, a grace which would be utterly lost by endeavouring to give them what we call a more ingenious, that is, a more modern turn in the paraphrase. Perhaps the mixture of some Grecisms and old words after the banner of Milton, if done without too much affectation, might not have an ill effect in a version of this particular work, which most of any other seems to require a venerable antique cast. But certainly the use of modern terms of war and government, such as platoon, campaign, junto, or the like, into which some of his translators have fallen, cannot be allowable, those only accepted without which it is impossible to treat the subjects in any living language." There are two peculiarities in Homer's diction which are a sort of marks or moles by which every common eye distinguishes him at first sight. Those who are not his greatest admirers look upon them as defects, and those who are seemed pleased with them as beauties. I speak of his compound epithets and of his repetitions. Many of the former cannot be done literally into English without destroying the purity of our language. I believe such should be retained as slide easily of themselves into an English compound, without violence to the ear, or to the received rules of composition, as well as those which have received a sanction from the authority of our best poets, and are become familiar through their use of them, such as the cloud-compelling Jove, etc. As for the rest, whenever any can be as fully and significantly expressed in a single word as in a compounded one, the course to be taken is obvious." Some that cannot be so turned as to preserve their full image by one or two words may have justice done them by circumlocution, as the epithet inocyphalos to a mountain would appear little or ridiculous translated literally leaf-shaking, but affords a majestic idea in the paraphrasis, the lofty mountain shakes his waving woods. Others that admit of different significations may receive an advantage from a judicious variation according to the occasions on which they are introduced. For example, the epithet of Apollo Hecabalos, or for shooting, is capable of two explications, one literal, in respect of the darts and bow, the ensigns of that god, the other allegorical with regard to the rays of the sun. Therefore, in such places where Apollo is represented as a god in person, I would use the former interpretation, and where the effects of the sun are described, I would make choice of the latter." Upon the whole, it will be necessary to avoid that perpetual repetition of the same epithets which we find in Homer, and which, though it might be accommodated, as has been already shown, to the ear of those times, is by no means so to ours. But one may wait for opportunities of placing them where they derive an additional beauty from the occasions on which they are employed, and in doing this properly a translator may at once show his fancy and his judgment. As for Homer's repetitions, we may divide them into three sorts— of whole narrations and speeches, of single sentences, and of one verse or hemistitch. I hope it is not impossible to have such a regard to these, as neither to lose so known a mark of the author on the one hand, nor to offend the reader too much on the other. The repetition is not ungraceful in those speeches, where the dignity of the speaker renders it a sort of insolence to alter his words, as in the messages from gods to men, or from higher powers to inferiors in concerns of state, 
or where the ceremonial of religion seems to require it, in the solemn forms of prayers, oaths, or the like. In other cases, I believe the best rule is to be guided by the nearness or distance at which the repetitions are placed in the original. When they follow too close, one may vary the expression, but it is a question whether a professed translator be authorized to admit any. If they be tedious, the author is to answer for it. It only remains to speak of the versification. Homer, as has been said, is perpetually applying the sound to the sense, and varying it on every new subject. This is indeed one of the most exquisite beauties of poetry, and attainable by very few. I only know of Homer eminent for it in the Greek, and Virgil in the Latin. I am sensible it is what may sometimes happen by chance when a writer is warm and fully possessed of his image. However, it may reasonably be believed they designed this, in whose verse it so manifestly appears in a superior degree to all others. Few readers have the ear to be judges of it, but those who have will see I have endeavoured at this beauty. Upon the whole, I must confess myself utterly incapable of doing justice to Homer. I attempt him in no other hope but that which one may entertain, without much vanity, of giving a more tolerable copy of him than any entire translation in verse has yet done. We have only those of Chapman, Hobbes, and Ogilby. Chapman has taken the advantage of an immeasurable length of verse, notwithstanding which there is scarce any paraphrase more loose and rambling than his. He has frequent interpolations of four or six lines, and I remember one in the thirteenth book of the Odyssey, verse 312, where he has spun twenty verses out of two. He is often mistaken in so bold a manner that one might think he deviated on purpose, if he did not in other places of his notes insist so much upon verbal trifles. He appears to have had a strong affectation of extracting new meanings out of his author, insomuch as to promise, in his rhyming preface, a poem of the mysteries he had revealed in Homer, and perhaps he endeavoured to strain the obvious sense to this end. His expression is involved in Fustian, a fault for which he was remarkable in his original writings, as in the tragedy of Bussy d'Ambois, etc. In a word, the nature of the man may account for his whole performance, for he appears, from his preface and remarks, to have been of an arrogant turn, and an enthusiast in poetry. His own boast of having finished half the Iliad in less than fifteen weeks shows with what negligence his version was performed but that which is to be allowed him, and which very much contributed to cover his defects, is a daring fiery spirit that animates his translation, which is something like what one might imagine Homer himself would have writ before he arrived at years of discretion. Hobbes has given us a correct explanation of the sense in general, but for particulars and circumstances he continually lops them, and often omits the most beautiful— as for its being esteemed a close translation, I doubt not many have been led into that error by the shortness of it, which proceeds not from his following the original line by line, but from the contractions above mentioned. He sometimes omits whole similes and sentences, and is now and then guilty of mistakes into which no writer of his learning could have fallen, but through carelessness. His poetry, as well as Ogilby's, is too mean for criticism." It is a great loss to the poetical world that Mr. Dryden did not live to translate the Iliad. He has left us only the first book, and a small part of the sixth, in which, if he has in some places not truly interpreted the sense or preserved the antiquities, it ought to be excused on account of the haste he was obliged to write in. He seems to have had too much regard to Chapman, whose words he sometimes copies, and has unhappily followed him in passages where he wanders from the original. However, had he translated the whole work, I would no more have attempted Homer after him than Virgil, his version of whom, notwithstanding some human errors, is the most noble and spirited translation I know in any language. But the fate of great geniuses is like that of great ministers. Though they are confessedly the first in the commonwealth of letters, they must be envied and calumniated only for being at the head of it. That which, in my opinion, ought to be the endeavour of any one who translates Homer is above all things to keep alive that spirit and fire which makes his chief character, in particular places where the sense can bear any doubt, to follow the strongest and most poetical, as most agreeing with that character, to copy him in all the variations of his style and the different modulations of his numbers, to preserve in the more active or descriptive parts a warmth and elevation, in the more sedate or narrative a plainness and solemnity, 
In the speeches, a fullness and perspicuity. In the sentences, a shortness and gravity, not to neglect even the little figures and turns on the words, nor sometimes the very cast of the periods. Neither to omit nor confound any rites or customs of antiquity. Perhaps, too, he ought to include the whole in a shorter compass than has hitherto been done by any translator who has tolerably preserved either the sense or poetry. What I would further recommend to him is to study his author rather from his own text than from any commentaries, how learned soever, or whatever figure they may make in the estimation of the world, to consider him attentively in comparison with Virgil above all the ancients, and with Milton above all the moderns. Next these, the Archbishop of Cambrai's Telemachus, may give him the truest idea of the spirit and turn of our author, and Bossu's admirable treatise de the epic poem, the justest notion of his design and conduct. But after all, with whatever judgment and study a man may proceed, or with whatever happiness he may perform such a work, he must hope to please but a few, those only who have at once a taste of poetry and competent learning. For to satisfy such a want either is not in the nature of this undertaking, since a mere modern wit can like nothing that is not modern and a pedant, nothing that is not Greek. What I have done is submitted to the public, from whose opinions I am prepared to learn, though I fear no judges so little as our best poets, who are most sensible of the weight of this task. As for the worst, whatever they shall please to say, they may give me some concern as they are unhappy men, but none as they are malignant writers. I was guided in this translation by judgments very different from theirs, and by persons for whom they can have no kindness, if an old observation be true, that the strongest antipathy in the world is that of fools to men of wit." Mr. Addison was the first whose advice determined me to undertake this task, who was pleased to write to me upon that occasion in such terms as I cannot repeat without vanity. I was obliged to Sir Richard Steele for a very early recommendation of my undertaking to the public. Dr. Swift promoted my interest with that warmth with which he always serves his friend. The humanity and frankness of Sir Samuel Garth are what I never knew wanting on any occasion." I must also acknowledge with infinite pleasure the many friendly offices as well as sincere criticisms of Mr. Congreve, who had led me the way in translating some parts of Homer. I must add the names of Mr. Rowe and Dr. Parnell, though I shall take a further opportunity of doing justice to the last, whose good nature, to give it a great panegyric, is no less extensive than his learning. The favour of these gentlemen is not entirely undeserved by one who bears them so true an affection. But what can I say of the honour so many of the great have done me, while the first names of the age appear as my subscribers, and the most distinguished patrons and ornaments of learning as my chief encouragers? Among these it is a particular pleasure to me to find that my highest obligations are to such who have done most honour to the name of poet. That his grace the Duke of Buckingham was not displeased I should undertake the author to whom he has given in his excellent essay so complete a praise." Read Homer once, and you can read no more, for all books else appear so mean, so poor, verse will seem prose, but still persist to read, and Homer will be all the books you need. That the Earl of Halifax was one of the first to favour me, of whom it is hard to say whether the advancement of the polite arts is more owing to his generosity or his example. That such a genius as my Lord Bolingbroke, not more distinguished in the great scenes of business than in all the useful and entertaining parts of learning, has not refused to be the critic of these sheets, and the patron of their writer, and that the noble author of the tragedy of heroic love has continued his partiality to me from my writing pastorals to my attempting the Iliad. I cannot deny myself the pride of confessing that I have had the advantage not only of their advice for the conduct in general, but their correction of several particulars of this translation. I could say a great deal of the pleasure of being distinguished by the Earl of Carnarvon, but it is almost absurd to particularize any one generous action in a person whose life is a continued series of them. Mr. Stanhope, the present Secretary of State, will pardon my desire of having it known that he was pleased to promote this affair. The particular zeal of Mr. Harcourt, the son of the late Lord Chancellor, gave me a proof how much I am honoured in a share of his friendship. I must attribute to the same motive that of several others of my friends, to whom all acknowledgments are rendered unnecessary by the privileges of a familiar correspondence, and I am satisfied I can no way better oblige men of their turn than by my silence. In short, 
I have found more patrons than ever Homer wanted. He would have thought himself happy to have met the same favor at Athens that has been shown me by its learned rival, the University of Oxford, and I can hardly envy him those pompous honors he received after death when I reflect on the enjoyment of so many agreeable obligations and easy friendships which make the satisfaction of life. This distinction is the more to be acknowledged as it is shown to one whose pen has never gratified the prejudices of particular parties or the vanities of particular men. Whatever the success may prove, I shall never repent of an undertaking in which I have experienced the candor and friendship of so many persons of merit, and in which I hope to pass some of those years of youth that are generally lost in a circle of follies after a manner neither wholly useful to others nor disagreeable to myself." The end of Alexander Pope's preface to his translation of the Iliad by Homer. Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer. Translation by Alexander Pope. Book One. Argument. The Contention of Achilles and Agamemnon. In the war of Troy, the Greeks, having sacked some of the neighboring towns, and taken from thence two beautiful captives, Chryseis and Briseis, allotted the first to Agamemnon, and the last to Achilles. Chryses, the father of Chryseis, and priest of Apollo, comes to the Grecian camp to ransom her, with which the action of the poem opens in the tenth year of the siege. The priest, being refused and insolently dismissed by Agamemnon, entreats for vengeance from his god who inflicts a pestilence on the Greeks. Achilles calls a council and encourages Calchas to declare the cause of it, who attributes it to the refusal of Chryseis. The king, being obliged to send back his captive, enters into a furious contest with Achilles, which Nestor pacifies. However, as he had the absolute command of the army, he seizes on Briseis in revenge. Achilles, in discontent, withdraws himself and his forces from the rest of the Greeks, and, complaining to Thetis, she supplicates Jupiter to render them sensible of the wrong done to her son by giving victory to the Trojans. Jupiter, granting her suit, incenses Juno, between whom the debate runs high, till they are reconciled by the address of Vulcan. The time of two and twenty days is taken up in this book, nine during the plague— one in the council and quarrel of the princes, and twelve for the Jupiter's stay with the Ethiopians, at whose return Thetis prefers her partition. The scene lies in the Grecian camp, then changes to Crisa, and lastly to Olympus. Achilles' wrath to Greece, the direful spring of woes unnumbered, heavenly goddess sing, that wrath which hurled to Pluto's gloomy reign. The souls of mighty chiefs untimely slain, whose limbs unburied on the naked shore, devouring dogs and hungry vultures tore. Since great Achilles and Atrodi strove, such was the sovereign doom, and such the will of Jove. Declare, O muse, in what ill-fated hour sprung the fierce strife, from what offended power Latona's son a dire contagion spread, and heaped the camp with mountains of the dead. The king of men his reverent priest defied, and for the king's offence the people died. For Chryses sought with costly gifts to gain his captive daughter from the victor's chain. Suppliant, the venerable father stands, Apollo's awful ensigns grace his hands. By these he begs, and lowly, bending down, extends the scepter and the laurel crown he sued to all, but chief implored for grace, the brother kings of Atreus' royal race. Ye kings and warriors, may your vows be crowned, and Troy's proud walls lie level with the ground. May Jove restore you when your toils are o'er, safe to the pleasures of your native shore. But, oh, relieve a wretched parent's pain, and give Chryseis to these arms again. If mercies fail, yet let my presence move, and dread avenging Phoebus, son of Jove. The Greeks in shouts their joint assent declare, the priest to reverence and release the fair. Not so, Atrides, he, with kingly pride, repulsed the sacred sire, and thus replied, Hence on thy life, and fly these hostile plains, nor ask presumptuous what the king detains, hence with thy laurel crown and golden rod, nor trust too far those ensigns of thy god. Mine is thy daughter, priest, and shall remain, and prayers and tears 
and bribes shall plead in vain, till time shall rifle every youthful grace, and age dismiss her from my cold embrace, in daily labours of the loom employed, or doomed to deck the bed she once enjoyed. Hence, then, to Argos shall the maid retire, far from her native soil and weeping sire. The trembling priest along the shore returned, and in the anguish of a father mourned, disconsolate, not daring to complain, silent, he wandered by the sounding main, till, safe at distance to his God, he prays, the God who darts around the world his rays. O Sminthius, sprung from fair Latona's line, thou guardian power of Sela the divine, thou source of light, whom Tenedos adores, and whose bright presence gilds thy crisis shores, if e'er with wreaths I hung thy sacred fane, or fed the flames with fat of oxen slain, God of the silver bow, thy shafts employ, avenge thy serpent, and the Greeks destroy. Thus Chrysus prayed, the favouring power attends, and from Olympus lofty tops descends. Bent was his bow, the Grecian heart to wound, fierce as he moved his silver shafts resound, breathing revenge, a sudden night he spread, and gloomy darkness rolled about his head. The fleet in view he twanged his deadly bow, and hissing fly the feathered fates below. On mules and dogs the infection first began, and last the vengeful arrows fixed in man. For nine long nights through all the dusky air the pyre's thick flaming shot a dismal glare, but ere the tenth revolving day was run, inspired by Juno Thetis' godlike son, convened to counsel all the Grecian train, for much the goddess mourned her heroes slain. The assembly seated, rising o'er the east, Achilles thus the king of men addressed. Why leave we not the fatal Trojan shore, and measure back the seas we crossed before? The plague, destroying whom the sword would spare, tis time to save the few remains of war. But let some prophet, or some sacred sage, explore the cause of great Apollo's rage, or learn the wasteful vengeance to remove by mystic dreams, for dreams descend from Jove. If broken vows this heavy curse have laid, let altars smoke, and hecatombs be paid." So heaven atoned, shall dying Greece restore, and Phoebus dart his burning shafts no more. He said, and sat, when Chalcus thus replied, Chalcus the wise, the Grecian priest and guide, that sacred seer whose comprehensive view the past, the present, and the future knew. Uprising slow, the venerable sage thus spoke the prudence and the fears of age. Beloved of Jove, Achilles, wouldst thou know why angry Phoebus bends his fatal bow? First give thy faith and plight a prince's word, of sure protection by thy power and sword. For I must speak what wisdom would conceal, and truths invidious to the great reveal. Bold is the task, when subjects grown too wise instruct a monarch where his error lies. For though we deem the short-lived fury past, tis sure the mighty will revenge at last." To whom, Pelides, from thy inmost soul, speak what thou knowest, and speak without control. E'en by that God, I swear, who rules the day, to whom thy hands the vows of Greece convey, and whose blessed articles thy lips declare, long as Achilles breathes this vital air. No daring Greek of all the numerous band against his priest shall lift an impious hand. Not e'en the chief by whom our hosts are led, the king of kings, shall touch that sacred head." Encouraged thus, the blameless man replies, Nor vows unpaid, nor slighted sacrifice, But he, our chief, provoked the raging pest, Apollo's vengeance fought his injured priest. Nor will the gods' awakened fury cease, But plagues shall spread, and funeral pyres increase. To the great king, without a ransom paid, To her own Carissa, send the black-eyed maid. Perhaps with added sacrifice and prayer, The priest may pardon and the god may spare. The prophet spoke when with a gloomy frown the monarch started from his shining throne, black collar filled his breast that boiled with ire, and from his eyeballs flashed the living fire, augured, accursed, denouncing mischief still, prophet of plagues for ever boding ill, still must that tongue some wounding message bring, and still thy priestly pride provoke thy king? For this are Phoebus's oracles explored, to teach the Greeks to murmur at their lord, for well, this with falsehood is my honour stained, is heaven offended and a priest profaned, because my prize, my beauteous maid I hold, and heavenly charms prefer to proffered gold. A maid, 
unmatched in manners as in face, skilled in each art and crowned with every grace. Not half so dear were Clytemnestra's charms when first her blooming beauties blessed my arms. Yet if the gods demand her let her sail, our cares are only for the public weal. Let me be deemed the hateful cause of all, and suffer rather than my people fall. The prize, the beauteous prize, I will resign, so dearly valued and so justly mine. But since for common good I yield the fair, my private loss let grateful Greece repair. Nor unrewarded let your prince complain that he alone has fought and bled in vain. Insatiate king, Achilles thus replies, fond of the power but fonder of the prize, wouldst thou the Greeks their lawful prey should yield the due reward of many a well-fought field? The spoils of cities raised and warriors slain, we share with justice as with toil we gain, but to resume what e'er thy avarice craves, that trick of tyrants may be borne by slaves. Yet if our chief or plunder only fight, the spoils of Ilion shall thy loss requite, when e'er by Jove's decree our conquering powers shall humble to the dust her lofty towers. Then thus the king, Shall I my prize resign with tame content, and thou possessed of thine? Great as thou art, and like a god in fight, think not to rob me of a soldier's right. At thy demand shall I restore the maid. First let the just equivalent be paid, such as a king might ask, and let it be a treasure worthy her and worthy me, or grant me this, or with a monarch's claim this hand shall seize some other captive dame. The mighty Ajax shall his prize resign, Ulysses, spoils, or even thy own be mine. The man who suffers loudly may complain, and rage he may, but he shall rage in vain. But this, when time requires, it now remains. We launch a bark to plough the watery plains, and waft the sacrifice to Christ's shores with chosen pilots and with labouring oars. Soon shall the fair the sable ship ascend, and some deputed prince the charge attend. This Cretus king, or Ajax shall fulfil, or wise Ulysses see performed our will, or if our royal pleasure shall ordain Achilles' self-conduct her o'er the main, let fierce Achilles, dreadful in his rage, the god propitiate, and the pest assuage. At this Pelides, frowning stern, replied, O tyrant, armed with insolence and pride, inglorious slave to interest, ever joined with fraud unworthy of a royal mind, was generous Greek, Obedient to thy word, shall form an ambush, or shall lift the sword. What cause have I to war at thy decree? The distant Trojans never injured me. To Thea's realms no hostile troops they led. Safe and her veils my warlike coursers fed. Far hence remove the hoarse resounding main, and walls of rock secure my native reign, whose fruitful soil luxuriant harvests grace, rich in her fruits and in her martial race. Hither we sailed a voluntary throng to avenge a private, not a public wrong. What else to Troy the assembled nations draws but thine, ungrateful, and thy brother's cause? Is this the pay our blood and toils deserve, disgraced and injured by the man we serve? And darest thou threat to snatch my prize away due to the deeds of many a dreadful day? A prize as small, O tyrant, matched with thine, as thy own actions if compared to mine, thine, in each conquest is the wealthy prey, though mine the sweat and danger of the day. Some trivial present to my ships I bear, or barren praises pay the wounds of war, but no proud monarch I am thy slave no more. My fleet shall waft me to Thessalia's shore, left by Achilles on the Trojan plain. What spoils, what conquests shall Atrides gain? To this the king, fly, mighty warrior, fly, thy aid we need not, and thy threats defy. There want not chiefs in such a cause to fight, and Jove himself shall guard a monarch's right. Of all the kings, the gods' distinguished care, to power superior none such hatred bear. Strife and debate thy restless soul employ, and wars and horrors are thy savage joy. If thou hast strength, t'was heaven that strength bestowed. For no vain man, thy valour is from God. Haste, launch thy vessels, Fly with speed away, rule thy own realms with arbitrary sway. I heed thee not, but prize at equal rate thy short-lived friendship and thy groundless hate. Go, threat thy earth-born myrmidons, but here tis mine to threaten, prince, and thine to fear. 
knoweth the god, the beauteous dame demand, my bark shall waft her to her native land. But then prepare, imperious prince, prepare, fierce as thou art, to yield thy captive fair. Even in thy tent I'll seize the blooming prize, thy loved Bresius with the radiant eyes. Hence shalt thou prove my might, and curse the hour thou stoodst a rival of imperial power. And hence to all our hosts it shall be known that kings are subject to the gods alone. Achilles heard, with grief and rage oppressed, his heart swelled high and laboured in his breast. Distracting thoughts by turns his bosom ruled, now fired by wrath, and now by reason cooled. That prompts his hand to draw the deadly sword, force through the Greeks, and pierce their haughty lord. This whispers soft his vengeance to control, and calm the rising tempest of his soul. Just as in anguish of suspense he stayed, while half unsheathed appeared the glittering blade. Minerva swift descended from above, sent by the sister and the wife of Jove, for both the princes claimed her equal care. Behind she stood, and by the golden hair Achilles seized, to him alone confessed. A sable cloud concealed her from the rest. He sees, and sudden to the goddess cries, known by the flames that sparkle from her eyes. Descends Minerva, in her guardian care, a heavenly witness of the wrongs I bear, from Atreus's son, then let those eyes that view the daring crime behold the vengeance too. Forbear, the progeny of Jove replies, to calm thy fury I forsake the skies. Let great Achilles to the gods resigned, to reason yield the empire o'er his mind. By awful Juno this command is given, the king and you are both the care of heaven. The force of keen reproaches let him feel, but sheathe obedient thy revenging steel, for I pronounce and trust a heavenly power, thy injured honour has its fated hour. When the proud monarch shall thy arms implores, and bribe thy friendship with a boundless store, then let revenge no longer bear the sway. Command thy passions, and the gods obey. To her, Pelides, with regardful ear, tis just, O goddess, I, thy dictates here. Hard as it is my vengeance I suppress. Those who revere the gods, the gods will bless." He said observant of the blue-eyed maid, then in the sheath returned the shining blade. The goddess swift to high Olympus flies, and joins the sacred senate of the skies. Nor yet the rage his boiling breast forsook, which thus redoubling on Atreides broke. O oh, monster, mixed of insolence and fear, thou dog in forehead but in heart a dear, when wert thou known in ambushed fights to dare, or nobly face the horrid front of war? "'Tis ours the chance of fighting fields to try, "'thine to look on and bid the valiant die. "'So much tis safer through the camp to go "'and rob a subject than to spoil a foe. "'Scourge of thy people violent and base "'sent in Jove's anger on a slavish race, "'who, lost a sense of generous freedom past, "'or tamed to wrongs, or this had been thy last. "'Now by this sacred scepter hear me swear, "'which never more shall leaves or blossoms bear, "'which severed from the trunk, as I from thee, on the bare mountains, left its parent tree, this sceptre formed by tempered steel to prove an ensign of the delegates of Jove, from whom the power of laws and justice springs, tremendous oath, inviolate to kings. By this I swear, when bleeding Greece again shall call Achilles, she shall call in vain, when flushed with slaughter Hector comes to spread the purpled shore with mountains of the dead. Then shall thou mourn, the affront thy madness gave, forced to deplore when impotent to save, then rage in bitterness of soul to know this act has made the bravest Greek thy foe. He spoke, and furious hurled against the ground his scepter, starred with golden studs around, then sternly silent sat. With like disdain the raging king returned his frowns again. To calm their passion with the words of age, slow from his seat rose the pillion sage, Experienced Nestor in persuasion skilled, words, sweet as honey, from his lips distilled. Two generations now had passed away, wise by his rules and happy by his sway. Two ages o'er his native realm he reigned, and now the example of the third remained, all viewed with awe the venerable man who thus with mild benevolence began. What shame! What woe is this to Greece! What joy to Troy's proud monarch and the friends of Troy, that adverse gods commit to stern debate the best, the bravest of the Grecian state. 
Young as ye are, this youthful heat restrain, nor think your Nestor's years and wisdom vain. A godlike race of heroes once I knew, such as no more these aged eyes shall view. Lives there a chief to match Perithus' fame, Dreus the bold, or Senius' deathless name, Theseus endued with more than mortal might, or Polyphemus like the gods in fight? With these of old the toils of battle bred in early youth my hardy days I led, fired with the thirst which virtuous enemy breeds, and smit with love of honourable deeds. Strongest of men, they pierced the mountain boar, ranged the wild deserts red with monsters' gore, and from their hills the shaggy centaurs tore, yet these with soft persuasive arts I swayed. When Nestor spoke, they listened and obeyed, if in my youth even these esteemed me wise, do you, young warriors, hear my age advise? Atrides, seize not on the beauteous slave that prize the Greeks by common suffrage gave, nor thou, Achilles, treat our prince with pride. Let kings be just and sovereign power preside. Thee, the first honours of the war adorn like gods in strength and of a goddess born. Him, awful majesty, exalts above the powers of earth and sceptred sons of Jove. Let both unite with well-consenting mind, so shall authority with strength be joined. Leave me, O king, to calm Achilles' rage. Rule thou thyself as more advanced and aged. Forbid it, gods, Achilles should be lost, the pride of Greece and bulwark of our host. This said, he ceased. The king of men replies, Thy years are awful and thy words are wise. But that imperious, that unconquered soul, no laws can limit, no respect control. Before his pride must his superiors fall, his word the law, and he the lord of all? Him must our host, our chiefs, our self obey? What king can bear a rival in his sway? Grant that the gods his matchless force have given, has foul reproach a privilege from heaven? Here, on the monarch's speech, Achilles broke, and, furious thus, and interrupting, spoke, Tyrant! I well deserve thy galling chain to live thy slave and still to serve in vain. Should I submit to each unjust decree, command thy vessels, but command not me. Seize on Briseis, whom the Grecians doomed my prize of war, yet tamely see resumed, and seize secure, no more Achilles draws his conquering sword in any woman's cause. The gods command me to forgive the past, but let this first invasion be the last, for know thy blood when next thou darest invade, shall stream in vengeance on my reeking blade. At this they ceased. The stern debate expired. The chiefs in solemn majesty retired. Achilles, with Patroclus, took his way, where, near his tents, his hollow vessels lay. Meantime Atrides launched with numerous oars a well-rigged ship for Croesus' sacred shores. High on the deck was fair Croesus placed, and sage Ulysses, with the conduct graced, safe in her sides the hecatomb they stowed, then swiftly sailing cut the liquid road. The host to expiate next the king prepares, with pure lustrations and with solemn prayers, washed by the briny wave the pious train, are cleansed, and cast the ablutions in the main. Along the shore whole hecatombs were laid, and bulls and goats to Phoebus's altars paid, the sable fumes and curling spires arise, and waft their grateful odours to the skies. The army, thus in sacred rites engaged, Atrides still with deep resentment raged. To wait his will, two sacred heralds stood. Talthebius and Eurybates the good. Haste to the fierce Achilles' tent, he cries. Then spare Brasius as our royal prize. Submit he must, or if they will not part ourself in arms, shall tear her from his heart. The unwilling heralds act, they walk along the barren sands. Arrived the hero in his tent they find, with gloomy aspect on his arm reclined. At awful distance long they silent stand, loath to advance and speak their hard command. Decent confusion, this the godlike man perceived, and thus with accent mild began. With leave, and honour, enter our abodes, ye sacred ministers of men and gods. I know your message. By constraint you came, not you, but your imperious lord I blame. Patroclus, haste, the fair Brasius bring. Conduct my captive to the haughty king. But witness, heralds, 
and proclaim my vow, witness to gods above and men below, but first and loudest to your prince declare that lawless tyrant whose commands you bear, unmoved as death Achilles shall remain, though prostrate Greece shall bleed at every vein, the raging chief in frantic passion lost, blind to himself and useless to his host, unskilled to judge the future by the past, in blood and slaughter shall repent at last. Patroclus now the unwilling beauty brought, she in soft sorrows and in pensive thought passed silent as the heralds held her hand, and have looked back, slow moving o'er the strand. Not so his loss the fierce Achilles bore, but sad, retiring to the sounding shore. O'er the wild margin of the deep he hung, that kindred deep from whence his mother sprung, there, bathed in tears of anger and disdain, thus loud lamented to the stormy main. O parent goddess, since in early bloom thy son must fall by too severe a doom, sure to so short a race of glory born, great Jove in justice should this span adorn, honour, and fame at least the thunderer owed, and ill he pays the promise of a god. If yon proud monarch thus thy son defies, obscures my glories and resumes my prize. Far from the deep recesses of the main, where aged ocean holds his watery reign, the goddess mother heard, the waves divide, and like a mist she rose above the tide, beheld him mourning on the naked shores, and thus the sorrows of his soul explores. Why grieves my son? Thy anguish let me share. Reveal the cause and trust a parent's care. He, deeply sighing, said, To tell my woe is but to mention what too well you know, from Thebe, sacred to Apollo's name, Aetion's realm, how a conquering army came, with treasure loaded and triumphant spoils, whose just division crowned the soldiers' toils. But bright Chryseus, heavenly prize, was led by vote selected to the general's bed. The priest of Phoebus sought by gifts to gain his beauteous daughter from the victor's chain. The fleet he reached, and lowly bending down, held forth the scepter and the laurel crown, entreating all, but chief implored for grace, the brother kings of Atreus's royal race. The generous Greeks their joint consent declare, the priest to reverence, and release the fair. Not so Atreides, he with wanted pride, the sire insulted, and his gifts denied. The insulted sire his god's peculiar care to Phoebus prayed, and Phoebus heard the prayer. A dreadful plague ensues, the avenging darts incessant fly, and pierce the Grecian hearts, a prophet then inspired by heaven arose, and points the crime, and thence derives the woes. Myself, the first, the assembled chiefs incline, to avert the vengeance of the power divine. Then rising in his wrath, the monarch stormed, incensed, he threatened, and his threats performed. The fair Chryseus to her sire was sent, with offered gifts to make the god relent. But now he seized Brasius' heavenly charms, and of my valour's prize defrauds my arms, defrauds the votes of all the Grecian train, and service, faith, and justice plead in vain. But, goddess, thou thy suppliant son attend, to high Olympus' shining court ascend, urge all the ties to form a service owed, and sue for vengeance to the thundering god. Oft hast thou triumphed in the glorious boast that thou stoodest forth of all the ethereal host, when bold rebellion shook the realms above, the undaunted guard of cloud-compelling Jove, when the bright partner of his awful reign, the warlike maid and monarch of the main, the traitor gods by mad ambition driven, durst threat with chains the omnipotence of heaven. Then called by thee the monster Titan came, whom gods, Briarius, men, Argion name. Through wandering skies enormous stalked along, not he that shakes the solid earth so strong, with giant pride at Jove's high throne he stands, and brandished round him all his hundred hands. The affrighted gods confessed their awful lord. They dropped the fetters, trembled, and adored. This goddess, this to his remembrance call, embrace his knees at his tribunal fall. Conjure him far to drive the Grecian train, to hurl them headlong to their fleet and main, to heap the shores with copious death, and bring the Greeks to know the curse of such a king." Let Agamemnon lift his haughty head o'er all his wide dominion of the dead, and mourn in blood that ere he durst disgrace the boldest warrior of the Grecian race. Unhappy son, fair Thetis thus replies, while tears celestial trickle from her eyes, why have I borne thee with a mother's throes to fates averse, and nursed for future woes? 
So short a space, the light of heaven to view, So short a space, and filled with sorrow too. Oh, might a parent's careful wish prevail, Far, far from Ilion should thy vessel sail, And thou, from camps remote, the danger shun, Which now, alas, too nearly threats my son. Yet, what I can to move thy suit, I'll go to great Olympus crowned with fleecy snow. Meantime, secure within thy ships from far, Behold the field not mingle in the war. The sire of gods and all the ethereal train On the warm limits of the farthest main, Now mix with mortals nor disdain to grace The feasts of Ethiopia's blameless race. Twelve days the powers indulge the genial rite, Returning with the twelfth revolving light. Then will I mount the brazen dome And move the high tribunal of immortal Jove. The goddess spoke, the rolling waves unclose. Then down the steep she plunged from whence she rose, and left him sorrowing on the lonely coast, in wild resentment for the fare he lost. In Chrysa's port now sage Ulysses rode, beneath the deck the destined victim stowed. The sails they furled, they lashed the mast aside, and dropped their anchors and the pinnace tied. Next on the shore their hecatomb they land, Chryseis last descending on the strand, her thus Returning from the furrowed main, Ulysses led to Phoebus' sacred fane, whereat his solemn altar as the maid he gave to Chryses. Thus the hero said, Hail, reverend priest! To Phoebus' awful dome, a suppliant, I, from great Atrides, come. Unransomed here, receive the spotless fair. Accept the hecatomb the Greeks prepare. And may thy God, who scatters darts around, atoned by sacrifice, desist a wound. At this... The sire embraced the maid again, so sadly lost, so lately sought in vain. Then near the altar of the darting king, disposed in rank, their hecatomb they bring, with water purify their hands, and take the sacred offering of the salted cake. While thus with arms devoutly raised in air, and solemn voice the priest directs his prayer, God of the silver bow, thy ear incline, whose power encircles Scylla the divine, whose sacred eye Thy tinidus surveys, and gilds fair Chrysa with distinguished rays, if, fired to vengeance at thy priest's request, thy direful darts inflict the raging pest, once more attend, avert the wasteful woe, and smile propitious and unbend thy bow. So Chryses prayed. Apollo heard his prayer, and now the Greeks their hecatomb prepare. Between their horns the salted barley threw, and with their heads to heaven the victims slew. The limbs they sever from the enclosing hide, the thighs selected to the gods divide. On these, in double calls involved with art, the choicest morsels lay from every part. The priest himself before his altar stands, and burns the offering with his holy hands, pours the black wine, and sees the flames aspire. The youth with instruments surround the fire. The thighs, thus sacrificed, and entrails dressed, the assistants part, transfix, and roast the rest, then spread the tables, the repast prepare. Each takes his seat, and each receives his share. When now the rage of hunger was repressed, with pure libations they conclude the feast, the youths with wine the copious goblets crowned, and pleased dispense the flowing bowls around. With hymns divine the joyous banquet ends." The paeons lengthened till the sun descends. The Greeks restored, the grateful notes prolong. Apollo listens and approves the song. T'was night. The chiefs beside their vessel lie till rosy morn had purpled o'er the sky, then launch and hoist the mast. Indulgent gales supplied by Phoebus fill the swelling sails, the milk-white canvas bellying as they blow. The parted ocean foams and roars below. Above the bounding billows swift they flew, till now the Grecian camp appeared in view. Far on the beach they haul their bark to land. The crooked keel divides the yellow sand. Then part, where stretched along the winding bay, the ships and tents in mingled prospect lay. But raging still amidst his navy sat the stern Achilles, steadfast in his hate. Nor mixed in combat, nor in council joined, but... Wasting cares lay heavy on his mind, in his black thoughts revenge and slaughter roll, and scenes of blood rise dreadful in his soul. Twelve days were past, and now the dawning light the gods had summoned to the Olympian height. 
Jove, first ascending from the watery bowers, leads the long order of ethereal powers, when, like the morning mist in early day, rose from the flood the daughter of the sea, and to the seats divine her flight addressed. There, far apart and high above the rest, the thunderer sat, where old Olympus shrouds his hundred heads in heaven and props the clouds. Suppliant, the goddess stood, one hand she placed beneath his beard, and one his knees embraced. If e'er, O father of the gods, she said, my words could please thee or my actions aid, some marks of honour on my son bestow, and pay in glory what in life you owe. Fame is at least by heavenly promise due to life so short, and now dishonoured too. Avenge this wrong, O ever just and wise. Let Greece be humbled and the Trojans rise. To the proud king and all the Achaean race shall heap with honours him they now disgrace. Thus Thetis spoke. But Jove, in silence, held the sacred counsels of his breast concealed, not so repulsed, the goddess closer pressed, still grasped his knees and urged the dear request. O oh, sire of gods and men, thy suppliant here, refuse or grant, for what has Jove to fear? Or, O oh, declare of all the powers above, is wretched Thetis least the care of Jove? She said, and sighing, thus the god replies, Who rolls the thunder o'er the vaulted skies? What hast thou asked? Ah, why should Jove engage in foreign contests and domestic rage, the gods' complaints and Juno's fierce alarms, while I, too partial, aid the Trojan arms? Go, lest the haughty partner of my sway with jealous eyes thy close access survey. But part in peace, secure thy prayer is sped." Witness the sacred honours of our head, the nod that ratifies the will divine, the faithful fixed irrevocable sign. This seals thy suit, and this fulfils thy vows. He spoke, and awful bends his sable brows, shakes his ambrosial curls, and gives the nod, the stamp of fate and sanction of the god. High heaven with trembling the dread signal took, and all Olympus to the centre shook. Swift to the seas profound the goddess flies, Jove to his starry mansions in the skies. The shining synod of the immortals wait the coming god. And from their thrones of state arising silent, wrapped in holy fear, before the majesty of heaven appear, trembling they stand while Jove assumes the throne. Or, but the god's imperious queen alone. Late had she viewed the silver-footed dame, and all her passions kindled into flame. Say, artful manager of heaven, she cries, who now partakes the secrets of the skies? Thy Juno knows not the decrees of fate, in vain the partner of imperial state. What favorite goddess, then, those cares divides, which Jove in prudence from his consort hides? To this the thunderer, shake not thou to find the sacred counsels of almighty mind, involved in darkness likes the great decree, nor can the depths of fate be pierced by thee. What fits thy knowledge? Thou the first shall know, the first of gods above and men below. But thou nor they shall search the thoughts that roll deep in the close recesses of my soul. Full on the sire, the goddess of the skies, rolled the large orbs of her majestic eyes, and thus returned. Austere Saturnius, say, from whence this wrath, or who controls thy sway? Thy boundless will for me remains in force, and all thy counsels take the destined course, but tis for Greece I fear, for late was seen in close consult the silver-footed queen, Jove, to his Thetis nothing could deny, nor was the signal vain that shook the sky. What fatal favour has the goddess won to grace her fierce, inexorable son, perhaps in Grecian blood to drench the plain and glut his vengeance with my people slain? Then thus the god, O restless fate of pride, that strives to learn what heaven resolves to hide, vain is the search, presumptuous and abhorred, anxious to thee, and odious to thy lord, let this suffice. The immutable decree no force can shake. What is that ought to be? Goddess, submit, nor dare our will withstand. But dread the power of this avenging hand. The united strength of all the gods above in vain resists the omnipotence of Jove. The thunderer spoke, nor durst the queen reply. A reverent horror silenced all the sky. The feast, disturbed with sorrow, Vulcan saw, his mother menaced, and the gods in awe. Peace at his heart, and pleasure his design, thus interposed the architect divine. The wretched quarrels of the mortal state are far unworthy, gods, of your debate. 
Let men their days in senseless strife employ, we in eternal peace and constant joy. Thou goddess mother with our sire comply, nor break the sacred union of the sky, lest, roused to rage, he shake the blessed abodes, launch the red lightning, and dethrone the gods. If you submit, the thunderer stands appeased, the gracious power is willing to be pleased. Thus Vulcan spoke, and rising with a bound, the double bowl with sparkling nectar crowned, which held to Juno in a cheerful way, Goddess, he cried, be patient and obey. Dear as you are, if Jove his arm extend, I can but grieve, unable to defend, what God so daring in your aid to move, or lift his hand against the force of Jove. Once in your cause I felt his matchless might, hurled headlong down from the ethereal height, tossed all the day in rapid circles round, nor till the sun descended touched the ground. Breathless I fell, in giddy motion lost. The Scythians raised me on the Lemnian coast. He said, and to her hands the goblet heaved, which, with a smile, the white-armed queen received. Then, to the rest he filled, and in his turn, each to his lips applied the nectared urn. Vulcan, with awkward grace, his office plies, and unextinguished laughter shakes the skies. Thus, the blessed gods the genial day prolong, in feasts ambrosial and celestial song. Apollo tuned the lyre. The muses round, with voice alternate, aid the silver sound. Meantime the radiant sun, to mortal sight, descending swift rolled down the rapid light. Then to their starry domes the gods depart, the shining monuments of Vulcan's art. Jove on his couch reclined his awful head, and Juno slumbered on the golden bed. The End of Book One of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope, read by Rick Kistner, for lit to go on the web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book Two Argument The Trial of the Army and Catalogue of the Forces. Jupiter, in pursuance of the request of Thetis, sends a deceitful vision to Agamemnon, persuading him to lead the army to battle in order to make the Greeks sensible of their want of Achilles. The general, who is deluded with the hopes of taking Troy without his assistance, but fears the army was discouraged by his absence and the late plague, as well as by the length of time, contrives to make trial of their disposition by a stratagem. He first communicates his design to the princes in council, that he would propose a return to the soldiers, and that they should put a stop to them if the proposal was embraced. Then he assembles the whole host, and upon moving for a return to Greece, they unanimously agree to it, and run to prepare the ships. They are detained by the management of Ulysses, who chastises the insolence of Thersites. The assembly is recalled, several speeches made on the occasion, and at length the advice of Nestor followed, which was to make a general muster of the troops, and to divide them into their several nations before they proceeded to battle. This gives occasion to the poet to enumerate all the forces of the Greeks and Trojans, and in a large catalogue. The time employed in this book consists not entirely of one day. The scene lies in the Grecian camp, and upon the seashore, towards the end it removed to Troy. Now pleasing sleep had sealed each mortal eye, stretched in the tents the Grecian leaders lie. The immortals slumbered on their thrones above, all but the ever-wakeful eyes of Jove. To honor Thetis' son he bends his care, and plunge the Greeks in all the woes of war, then bids an empty phantom rise to sight, and thus commands the vision of the night. Fly hence, deluding dream, and light as air, to Agamemnon's ample tent repair. Bid him in arms draw forth the embattled train. Lead all his Grecians to the dusty plain. Declare e'en now tis given him to destroy the lofty towers of wide-extended Troy. For now, no more the gods with fate contend. At Juno's suit the heavenly factions end. Destruction hangs o'er yon devoted wall, and nodding Ilion awaits the impending fall. Swift as the word, the vain illusion fled, descends, and hovers o'er Atrides' head. Clothed in the figure of the Pillian sage, renowned for wisdom and revered for age, 
around his temples spreads his golden wing, and thus the flattering dream deceives the king. Canst thou, with all a monarch's cares oppressed, O Atreus' son, canst thou indulge the rest? Ill fits a chief who mighty nations guides, directs in council and in war presides, to whom its safety a whole people owes to waste long nights in indolent repose. Monarch, awake, tis Jove's command I bear, thou and thy glory claim his heavenly care. In just array draw forth the embattled train, lead all thy Grecians to the dusty plain. E'en now, O king, tis given thee to destroy the lofty towers of wide-extended Troy. For now no more the gods with fate contend, at Juno's suit the heavenly factions end. Destruction hangs o'er yon devoted wall, and nodding Ilion awaits the impending fall. Awake, but waking this advice approve, and trust the vision that descends from Jove. The phantom said, then vanished from his sight, resolves to err, and mixes with the night. A thousand schemes the monarch's mind employ. Elate in thought, he sacks untaken Troy, vain as he was, and to the future blind, nor saw what Jove and secret fate designed. What mighty toils to either host remain, what scenes of grief and numbers of the slain, Eager he rises, and in fancy hears the voice celestial murmuring in his ears. First on his limbs a slender vest he drew, around him next the regal mantle threw. The embroidered sandals on his feet were tied, the starry falchion glittered at his side. And last his arm the massy scepter loads, unstained, immortal, and the gift of gods. Now rosy morn ascends the court of Jove, lifts up her light, and opens day above. The king dispatched his heralds with commands to range the camp and summon all the bands. The gathering hosts the monarch's word obey, while to the fleet Atreides bends his way. In his black ship the Pylian prince he found. There calls the senate of the peers around. The assembly placed, the king of men expressed, the councils laboring in his artful breast. Friends and confederates, with attentive ear, receive my words and credit what you hear. Late as I slumbered in the shades of night, a dream divine appeared before my sight, whose visionary form like Nestor came, the same in habit, and in me the same. The heavenly phantom hovered o'er my head, and, Dost thou sleep, O Atreus' son? he said, ill fits a chief who mighty nation guides, directs in council and in war presides, to whom its safety a whole people owes, to waste long nights in indolent repose. Monarch, awake! Tis Jove's command I bear." Thou and thy glory claim his heavenly care. In just array draw forth the embattled train, and lead the Grecians to the dusty plain. E'en now, O king, tis given thee to destroy the lofty towers of wide-extended Troy. For now no more the gods with fate contend. At Juno's suit the heavenly factions end. Destruction hangs o'er yon devoted wall, and nodding Ilion waits the impending fall. This hear observant, and the gods obey. The vision spoke, and passed in air away. Now, valiant chiefs, since heaven itself alarms, unite, and rouse the sons of Greece to arms. But first with caution, try what yet they dare. Worn with nine years of unsuccessful war, to move the troops to measure back the main, be mine, and yours the province to detain. He spoke and sat. When Nestor, rising, said, Nestor, whom Pylos' sandy realms obeyed, Princes of Greece, your faithful ears incline, nor doubt the vision of the powers divine, sent by great Jove to him who rules the host. Forbid it, heaven, this warning should be lost. Then let us haste, obey the gods' alarms, and join to rouse the sons of Greece to arms. Thus spoke the sage. The kings, without delay, dissolve the council, and their chief obey. The sceptred rulers lead, the following host, poured forth by thousands, darkens all the coast. As from some rocky cleft the shepherd sees, clustering in heaps on heaps the driving bees, rolling and blackening, swarms succeeding swarms, with deeper murmurs and more hoarse alarms. Dusky they spread, a close-embodied crowd, and o'er the veil descends the living cloud. So from the tents and ships a lengthened train spreads all the beach, and wide or shades the plain. Along the region runs a deafening sound. Beneath their footsteps groans the trembling ground. 
Fame flies before the messenger of Jove, and shining soars and claps her wings above. Nine sacred heralds now proclaiming loud, the monarch's will suspend the listening crowd. Soon as the throngs in order ranged appear, and fainter murmurs died upon the air, the king of kings, his awful figure raised, high in his hand the golden scepter blazed, the golden scepter of celestial flame, by Vulcan formed, from Jove to Hermes came. To Pelops he the immortal gift resigned, the immortal gift great Pelops left behind in Atreus' hand, which not with Atreus ends, to rich Thyestes next the prize descends, and now the mark of Agamemnon's reign, subjects all Argos and controls the main. On this bright scepter now the king reclined, and artful thus pronounced the speech designed. Ye sons of Mars, partake your leader's care, heroes of Greece and brothers of the war. Of partial Jove with justice I complain, and heavenly articles believed in vain a safe return was promised to our toils, renowned, triumphant, and enriched with spoils. Now shameful flight alone can save the host, our blood, our treasure, and our glory lost. So Jove decrees, resistless lord of all, at whose command whole empires rise or fall, he shakes the feeble props of human trust, and towns and armies humbles to the dust. What shame to Greece a fruitful war to wage! O oh, lasting shame in every future age! Once great in arms, the common scorn we grow, repulsed and baffled by a feeble foe. So small their number that if wars were ceased and Greece triumphant held a general feast, all ranked by tens whole decades when they died must want a Trojan slave to pour the wine. But other forces have our hopes o'erthrown, and Troy prevails by armies not her own. Now nine long years of mighty Jove are run, since first the labours of this war begun. Our cordage torn, decayed our vessels lie, and scarce ensure the wretched power to fly. Haste, then, forever leave the Trojan wall. Our weeping wives, our tender children call. Love, duty, safety, summon us away. Tis nature's voice, and nature we obey. Our shattered barks may yet transport us o'er, safe and inglorious to our native shore. Fly, Grecians, fly, your sails and oars employ, and dream no more of heaven-defended Troy. His deep design unknown, the hosts approve Atreides' speech. The mighty numbers move, so roll the billows to the Icarian shore, from east and south when winds begin to roar, burst their dark mansions in the clouds, and sweep the whitening surface of the ruffled deep. And as on corn, when western gusts descend, before the blast the lofty harvests bend, thus o'er the field the moving host appears with nodding plumes and groves of waving spears. The gathering murmur spreads, their trampling feet beat the loose sands and thicken to the fleet. With long resounding cries they urge the train to fit the ships and launch into the main. They toil, they sweat, thick clouds of dust arise, the doubling clamours echo to the skies. E'en then the Greeks had left the hostile plain, and fate decreed the fall of Troy in vain. But Jove's imperial queen their flight surveyed, and sighing thus bespoke the blue-eyed maid, Shall then the Grecians fly, O dire disgrace, and leave unpunished this perfidious race? Shall Troy, shall Priam and the adulterous spouse in peace enjoy the fruits of broken vows? And bravest chiefs in Helen's quarrel slain lie unrevenged on yon detested plain? No. Let my Greeks, unmoved by vain alarms, once more refulgent shine in brazen arms. Haste, goddess, haste, the flying host detain, nor let one sail be hoisted on the main. Pallas obeys, and from Olympus' height, swift to the ships precipitates her flight. Ulysses, first in public cares she found, for prudent counsel like the gods renowned, oppressed with generous grief the hero stood, nor drew his sable vessels to the flood. And is it thus, divides Laertes' son, thus fly the Greeks, the martial maid begun, thus to their country bear their own disgrace, and fame eternal leave to Priam's race? Shall beauteous Helen still remain unfreed, still unrevenged, a thousand heroes bleed? Haste, generous Ithacus, prevent the shame. Recall your armies and your chiefs reclaim. Your own resistless eloquence employ, and to the immortals trust the fall of Troy. The voice divine confessed the warlike maid. Ulysses heard, nor uninspired obeyed. Then meeting first Atreides from his hand, received the imperial scepter of command, 
Thus graced attention and respect to gain. He runs, he flies, through all the Grecian train. Each prince of name or chief in arms approved, he fired with praise or with persuasion moved. Warriors like you, with strength and wisdom blessed, by brave examples should confirm the rest. The monarch's will not yet revealed appears. He tries our courage, but resents our fears. The unwary Greeks his fury may provoke. Not thus the king in secret council spoke. Jove loves our chief. From Jove his honor springs. Beware, for dreadful is the wrath of kings. But if a clamorous, vile plebeian rose, him with reproof he checked or tamed with blows. Be still, thou slave, and to thy betters yield. Unknown alike in council and in field, ye gods, what dastards would our host command? Swept to the war, the lumber of a land. Be silent, wretch, and think not here aloud, that worst of tyrants, an usurping crowd. To one sole monarch, Jove, commits the sway. His are the laws, and him let all obey. With words like these, the troops Ulysses ruled, the loudest silenced, and the fiercest cooled. Back to the assembly roll the thronging train, desert the ships and pour upon the plain. Murmuring they move as when old oceans roars and heaves huge surges to the trembling shores. The groaning banks are burst with bellowing sound, the rocks remurmur and the deeps rebound. At length the tumult sinks, the noises cease, and a still silence lulls the camp to peace. Thersites only clamoured in the throng, loquacious, loud, and turbulent of tongue, awed by no shame, by no respect controlled, in scandal busy and reproaches bold, with witty malice studious to defame, scorn all his joy and laughter all his aim. But chief he gloried with licentious style to lash the great and monarchs to revile. His figure, such as might his soul proclaim, one eye was blinking, and one leg was lame. His mountain shoulders half his breast o'erspread, thin hairs bestrewed his long misshapen head, spleen to mankind his envious heart possessed, and much he hated all, but most the best. Ulysses, or Achilles, still his theme, but royal scandal his delight supreme. Long had he lived the scorn of every Greek, vexed when he spoke, yet still they heard him speak. Sharp was his voice, which in the shrillest tone thus, with injurious taunts, attacked the throne. Amidst the glories of so bright a reign, what moves the great Atreides to complain? Tis thine, whate'er the warrior's breast inflames, the golden spoil, and thine the lovely dames, with all the wealth our wars and blood bestow. Thy tents are crowded, and thy chest o'erflow. Thus at full ease, in heaps of riches rolled, what grieves the monarch? Is it thirst of gold? Say, shall we march with our unconquered powers, the Greeks and I, to Ilion's hostile towers, and bring the race of royal bastards here for Troy to ransom at a price too dear? But safer plunder thy own host supplies. Say, wouldst thou seize some valiant leader's prize? Or if thy heart to generous love be led, some captive fair to bless thy kingly bed? Whate'er our master craves, submit we must. Plagued with his pride or punished for his lust, O oh, women of Achaea, men no more, hence let us fly, and let him waste his store in loves and pleasures on the Phrygian shore. We may be wanted on some busy day when Hector comes, so great Achilles may. From him he forced the prize we jointly gave, from him the fierce, the fearless, and the brave, and durst he as he ought resent that wrong. This mighty tyrant were no tyrant long. Fierce from his seat at this Ulysses springs, in generous vengeance of the king of kings, with indignation sparkling in his eyes, he views the wretch, and sternly thus replies. Peace, factious monster, born to vex the state, with wrangling talents formed for foul debate. Curb that impetuous tongue, nor rashly vain, and singly mad asperse the sovereign reign. Have we not known thee, slave of all our host, the man who acts the least, upbraids the most, think not the Greeks to shameful flight to bring, nor let those lips profane the name of king. For our return we trust the heavenly powers, be that their care, to fight like men be ours. But grant the host with wealth the general load, accept detraction, what hast thou bestowed? Suppose some hero should his spoils resign, art thou that hero, could those spoils be thine? Gods! Let me perish on this hateful shore, and let these eyes behold my son no more, if on thy next offence this hand forbear, to strip those arms thou ill deservest to swear. 
expel the council where our princes meet, and send thee scourged and howling through the fleet. He said, and cowering as the dastard bends, the weighty scepter on his bank descends. On the round bunch the bloody tumors rise, the tears spring starting from his haggard eyes. Trembling he sat, and shrunk in abject fears, from his vile visage wiped the scalding tears, while to his neighbor each expressed his thought, Ye gods, what wonders has Ulysses wrought! What fruits his conduct and his courage yield, great in the council, glorious in the field! Generous he rises in the crown's defense to curb the factious tongue of insolence. Such just examples on offenders shown, sedition, silence, and assert the throne. "'Twas thus the general voice the hero praised, who, rising high, the imperial scepter raised. The blue-eyed palace, his celestial friend, in form a herald, bade the crowds attend. The expecting crowds in still attention hung, to hear the wisdom of his heavenly tongue. Then, deeply thoughtful, pausing ere he spoke, his silence thus the prudent hero broke. "'Unhappy monarch, whom the Grecian race with shame deserting heap with vile disgrace, not such at Argos was their generous vow, once all their voice but ah, forgotten now. Ne'er to return was then the common cry, till Troy's proud structure should in ashes lie. Behold them weeping for their native shore, what could their wives or helpless children more? What heart but melts to leave the tender train, and one short month endure the wintry main? Few leagues removed we wish our peaceful seat, when the ship tosses and the tempests beat. Then, well, may this long stay provoke their tears, the tedious length of nine revolving years. Not for their grief the Grecian host I blame, but vanquished, baffled, oh, eternal shame. Expect the time to Troy's destruction given, and try the faith of Chalcus and of heaven. What passed at Aulus, Greece can witness bear, and all who live to breathe this Phrygian air." Beside a fountain sacred brink we raised our verdant altars and the victims blazed. Twas where the plain tree spread its shades around, the altars heaved, and from the crumbling ground a mighty dragon shot of dire portent. From Jove himself the dreadful sign was sent. Straight to the trees his sanguine spires he rolled, and curled around in many a winding fold. The topmost branch a mother bird possessed, Eight callow infants filled the mossy nest. Herself the ninth, the serpent, as he hung, stretched his black jaws and crushed the crying young. While hovering near with miserable moan, the drooping mother wailed her children gone. The mother last, as round the nest she flew, seized by the beating wing the monster slew. Nor long survived, to marble turned he stands, a lasting prodigy in Aulus's sands. Such was the will of Jove, and hence we dare trust in his omen, and support the war, for while around we gaze with wondering eyes, and trembling sought the powers with sacrifice, full of his god the reverend Chalcris cried, Ye Grecian warriors, lay your fears aside, this wondrous signal Jove himself displays, of long, long labors, but eternal praise. As many birds as by the snake were slain, so many years the toils of Greece remain, but wait the tenth for Ilion's fall decreed, thus spoke the prophet, thus the fates succeed. Obey, ye Grecians, with submission wait, nor let your flight avert the Trojan fate. He said, the shores with loud applauses sound, the hollow ships each deafening shout rebound. Then Nestor thus, These vain debates forbear, ye talk like children, not like heroes dare. Where now are all your high resolves at last? Your leagues concluded your engagements past, vowed with libations and with victims then, now vanished like their smoke the faith of men. While useless words consume the unactive hours, no wonder Troy so long resists our powers. Rise, great Atrides, and with courage sway we march to war if thou direct the way. But leave the few that dare resist thy laws, the mean deserters of the Grecian cause." to grudge the conquests mighty Jove prepares, and view with envy our successful wars. On that great day, when first the martial train, big with the fate of Ilion, ploughed the main, Jove, on the right, a prosperous signal sent, and thunder rolling shook the firmament, 
encouraged hence, maintain the glorious strife, till every soldier grasp a Phrygian wife, till Helen's woes at full revenged appear, and Troy's proud matrons render tear for tear. Before that day, if any Greek invite his country's troops to base in glorious flight, stand forth that Greek, and hoist his sail to fly, and die the dastard first who dreads to die. But now, O monarch, all thy chiefs advise, nor what they offer, thou thyself despise. Among those counsels let not mine be vain, in tribes and nations to divide thy train. His separate troops let every leader call, each strengthen each, and all encourage all. What chief or soldier of the numerous band, or bravely fights or ill obeys command, when thus distinct they war, shall soon be known. And what the cause of Ilia not or thrown, if fate resists, or if our arms are slow, if gods above prevent or men below? To him the king. How much thy years excel in arts of counsel, and in speaking well? Oh, would the gods in love to Greece decree but ten such sages as they grant in thee, such wisdom should soon Priam's force destroy, and soon should fall the haughty towers of Troy. But Jove forbids, who plunges those he hates in fierce contention and in vain debates. Now great Achilles from our aid withdraws, by me provoked, a captive made the cause, if e'er as friends we join the Trojan wall must shake, and heavy will the vengeance fall. But now, ye warriors, take a short repast, and well refreshed to bloody conflict haste, his sharpened spear let every Grecian wield, and every Grecian fix his brazen shield, let all excite the fiery steeds of war, and all for combat fit the rattling car. This day, this dreadful day, let each contend, no rest, no respite, till the shades descend, till darkness, or till death, shall cover all. Let the war bleed, and let the mighty fall." till bathed in sweat be every manly breast, with the huge shield each brawny arm depressed, each aching nerve refuse the lance to throw, and each spent courser at the chariot blow. Who dares, inglorious, in his ships to stay? Who dares to tremble on this signal day? That wretch, too mean to fall by martial power, the birds shall mangle, and the dogs devour. The monarch spoke, and straight a murmur rose, loud as the surges when the tempest blows, that dashed on broken rocks tumultuous roar, and foam and thunder on the stony shore. Straight to the tents the troops dispersing bend, the fires are kindled, and the smokes ascend. With hasty feasts they sacrifice and pray, to avert the dangers of the doubtful day. A steer of five years' age, large-limbed and fed, to Jove's high altars Agamemnon led. There bade the noblest of the Grecian peers, and Nestor first as most advanced in years. Next came Idomeneus, and Tadius' son Ajax the less, and Ajax Telamon. Then wise Ulysses in his rank was placed, and Menelaus came unbid the last. The chiefs surround the destined beast, and take the sacred offering of the salted cake. When thus the king prefers his solemn prayer, O thou! whose thunder rends the clouded air, who in the heaven of heavens hast fixed thy throne, supreme of gods, unbounded and alone, here, and before the burning sun descends, before the night her gloomy veil extends, lo, in the dust be laid yon hostile spires, be Priam's palace sunk in Grecian fires, in Hector's breast be plunged this shining sword, and slaughtered heroes groan around their lord. Thus prayed the chief, his unavailing prayer, great Jove refused, and tossed in empty air. The god averse, while yet the fumes arose, prepared new toils and doubled woes on woes. Their prayers performed, the chiefs the right pursue, the barley sprinkled, and the victim slew. The limbs they sever from the enclosing hide, the thighs selected to the gods divide. On these, in double coals involved with art, the choicest morsels lie from every part, from the cleft wood the crackling flames aspires, while the fat victims feed the sacred fire. The thighs thus sacrificed, and entrails dressed, the assistants part, transfix, and roast the rest. Then spread the table, the repast prepare, each takes his seat, and each receives his share. Soon as the rage of hunger was suppressed, the generous Nestor thus the prince addressed. Now bid thy heralds sound the loud alarms, and call the squadrons sheathed in brazen arms. 
Now seize the occasion, now the troops survey, and lead to war when heaven directs the way. He said, the monarch issued his commands, straight the loud heralds call the gathering bands. The chiefs enclose their king, the hosts divide, in tribes and nations ranked on either side. High in the midst the blue-eyed virgin flies, from rank to rank she darts her ardent eyes. The dreadful Aegis, Jove's immortal shield, blazed on her arm, and lightened all the field. Round the vast orb a hundred serpents rolled, formed the bright fringe, and seemed to burn in gold. With this each Grecian's manly breast she warms, swells their bold hearts, and strings their nervous arms. No more they sigh, inglorious to return, but breathe revenge, and for the combat burn. As on some mountain through the lofty grove, the crackling flames ascend and blaze above. The fires, expanding as the winds arise, shoot their long beams and kindle half the skies. So from the polished arms and brazen shields a gleamy splendor flashed along the fields, not less their number than the embodied cranes, or milk-white swans in Asia's watery plains, that o'er the windings of Caestus springs stretch their long necks and clap their rustling wings. Now tower aloft and course in airy rounds, now light with noise, with noise the field resounds. Thus numerous and confused, extending wide, the legions crowd Scamander's flowery side. With rushing troops the plains are covered o'er, and thundering footsteps shake the sounding shore. Along the river's level meads they stand, thick as in spring the flowers adorn the land, or leaves the trees, or thick as insects play, the wandering nation of a summer's day that drawn by milky streams at evening hours in gathered swarms surround the rural bowers. From pale to pale, with busy murmur run, the gilded legions glittering in the sun. So thronged, so close, the Grecian squadron stood in radiant arms and thirst for Trojan blood. Each leader now his scattered force conjoins in close array and forms the deepening lines. Not with more ease the skilful shepherd swain collects his flocks from thousands on the plain. The king of kings, majestically tall, towers o'er his armies and outshines them all. Like some proud bull that round the pastures leads his subject herds, the monarch of the Medes, great as the gods the exalted chief was seen, his strength like Neptune and like Mars is mien. Jove o'er his eyes celestial glory spread, and dawning conquest played around his head. Say, virgins, seated round the throne divine, all-knowing goddesses, immortal nine, since earth's wide regions, heaven's unmeasured height, and hell's abyss hide nothing from your sight, we, wretched mortals, lost in doubts below, but guess by rumour, and but boast we know. Oh, say what heroes fired by thirst of fame, or urged by wrongs to Troy's destruction came, to count them all demands a thousand tongues, a throat of brass and adamantine lungs, daughters of Jove assist, inspired by you, the mighty labour dauntless I pursue." What crowded armies from what climes they bring, their names, their numbers, and their chiefs I sing. The hardy warriors whom Boeotia bred, Penelius, Laetus, Prothonor led. With these Alcesilos and Clonius stand, equal in arms and equal in command. These head the troops that rocky Aulus yields, and Etion's hills and Heri's watery fields, and Shonos, Scolos, Grea near the main, and Mycalesia's ample piney plain, those who in Petion or Elysian dwell, or Harma where Apollo's prophet fell, Helion and Hyle, which the springs o'erflow, and Medion lofty, and Ocalia low, or in the meads of Heliartus stray, or Thespia sacred to the god of day, on Chestus, Neptune's celebrated groves, Copiae and Thisbe, famed for silver doves, for flocks, Erythrae, Glissa for the vine, Platia green, and Nysa the divine, and they whom Thebes' well-built walls enclose, where mighty Euthresis' corona rose, and on, rich with purple harvests crowned, and Anthodon Boeotia's utmost bound, full fifty ships they send, and each conveys twice sixty warriors through the foaming seas. To these succeed Asplodon's martial train, who plough the spacious Orchomenian plain. Two valiant brothers rule the undaunted throng, Aealman and Ascalaphus the strong, sons of Astioch the heavenly fair, whose virgin charms subdued the god of war. In actor's court, as she retired to rest, the strength of Mars the blushing maid compressed. 
their troops in thirty sable vessels sweep with equal oars the horse resounding deep. The Phocians next in forty barks repair. Epistrophus and Scadius head the war from those rich regions where Cephasus leads his silver current through the flowery meads, from Panopia, Greece of the Divine, where Anamorius' stately turrets shine, where Pithos, Dolus, Saperesus stood, and fair Lilae views the rising flood. These ranged in order on the floating tide, close on the left, the bold Boeotian side. Fierce Ajax led the Locrian squadrons on, Ajax the less, Oleus's valiant son, skilled to direct the flying dart aright, swift in pursuit and active in the fight, him as their chief the chosen troops attend, which Bessa, Thronos, and rich Sinos send, Opus, Caliaris, and Scarface's bands, and those who dwell where pleasing Augea stands, and where Boagrius floats the lowly lands, or in fair Tarfe's sylvan seats reside, in forty vessels cut the yielding tide. Euboa, Next her martial sons prepares, and sends the brave Abantes to the wars. Breathing revenge in arms, they take their way from Chalcis's walls and strong Eritrea, the Istian fields for generous vines renowned, the fair Caristos and the Styrian ground, where Dios from her towers o'erlooks the plain, and high Serinthus views the neighboring main. Down their broad shoulders falls a length of hair. Their hands dismiss not the long lance in air, but with protended spears in fighting fields pierce the tough corslets and the brazen shields. Twice twenty ships transport the warlike bands which bold Elphenor, fierce in arms, commands. Full fifty more from Athens stem the main, led by Menestheus through the liquid plain. Athens the fair, where great Erechtheus swayed, that owed his nurture to the blue-eyed maid. But from the teeming furrow took his birth, the mighty offspring of the foodful earth. Him Pallas placed amidst her wealthy fane, adored with sacrifice and oxen slain, whereas the years revolve her altars blaze, and all the tribes resound the goddess's praise. No chief like thee, Menestheus, Greece could yield, to martial armies in the dusty field, the extended wings of battle to display, or close the embodied host in firm array. Nestor alone, improved by length of days, for martial conduct, bore an equal praise. With these appear the Salaminian bands, whom the gigantic Telamon commands. In twelve black ships to Troy they steer their course, and with the great Athenians join their force. Next move to war the generous Argive train, from high Trozene and Mesetis plain, and fair Aegina circled by the main, whom strong Tirinthi's lofty walls surround, and Epidauri with viney harvest crowned, and where fair Asinon and Hamoin show, their cliffs above and ample bay below, these by the brave Euryalus were led, great Thenalus and greater Diomed, but chief Tydides bore the sovereign sway, in fourscore barks they plough the watery way, the proud Mycenae armies, her martial powers, Cleon, Corinth, with imperial towers, fair Aretheriae, Orneus, fruitful plain, and Aegeon, and Adrastus, ancient reign, and those who dwell along the sandy shore, and where Pelene yields her fleecy store, where Hellas and Hyperesia lie, and Gonoessa's spires salute the sky. Great Agamemnon rules the numerous band, a hundred vessels in long order stand, and crowded nations wait his dread command. High on the deck the king of men appears, and his refulgent arms in triumph wears, proud of his host, unrivaled in his reign, in silent pomp he moves along the main. His brother follows, and to vengeance warms the hardy Spartans exercised in arms, Ferris and Brisius' valiant troops, and those whom Lacedaemon's lofty hills enclose, or Messi's towers for silver doves renowned, Amaclea, Laos, Algiers' happy ground, and those whom Otilus low walls contain, and Helos on the margin of the main, these or the bending ocean Helen's cause, in sixty ships with Menelaus draws, eager and loud from man to man he flies, revenge and fury flaming in his eyes, while vainly fond, in fancy oft, he hears the fair one's grief, and sees her falling tears. In ninety sail from Pylos' sandy coast, Nestor the sage conducts his chosen host, from Amphigenia's ever fruitful land, where Aphi high and little Teleon stand, where beauteous Arene her structure shows, 
and Thyron's walls Alpheus streams enclose, and Dorion, famed for Thamyris's disgrace superior once of all the tuneful race, till vain of mortals empty praise he strove to match the seed of cloud-compelling Jove, too daring bard, whose unsuccessful pride the immortal muses in their art defied. The avenging muses of the light of day deprived his eyes and snatched his voice away. No more his heavenly voice was heard to sing, his hand no more awaked the silver string. Where high, under Selene, crowned with wood, the shaded tomb of old Eptius stood, from light Strache, Tegia's bordering towns, the Fenian fields, and Orcomenian downs, where the fat herds in plenteous pasture rove, and Stymphelus with her surrounding grove, Palhazia on her snowy cliffs reclined, and high Anispe shook by wintry wind, and fair Matinia's ever-pleasing sight, in sixty sail the Arcadian bands unite, bold Agapenor, glorious at their head, and Caius's son, the mighty squadron led, their ships, supplied by Agamemnon's care, through roaring seas the wandering warriors bear, the first to battle on the appointed plain, but knew to all the dangers of the main. Those where fair Elis and Buprasium join, whom Hiramin here and Myrsanus confine, and bounded there where all the valleys rose the Olenian rock, and where Elysium flows, beneath four chiefs a numerous army came, the strength and glory of the Appian name, in separate squadrons these their train divide. Each leads ten vessels through the yielding tide. One was Amphimachus and Thalpius, one. Eurytus, this, and that, Tietus' son. Deoris sprung from Amarcinius's line, and great Polyxenus of force divine. But those who view fair Ellis o'er the seas from the blessed islands of the Echinides, in forty vessels under Magus move, begot by Phileus, the beloved of Jove, to strong Dulichium from his sire he fled, and thence to Troy his hardy warriors led. Ulysses followed through the watery road, a chief in wisdom equal to a god. With those whom Cephalenia's line enclosed, or till their fields along the coast opposed, or where fair Ithaca o'erlooks the floods, where high Naritos shakes his waving woods, where Agilipa's rugged sides are seen, Crocilia rocky, and Zacynthus green, these, in twelve galleys with vermilion prores, beneath his conduct sought the Phrygian shores. Thoas came next, and Dramanon's valiant son, from Pluron's walls, and Chalky Calidon, and rough Pelene, and the Olenian steep, and Chalcis beaten by the rolling deep. He led the warriors from the Aetolian shore, for now the sons of O Aeneas were no more. The glories of the mighty race were fled, O Aeneas himself, and Meliager dead. To Thoa's care now trust the martial train, his forty vessels follow through the main. Next, eighty barks the Cretan king commands of Gnosis, Lictus, and Gortina's bands, and those who dwell where Rytheon's domes arise, or white Lycastus glitters to the skies, or whereby Phaestus silver Jordan runs, Crete's hundred cities pour forth all her sons. These marched Idomeneus beneath thy care, and Merion dreadful as the god of war. Tepolemus, the son of Hercules, led nine swift vessels through the foamy seas, from roads with everlasting sunshine bright, Jalissus, Lindus, and Chimerus white, his captive mother fierce Alcides bore, from Iphia's walls and Selle's winding shore, where mighty towns and ruins spread the plain, and saw their blooming warriors early slain. The hero, when to manly years he grew, Alcides' uncle, old Lysimnius, slew, for this constrained to quit his native place, and shun the vengeance of the Herculean race. A fleet he built, and with a numerous train of willing exiles wandered o'er the main, where many seas and happy sufferings passed. On happy roads the chief arrived at last. There in three tribes divides his native band, and rules them peaceful in a foreign land, increased and prospered in their new abodes by mighty Jove, the sire of men and gods. With joy they saw the growing empire rise, and showers of wealth descending from the skies. Three ships with Nereus sought the Trojan shore, Nereus, whom Aglia to Charopus bore, Nereus in faultless shape and blooming grace, the loveliest youth of all the Grecian race. Pelides only matched his early charms, but few his troops, and small his strength in arms. Next, thirty galleys cleave the liquid plain, of those Calidines' sea-girt isles contain, 
With them the youth of Nisiris repair, Cassus the strong, and Crepathus the fair. Cos, where Eurypolis possessed the sway, till great Alcides made the realms obey. These, Antiphus and bold Phidippus bring, sprung from the god by Thessalus the king. Now, Muse, recount Pelasogic Argos' powers, from Allos' Alope and Thracian's towers, from Thea's spacious vales, and Hella, blessed with female beauty far beyond the rest, full fifty ships beneath Achilles' care, the Achaeans, Myrmidons, Hellenians bear, the Salians all, though various in their name, the same their nation, and their chief the same, but now in glorious stretched along the shore, they hear the brazen voice of war no more, no more the foe they face in dire array. Close in his fleet the angry leader lay, since fair Brasseus from his arms was torn, the noblest spoil from sacked Lernessus born. Then, when the chief the Theban walls o'erthrew, and the bold sons of great Ivana slew, there mourned Achilles plunged in depth of care, but soon derise in slaughter, blood, and war. To these the youth, of Phalaci succeed, Iltona famous for her fleecy breed, and grassy Teleon decked with cheerful greens, the bowers of Ceres and the sylvan scenes, sweet Parasus with blooming flowerets crowned, and Antron's watery dens and caverned ground, these owned as chief Protosilus the brave, who now lay silent in the gloomy grave, the first who boldly touched the Trojan shore, and dyed a Phrygian lance with Grecian gore, there lies far distant from his native plain, Unfinished his proud palaces remain, and his sad consort beats her breast in vain. His troops and forty ships Padarces led, Iphiclus, son and brother to the dead. Nor he unworthy to command the host, yet still they mourn their ancient leader lost. The men who Glaphira's fair soil partake, where hills encircle Bobi's lowly lake, where Phare hears the neighboring waters fall, or proud Iolcus lifts her airy wall. In ten black ships embarked for Ilion's shore, with bold Eumelus, whom Alceste bore, all Pelis's race, Alceste far out glory of the beauteous kind. The troops Methone or Pharmacia yields, Olazon's rocks or Melabea's fields, with Philoctetes sailed, whose matchless art from the tough bow directs the feathered dart. Seven were his ships, each vessel fifty row, skilled in his science of the dart and bow. But he lay raging on the Lemnian ground, a poisonous hydra gave the burning wound. There groaned the chief in agonizing pain, whom Greece at length shall wish, nor wish in vain. His forces, Medon, led from Lemnos' shore, all his son, whose beauteous Rena bore, the Orcalian race, in whose high towers contained, where once Eurytus in proud triumph reigned, or where her humbler turret Stryker rears, or where Ithome, rough with rocks, appears. In thirty sail the sparkling waves divide, which Podalerius and Machaon guide. To these his skill their parent god imparts, divine professors of the healing arts. The bold Orominian and Asterian bands, in forty barks Eurypolis commands, where Titan hides his hoary head in snow, and where Hyperius' silver fountains flow. Thy troops, Orgissa, Polypetes leads, and Eleon sheltered by Olympus shades, Gitoni's warriors, and where Orthe lies, and Olusun's chalky cliffs arise, sprung from Perithus of immortal race, the fruit of fair Hippodamis' embrace. That day, when hurled from Pelion's cloudy head, to distant dens the shaggy centaurs fled, with Polyportes joined in equal sway, Leontius leads, and forty ships obey. In twenty sail the bold Perhabians came from Cyphus, Gunius was their leader's name, with these their Enians joined, and those who freeze where cold Dodona lifts her holy trees, or where the pleasing Titaricius glides, and into Peneus rolls his easy tides. Yet o'er the silvery surface pure they flow, the sacred stream unmixed with streams below, sacred and awful from the dark abode sticks pours them forth the dreadful oath of gods. Last, unto Prothous the Magnesian stood, Prothous, the swift of old Tenthridon's blood, who dwell where Pelion, crowned with piney boughs, obscures the glade and nods his shaggy brows, or where through flowery Tempe Peneus strayed, the region stretched beneath his mighty shade. In forty sable barks they stemmed the main, such were the chiefs, and such the Grecian train. 
Say next, O muse, of all Achaea breeds, Whose bravest fought or reigned the noblest steeds. Eumelus mares were foremost in the chase, As eagles fleet and of Thoritian race, Bred where Pieria's fruitful fountains flow, And trained by him who bears the silver bow. Fierce in the fight their nostrils breathed the flame, Their height, their colour, and their age the same. O'er fields of death they whirl the rapid car, And breaks the ranks and thunder through the war. Ajax in arms the first renown acquired, While stern Achilles in his wrath retired. His was the strength that mortal might exceeds, And his the unrivalled race of heavenly steeds. But Thetis' son now shines in arms no more, His troops neglected on the sandy shore. In empty air their sport of javelins throw, Or whirl the disc or bend an idle bow. Unstained with blood his covered chariots stand, the immortal courses graze along the strand, but the brave chiefs the inglorious life deplored, and wandering o'er the camp required their lord. Now, like a deluge covering all around, the shining armies sweep along the ground, swift as a flood of fire when storms arise, floats the wild field and blazes to the skies. Earth groaned beneath them as when angry Jove hurls down the forky lightning from above on Arame when he the thunder throws, and fires Typhoeus with redoubled blows, where Typhon, pressed beneath the burning load, still feels the fury of the avenging god. But various Iris, Jove's commands to bear, speeds on the wings of winds through liquid air. In Priam's ports the Trojan chief she found, the old consulting and the youths around. Polity's shape, the monarch's son, she chose, who from Aesetes' tomb observed the foes, high on the mound, from whence in prospect lay the fields, the tents, the navy, and the bay. In this disassembled form she hastes to bring the unwelcome message to the Phrygian king. Cease to consult the time for action calls. War, horrid war, approaches to your walls. Assembled armies oft have I beheld, but ne'er till now such numbers charged a field. Thick as autumnal leaves or driving sand, the moving squadrons blacken all the strand. Thou godlike Hector, all thy force employ, assemble all the united bands of Troy. In just array let every leader call, the foreign troops this day demands them all. The voice divine, the mighty chief alarms, the council breaks, the warriors rush to arms, the gates unfolding pour forth all their train. Nations on nations fill the dusky plain, men, steeds, and chariots shake the trembling ground, the tumult thickens, and the skies resound. Amidst the plain, in sight of Ilion, stands a rising mount, the work of human hands. This, for Myrony's tomb, the immortals know, though called Betia in the world below. Beneath their chiefs in martial order here, the auxiliar troops and Trojan hosts appear. The godlike Hector, high above the rest, shakes his huge spear and nods his plumy crest. In throngs around his native bands repair, and groves of lances glitter in the air. Divine Aeneas brings the Dardan race, and Kisi's son by Venus' stolen embrace, born in the shades of Ida's secret grove, a mortal mixing with the queen of love. Ochilochus and Achamas divide the warrior's toils and combat by his side. Who fare Zelea's wealthy valleys, till fast by the foot of Ida's sacred hill, or drink Aesepus of thy sable flood, or led by Pandarus of royal blood, to whom his art Apollo deigned to show, graced with the presence of his shafts and bow. From rich Apesus and Adrestia's towers, high Tyre summits and Pitye's bowers, from these the congregated troops obey young Amphius and Adrastus' equal sway, old Merop's sons whom, skilled in fates to come, the sire forewarned and prophesied their doom, fate urged them on the sire forewarned in vain, they rushed to war and perished on the plain. From Tacteus' stream, Percotes pasture lands, and Sestos and Abydos name brig strands, from great Arisba's walls and Celis coast, Asius Hyrtacides conducts his host. High on his car he shakes the flowing reins, his fiery courses thunder o'er the plains. The fierce Pelasgi, next in war renowned, march from Larissa's ever fertile ground. In equal arms their brother leaders shine, Hippothous bold, and Peleus the divine. Next Acamas and Pyroas lead their hosts in dread array from Thracia's wintry coasts. Round the bleak realms where Hellespontus roars, and Boreas beats the horse 
resounding shores. With great euphemus, the Siconians move, sprung from Prozenian Seos loved by Jove. Perachmes, the Paeonian troops attend, skilled in the fight their crooked bows to bend. From Axius' ample bed he leads them on, Axius that laves the distant Amidon. Axius that swells with all his neighboring thrills and wide around the floating region fills. The Paphlagonians and Palamenes rules, where rich Henicia breeds her savage mules, where Erythinus rising cliffs are seen, thy groves of box, Sistorus evergreen, and where Aegialus and Cromna lie, and lofty Sesamus invades the sky, and where Parthenius, rolled through banks of flowers, reflects her bordering palaces and bowers. Here marched in arms the Halizonian band, whom Odius and Epistrophus command, from those far regions where the sun refines the ripening silver in Albion mines, their mighty Chromus led the Mysian train, and Augur Enomus inspired in vain, for stone Achilles lopped his sacred head, rolled down Scamander with the vulgar dead. Phorcys and brave Ascanius here unite the Ascanian Phrygians eager for the fight. Of those who round Maeonia's realms reside, or whom the veils and shades of Tmolus hide, Meslas and Antiphus the charge partake, born on the banks of Gyges' silent lake, there from the fields where wild Maeander flows, high Michaele and Latmos' shady brows, and proud Miletus comes the Carian throngs, with mingled clamours and with barbarous tongues, Amphimachus and Noestus guide the train, Noestus the bold, Amphimachus the vain, who, tricked with gold and glittering on his car, rode like a woman to the field of war. Fool that he was, by fierce Achilles slain, the river swept him to the briny main. There, whelmed with waves, the gaudy warrior lies, the valiant victor seized the golden prize. The forces, last in fair array, succeed, which blameless Glaucus and Sarpedon lead, the warlike bands that distant Lycia yields, where Golfi Xanthus foams along the fields. The end of Book Two of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Read by Rick Kishner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book Three Argument The Duel of Menelaus and Paris. The armies being ready to engage. A single combat is agreed upon between Menelaus and Paris, by the intervention of Hector, for the determination of the war. Iris is sent to call Helen to behold the fight. She leads her to the walls of Troy, where Priam sits with his counselors, observing the Grecian leaders on the plain below, to whom Helen gives an account of the chief of them. The kings on either part take the solemn oath for the conditions of the combat. The duel ensues, wherein Paris, being overcome, he is snatched away in a cloud by Venus, and transported to his apartment. She then calls Helen from the walls, and brings the lovers together. Agamemnon, on the part of the Grecians, demands the restoration of Helen, and the performance of the articles. The three and twentieth day still continues throughout this book. The scene is sometimes in the fields before Troy, and sometimes in Troy itself. Thus, by their leader's care, each martial band moves into ranks and stretches o'er the land, with shouts, the Trojans, rushing from afar, proclaim their motions and provoke the war. So, when inclement winters vex the plain, with piercing frosts or thick descending rain, to warmer seas the cranes embodied fly, with noise and order through the midway sky. To pygmy nations wounds and death they bring, and all the war descends upon the wing, but silent, breathing, rage resolved and skilled, by mutual age to fix a doubtful field, swift march the Greeks, the rapid dust, around darkening, arises from the laboured ground. Thus, from his flaggy wings, when notice shed a night of vapours round the mountain heads, swift gliding mists the dusky fields invade, to thieves more grateful than the midnight shade, while scarce the swains their feeding flocks survey, lost and confused, amidst the thickened day. So wrapped in gathering dust the Grecian train, a moving cloud swept on and hid the plain." Now front to front the hostile armies stand, eager of fight, and only wait command, when, to the van, before the sons of fame, whom Troy sent forth, the beauteous Paris came, in form a god, the panther's speckled hide flowed o'er his armour with an easy pride, his bended bow across his shoulders flung, his sword beside him negligently hung, 
two-pointed spears he shook with gallant grace, and dared the bravest of the Grecian race. As thus, with glorious air and proud disdain, he boldly stalked the foremost on the plain, him, Menelaus, loved of Mars, espies, with heart elated and with joyful eyes, so joys a lion, if the branching deer or mountain goat his bulky prize appear. Eager, he seizes and devours the slain, pressed by bold youths and baying dogs in vain. Thus fond of vengeance, with a furious bound and clanging arms, he leaps upon the ground from his high chariot. Him, approaching near, the beauteous champion views with marks of fear, smit with a conscious sense, retires behind, and shuns the fate he well deserved to find. As when some shepherd from the rustling trees shot forth to view a scaly serpent sees, trembling and pale, he starts with wilder fright, and all confused precipitates his flight. So from the king the shining warrior flies, and plunged amid the thickest Trojan lies. As godlike Hector sees the prince retreat, he thus upbraids him with a generous heat. Unhappy Paris, but to women brave, so fairly formed and only to deceive, O oh, hadst thou died when first thou sawest the light, or died at least before thy nuptial rite, a better fate than vainly thus to boast, and fly the scandal of thy Trojan host. Gods, how the scornful Greeks exult to see their fears of danger undeceived in thee, thy figure promised with a martial air, but ill thy soul supplies a form so fair. In former days in all thy gallant pride, when thy tall ships triumphant stemmed the tide, when Greece beheld thy painted canvas flow, and crowds stood wondering at the passing show. Say, was it thus, with such a baffled mien, you met the approaches of the Spartan queen? Thus from her realm conveyed the beauteous prize, and both her warlike lords outshined in Helen's eyes? This deed thy foes delight, thy own disgrace, thy father's grief, and ruin of thy race. This deed recalls thee to the proffered flight, or hast thou injured whom thou darest not right? Soon to thy cost the feud would make thee known, thou keepest the consort of a braver foe, thy graceful form instilling soft desire, thy curling tresses and thy silver lyre, beauty and youth. In vain to these you trust, when youth and beauty shall be laid in dust. Troy yet may wake, and one avenging blow crush the dire author of his country's woe. His silence here, with blushes, Paris breaks. Tis just, my brother, what your anger speaks, but who like thee can boast a soul sedate so firmly proof to all the shocks of fate? Thy force, like steel, a tempered hardness shows, still edged to wound and still untired with blows, like steel uplifted by some strenuous swain, with falling woods to strew the wasted plain. Thy gifts I praise, nor thou despise the charms with which a lover golden Venus arms, soft moving speech and pleasing outward show, no wish can gain them but the gods bestow. Yet wouldst thou have the proffered combat stand, the Greeks and Trojans seat on either hand, then let a midway space our hosts divide, and on that stage of war the cause be tried, by Paris, there the Spartan king be fought, for beauteous Helen and the wealth she brought. And who his rival can in arms subdue, his be the fair, and his the treasure too. Thus, with a lasting league, your toils may cease, and thus Troy possesses her fertile fields in peace. Thus may the Greeks view their native shore, much famed for generous steeds, for beauty more. He said. The challenge Hector heard with joy, then with a spear restrained the youth of Troy, held by the midst athwart, and near the foe advanced with steps majestically slow, while round his dauntless head the Grecians pour their stones and arrows in a mingled shower. Then thus the monarch great Atreides cried, Forbear, ye warriors, lay the doors aside. A parley Hector asks, a message bears, we know him by the various plume he wears. Awed by his high command, the Greeks attend, the tumult silence, and the fight suspend. While from the centre Hector rolls his eyes on either host, and thus to both applies, Hear all ye Trojan, all ye Grecian bands, what Paris, author of the war, demands. Your shining swords within the sheath restrain, and pitch your lances in the yielding plain. Here in the midst, in either army's sight, he dares the Spartan king to single fight, and wills that Helen and the ravished spoil that caused the contest shall reward the toil. Let these the brave triumphant victor grace, and different nations part in leagues of peace. He spoke. 
In still suspense on either side each army stood, the Spartan chief replied, "'Me too, ye warriors, here, whose fatal right a world engages in the toils of fight. To me the labour of the field resign, me, Paris, injured, all the war be mine. Fall he that must beneath his rival's arms, and live the rest secure of future harms. Two lambs, devoted by your country's right, to earth a sable, to the sun a white. Prepare ye, Trojans, while a third we bring select to Jove, the inviolable king.' Let revered Priam in the truce engage, and add the sanction of considerate age. His sons are faithless, headlong in debate, and youth itself an empty, wavering state. Cool age advances venerably wise, turns on all hands its deep discerning eyes, sees what befell, and what may yet befall, concludes from both, and best provides for all. The nations here with rising hopes possessed, and peaceful prospects dawn in every breast. Within the lines they drew their steeds around, and from their chariots issued on the ground. Next, all unbuckling the rich mail they wore, laid their bright arms along the sable shore. On either side the meeting hosts are seen with lances fixed, and close the space between. Two heralds now, dispatched to Troy, invite the Phrygian monarch to the peaceful rite. Talthibius hastens to the fleet to bring the lamb for Jove, the inviolable king. Meantime to beauteous Helen... From the skies the various goddess of the rainbow flies, like fair Laodice in form and face, the loveliest nymph of Priam's royal race. Her in the palace at her loom she found, the golden web her own sad story crowned. The Trojan wars she weaved, herself the prize, and the dire triumphs of her fatal eyes. To whom the goddess of the painted bow approach and view the wondrous scene below, each hardy Greek and valiant Trojan knight, so dreadful late and furious for the fight, now rest their spears, or lean upon their shields, ceased is the war, and silent all the fields. Paris alone, and Sparta's king advance, in single fight to toss the beamy lance, each met in arms the fate of combat tries, thy love the motive, and thy charms the prize. This said, the many-coloured maid inspires her husband's love, and wakes her former fires. Her country, parents, all that once were dear, rush to her thought, and force a tender tear. O'er her fair face a snowy veil she threw, and, softly sighing, from the loom withdrew. Her handmaids, Clymene and Aethra, wait her silent footsteps to the Scaean gate. There sat the seniors of the Trojan race, Lord Priam's chiefs, and most in Priam's grace, the king, the first, Thamoetes at his side, Lampus and Cletius, long in council tried, Panthus and Hisaktion, once the strong, and next the wisest of the revered throng, Antenor, grave and sage, Ucalagon, leaned on the walls and basked before the sun, chiefs who no more in bloody fights engage, but wise through time and narrative with age, in summer days, like grasshoppers, rejoice a bloodless race that send a feeble voice. These, when the Spartan queen approached the tower, in secret owned resistless beauty's power. They cried, No wonder such celestial charms, for nine long years have set the world in arms. What winning graces, what majestic mien! She moves a goddess, and she looks a queen. Yet hence, O oh heaven, convey that fatal face, and from destruction save the Trojan race." The good old Priam welcomed her, and cried, Approach, my child, and grace thy father's side. She on the plain, thy Grecian spouse, appears, the friends and kindred of thy former years. No crime of thine our present sufferings draws, not thou, but heaven's disposing will, the cause, the gods, these armies, and this force employ. The hostile gods conspire the fate of Troy. But lift thy eye, and say, What Greek! is he, far as from hence these aged orbs can see, around whose brow such martial graces shine, so tall, so awful, and almost divine. Though some of larger stature tread the green, none match his grandeur and exalted mien, he seems a monarch and his country's pride. Thus ceased the king, and thus the fair replied, Before thy presence, father, I appear, with conscious shame and reverential fear. Ah, had I died, ere to these walk I fled, false to my country and my nuptial bed. My brothers, friends, and daughter left behind, false to them all, to Paris only kind. For this I mourn till grief or dire disease shall waste the form whose fault it was to please, 
the king of kings, Atrides, you survey, great in the war and great in arts of sway, my brother once, before my days of shame, and, oh, that still he bore a brother's name. With wonder Priam viewed the godlike man, extolled the happy prince, and thus began, O blessed Atrides, born to prosperous fate, successful monarch of a mighty state, how vast thy empire, of your matchless train, what numbers lost, what numbers yet remain! In Phrygia once were gallant armies known in ancient time, when Otreus filled the throne, when godlike Magdon led their troops of horse, and I, to join them, raised the Trojan force. Against the manlike Amazons we stood, and Sangar's stream ran purple with their blood. But far inferior those in martial grace, and strength of numbers to this Grecian race. This said, once more he viewed the warrior train. What's he whose arms lie scattered on the plain? Broad is his breast, his shoulders larger spread, though great Atrides overtops his head. Nor yet appear his care and conduct small, from rank to rank he moves and orders all. The stately ram thus measures o'er the ground, and master of the flock surveys them round. Then Helen, thus, whom your discerning eyes have singled out, is Ithacus the wise, a barren island boasts his glorious birth, his fame for wisdom fills the spacious earth. Antenor took the word, and thus began. Myself, O king, have seen that wondrous man when, trusting Jove and hospitable laws, to Troy he came to plead the Grecian cause. Great Menelaus urged the same request. My house was honoured with each royal guest. I knew their persons and admired their parts, both brave in arms and both approved in arts. Erect, the Spartan most engaged our view, Ulysses seated, greater reverence drew. When Atreus' son harangued the listening train, just was his sense and his expression plain. His words succinct, yet fool without a fault. He spoke no more than just the thing he ought, but when Ulysses rose, in thought profound, his modest eyes he fixed upon the ground, as one unskilled or dumb he seemed to stand, nor raised his head nor stretched his sceptred hand. But when he speaks what elocution flows, soft as the fleeces of descending snows, the copious accents fall with easy art, melting they fall and sink into their heart, wondering we hear, and fixed in deep surprise our ears refute the censure of our eyes. The king then asked, as yet the camp he viewed, what chief is that, with giant strength endued, whose brawny shoulders and whose swelling chest and lofty stature far exceed the rest? Ajax the Great, the beauteous queen replied, himself a host, the Grecian strength and pride. See, bold Idomeneus, superior towers, amid yon circle of his Cretan powers, great as a god. I saw him once before with Menelaus on the Spartan shore. The rest I know, and could in order name, all valiant chiefs and men of mighty fame. Yet two are wanting of the numerous train, whom long my eyes have sought, but sought in vain. Castor and Pollux, first in martial force, one bold on foot, and one renowned for horse. My brothers these— the same our native shore, one house contained us as one mother bore. Perhaps the chiefs from warlike toils at ease for distant Troy refuse to sail the seas. Perhaps their swords some nobler quarrel draws, ashamed to combat in their sister's cause. So spoke the fair, nor knew her brother's doom, wrapped in the cold embraces of the tomb, adorned with honours in their native shore. Silent they slept, and heard of wars no more. Meantime the heralds, through the crowded town, bring the rich wine and destined victims down. Idaeus arms the golden goblets pressed, who thus the venerable king addressed, Arise, O father of the Trojan state! The nations call thy joyful people wait to seal the truce, and end the dire debate. Paris thy son, and Sparta's king advance in measured lists to toss the weighty lance, and who his rival shall in arms subdue, his be the dame, and his the treasure too. Thus, with a lasting league, our toils may cease, and Troy possess her fertile fields in peace. So shall the Greeks renew their native shore, much famed for generous steeds, for beauty more. With grief he heard, and bade the chiefs prepare to join his milk-white coursers to the car. He mounts the seat, Antenor at his side. The gentle steeds through Scaea's gates they guide. Next from the car, descending on the plain, amid the Grecian host and Trojan train, slow they proceed. The sage Ulysses then arose, and with him rose the king of men. On either side a sacred herald stands. The wine they mix, and on each monarch's hands pour the full urn. Then draw the Grecian lord his cutlass sheathed beside his ponderous sword. From the signed victims crops the curling hair. 
the heralds parted, and the princes share. Then loudly thus before the attentive bands he calls the gods, and spreads his lifted hands. O first and greatest power, whom all obey, who high on Ida's holy mountain sway eternal Jove, a new bright orb that roll from east to west and view from pole to pole, thou mother earth, and all ye living floods, infernal furies, and Tartarian gods, who rule the dead and horrid woes, prepare for perjured kings and all who falsely swear, hear and be witness, if by Paris slain great Menelaus press the fatal plain, the dame and the treasures let the Trojan keep, and Greece returning plough the watery deep, if by my brother's lance the Trojan bleed, be his the wealth and beauteous dame decreed. The appointed fine let Ilion justly pay, and every age record the signal day. This, if the Phrygians shall refuse to yield, arms must revenge, and Mars decide the field. With that the chief the tender victim slew, and in the dust their bleeding bodies threw. The vital spirit issued at the wound, and left the members quivering on the ground. From the same urn they drink the mingled washings to the powers divine, while thus their prayers united mount the sky. Hear, mighty Jove, and hear ye gods on high. And may their blood, who first the league confound, shed like this wine disdain the thirsty ground. May all their consorts serve promiscuous lust, and all their lust be scattered as the dust. Thus either host their imprecations joined, which Jove refused, and mingled with the wind. The rites now finished, revered Priam rose, and thus expressed a heart o'ercharged with woes. Ye Greeks and Trojans, let the chiefs engage, but spare the weakness of my feeble age. In yonder walls that object let me shun, nor view the danger of so dear a son, whose arms shall conquer, and what prince shall fall, heaven only knows, for heaven disposes all. This said, the hoary king no longer stayed, but on his car the slaughtered victims laid, then seized the reins, his gentle steeds to guide, and drove to Troy, Antenor at his side. Bold Hector and Ulysses now dispose the lists of combat, and the ground enclose. Next, to decide by sacred lots, prepare, who first shall launch his pointed spear in air. The people pray with elevated hands, and words like these are heard through all the bands. Immortal Jove, high heaven's superior lord, on lofty Ida's holy mount adored, who e'er involved us in this dire debate, O oh, give that author of the war to fate, and shades eternal let division cease, and joyful nations join in leagues of peace. With eyes averted, Hector hastes to turn the lots of fight, and shakes the brazen urn. Then Paris, thine leaped forth, by fatal chance ordained the first to whirl the weighty lance. Both armies sat the combat to survey. Beside each chief his azure armor lay, and round the lists the generous courses neigh. The beauteous warrior now arrays for fight in gilded arms magnificently bright. The purple coishes clasp his thighs around, with flowers adorned, with silver buckles bound. Lycaon's corslet, his fair body dressed, braced in and fitted to his softer breast, a radiant baldric o'er his shoulder tied, sustained the sword that glittered at his side. His youthful face a polished helm all spread, the waving horsehair nodded on his head. His figured shield a shining orb he takes, and in his hand a pointed javelin shakes, with equal speed and fired by equal charms, the Spartan hero sheathes his limbs in arms. Now round the lists the admiring armies stand, with javelins fixed, the Greek and Trojan band. Amidst the dreadful veil the chiefs advance, all pale with rage, and shake the threatening lance. The Trojan first his shining javelin threw, full on Atrides' ringing shield it flew, nor pierced the brazen orb, but with a bound leaped from the buckler blunted on the ground. Atrides then his massy lance prepares in act to throw, but first prefers his prayers. Give me, great Jove, to punish lawless lust, and lay the Trojan gasping in the dust. Destroy the aggressor, aid my righteous cause, avenge the breach of hospitable laws. Let this example future times reclaim, and guard from wrong fair friendship's holy name. Be said, and poised in air, the javelin sent. Through Paris's shield the forceful weapon went. His corslet pierces, and his garment rends, and glancing downward near his flank descends. The wary Trojan, bending from the blow, eludes the death and disappoints his foe, 
but fierce Atrides waved his sword and struck full on his cask. The crested helmet shook. The brittle steel, unfaithful to his hand, broke short. The fragments glittered on the sand. The raging warrior to the spacious skies raised his upbraiding voice and angry eyes. Then is it vain in Jove himself to trust? And is it thus the gods assist the just? When crimes provoke us, heaven success denies. The dart falls harmless, and the falchion flies. Furious, he said, and towards the Grecian crew, seized by the crest, the unhappy warrior drew. Struggling, he followed, while the embroidered thong that tied his helmet dragged the chief along. Then had his ruin crowned Atrides' joy. But Venus trembled for the prince of Troy. Unseen she came, and burst the golden band, and left an empty helmet in his hand. The cask, enraged amidst the Greeks, he threw. The Greeks with smiles the polished trophy view. Then, as once more he lifts the deadly dart, in thirst of vengeance at his rival's heart, the queen of love her favorite champion shrouds, for gods can all things in a veil of clouds. Raised from the field, the panting youth she led, and gently laid him on the bridal bed with pleasing sweets, his fainting sense renews, and all the dome perfumes with heavenly dews. Meantime the brightest of the female kind, the matchless Helen, o'er the walls reclined. To her, beset with Trojan beauties, came, in borrowed form, the laughter-loving dame. She seemed an ancient maid, well skilled, to cull the snowy fleece, and wind the twisted wool. The goddess softly shook her silken vest, that shed perfumes, and whispering thus addressed, Haste, happy nymph, for thee thy Paris calls, safe from the fight in yonder lofty walls. Fair as a god with odors round him spread, he lies and waits thee on the well-known bed. Not like a warrior parted from the foe, but some gay dancer in the public show. She spoke, and Helen's secret soul was moved. She scorned the champion, but the man she loved, fair Venus's neck, her eyes that sparkled fire, and breast revealed the queen of soft desire. Struck with her presence, straight the lively red forsook her cheek, and trembling thus she said, Then is it still thy pleasure to deceive, and woman's frailty always to believe? Say, to new nations must I cross the main, or carry wars to some soft Asian plain, for whom must Helen break her second vow? What other Paris is thy darling now? Left to Atrides, victor in the strife, an odious conquest, and a captive wife, hence let me sail— and if thy Paris bear my absence ill, let Venus ease his care. A handmaid goddess at his side to wait, renounce the glories of thy heavenly state, be fixed for heir to the Trojan shore, his spouse or slave, and mount the skies no more. For me, to lawless love no longer led, I scorn the coward and detest his bed, else should I merit everlasting shame, and keen reproach from every Phrygian dame. Ill suits it now the joys of love to know, too deep my anguish, and too wild my woe. Then, thus incensed, the Paphian queen replies, Obey the power from whom thy glories rise. Should Venus leave thee, every charm must fly, Fade from thy cheek, and languish in thy eye. Cease to provoke me, lest I make thee more The world's aversion than their love before. Now the bright prize for which mankind engage, Than the sad victim of the public rage. At this the fairest of her sex obeyed, and veiled her blushes in a silken shade, unseen and silent from the train she moves, led by the goddess of the smiles and loves, arrived and entered at the palace gate, the maids officious round their mistress wait, then all dispersing various tasks attend. The queen and goddess to the prince ascend, full on her Paris sight, the queen of love had placed the beauteous progeny of Jove, where, as he viewed her charm, she turned away her glowing eyes, and thus began to say, is this the chief who, lost to sense of shame, late fled the field, and yet survives his fame? Oh, hadst thou died beneath the righteous sword of that brave man whom once I called my lord! The boast of Paris oft desired the day with Sparta's king to meet in single fray. Go now once more, thy rival's rage excite, provoke Atrides, and renew the fight. Yet Helen bids thee stay, lest thou unskilled shouldst fall an easy conquest on the field." The prince replies, Ah, cease, divinely fair, nor add reproaches to the wounds I bear. This day the foe prevailed by Pallas's power. We may yet vanquish in a happier hour. There want not gods to favor us above, but let the business of our life be love. 
these softer moments let delights employ, and kind embraces snatch the hasty joy. Not thus I loved thee when from Sparta's shore my forced, my willing heavenly prize I bore, when first entranced in Cranae's isle I lay, mixed with thy soul, and all dissolved away. Thus, having spoke, the enamoured Phrygian boy rushed to the bed, impatient for the joy. Him Helen followed, slow with bashful charms, and clasped the blooming hero in her arms. While these to love's delicious rapture yield, the stern Atrides rages round the field. So some fell lion whom the woods obey roars through the desert and demands his prey. Paris he seeks, impatient to destroy, but seeks in vain along the troops of Troy. Even those had yielded to a foe so brave, the recreant warrior hateful as the grave. Then speaking thus the king of kings arose, Ye Trojans, Dardans, all our generous foes, here and attest from heaven with conquest crowned, our brothers' arms the just success have found. Be therefore now the Spartan wealth restored. Let Argive Helen own her lawful lord. The appointed fine let Ilion justly pay, and age to age record this signal day. He ceased. The army's loud applauses rise, and the long shout runs echoing through the skies. The end of Book Three of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope, read by Rick Kistner, for it to go on the web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book Four, Argument, The Breach of the Truce, and the First Battle. The gods deliberate in council concerning the Trojan War. They agree upon the continuation of it, and Jupiter sends down Minerva to break the truce. She persuades Pandarus to aim an arrow at Menelaus, who is wounded, but cured by Machaon. In the meantime, some of the Trojan troops attack the Greeks. Agamemnon is distinguished in all the parts of a good general. He reviews the troops and exhorts the leaders, some by praises and others by reproof. Nestor is particularly celebrated for his military discipline. The battle joins and great numbers are slain on both sides. The same day continues through this as through the last book, as it does almost through the following two, and almost to the end of the seventh book. The scene is wholly in the field before Troy. And now Olympus' shining gates unfold, the gods with Jove assume their thrones of gold. Immortal Hebe, fresh with bloom divine, the golden goblet crowns with purple wine, while the full bowls flow round, the powers enjoy their careful eyes on long-contended Troy. When Jove, disposed to tempt Saturnia's spleen, thus waked the fury of his partial queen, Two powers divine the son of Atreus' aid, imperial Juno, and the martial maid. But high in heaven they sit and gaze from far, the tame spectators of his deeds of war. Not thus fair Venus helps her favoured knight. The queen of pleasures shares the toils of fight. Each danger wards in constant inner care, saves in the moment of the last despair. Her act has rescued Paris' forfeit life, though great Atrides gained the glorious strife. Then, say ye powers, what signal issue waits to crown this deed, and finish all the fates? Shall heaven by peace the bleeding kingdom spare, or rouse the furies and awake the war? Yet would the gods, for human good provide, Atrides soon might gain his beauteous bride. Still, Priam's walls in peaceful honours grow, and through his gates the crowding nations flow. Thus, while he spoke, the queen of heaven enraged, and queen of war in close consult engaged, Apart they sit, their deep designs employ, and meditate the future woes of Troy. Though secret anger swelled Minerva's breast, the prudent goddess yet her wrath suppressed. But Juno, impotent of passion, broke her sullen silence, and with fury spoke. Shall then, O tyrant of the ethereal reign, my schemes, my labours, and my hopes be vain? Have I, for this, shook Ilion with alarms, assembled nations, set two worlds in arms? To spread the war I flew from shore to shore, the immortal courses scarce the labour bore. At length ripe vengeance o'er their heads impends, but Jove himself the faithless race defends. Loathe as thou art to punish lawless lust, not all the gods are partial and unjust. The sire whose thunder shakes the cloudy skies sighs from his inmost soul and thus replies, O oh, lasting rancour, O oh, insatiate hate to Phrygia's monarch and the Phrygian state! 
What high offence has fired the wife of Jove? Can wretched mortals harm the powers above, that Troy, and Troy's whole race, thou wouldst confound, and yon fair structures level with the ground? Haste, leave the skies, fulfill thy stern desire, burst all her gates, and wrap her walls in fire. Let Priam bleed, if yet you thirst for more, bleed all his sons, and Ilion float with gore. To boundless vengeance the wide realm be given, till vast destruction glut the queen of heaven. So let it be, and Jove his peace enjoy, when heaven no longer hears the name of Troy. But should this arm prepare to wreak our hate on thy loved realms, whose guilt demands their fate, presume not thou the lifted bolt to stay. Remember Troy, and give the vengeance way, for know of all the numerous towns that rise beneath the rolling sun and starry skies, which gods have raised or earth-born men enjoy, none stands so dear to Jove as sacred Troy. No mortals merit more distinguished grace than godlike Priam, or than Priam's race. Still to our name their hecatombs expire, and altars blaze with unextinguished fire. At this the goddess rolled her radiant eyes, then on the thunderer fixed them, and replies, Three towns are Juno's on the Grecian plains, more dear than all the extended earth contains, Mycenae, Argos, and the Spartan wall. These thou mayest raise, nor I forbid their fall. Tis not in me the vengeance to remove, the crimes sufficient that they share my love. Of power superior, why should I complain? Resent I may, but must resent in vain. Yet some distinction Juno might require, sprung with thyself from one celestial sire, a goddess born, to share the realms above, and styled the consort of the thundering Jove. Nor thou our wife and sister's right deny. Let both consent, and both by terms comply. So shall the gods our joint decrees obey, and heaven shall act as we direct the way. See, ready, Pallas, waits thy high commands to raise in arms the Greek and Phrygian bands. Their sudden friendship by her arts may cease, and the proud Trojans first infringe the peace. The sire of men and monarch of the sky, the advice approved and bade Minerva fly, Dissolve the league, and all her arts employ to make the breach the faithless act of Troy. Fired with the charge, she headlong urged her flight, and shot like lightning from Olympus height. As the red comet from Saturnius send to fright the nations with a dire portent, a fatal sign to armies on the plain, or trembling sailors on the wintry main, with sweeping glories glides along in air, and shakes the sparkles from its blazing hair, between both armies thus, in open sight, shot the bright goddess in a trail of light. With eyes erect, the gazing hosts admire the power descending, and the heavens on fire. The gods, they cried, the gods this signal sent, and fate now labors with some vast event. Jove seals the league, or bloodier scenes prepares, Jove the great arbiter of peace and wars. They said, while Pallas through the Trojan throng, in shape a mortal, passed, disguised along, like bold Laodocus, her course she bent, who from Anator traced his high descent. Amidst the ranks, Lycaon's son, she found the warlike Pandarus for strength renowned, whose squadrons, led from black Asipus' flood, with flaming shields in martial circle stood. To him the goddess. Phrygian, canst thou hear a well-timed counsel with a willing ear? What praise were thine couldst thou direct thy dot amidst his triumph to the Spartan's heart? What gifts from Troy, from Paris, wouldst thou gain, thy country's foe, the Grecian glory slain? Then seize the occasion, dare the mighty deed, aim at his breast, and may that aim succeed. But first, to speed the shaft, address thy vow to Lycian Phoebus with the silver bow, and swear the firstlings of thy flock to pay on Zelia's altars to the god of day. He heard, and madly at the motion pleased, his polished bow with hasty rashness seized. T'was formed of horn and smoothed with artful toil. A mountain goat resigned the shining spoil. Who pierced long since beneath his arrows bled, the stately quarry on the cliffs lay dead, and sixteen palms his brow's large honours spread. The workmen joined and shaped the bended horns, and beaten gold each taper point adorns. This, by the Greeks unseen, the warrior bends, screened by the shields of his surrounding friends. There meditates the mark, and couching low, fits the sharp arrow to the well-strung bow. One from a hundred feathered deaths he chose, fated to wound and cause of future woes. 
than offers vows with hecatombs to crown Apollo's altars in his native town. Now with full force the yielding horn he bends, drawn to an arch, and joins the doubling ends. Close to his breast he strains the nerve below till the barbed points approach the circling bow. The impatient weapon whizzes on the wing, sounds the tough horn, and twangs the quivering string. But thee, Atrides, in that dangerous hour the gods forget not, nor thy guardian power Pallas assists, and weakened, in its force, diverts the weapon from its destined course. So from her babe, when slumber seals his eye, the watchful mother wafts the envenomed fly, just where his belt with golden buckles joined, where linen folds the double corslet lined, she turned the shaft, which, hissing from above, passed the broad belt, and through the corslet drove. The folds it pierced, the plated linen tore, and raised the skin, and drew the purple gore. As when some stately trappings are decreed to grace a monarch on his bounding steed, a nymph and carrier or maonia bred stains the pure ivory with a lively red. With equal lustre various colours vie, the shining whiteness and the Tyrian dye. So, great Atrides, showed thy sacred blood, as down thy snowy thigh distilled the streaming flood. With horror seized the king of men, descried the shaft infixed, and saw the gushing tide. Nor less the Spartan feared before he found the shining bob appear above the wound. Then with a sigh that heaved his manly breast, the royal brother thus his grief expressed, and grasped his hand while all the Greeks around with answering sighs returned the plaintive sound. O oh, dearest life, did I for this agree the solemn truce, a fatal truce to thee? Wert thou exposed to all the hostile train, to fight for Greece and conquer to be slain? The race of Trojans in thy ruin join, and faith is scorned by all the perjured line. Not thus our vows confirmed with wine and gore, those hands we plighted, and those oaths we swore, shall all be vain. When heaven's revenge is slow, Jove but prepares to strike the fiercer blow. The day shall come, that great avenging day, when Troy's proud glories in the dust shall lay, when Priam's powers and Priam's self shall fall, and one prodigious ruin swallow all. I see the god already, from the pole bear his red arm, and bid the thunder roll. I see the Eternal, all his fury shed, and shake his aegis over their guilty head. Such mighty woes on perjured princes wait, but thou, alas, deservest a happier fate. Still must I mourn the period of thy days, and only mourn without my share of praise. Deprived of thee, the heartless Greeks no more shall dream of conquests on the hostile shore. Troy, seized of Helen, and our glory lost, thy bones shall moulder on a foreign coast, while some Proud Trojan thus insulting cries, and spurns the dust where Menelaus lies. Such are the trophies Greece from Ilion brings, and such the conquest of her king of kings. Lo, his proud vessel scattered o'er the main, and unrevenged his mighty brother slain. O, oh, ere that dire disgrace shall blast my fame, o'erwhelm me earth, and hide a monarch's shame. He said, a leader's and a brother's fears possess his soul, which thus the Spartan cheers. Let not thy words the warmth of Greece abate. The feeble dart is guiltless of my fate. Stiff, with a rich embroidered work around, my varied belt repelled the flying wound. To whom the king, my brother and my friend, thus, always thus, may heaven thy life defend. Now seek some skilful hand whose powerful art may staunch the effusion and extract the dart. Herald, be swift, and bid Maxion bring his speedy succor to the Spartan king, pierced with a winged shaft the deed of Troy, the Grecian's sorrow and the Dardan's joy. With hasty zeal the swift Talthibius flies, through the thick files he darts his searching eyes, and finds Maxion, where sublime he stands, in arms encircled with his native bands. Then thus, Maxion, to the king repair, his wounded brother claims thy timely care, pierced by some Lycian or Dardanian bow, a grief to us, a triumph to the foe. The heavy tidings grieved the godlike man. Swift to his succour through the ranks he ran. The dauntless king yet standing firm he found, and all the chiefs in deep concern around, where, to the steely point, the reed was joined. The shaft he drew, but left the head behind. Straight the broad belt, with gay embroidery graced, he loosed the corslet from his breast, unbraced, then sucked the blood, and sovereign balm infused, which Chiron gave, and Aesculapius used. 
where round the prince the Greeks employ their care. The Trojans rush tumultuous to the war. Once more they glitter in refulgent arms. Once more the fields are filled with dire alarms. Nor had you seen the king of men appear, confused, unactive, or surprised with fear, but fond of glory with severe delight. His beating bosom claimed the rising fight. No longer with his warlike steeds he stayed, or pressed the car with polished brass inlaid, but left Eurymedon on the reins to guide. The fiery courses snorted at his side. On foot through all the martial ranks he moves, and these encourages and those reproves. Brave men, he cries, to such who boldly dare urge their swift steeds to face the coming war. Your ancient valor on the foes approve. Jove is with Greece, and let us trust in Jove. Tis not for us but guilty Troy to dread, whose crimes sit heavy on her perjured head. Her sons and matrons Greece shall lead in chains, and her dead warriors strew the mournful plains. Thus, with new ardor, he the brave inspires, or thus the fearful with reproach fires. Shame to your country, scandal of your kind, born to the fate ye well deserve to find. Why stand ye gazing round the dreadful plain, prepared for flight but doomed to fly in vain? Confused and panting thus the hunted deer falls as he flies, a victim to his fear. Still must ye wait the foes, and still retire, till yon tall vessels blaze with Trojan fire? Or trust ye, Jove, a valiant foe shall chase, to save a trembling, heartless, dastard race? This said, he stalked with ample strides along, to Crete's brave monarch and his martial throng. High at their head he saw the chief appear, and bold Mariones excite the rear. At this the king his generous joy expressed, and clasped the warrior to his armed breast. Divine Idomeneus, what thanks we owe to worth like thine? What praise shall we bestow? To thee the foremost honors are decreed, first in the fight and every graceful deed, for this in banquets when the generous bowls restore our blood and raise the warriors' souls, though all the rest with stated rules we bound unmixed, unmeasured, are thy goblets crowned. Be still thyself in arms a mighty name. Maintain thy honors and enlarge thy fame. To whom the Cretan thus his speech addressed, Secure of me, O king, exhort the rest, fixed to thy side in every toil I share, thy firm associate in the day of war. But let the signal be this moment given, to mix in fight is all I ask of heaven. The field shall prove how perjuries succeed, and chains or death avenge the impious deed. Charmed with this heat, the king his course pursues, and next the troops of either Ajax views, in one firm orb the bands were ranged around, a cloud of heroes blackened all the ground. Thus from the lofty promontory's brow a swain surveys the gathering storm below. Slow from the main the heavy vapours rise, spread in dim streams and sail along the skies, till black as night the swelling tempest shows. The cloud, condensing as the west wind blows, he dreads the impending storm and drives his flock to the close covert of an arching rock. Such, and so thick the embattled squadron stood, with spears erect, a moving ironwood, a shady light was shot from glimmering shields, and their brown arms obscured the dusky fields. O oh, heroes, worthy such a dauntless train, whose godlike virtue we but urge in vain, exclaimed the king, who raise your eager bands with great examples more than loud commands. Ah, would the gods but breathe in all the rest, such souls as burn in your exalted breast. Soon should our arms with just success be crowned, and Troy's proud walls lie smoking on the ground. Then to the next the general bends his course, his heart exults, and glories in his force. There revered Nestor ranks his Pylian bands, and with inspiring eloquence commands, with strictest order sets his train in arms, the chief's advises, and the soldier's warms. Alastor, Chromius, Haman, round him wait, Bias the good, and Pelagon the great the horse and chariots to the front assigned, the foot, the strength of war, he ranged behind. The middle space suspected troops supply, enclosed by both, nor let the powers to fly, he gives command to curb the fiery steed, nor cause confusion, nor the ranks exceed. Before the rest let none too rashly ride, no strength, nor skill, but just in time be tried. The charge once made, no warrior turn the rein, but fight or fall a firm embodied train. He, whom the fortune of the field shall cast, from forth his chariot mount the next in haste, nor seek unpractised to direct the car, content with javelins to provoke the war. Our great forefathers held this prudent course, thus ruled their ardor, thus preserved their force. By laws like these immortal conquests made, and earth's proud tyrants low in ashes laid. 
So spoke the master of the martial art, and touched with transport great Atreides' heart. Oh, hadst thou strength to match thy brave desires, and nerves to second what thy soul inspires, but, wasting years that wither human race, exhaust thy spirits, and thy arms unbrace. What once thou wert, O ever mightest thou be, and age the lot of any chief but thee. Thus to the experienced prince Atreides cried, he shook his hoary locks, and thus replied, Well might I wish, could mortal wish renew, that strength which once in boiling youth I knew, such as I was when Eruthalion, slain beneath this arm, fell prostrate on the plain. But heaven its gifts not all at once bestows, these years with wisdom crowns, with action those. The field of combat fits the young and bold, the solemn counsel best becomes the old. To you the glorious conflict I resign, let sage advice the palm of age be mine." He said, with joy the monarch marched before, and found Menestheus on the dusty shore, with whom the firm Athenian phalanx stands, and next Ulysses with his subject bands. Remote their forces lay, nor knew so far the peace infringed, nor heard the sound of war. The tumult late begun, they stood intent to watch the motion dubious of the event. The king, who saw their squadrons yet unmoved, with hasty ardour thus the chiefs reproved. Can Pleus' son forget a warrior's part? and fears Ulysses, skilled in every art? Why stand you distant, and the rest expect to mix in combat which yourselves neglect? From you t'was hoped among the first to dare the shock of armies, and commence the war. For this your names are called before the rest, to share the pleasures of the genial feast, and can you, chiefs, without a blush, survey whole troops before you, laboring in the fray? Say, is it thus those honors you requite, the first in banquets, but the last in fight? Ulysses heard, the hero's warmth o'erspread his cheek with blushes, and severe he said, Take back the unjust reproach. Behold, we stand sheathed in bright arms, but expect command. If glorious deeds afford thy soul delight, behold me plunging in the thickest fight. Then give thy warrior chief a warrior's due. Who dares to act whate'er thou darest to view? Struck with his generous wrath, the king replies, O oh, great in action and in counsel wise, with ours thy care and ardor are the same, nor need I to commend nor ought to blame, sage as thou art, and learned in humankind. Forgive the transport of a martial mind, haste to the fight, secure of just amends, the gods that make shall keep the worthy friends. He said and passed where great Tydides lie, his steeds and chariots wedged in firm array, the warlike Sthenelus attends his side, to whom with stern reproach the monarch cried, O son of Tydeus, he whose strength could tame the bounding steed in arms a mighty name. Canst thou remote the mingling hosts descry, with hands unactive and a careless eye? Not thus thy sire the fierce encounter feared. Still first in front the matchless prince appeared. What glorious toils, what wonders they recite, who viewed him laboring through the ranks of fight. I saw him once when gathering martial powers, a peaceful guest, he sought Mycenae's towers. Armies he asked, and armies had been given. Not we denied, but Jove forbade from heaven, while dreadful comets glaring from afar forewarned the horrors of the Theban war. Next, sent by Greece from where Aesopus flows, a fearless envoy, he approached the foes. Thebes' hostile walls unguarded and alone, dauntless he enters and demands the throne. The tyrant feasting with his chiefs he found, and dared to combat all those chiefs around, dared and subdued before their haughty lord, for Pallas strung his arm and edged his sword, stung with the shame within the winding way, to bar his passage fifty warriors lay. Two heroes led the secret squadron on, Mason the Fierce and Hardy Lycophon. Those fifty slaughtered in the gloomy vale, he spared but one to bear the dreadful tale. Such Tadeus was, and such his martial fire. Gods, how the sun degenerates from the sire! No words the godlike Diomed returned, but heard, respectful, and in secret burned. Not so fierce, Capaneus, undaunted son, stern as his sire, the boaster thus begun. What needs, O monarch, this invidious praise? Ourselves to lessen, while our sire you raise? Dare to be just, Atreides, and confess our value equal, though our fury less. With fewer troops we stormed the Theban wall, and happier saw the sevenfold city fall. In impious acts the guilty father died, the son subdued, for heaven was on their side. Far more than heirs of all our parents' fame, our glories darken their diminished name. To him, Titides thus, My friend, forbear, suppress thy passion and the king revere. His high concern may well excuse this rage whose cause we follow, 
and whose war we wage. His the first praise were Ilion's towers o'erthrown, and if we fail, the chief disgrace his own. Let him, the Greeks, to hardy toils excite. Tis ours to labour in the glorious fight. He spoke, and ardent on the trembling ground sprung from his car. His ringing arms resound. Dire was the clang, and dreadful from afar of armed Tydides rushing to the war, as when the winds ascending by degrees first move the whitening surface of the seas. The billows float in order to the shore. The wave behind rolls on the wave before, till with the growing storm the deeps arise, foam o'er the rocks, and thunder to the skies. So to the fight the thick battalions throng. Shields urged on shields, and men drove men along, sedate and silent move the numerous bands, no sound, no whisper, but the chief's commands. Those only heard with awe the rest obey, as if some god had snatched their voice away. Not so the Trojans, from their host ascends a general shout that all the region rends, as when the fleecy flocks unnumbered stand in wealthy folds and wait the milker's hand. The hollow veils incessant bleating fiddles, the lambs reply from all the neighbouring hills. Such clamours rose from various nations round, mixed was the murmur, and confused the sound. Each host now joins, and each a god inspires. These Mars incites, and those Minerva fires. Pale flight around, and dreadful terror reign, and discord raging bathes the purple plain. Discord, dire sister of the slaughtering power, small at her birth but rising every hour, while scarce the skies her horrid head can bound, she stalks on earth and shakes the world around. The nations bleed, where e'er her steps she turns, the groan still deepens, and the combat burns. Now, shield with shield, with helmet, helmet closed, to armor, armor, lance to lance opposed, host against host with shadowy squadrons drew, the sounding darts in iron tempests flew, victors and vanquished joined promiscuous cries, and shrilling shouts and dying groans arise, with streaming blood the slippery fields are dyed, and slaughtered heroes swell the dreadful tide, as torrents roll increased by numerous rills, with rage impetuous down their echoing hills, rushed to the vales, and poured along the plain, roar through a thousand channels to the main, the distant shepherd trembling hears the sound, so mix both hosts, and so their cries rebound. The bold Antilochus the slaughter led, the first who struck a valiant Trojan dead. At great Acapolis the lance arrives, raised his high crest, and through his helmet drives. Warmed in the brain the brazen weapon lies, and shades eternal settle o'er his eyes. So sinks a tower that long assaults had stood of force and fire, its walls besmeared with blood. Him, the bold leader of the Bantian throng, seized to despoil and drag the corpse along, but while he strove to tug the inserted dart, Agenor's javelin reached the hero's heart. His flank, unguarded by his ample shield, admits the lance. He falls and spurns the field. The nerves, unbraced, support his limbs no more. The soul comes floating in a tide of gore. Trojans and Greeks now gather round the slain. The war renews. The warriors bleed again. As o'er their prey rapacious wolves engage, man dies on man, and all is blood and rage. In blooming youth, fair Samosius fell, sent by great Ajax to the shades of hell. Fair Samosius, whom his mother bore amid the flocks on silver Samoy's shore, the nymph descending from the hills of Ide, to seek her parents on his flowery side, brought forth the babe, their common care and joy, and thence from Samoy's named the lovely boy. Short was his date, by dreadful Ajax slain, he falls and renders all their cares in vain. So falls a poplar that in watery ground raised high the head with stately branches crowned, felled by some artist with his shining steel to shape the circle of the bending wheel. Cut down it lies, tall, smooth, and largely spread, with all its beauteous honors on its head. There, left a subject to the wind and rain, and scorched by suns, it withers on the plain. Thus, pierced by Ajax, Samoysius lies stretched on the shore, and thus neglected dies. At Ajax, Antiphus, his javelin threw, the pointed lance with erring fury flew, and Leucus, loved by wise Ulysses, slew. He drops the corpse of Samoysius slain, and sinks a breathless carcass on the plain. This saw Ulysses, and with grief enraged, strode where the foremost of the foes engaged, armed with a spear, he meditates the wound in act to throw, but cautious looked around, struck at his sight the Trojans backward drew, and trembling heard the javelin as it flew. A chief stood nigh, who from Abydos came, old Priam's son, Democoon was his name. The weapon entered close above his ear, cold, 
Through his temples glides the whizzing spear. With piercing shrieks the youth resigns his breath, his eyeballs darken with the shades of death. Ponderous he falls, his clanging arms resound, and his broad buckler rings against the ground. Seized with affright, the boldest foes appear. E'en godlike Hector seems himself to fear. Slow he gave way, the rest tumultuous fled. The Greeks with shouts press on and spoil the dead. But Phoebus, now from Ilion's towering height, shines forth revealed and animates the fight. Trojans, be bold and force with force oppose. Your foaming steeds urge headlong on the foes, nor are their bodies rocks nor ribbed with steel. Your weapons enter and your strokes they feel. Have ye forgot what seemed your dread before? The great, the fierce Achilles, fights no more. Apollo, thus from Ilion's lofty towers, arrayed in terrors, roused the Trojan powers, while war's fierce goddess fires the Grecian foe, and shouts and thunders in the fields below. Then great Diores fell, by doom divine in vain his valour and illustrious line. A broken rock, the force of Pyrrhus threw, who from cold Aenus led the Thracian crew, full on his ankle dropped the ponderous stone, burst the strong nerves, and crashed the solid bone. Supine he tumbles on the crimson sands, before his helpless friends and native bands, and spreads for aid his unavailing hands. The foe rushed furious as he pants for breath, and through his navel drove the pointed death. His gushing entrails smoked upon the ground, and the warm life came issuing from the wound. His lance, bold Thoas, at the conqueror sent, deep in his breast above the papet went, amid the lungs was fixed the winged wood, and quivering in his heaving bosom stood, till from the dying chief approaching near, the Aetolian warrior tugged his weighty spear, then sudden waved his flaming falchion round, and gashed his belly with a ghastly wound. The corpse, now breathless on the bloody plain, to spoil his arms the victor strove in vain. The Thracian bands against the victor pressed, a grove of lances glittered at his breast. Stern Thoas, glaring with revengeful eyes, in solemn fury slowly quits the prize. Thus fell two heroes, one the pride of Thrace, and one the leader of the Epian race. Death's sable shade at once o'ercast their eyes, in dust the vanquished and the victor lies, with copious slaughter all the fields are red, and heaped with growing mountains of the dead. Had some brave chief this martial scene beheld, by Pallas guarded through the dreadful field, might darts be bid to turn their points away, and wounds around him innocently play. The war's whole art, with wonder had he seen, and counted heroes where he counted men. So fought each host, with thirst of glory fired, and crowds on crowds triumphantly expired. The end of Book Four of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book Five, Argument, the Acts of Diomed. Diomed, assisted by Pallas, performs wonders in this day's battle. Pandarus wounds him with an arrow, but the goddess cures him, enables him to discern gods from mortals, and prohibits him from contending with any of the former, excepting Venus. Aeneas joins Pandarus to oppose him. Pandarus is killed, and Aeneas in great danger, but for the assistance of Venus, who, as she is removing her son from the fight, is wounded on the hand by Diomed. Apollo seconds her in his rescue, and at length carries off Aeneas to Troy, where he is healed in the temple of Pergamus. Mars rallies the Trojans, and assists Hector to make a stand. In the meantime, Aeneas is restored to the field, and they overthrow several of the Greeks. Among the rest, Tipolemus is slain by Sarpedon. Juno and Minerva descend to resist Mars. The latter incites Diomed to go against that god. He wounds him and sends him groaning to heaven. The first battle continues through this book. The scene is the same as in the former. But Pallas now, Tydides' soul inspires, fills with her force and warms with all her fires, above the Greeks his deathless fame to raise and crown her hero with distinguished praise. High on his helm celestial lightnings play, his beamy shield emits a living ray, the unwearied blaze incessant streams supplies, like the red star that fires the autumnal skies. When, fresh, he rears his radiant orb to sight, 
and bathed in ocean, shoots a keener light. Such glory's palace on the chief bestowed, such from his arms the fierce effulgence flowed. Onward she drives him, furious to engage, where the fight burns, and where the thickest rage. The sons of Darius first the combat sought, a wealthy priest, but rich without a fault. In Vulcan's fane the father's days were led, the sons to toils of glorious battle bred. These, singled from their troops, the fight maintained, these from their steeds, Tydides on the plain. Fierce for renown, the brother chiefs draw near, and first, bold Phagius casts his sounding spear, which o'er the warrior's shoulder took its course, and spent in empty air its erring force. Not so Tydides flew thy lance in vain, but pierced his breast and stretched him on the plain. Seized with unusual fear, Odeus fled, left the rich chariot and his brother dead, and had not Vulcan lent celestial aid, he too had sunk to death's eternal shade. But in a smoky cloud the god of fire preserved the sun in pity to the sire. The steeds and chariot to the navy led increased the spoils of gallant Diomed. Struck with amaze and shame, the Trojan crew, or slain or fled the sons of Darius view, when by the blood-stained hand Minerva pressed the god of battles in this speech addressed. Stern power of war, by whom the mighty fall, who bathe in blood and shake the lofty wall, let the brave chiefs their glorious toils divide, and whose the conquest mighty Jove decide, while we from interdicted fields retire, nor tempt the wrath of heaven's avenging sire. Her words allay the impetuous warrior's heat. The god of arms and martial made retreat. Removed from fight on Xanthus' flowery bounds, they sat and listened to the dying sounds. Meantime, the Greeks the Trojan race pursue, and some bold chieftain every leader slew. First Odeus falls and bites the bloody sand, his death ennobled by Atrides' hand. As he to flight his wheeling car addressed, the speedy javelin drove from back to breast. In dust the mighty Halizonian lay. His arms resound, the spirit wings its way. Thy fate was next, O Phaestus, doomed to feel the great Adumenianus potended steel, whom Borus sent his son and only joy from fruitful tarny to the fields of Troy. The Cretan javelin reached him from afar and pierced his shoulder as he mounts his car. Back from the car he tumbles to the ground and everlasting shades his eyes surround. Then died Scamandrius, expert in the chase, in woods and wilds to wound the savage race. Diana taught him all her sylvan arts, to bend the bow and aim on erring darts. But vainly here Diana's arts he tries. The fatal lance arrests him as he flies. From Menelaus' arm the weapon sent, through his broad back and heaving bosom went. Down sinks the warrior with a thundering sound, his brazen armor rings against the ground. Next, artful Phariclus untimely fell. Bold Marion sent him to the realms of hell. Thy father's skill, O Phariclus, was thine, the graceful fabric and the fair design, for loved by Pallas, Pallas did impart to him the shipwrights and the builder's art. Beneath his hand the fleet of Paris rose, the fatal cause of all his country's woes. But he, the mystic will of heaven unknown, nor saw his country's peril, nor his own. The hapless artist, while confused, he fled, the spear of Marion mingled with the dead. Through his right hip, with forceful fury cast, between the bladder and the bone it passed. Prone on his knees he falls with fruitless cries, and death in lasting slumber seals his eyes. From Magus' force the swift Pideus fled, Antinor's offspring from a foreign bed, whose generous spouse, Theanor, heavenly fair, nursed the young stranger with a mother's care. How vain those cares! When Magus in the rear, full in his nape, infixed the fatal spear, swift through his crackling jaws the weapon glides, and the cold tongue and grinning teeth divides. Then died Hypsenor, generous and divine, sprung from the brave Dolopian's mighty line, who near adored Scamander made abode priest of the stream, and honoured as a god. On him amidst the flying numbers found, Eurypolis inflicts a deadly wound. On his broad shoulders fell the forceful brand, thence, glancing downwards, lopped his holy hand, which stained with sacred blood the blushing sand. Down sunk the priest, the purple hand of death closed his dim eye, and fate suppressed his breath. Thus toiled the chiefs in different parts engaged, in every quarter fierce Tydides raged. Amid the Greek, amid the Trojan train, wrapped through the ranks, he thunders o'er the plain. Now here, now there, he darts from place to place, pours on the rear, or lightens in their face. Thus from high hills, 
The torrents swift and strong deluge whole fields and sweep the trees along. Through ruin moles the rushing wave resounds, o'erwhelms the bridge and bursts the lofty bounds, the yellow harvests of the ripened year, and flattered vineyards one sad waste appear. While Jove descends in sluicy sheets of rain, and all the labours of mankind are vain, so raged Tydides, boundless in his ire, drove armies back and made all Troy retire. With grief the leader of the Lycian band saw the wide waste of his destructive hand. His bended bow against the chief he drew, swift to the mark the thirsty arrow flew, whose forky point the hollow breastplate tore, deep in his shoulder pierced and drank the gore. The rushing stream, his brazen armor died, while the proud archer, thus exulting, cried, Hither, ye Trojans, hither drive your steeds, lo, by our hand the bravest Grecian bleeds. Not long the deathful dart he can sustain, or Phoebus urged me to these fields in vain. So spoke he, boastful, but the winged dart stopped short of life and mocked the shooter's art. The wounded chief behind his car retired, the helping hand of Sthenelus required. Swift from his seat he leaped upon the ground, and tugged the weapon from the gushing wound, when thus the king his guardian power addressed, the purple current wandering o'er his vest. O progeny of Jove, unconquered maid, if e'er my godlike sire deserved thy aid, if e'er I felt thee in the fighting field, now, goddess, now thy sacred succor yield. O give my lance to reach the Trojan knight, whose arrow wounds the chief thou goddest in fight, and lay the boaster groveling on the shore, that vaunts these eyes shall view the light no more. Thus prayed Tydides, and Minerva heard, his nerves confirmed, his languid spirits cheered, he feels each limb with wanted vigour light, his beating bosom claimed the promised fight. Be bold, she cried, in every combat shine, war be thy province, thy protection mine, rush to the fight, and every foe control, wake each paternal virtue in thy soul, strength swells thy boiling breast infused by me, and all thy godlike father breathes in thee, yet more... From mortal mists I purge thy eyes, and set to view the warring deities. These see thou shun through all the embattled plain, nor rashly strive where human force is vain. If Venus mingle in the martial band, her shalt thou wound, so Pallas gives command. With that the blue-eyed virgin winged her flight. The hero rushed impetuous to the fight, with tenfold ardour now invades the plain, wild with delay, and more enraged by pain, as on the fleecy locks, when hunger calls, amidst the field a brindled lion falls. If chance some shepherd with a distant dart, the savage wound he rouses at the smart, he foams, he roars, the shepherd dares not stay, but trembling leaves the scattering flocks a prey. Heaps fall on heaps, he bathes with blood the ground, then leaps victorious o'er the lofty mound. Not with less fury stern Tydides flew, and two brave leaders at an instant slew. Astinus breathless fell, and by his side his people's past a good Hypenor died. Astinus breast the deadly lance receives, Hypenor's shoulder his broad falchion cleaves. Those slain he left, and sprung with noble rage, Abbas and Polyidus, to engage, sons of Eurydimus, who wise and old could fate foresee and mystic dreams unfold. The youths returned not from the doubtful plain, and the sad father tried his arts in vain. No mystic dream could make their fates appear, though now determined by Tydides' spear. Young Xanthus next, and Thune felt his rage, the joy and hope of Phanop's feeble age. Vast was his wealth, and these the only heirs of all his labours and a life of cares. Cold death all takes them in their blooming years, and leaves the father unavailing tears. To strangers now descends his heapy store, the race forgotten, and the name no more. Two sons of Priam in one chariot ride, glittering in arms and combat, side by side, as when the lordly lion seeks his food, where grazing heifers range the lonely wood, he leaps amidst them with a furious bound, bends their strong necks and tears them to the ground. So from their seats the brother chiefs are torn, their steeds and chariot to the navy borne. With deep concern divine Aeneas viewed the foe prevailing, and his friends pursued. Through the thick storm of singing, spears he flies, exploring Pandarus with careful eyes. At length he found Lycaon's mighty son, to whom the chief of Venus' race begun. Where, Pandarus, are all thy honours now, thy winged arrows and unerring bow, thy matchless skill, thy yet unrivalled fame? 
and boasted glory of the Lycian name? Oh, pierce that mortal, if we mortal call, that wondrous force by which whole armies fall, or God incensed who quits the distant skies to punish Troy for slighted sacrifice, which, oh, avert from our unhappy state, for what so dreadful as celestial hate, who e'er he be, propitiate Jove with prayer, if man destroy, if God entreat to spare. To him, the Lycian, whom your eyes behold, if right I judge, is Diomed the bold, such courses whirl him o'er the dusty field, so towers his helmet, and so flames his shield. If tis a god, he wears that chief's disguise, or if that chief some guardian of the skies involved in clouds protects him in the fray, and turns unseen the frustrate dart away, I winged an arrow, which not idly fell, the stroke had fixed him to the gates of hell, and but some god, some angry god withstands, his fate was due to these unerring hands. Skilled in the bow, on foot I sought the war, nor joined swift horses to the rapid car. Ten polished chariots I possessed at home, and still they grace Lacaon's princely dome. There, veiled in spacious coverlets, they stand, and twice ten courses wait their lord's command. The good old warrior bade me trust to these when first for Troy I sailed the sacred seas, in fields aloft the whirling car to guide, and through the ranks of death triumphant ride. But vain, with youth, and yet to thrift inclined, I heard his counsels with unheedful mind, and thought the steeds, your large supplies unknown, might fail of forage in the straitened town, so took my bow and pointed darts in hand, and left the chariots in my native land. Too late, O oh friend, my rashness I deplore, these shafts once fatal carry death no more. Tadius and Atreus' sons their points have found, and undissembled gore pursued the wound. In vain they bleed, this unavailing bow serves not to slaughter, but provoke the foe. In evil hour these bended horns I strung, and seized the quiver where it idly hung. Cursed be the fate that sent me to the field without a warrior's arms, the spear and shield. If e'er with life I quit the Trojan plain, if e'er I see my spouse and sire again, this bow, unfaithful to my glorious aims, broke by my hand, shall feed the blazing flames. To whom the leader of the Dardan race, be calm, nor Phoebus' honoured gift disgrace, the distant dart be praised, though here we need the rushing chariot and the bounding steed. Against yon hero let us bend our course, and hand to hand encounter force with force. Now mount my seat, and from the chariot's height observe my father's steeds renowned in flight, practised alike to turn, to stop, to chase, to dare the shock, or urge the rapid pace, secure with these through fighting fields we go, or safe to Troy if Jove assists the foe. Haste, seize the whip, and snatch the guiding rein. The warrior's fury let this arm sustain, or if to combat thy bold heart incline, take thou the spear, the chariot's care be mine. O prince, Lycaon's valiant son replied, as thine the steeds be thine the task to guide, the horses practised to their lord's command shall bear the rein and answer to thy hand. But if, unhappy, we desert the fight, thy voice alone can animate their flight. Else shall our fates be numbered with the dead, and these the victor's prize in triumph led. Thine be the guidance, then, with spear and shield. Myself will charge this terror of the field. And now both heroes mount the glittering car. The bounding coursers rush amidst the war. Their fierce approach, bold Thenhelus espied, who thus alarmed to great Tydides, cried, O friend, two chiefs of force immense I see. Dreadful they come and bend their rage on thee. Lo, the brave heir of old Lycaon's line and great Aeneas sprung from race divine. Enough is given to fame. Ascend thy car and save a life, the bulwark of our war. At this the hero cast a gloomy look, fixed on the chief with scorn, and thus he spoke. Me dost thou bid to shun the coming fight? Me wouldst thou move to base in glorious flight? No, tis not honest in my soul to fear, nor was Tydides born to tremble here. I hate the cumbrous chariot's slow advance, and the long distance of the flying lance. But while my nerves are strong, my force entire, thus front the foe and emulate my sire. Nor shall yon steeds that fierce to fight convey those threatening heroes, bear them both away. One chief at last beneath this arm shall die, so Pallas tells me, and forbids to fly, but if she dooms, and if no god withstand, that both shall fall by one victorious hand, then heed my words, my horses here detain, fixed to the chariot by the straitened rein, swift to Aeneas' empty seat proceed, and seize the courses of ethereal breed, the race of those which once the thundering god for ravished Ganymede on Thros bestowed, the best 
that ere on earth's broad surface run, beneath the rising or the setting sun, hence great Anchises stole a breed unknown, by mortal mares from fierce Laomedon, four of his race his ample stalls contain, and two transport Aeneas o'er the plain, these where the rich immortal prize our own through the wide world should make our glory known. Thus while they spoke, the foe came furious on, and stern Lycaon's warlike race begun. Prince, thou art met, though late in vain assailed, the spear may enter where the arrow failed, he said, then shook the ponderous lance and flung. On his broad shield the sounding weapon rung, pierced the tough orb, and in his cuirass hung. He bleeds! The pride of Greece, the boaster cries. Our triumph now, the mighty warrior lies. Mistaken vaunter, Diomed replied. Thy dart has erred, and now my spear be tried. Ye escape not both. One, and long from his car, with hostile blood shall glut the god of war. He spoke, and rising, hurled his forceful dart, which driven by Pallas pierced a vital part. Full in his face it entered, and betwixt the nose and eyeball, the proud Lycian fixed crashed all his jaws, and cleft the tongue within, to the bright point looked out beneath the chin. Headlong he falls, his helmet knocks the ground, earth groans beneath him, and his arms resound. The starting courses tremble with affright, the soul indignant seeks the realms of night. To guard his slaughtered friend, Aeneas flies, his spear extending where the carcass lies. Watchful he wheels, protects it every way, as the grim lion stalks around his prey. All the fallen trunk his ample shield displayed. He hides the hero with his mighty shade, and threats aloud. The Greeks, with longing eyes, behold at distance, but forbear the prize. Then fierce Tydides stoops, and from the fields heaved with vast force a rocky fragment wields, not Two strong men the enormous weight could raise, such men as live in these degenerate days. He swung it round, and gathering strength to throw, discharged the ponderous ruin at the foe, where to the hip the inserted thigh unites, full on the bone the pointed marble lights. Through both the tendons broke the rugged stone, and stripped the skin and cracked the solid bone, sunk on his knees and staggering with his pains, his falling bulk his bended arm sustains. Lost in a dizzy mist the warrior lies. A sudden cloud comes swimming o'er his eyes. There the brave chief, who mighty numbers swayed, oppressed, had sunk to death's eternal shade. But heavenly Venus, mindful of the love she bore, and Kesis in the Idian grove, his danger views with anguish and despair, and guards her offspring with a mother's care. About her much-loved son her arms she throws, her arms, whose whiteness matched the falling snows, screened from the foe behind her shining veil. The swords wave harmless, and the javelins fail. Safe through the rushing horse and feathered flight of sounding shafts, she bears him from the flight. Nor Stenilus, with unassisting hands, remained unheedful of his lord's commands. His panting steeds, removed from out the war, he fixed with straightened traces to the car. Next, rushing to the Darden spoil, detains the heavenly courses with the flowing manes, these in proud triumph to the fleet conveyed. No longer now a Trojan lord obeyed, that charge to bold Dipolus he gave, whom most he loved as brave men love the brave. Then mounting on his car, resumed the rein, and followed where Tydides swept the plain. Meanwhile, his conquest ravished from his eyes, the raging chief in chase of Venus flies. No god or she commissioned to the field, like Pallas dreadful with her sable shield, or fierce Bellona thundering at the wall while flames ascend and mighty ruins fall. He knew soft combats suit the tender dame, new to the field and still a foe to fame. Through breaking ranks his furious course he bends, and at the goddess his broad lance extends. Through her bright veil the daring weapons drove, the ambrosial veil which all the graces wove, her snowy hand the raising steel profaned, and the transparent skin with crimson stained. From the clear vein a stream immortal flowed, such stream as issues from a wounded god, pure emanation, uncorrupted flood, unlike our gross diseased terrestrial blood. For not the bread of man their life sustains, nor wine's inflaming juice supplies their veins. With tender shrieks the goddess filled the place, and dropped her offspring from her weak embrace. Him Phoebus took, he cast a cloud around the fainting chief, and wards the mortal wound. Then with a voice that shook the vaulted skies, the king insults the goddess as she flies. Ill with Jove's daughter bloody fights agree, the field of combat is no scene for thee. Go, let thy own soft sex employ thy care. Go, lull the coward or delude the fair. 
taught by this stroke, renounce the war's alarms, and learn to tremble at the name of arms. Tydides thus. The goddess seized with dread, confused, distracted, from the conflict fled. To aid her, swift the winged iris flew, wrapped in a mist above the warring crew. The queen of love with faded charms she found. Pale was her cheek, and livid looked the wound. To Mars, who sat remote, they bent their way. Far on the left, with clouds involved, he lay. Beside him stood his lance, disdained with gore, and reigned with gold his foaming steeds before. Low at his knee she begged with streaming eyes her brother's car to mount the distant skies and show the wound by fierce Tydides given, a mortal man who dares encounter heaven. Stern Mars attentive hears the queen complain, and to her hand commits the golden rein. She mounts the seat, oppressed with silent woe, driven by the goddess of the painted bow. The lash resounds, the rapid chariot flies, and in a moment scales the lofty skies. They stop the car, and there the courser stood, fed by fair Iris with ambrosial food. Before her mother, love's bright queen appears, o'erwhelmed with anguish and dissolved in tears. She raised her in her arms, beheld her bleed, and asked what god had wrought this guilty deed. Then she, this insult from no god I found, an impious mortal gave the daring wound. Behold the deed of haughty Diomed. Twas in the sun's defence the mother bled, the war with Troy, no more the Grecians wage, but with the gods, the immortal gods, engage. Dion, then, thy wrongs with patience bear, and share those griefs inferior powers must share. Unnumbered woes mankind from us sustain, and men with woes afflict the gods again. The mighty Mars in mortal fetters bound, and lodged in brazen dungeons underground, full thirteen moons in prison, roared in vain. Otus and Ephialtus held the chain. Perhaps had perished, had not Hermes' care restored the groaning god to upper air. Great Juno's self has borne her weight of pain, the imperial partner of the heavenly reign. Amphitryon's son infixed the deadly dart, and filled with anguish her immortal heart. In hell's grim king Alcides' power confessed, the shaft found entrance in his iron breast. To Jove's high palace for a cure he fled, pierced in his own dominions of the dead, where Paeon, sprinkling heavenly balm around, assuaged the glowing pangs and closed the wound. Rash, impious man, to stain the blessed abodes and drench his arrows in the blood of gods. But thou, though Pallas urged thy frantic deed, whose spear ill-fated makes a goddess bleed, know thou, whoe'er with heavenly power contends, short as his date and soon as glory ends, from fields of death when late he shall retire, no infant on his knees shall call him sire. Strong as thou art, some god may yet be found to stretch thee pale and gasping on the ground, thy distant wife. Aegiel the fair, starting from sleep with a distracted air, shall rouse the slaves and her lost lord deplore, the brave, the great, the glorious, now no more. This said, she wiped from Venus's wounded palm the sacred ichor, and infused the balm. Juno and Pallas with a smile surveyed, and thus to Jove began the blue-eyed maid, Permit thy daughter, gracious Jove, to tell how this mischance the Cyprian queen befell, as late she tried with passion to inflame the tender bosom of a Grecian dame, allured the fair with moving thoughts of joy to quit her country for some youth of Troy. The clasping zone, with golden buckles bound, raised her soft hand with this lamented wound. The sire of gods and men superior smiled, and, calling Venus, thus addressed his child, "'Not these, O daughter, are thy proper cares. "'Thee milder arts befit, and softer wars. "'Sweet smiles are thine, and kind endearing charms. "'To Mars and Pallas leave the deeds of arms.' "'Thus they in heaven, while on the plain below "'the fierce Tydides charged his dart and foe, "'flushed with celestial blood pursued his way, "'and fearless dared the threatening god of day. "'Already in his hopes he saw him killed.' Though screened behind Apollo's mighty shield, thrice, rushing furious at the chief, he struck, his blazing buckler thrice Apollo shook, he tried the fourth, when, breaking from the cloud, a more than mortal voice was heard aloud, O son of Tydeus, cease, be wise and see how vast the difference of the gods and thee, distance immense between the powers that shine above, eternal deathless and divine, and mortal man, a wretch of humble birth, a short-lived reptile in the dust of earth. So spoke the god who darts celestial fires. He dreads his fury, and some steps retires, 
Then Phoebus bore the chief of Venus's race to Troy's high fane and to his holy place. Latona there, and Phoebe healed the wound. With vigor armed him, and with glory crowned, this done the patron of the silver bow a phantom raised, the same in shape and show with great Aeneas, such the form he bore, and such in fight the radiant arms he wore. Around the spectre bloody wars are waged, and Greece and Troy with clashing shields engaged. Meantime on Ilion's tower Apollo stood, and, calling Mars, thus urged the raging god, "'Stern power of arms by whom the mighty fall, "'who bathest in blood and shakest the embattled wall, "'rise in thy wrath, to hell's abhorred abodes "'dispatch yon Greek and vindicate the gods.' First rosy Venus felt his brutal rage, "'me next he charged and dares all heaven engage. "'The wretch would brave high heaven's immortal sire, "'his triple thunder and his bolts of fire.' The god of battle issues on the plain, stirs all the ranks, and fires the Trojan train, in form like Achimus, the Thracian guide, in enraged to Troy's retiring chiefs, he cried, How long, ye sons of Priam, will ye fly, and unrevenged see Priam's people die? Still unresisted shall the foe destroy, and stretch the slaughter to the gates of Troy? Lo, brave Aeneas sinks beneath his wound, not godlike Hector more than arms renowned. Haste all, and take the generous warrior's part, he said. New courage swelled each hero's heart, sharpened on first his ardent soul expressed, and turned to Hector these bold words addressed, Say, chief, is all thy ancient valour lost? Where are thy threats, and where thy glorious boast, that propped alone by Priam's race should stand Troy's sacred walls, nor need a foreign hand? Now, now thy country calls her wanted friends, and the proud vaunt in just derision ends. Remote they stand, while alien troops engage like trembling hounds before the lion's rage. Far distant hence I held my wide command, where foaming Xanthus laves the Lycian land. With ample wealth the wish of mortals blessed, a beauteous wife and infant at her breast. With those I left whatever dear could be. Greece, if she conquers, nothing wins from me. Yet first in fight my Lycian bands I cheer, and long to meet this mighty man ye fear, while Hector idle stands, nor bids the brave their wives, their infants, and their altars save. Haste, warrior, haste, preserve thy threatened state, or one vast burst of all involving fate full o'er your towers shall fall, and sweep away sons, sires, and wives, and undistinguished prey. Rouse all thy Trojans, urge thy aids to fight. These claim thy thoughts by day, thy watch by night. With force incessant the brave Greeks oppose, such cares thy friends deserve, and such thy foes. Stung to the heart, the generous Hector hears, but just reproof with decent silence bears. From his proud car the prince impetuous springs, on earth he leaps, his brazen armor rings, two shining spears are brandished in his hands, thus armed he animates his drooping bands, revives their ardor, turns their steps from flight, and wakes anew the dying flames of fight. They turn. They stand, the Greeks, their fury dare, condense their powers, and wait the growing war, as when on Ceres' sacred floor the swain spreads the wide fan to clear the golden grain, and the light chaff before the breeze is born ascends in clouds from off the heapy corn, the grey dust rising with collected winds drives o'er the barn and whitens o'er the hinds, so white with dust the Grecian host appears, from trampling steeds and thundering charioteers, the dusky clouds from laboured earth arise and roll in smoking volumes to the skies. Mars hovers o'er them with his sable shield and adds new horrors to the darkened field. Pleased with his charge and ardent to fulfil in Troy's defence Apollo's heavenly will. Soon, as from fight the blue-eyed maid retires, each Trojan bosom with new warmth he fires. And now the god from forth his sacred fane Produced Aeneas to the shouting train, alive, unharmed, with all his peers around, erect he stood and vigorous from his wound. Inquiries none they made. The dreadful day no pause of words admits, no full delay. Fierce discord storms, Apollo loud exclaims, fame calls, Mars thunders, and the fields in flames. Stern Diomed, with either Ajax, stood, and great Ulysses, bathed in hostile blood, embodied close the labouring Grecian train, the fiercest shock of charging hosts sustain, unmoved and silent, the whole war they wait, serenely dreadful, and as fixed as fate, 
So when the embattled clouds in dark array along the skies their gloomy lines display, when now the north his boisterous rage is spent, and peaceful sleeps the liquid element, the low-hung vapours, motionless and still, rest on the summits of the shaded hill, till the mass scatters as the winds arise, dispersed and broken through the ruffled skies. Nor was the general wanting to his train. From troop to troop he toils through all the plain. Ye Greeks, be men! The charge of battle bear, your brave associates and yourselves revere. Let glorious acts, more glorious acts inspire, and catch from breast to breast the noble fire. On valor's side the odds of combat lie, the brave live glorious or lamented die. The wretch who trembles in the field of fame meets death, and worse than death, eternal shame. These words he seconds with his flying lance. To meet, whose point was strong, Deacoon's chance, and he his friend, and in his native place, honoured and loved like Priam's royal race, long had he fought the foremost in the field. But now the monarch's lance transpierced his shield, his shield too weak, the furious dart to stay. Through his broad belt the weapon forced its way, the grisly wound dismissed his soul to hell, his arms around him rattled as he fell. Then fierce Aeneas, brandishing his blade, in dust, or Silochus, and Crethon laid, whose sire, Diocleus, wealthy, brave, and great, in well-built ferry held his lofty seat, sprung from Alpheus's plenteous stream, that yields increase of harvest to the Pylian fields. He got Orsilochus, Diocleus he, and these descended in the third degree, too nearly expert in the martial toil. In sable ships they left their native soil, to avenge Atrides, now untimely slain, they fell with glory on the Phrygian plain. So two young mountain lions, nursed with blood in deep recesses of the gloomy wood, rush fearless to the plains, and uncontrolled depopulate the stalls and waste the fold, till pierced at distance from their native den, or powered, they fall beneath the force of men, prostrate on earth, their beauteous bodies lay, like mountain firs, as tall and straight as they. Great Menelaus views with pitying eyes, lifts his bright lance, and at the victor flies. Mars urged him on, yet ruthless in his hate, the god but urged him to provoke his fate. He, thus advancing, nest his valiant son, shakes for his danger, and neglects his own, struck with a thought, should Helen's lord be slain, and all his country's glorious labours vain, already met the threatening heroes stand. The spears already tremble in their hand, in rushed Antilochus his aid to bring, and fall or conquer by the Spartan king. These, seen the Dardan backward turned his course, brave as he was, and shunned unequal force. The breathless bodies to the Greek they drew, then mix in combat, and the toils renew. First, Palemenes, great in battle bled, who sheathed in brass the Paphilagonians led. Atrides marked him where sublime he stood, fixed in his throat the javelin drank his blood. The faithful Maidon, as he turned from fight, his flying courses sunk to endless night. A broken rock by Nestor's son was thrown. His bended arm received the falling stone. From his numbed hand the ivory-studded reins dropped in the dust or trailed along the plains. Meanwhile his temples feel a deadly wound. He groans in death and ponderous sinks to the ground. Deep drove his helmet in the sands, and there the head stood fixed, the quivering legs in air, till trampled flat beneath the course's feet, the youthful victor mounts his empty seat and bears the prize in triumph to the fleet. Great Hector saw, and raging at the view, pours on the Greeks, the Trojan troops pursue. He fires his host with animating cries, and brings along the furies of the skies, Mars, stern destroyer, and Bellona, dread, flame in the front, and thunder at their head. This swells the tumult and the rage of fight. That shakes a spear that casts a dreadful light. Where Hector marched, the god of battle shined, now stormed before him and now raged behind. Tydides paused amidst his full career. Then first the hero's manly breast knew fear, as when some simple swain his cot forsakes, and wide through fens an unknown journey takes, if chance a swelling brook his passage stay, and foam impervious cross the wanderer's way, confused he stops, a length of country past, eyes the rough waves, and tired returns at last. Amazed, no less the great Tydides stands. He stayed, and turning thus addressed his bands. No wonder, Greeks, that all to Hector yield. Secure of favouring gods, he takes the field. His strokes they second and avert our spears. Behold, where Mars in mortal arms appears. Retire then, warriors, but sedate and slow. Retire, but with your faces to the foe. Trust not too much your unavailing might. 
"'Tis not with Troy, but with the gods ye fight. Now near the Greeks the black battalions drew, and first two leaders valiant Hector slew. His force and Chialis and Menthes found in every art of glorious war renowned. In the same call the chiefs to combat ride and fought united and united died. Struck at the sight the mighty Ajax glows with thirst of vengeance and assaults the foes. His massy spear with matchless fury sent through Amphius' belt and heaving belly went. Amphius, Apiasus, happy soil possessed, with herds abounding with treasure blessed. But fate Resistless from his country led the chief to perish at his people's head, shook with his fall his brazen armor rung, and fierce to seize it conquering Ajax sprung. Around his head an iron tempest reigned, a wood of spears his ample shield sustained. Beneath one foot the yet warm corpse he pressed and drew his javelin from the bleeding breast. He could no more the showering darts denied to spoil his glittering arms and plumy pride. Now foes on foes came pouring on the fields, with bristling lances and compacted shields, till in this steely circle straightened round, forced he gives way and sternly quits the ground. While thus they strive, Dipolemus the great, urged by the force of unresisted fate, burns with desire, sarpent on strength to prove, Alcides' offspring meets the son of Jove. Sheathed in bright arms, each adverse chief came on, Jove's great descendant and his greater son, prepared for combat, ere the lance he tossed, the daring Rhodian vents his haughty boast. What brings this Lycian counsellor so far to tremble in our arms, not mix in war? Know thy vain self, nor let their flattery move, who style thee son of cloud-compelling Jove? How far unlike those chiefs of race divine! How vast the difference of their deeds and thine! Jove got such heroes as my sire, whose soul no fear could daunt, nor earth nor hell control. Troy felt his arm, and yon proud ramparts stand, raised on the ruins of his vengeful hand, with six small ships and but a slender train. Lee left the town a wide deserted plain. But... What art thou, who deedless look'st around, while unrevenged thy Lycian bite the ground? Small aid to Troy thy feeble force can be, but wert thou greater thou must yield to me. Pierced by my spear to endless darkness go, I make this present to the shades below. The son of Hercules, the Rhodian guide, thus haughty spoke. The Lycian king replied, Thy sire, O prince, or turn the Trojan state, whose perjured monarch well deserved his fate. Those heavenly steeds the hero sought so far, false he detained the just reward of war, nor so content the generous chief defied, with base reproaches and unmanly pride. But you, unworthy the high race you boast, shall raise my glory when thy own is lost. Now meet thy fate, and by Sarpedon slain, add one more ghost of Pluto's gloomy reign. He said, both javelins at an instant flew, both struck, both wounded, but Sarpedon's slew. Fool in the boaster's neck the weapon stood, transfixed his throat and drank the vital blood. The soul disdainful seeks the caves of night, and his sealed eyes forever lose the light. Yet not in vain, Dipolemus was thrown, thy angry lance, which piercing to the bone Sarpedon's thigh, had robbed the chief of breath. But Jove was present, and forbade the death. Born from the conflict by his Lycian throng, the wounded hero dragged the lance along. His friends, each busied in his several part, through haste or danger had not drawn the dart. The Greeks were slain, Tipolemus retired, whose fall Ulysses viewed with fury fired, doubtful if Jove's great son he should pursue, or pour his vengeance on the Lycian crew. But heaven and fate the first design withstand, nor this great death must grace Ulysses' hand. Minerva drives him on the Lycian train. Alastor, Cronius, Haleus, strewed the plain, Alcander, Pritanus, no man fell, and numbers more his sword had sent to hell, but Hector saw, and furious at the sight, rushed terrible amidst the ranks of flight. With joy Sarpedon viewed the wished relief, and, faint lamenting, thus implored the chief, O oh, suffer not the foe to bear away my helpless corpse and unassisted prey. If I unblessed must see my son no more, my much-loved consort and my native shore— Yet let me die in Ilion's sacred wall, Troy, in whose cause I fell, shall mourn my fall, he said. Nor Hector to the chief replies, but shakes his plume, and fierce to combat flies. Swift as a whirlwind, drives the scattering foes, and dyes the ground with purple as he goes. Beneath a beech, Jove's consecrated shade, his mournful friend's divine Sarpedon laid. Brave Pelagon, his favorite chief, was nigh, who wrenched the javelin from his sinewy thigh. The fainting soul stood ready-winged for flight, and o'er his eyeballs swam the shades of night. 
But Boreas, rising fresh with gentle breath, recalled his spirit from the gates of death. The generous Greeks recede with tardy pace, though Mars and Hector thunder in their face. None turn their backs to mean ignoble flight. Slow they retreat, and even retreating fight. Who first, who last by Mars and Hector's hand, stretched in their blood, lay gasping on the sand. Tenthrus the great, Orestes the renowned, for managed steeds and treacherous pressed the ground. Next, Omnimas and Enops offspring died. Oresebius last fell groaning at their side. Oresbius in his painted mitre gay, in far Boeotia held his wealthy sway, where lakes surround low Hylae's watery plain. A prince and people, studious of their gain, the carnage Juno from the sky surveyed, and touched with grief bespoke the blue-eyed maid. O oh, sight accursed! Shall faithless Troy prevail, and shall our promise to our people fail? How vain the word to men, alas, given by Jove's great daughter and the queen of heaven, beneath his arms that Priam's towers should fall, if warring gods forever guard the wall? Mars, red with slaughter, aids our hated foes. Haste, let us arm, and force with force oppose. She spoke. Minerva burns to meet the war, and now heaven's empress calls her blazing car. At her command rush forth the steeds divine, rich with immortal gold their trapping shine. Bright Hebe waits. By Hebe ever young, the whirling wheels are to the chariot hung. On the bright axle turns the bidden wheel of sounding brass, the polished axle steel. Eight brazen spokes in radiant order flame, the circle's gold of uncorrupted frame, such as the heavens produce. And round the gold two brazen rings of work divine were rolled. The bossy knaves of solid silver shone. Braces of gold suspend the moving throne. The car behind an arching figure bore. The bending concave formed an arch before. Silver the beam, the extended yoke was gold. And golden reins the immortal coursers hold. Herself impatient to the ready car. The coursers joins and breathes revenge and war. Pallas disrobes, her radiant veil untied. With flowers adorned, with art diversified. The laboured veil her heavenly fingers wove, Flows on the pavement of the court of Jove. Now heaven's dread arms her mighty limbs invest, Jove's cuirass blazes on her ample breast, Decked in sad triumph for the mournful field, O'er her broad shoulders hangs his horrid shield, Dire, black, tremendous, round the margin rolled, A fringe of serpents hissing guards the gold, Here all the terrors of grim war appear, Here rage, Force, here tremble, flight and fear, here stormed contention, and here fury frowned, and the dire orb portentous gorgon crowned. The massy golden helm she next assumes, that dreadful nods with four or shading plumes. So vast the broad circumference contains a hundred armies on a hundred plains. The goddess thus the imperial car ascends, shook by her arm the mighty javelin bends, ponderous and huge, that when her fury burns, proud tyrants humbles, and whole host o'er turns. Swift at the scourge the ethereal coursers fly, while the smooth chariot cuts the liquid sky. Heaven's gates spontaneous open to the powers, heaven's golden gates kept by the winged hours, commissioned in alternate watch they stand, the sun's bright portals and the sky's command, involved in clouds the eternal gates of day, or the dark barrier roll with ease away. The sounding hinges ring on either side, the gloomy volumes pierced with light divide. The chariot mounts, where deep in ambient skies, confused Olympus's hundred heads arise, where far apart the thunderer fills his throne o'er all the gods superior and alone. There with their snowy hand the queen restrains the fiery steeds, and thus to Jove complains, O sire, can no resentment touch thy soul? Can Mars rebel and does no thunder roll? What lawless rage on yon forbidden plain? What rash destruction, and what heroes slain? Venus and Phoebus with a dreadful bow smile on the slaughter and enjoy my woe, mad furious power, whose unrelenting mind no god can govern and no justice bind. Say, mighty father, shall we scourge this pride and drive from fight the impetuous homicide? To whom assenting thus, the thunderer said, Go, and the great Minerva be thy aid. To tame the monster god Minerva knows, and oft afflicts his brutal breast with woes, he said, Saturnia, ardent to obey, lashed her white steeds along the aerial way. Swift down the steep of heaven the chariot rolls. Between the expanded earth and starry poles, far as a shepherd from some point on high, o'er the wide main extends his boundless eye. Through such a space of air with thundering sound, at every leap, 
the immortal courses bound, Troy, now they reached, and touched those banks divine, where silver Simwa and Scamander join. There Juno stopped, and her fair steeds unloosed, of air condensed a vapour circumfused, for these impregnate with celestial dew. On Simwa, brink ambrosial herbage grew, thence to relieve the fainting argive throng, strong as the sailing doves they glide along. The best and bravest of the Grecian band, a warlike circle round Tydides stand. Such was their look as lions bathed in blood, or foaming boars. The terror of the wood, heaven's empress mingles with the mortal crowd, and shouts in Stentor's sounding voice aloud, Stentor the strong, endued with brazen lungs, whose throat surpassed the force of fifty tongues. Inglorious Argives, to your race a shame, and only men in figure and in name. Once from the walls your timorous foes engaged— while fierce in war divine Achilles raged, now issuing fearless they possess the plain, now when the shores and scarce the seas remain. Her speech new fury to their hearts conveyed, while near Tydides stood the Athenian maid, the king beside his panting steed she found, or spent, with toil reposing on the ground. To cool his glowing wound he sat apart, the wound inflicted by the Lycian dart. Large drops of sweat from all his limbs descend. Beneath his ponderous shield his sinews bend, whose ample belt that o'er his shoulder lay, he eased and washed the clotted gore away. The goddess, leaning o'er the bending yoke, beside his courses thus her silence broke. Degenerate prince, and not of tidious kind, whose little body lodged a mighty mind, for most depressed in glorious toils to share, and scarce refrained when I forbade the war, Alone unguarded once he dared to go, And feast encircled by the Theban foe, There braved and vanquished many a hardy knight. Such nerves I gave him, and such force in fight. Thou, too, no less hast been my constant care, Thy hands I armed and sent thee forth to war, But thee or fear deters or sloth detains, No drop of all thy father warms thy veins. The chief thus answered mild, Immortal maid, I own... Thy presence, and confess thy aid. Not fear, thou knowest, withholds me from the plains, nor sloth hath seized me, but thy word restrains. From warring gods thou badest me turn my spear, and Venus only found resistance here. Hence, goddess, heedful of thy high commands, loth I gave way, and warned our Argive bands. For Mars the homicide these eyes beheld with slaughter red and raging round the field. Then thus Minerva, brave Tydides, here. Not Mars himself, nor aught immortal fear. Full on the god impel thy foaming horse. Pallas commands, and Pallas lends thee force. Rash, furious, blind, from these to those he flies, and every side of wavering combat tries. Large promise makes and breaks the promise made. Now gives the Grecians, now the Trojans aid. She said, and to the steeds approaching near, Drew from his seat the martial charioteer, The vigorous power the trembling car ascends, Fierce for revenge and diomed attends, The groaning axle bent beneath the load, So great a hero, and so great a god, She snatched the reins, she lashed with all her force, And full on Mars impelled the foaming horse, But first to hide her heavenly visage, Spread black Orcus' helmet o'er her radiant head, Just then, Gigantic Periphus lay slain, the strongest warrior of the Aetolian train. The god who slew him leaves his prostrate prize, stretched where he fell, and at Tydides flies. Now rushing fierce in equal arms appear the daring Greek, the dreadful god of war. Full at the chief, above his courser's head, from Mars' arm the enormous weapon fled. Pallas opposed her hand, and caused to glance far from the car the strong immortal lance. Then through the force of Tadius' warlike son, the javelin hissed, the goddess urged it on, where the broad cincture girt his armor round it pierced the god, his groin received the wound. From the rent skin the warrior tugs again, the smoking steel, Mars bellows with the pain, loud as the roar, encountering armies yield. When shouting millions shake the thundering field, both armies start, 
and trembling gaze around, and earth and heaven rebellow to the sound, as vapors blown by Auster's sultry breath, pregnant with plagues and shedding seeds of death, beneath the rage of burning Sirius rise, choke the parched earth and blacken all the skies. In such a cloud the god from combat driven, high all the dusky whirlwind scales the heaven, wild with his pain he sought the bright abodes, there sullen sat beneath a sire of gods, showed the celestial blood, and with a groan thus poured his plaints before the immortal throne. Can Jove supine flagitious facts survey, and brook the furies of this daring day, for mortal men celestial powers engage, and gods on gods exert external rage? From thee, O father, all these ills we bear, and thy fell daughter with the shield and spear, thou gavest that fury to the realms of light, pernicious wild, regardless of the right. All heaven beside reveres thy sovereign sway. Thy voice we hear, and thy behest obey. Tis hers to offend, and even offending share thy breast, thy counsels, thy distinguished care. So boundless she, and thou so partial grown, well may we deem the wondrous birth thy own. Now frantic Diomed at her command, against the immortals lifts his raging hand. The heavenly Venus first his fury found, me next encountering, me he dared to wound. Vanquished I fled, even I, the god of flight, for mortal madness scarce was saved by flight. Else hadst thou seen me sink on yonder plain, heaped round and heaving under loads of slain, or pierced with Grecian darts for rages lie, condemned to pain, though fated not to die. Him thus abrading with a wrathful look, the Lord of Thunders viewed and stern bespoke, To me, perfidious, this lamenting strain, Of lawless force shall lawless Mars complain, Of all the gods who tread the spangled skies, Thou most unjust, most odious in our eyes, In human discord is thy dire delight, The waste of slaughter and the rage of fight. No bounds, no law, thy fiery temper quells, And all thy mother in thy soul rebels, in vain our threats, in vain our power we use. She gives the example, and her son pursues. Yet long the inflicted pangs thou shalt not mourn, sprung since thou art from Jove and heavenly born, else singed with lightning, hadst thou hence been thrown, where chained on burning rocks the titans groan. Thus he who shakes Olympus with his nod, then give to Paeon's care the bleeding god." With gentle hand the balm he poured round, and healed the immortal flesh and closed the wound, as when the figs pressed juice infused in cream, to curds coagulates the liquid stream. Sudden the fluids fix the parts combined, such and so soon the ethereal texture joined. Cleansed from the dust and gore, fair Hebe dressed his mighty limbs in an immortal vest. Glorious he sat, in majesty restored, fast by the throne of heaven's superior lord. Juno and Pallas mount the blessed abodes, their task performed, and mix among the gods. The end of Book Five of the Iliad by Homer. As translated by Alexander Pope and read by Rick Kistner for Let to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book Six. Argument. The episodes of Glaucus and Diomed, and of Hector and Adromache. The gods having left the field, the Grecians prevail. Helenus, the chief augur of Troy, commands Hector to return to the city in order to appoint a solemn procession of the queen and the Trojan matrons to the temple of Minerva to entreat her to remove Diomed from the fight. The battle relaxing during the absence of Hector, Glaucus and Diomed have an interview between the two armies, where, coming to the knowledge of the friendship and hospitality passed between their ancestors, they make exchange of their arms. Hector, having performed the orders of Helenus, prevails upon Paris to return to the battle, and, taking a tender leave of his wife, and Dramache hastens again to the field. The scene is first in the field of battle between the rivers Simois and Scamander, and then changes to Troy. Now heaven forsakes the fight, the immortals yield to human force and human skill the field. Dark showers of javelins fly from foes to foes. Now here, now there, the tide of combat flows, while Troy's famed streams that bound the deathful plain on either side run purple to the main. Great Ajax, first to conquest, led the way, broke the thick ranks and turned the doubtful day. The Thracian Acamas his falchion found and yewed the enormous giant to the ground. His thundering arm a deadly stroke impressed where the black 
horsehair nodded o'er his crest. Fixed in his front the brazen weapon lies, and seals in endless shades his swimming eyes. Next, Tuthra's son disdained the sands with blood. Axilus, hospitable, rich and good, in fair Arisby's walls his native place, he held his seat, a friend to human race. Fast by the road, his ever-open door obliged the wealthy and relieved the poor. To stern Tydides now he falls a prey. No friend to guard him in the dreadful day. Breathless, the good man fell, and by his side his faithful servant, old Calesius, died. By great Euryalus was Dresus slain, and next he laid Opheltius on the plain. Two twins were near, bold, beautiful, and the young, from a fair naiad and Bucolian sprung. Leomedon's white flocks Bucolian fed, that monarch's first born by a foreign bed. In secret woods he won the naiad's grace, and two fair infants crowned his strong embrace. Here dead they lay in all their youthful charms, the ruthless victor stripped their shining arms. Astylus by Polypoetus fell, Ulysses' spear, Pidiates sent to hell. By Teucer's shaft brave Aretion bled, and Nestor's son laid stirred Ablaris dead. Great Agamemnon, leader of the brave, the mortal wound of rich Elatus gave, who held in Pedasus his proud abode, and tilled the banks where silver Satnio flowed. Melanthius by Eurypylus was slain, and Philacus from Laetus flies in vain. Unblessed, Adrastus, next at mercy lies beneath the Spartan spear, a living prize. Scared with the din and tumult of the fight, his headlong steeds, precipitate in flight, rushed on a tamarisk strong trunk and broke the shattered chariot from the crooked yoke. Wide o'er the field, resistless as the wind, for Troy they fly and leave their lord behind. Prone on his face he sinks beside the wheel. After days o'er him shakes his vengeful steel. The fallen chief in suppliant posture pressed, the victor knees, and thus his prayer addressed. O oh, spare my youth, and for the life I owe, large gifts of price my father shall bestow. When fame shall tell that not in battle slain thy hollow ships his captive son detain, rich heaps of brass shall in thy tent be told, and still well-tempered and persuasive gold, he said. Compassion touched the hero's heart. He stood, suspended with the lifted dart, as pity pleaded for his vanquished prize, stern Agamemnon, swift to vengeance flies, and furious thus, O impotent of mine, shall these, shall these Atrides mercy find? Well hast thou known proud Troy's perfidious land, and well her natives married at thy hand. Not one of all the race, nor sex, nor age, shall save a Trojan from our boundless rage. Ilion shall perish whole and bury all. Her babes, her infants at the breast, shall fall. A dreadful lesson of exampled fate, to warn the nations and to curb the great." The monarch spoke. The words, with warmth addressed, to rigid justice steeled his brother's breast. Fierce from his knees the hapless chief he thrust. The monarch's javelin stretched him in the dust. Then, pressing with his foot, his panting heart, forth from the slain he tugged the reeking dart. Old Nestor saw and roused the warrior's rage. Thus, heroes, thus the vigorous combat wage. No son of Mars descend for servile gains. To touch the booty while a foe remains, behold yon glittering host, your future spoil. First gain the conquest, then reward the toil. And now, had Greece eternal fame acquired, and frightened Troy within her walls retired, had not sage Helenus her state redressed, taught by the gods that moved his sacred breast, where Hector stood with great Aeneas joined, the seer revealed the counsels of his mind. Ye generous chiefs, on whom the immortals lay the cares and glories of this doubtful day, on whom your aids, your country's hopes depend, wise to consult and active to defend. Here, at our gates, your brave efforts unite. Turn back the routed and forbid the flight, ere yet their wives' soft arms the cowards gain, the sport and insult of the hostile train. When your commands have heartened every band, ourselves, here, fixed, will make the dangerous stand, pressed as we are, and sore a former fight. These straits demand our last remains of might. Meanwhile, thou, Hector, to the town, retire, and teach our mother what the gods require. Direct the queen to lead the assembled train of Troy's chief matrons to Minerva's fane. Unbar the sacred gates, and seek the power with offered vows in Ilion's topmost tower. The largest mantle her rich wardrobes hold, most prized for art and labored o'er with gold. 
before the goddess's honoured knees be spread, and twelve young heifers to her altars led. If so the power, intoned by fervent prayer, our wives, our infants, and our city spare, and far avert Taididi's wasteful ire that mows the whole troops and makes all Troy retire, not thus Achilles taught our host to dread. Sprung though he was from more than mortal bed, not thus resistless ruled the stream of fight, in rage unbounded and unmatched in might. Hector obedient heard, and with a bound leaped from his trembling chariot to the ground. Through all his host inspiring force he flies, and bids the thunder of the battle rise, with rage recruited the bold Trojans glow, and turn the tide of conflict on the foe. Fierce in the front he shakes two dazzling spears, all Greece recedes and midst her triumph fears. Some god, they thought, who ruled the fate of wars, shot down avenging from the vault of stars. Then thus allowed ye dauntless Dardans here, and you whom distant nations send to war, be mindful of the strength your fathers bore. Be still yourselves, and Hector asks no more. One hour demands me in the Trojan wall to bid our altars flame and victims fall, nor shall I trust the matron's holy train and revered elders seek the gods in vain. This said, with ample strides the hero passed, the shield's large orb behind his shoulder cast, his neck or shading to his ankles hung, and as he marched the brazen buckler rung. Now paused the battle, godlike Hector gone, where daring Glaucus and great Tydeus' son between both armies met. The chiefs from far observed each other, and had marked for war. Near as they drew, Tydides thus began. What art thou, boldest of the race of man? Our eyes till now that aspect ne'er beheld, where fame is reaped amid the embattled field. Yet far before the troops thou darest appear, and meet a lance, the fiercest heroes fear. Unhappy they, and born of luckless sires, who tempt our fury when Minerva fires. But if from heaven, celestial, thou descend, no with immortals we no more contend. Not long, Lysurgus viewed the golden light, that daring men who mixed with gods in fight, Bacchus and Bacchus's votaries he drove, with brandished steel from Nias's sacred grove. Their consecrated spears lay scattered round, with curling vines and twisted ivy bound, while Bacchus headlong sought the briny flood, and Thetis' arms received the trembling god. Nor failed the crime, the immortals' wrath to move. The immortals, blessed with endless ease above, deprived of sight by their avenging doom, cheerless he breathed and wandered in the gloom, then sunk unpitied to the dire abodes, a wretch accursed and hated by the gods. I brave not heaven, but if the fruits of earth sustain thy life, and human be thy birth, bold as thou art, too prodigal of breath, approach and enter the dark gates of death. What, or from whence I am, or who my sire, replied the chief, can Tydeus' son inquire? Like leaves on trees the race of man is found, now green in youth, now withering on the ground. Another race the following spring supplies, they fall successive, and successive rise. So generations in their course decay, so flourish these when those are passed away. But if thou still persist to search my birth, then hear a tale that fills the spacious earth. A city stands on Argus's utmost bound, Argos, the fair for warlike steeds renowned. Aeolian Sisyphus, with wisdom blessed, in ancient time the happy wall possessed. Then called to Fere, Glaucus was his son, great Glaucus, father of Bellerophon, who all the sons of men in beauty shined, loved for that valour which preserves mankind. Then mighty Praetus Argos, Sceptre swayed, whose hard commands Bellerophon obeyed. With direful jealousy the monarch raged, and the brave prince in numerous toils engaged. For him, Antia burned with lawless flame, and strove to tempt him from the paths of fame. In vain she tempted the relentless youth, endued with wisdom, sacred fear, and truth. Fired at his scorn, the queen to Praetus fled, and begged revenge for her insulted bed. Incensed, he heard, resolving on his fate, but hospitable laws restrained his hate. To Lycia, the devoted youth he sent, with tablets sealed, that told his dire intent. Now, blessed by every power who guards the good, the chief arrived at Xanthus' silver flood. There Lycia's monarch paid him honours due. Nine days he feasted, and nine bulls he slew. But when the tenth bright morning orient glowed, the faithful youth his monarch's mandate showed. The fatal tablets, till that instant sealed, 
the deathful secret to the king revealed. First, dire Camara's conquest was enjoined, a mingled monster of no mortal kind. Behind, a dragon's fiery tail was spread, a goat's rough body bore a lion's head. Her pitchy nostrils flaky flames expire, her gaping throat emits infernal fire. This pest he slaughtered, for he read the skies, and trusted heaven's informing prodigies, then met in arms the Solibayan crew, fiercest of men, and those the warrior slew. Next the bold Amazon's whole force defied, and conquered still, for heaven was on his side, nor ended here his toils. His Lycian foes, at his retreat a treacherous ambush rose, with leveled spears along the winding shore, there fell they breathless, and returned no more. At length the monarch, with repentant grief, confessed the gods and god-descended chief. His daughter gave the stranger to detain with half the honours of his ample reign. The Lycians granted a chosen space of ground, with woods, with vineyards, and with harvests crowned. There long the chief his happy lot possessed, with two brave sons and one fair daughter blessed. Fair, e'en in heavenly eyes, her fruitful love, crowned with Sarpedon's birth, the embrace of Jove, but when at last distracted in his mind, forsook by heaven, forsaking humankind, wide o'er the alien field he chose to stray, a long, forlorn, uncomfortable way. Woes heaped on woes consumed his wasted heart, his beauteous daughter fell by Phoebe's dart, his eldest born by raging Mars was slain in combat on the Solomaean plain. Hippolochus survived, from him I came, the honoured author of my birth and name. By his decree I sought the Trojan town, by his instructions learn to win renown, to stand the first in worth as in command, to add new honours to my native land, before my eyes my mighty sires to place and emulate the glories of our race. He spoke, and transport filled Tydides' heart. In earth the generous warrior fixed his dart. Then, friendly, thus the Lycian prince addressed, Welcome, my brave hereditary guest, Thus ever let us meet with kind embrace, nor stain the sacred friendship of our race. No chief, our grandsires, have been guests of old. O Aeneas the strong, Bellerophon the bold, our ancient seat his honour presence graced, where twenty days in genial rites he passed, the parting hero's mutual presence left, a golden goblet was thy grandsire's gift. O Aeneas, a belt of matchless work bestowed, uh, that rich with Tyrian dire refulgent glowed. This from his pledge I learned, which, safely stored among my treasures, still adorns my board. For Tydeus left me young when Thebes' wall, behind the sons of Greece, untimely fall. Mindful of this, in friendship let us join. If heaven our steps to foreign lands incline, my guest in Argos thou, and I in Lycia thine. Enough of Trojans to this lance shall yield, in the full harvest of yon ample field, enough of Greeks shall dye thy spear with gore, but thou and Diomed be foes no more. Now, change we arms, and prove to either host we guard the friendship of the line we boast. Thus having said the gallant chiefs alight, their hands they join, their mutual faith they plight. Brave Clocus then, each narrow thought resigned, Jove warmed his bosom and enlarged his mind. For Diomed's brass arms of mean device for which nine oxen paid a vulgar price, he gave his own of gold divinely wrought. A hundred beeves the shining purchase bought. Meantime the guardian of the Trojan state, great Hector, entered at the Scaean gate. Beneath the beech trees' consecrated shades, the Trojan matrons and the Trojan maids around him flocked all pressed with pious care, for husbands, brothers, sons engaged in war. He bids the train in long procession go and seek the gods to avert the impending woe. And now to Priam's stately courts he came, raised on arched columns of stupendous frame. All these a range of marble structure runs, the rich pavilions of his fifty sons in fifty chambers lodged, and rooms of state opposed to those where Priam's daughters safe. Twelve domes for them and their loved spouses shone, of equal beauty and of polished stone. Hither great Hector passed, nor passed unseen of royal Hecuba, his mother queen, with her Laodice, whose beauteous face surpassed the nymphs of Troy's illustrious race. Long in a strict embrace she held her son, and pressed his hand, and tender thus begun. O Hector, say what great occasion calls my son from fight when Greece surrounds our walls. Comest thou to supplicate the almighty power with lifted hands from Ilion's lofty tower? Stay, 
till I bring the cup with Bacchus crowned in Jove's high name to sprinkle on the ground, and pay due vows to all the gods around. Then, with a plenteous draught, refresh thy soul, and draw new spirits from the generous bowl, spent as thou art with long laborious fight, the brave defender of thy country's right. Far hence be Bacchus' gifts, the chief rejoined, in flaming wine pernicious to mankind, unnerves the limbs and dulls the noble mind. Let chiefs abstain, and spare the sacred juice to sprinkle to the gods its better use. By me that holy office were profaned. Ill fits it me, with human gore disdained, to the pure skies these horrid hands to raise, or offer heaven's great sire polluted praise. You, with your matrons, go, a spotless train, and burn rich odours in Minerva's fane. The largest mantle your full wardrobes hold, most prized for art and laboured ore with gold, before the goddess's honoured knees be spread, and twelve young heifers to her altar led. So may the power atone by fervent prayer our wives, our infants, and our city spare, and far avert Tydides' wasteful ire, who mows whole troops and makes all Troy retire. Be this, O mother, your religious care. I go to rouse soft Paris to the war. If yet not lost to all the sense of shame, the recreant warrior hear the voice of fame. Oh, would kind earth the hateful wretch embrace, that pest of Troy, that ruin of our race! Deep to the dark abyss might he descend. Troy yet should flourish, and my sorrows end. This heard, she gave command, and summoned came each noble matron and illustrious dame. The Phrygian queen to a rich wardrobe went, where treasured odours breathed a costly scent. There lay the vestures of no vulgar art. Sidonian maids embroidered every part, whom, from soft Sidon, youthful Paris bore, with Helen touching on the Tyrian shore. Here, as the queen revolved with careful eyes the various textures and the various dyes, she chose a veil that shone superior far, and glowed refulgent as the morning star. Herself, with this, the long procession leads. The train majestically slow proceeds. Soon, as to Ilion's topmost tower they come, and awful reach the high Palladian dome, Antenor's concert, fair Theano, awaits, as Pallas's priestess, and unbars the gates. With hands uplifted and imploring eyes, they fill the dome with supplicating cries. The priestess then the shining veil displays, placed on Minerva's knees, and thus she prays. O awful goddess, ever dreadful maid, Troy's strong defence, unconquered Pallas aid, break thou Tydides' spear, and let him fall prone on the dust before the Trojan wall. So twelve young heifers, guiltless of the yoke, shall fill thy temple with a grateful smoke. But thou, atoned by penitence and prayer, ourselves, our infants, and our city spare. So prayed the priestess in her holy fane. So vowed the matrons, but they vowed in vain. While these appear before the power with prayers, Hector to Paris' lofty dome repairs. Himself, the mansion raised, from every part assembling architects of matchless art. Near Priam's court and Hector's palace stands the pompous structure, and the town commands. A spear the hero bore of wondrous strength, a full ten cubits was the lance's length. The steely point, with golden ringlets joined, before him brandished, at each motion shine thus entering in the glittering rooms, he found his brother chief, whose useless arms lay round, his eye delighting with their splendid show, brightening the shield and polishing the bow. Beside him Helen, with her virgins, stands, guides their rich labours, and instructs their hands. Him, thus inactive, with an ardent look, the prince beheld, and high resenting spoke. Thy hate to Troy, is this the time to show, O wretch ill-fated, and thy country's foe? Paris and Greece against us both conspire. Thy close resentment and their vengeful ire, for thee great Ilion's guardian heroes fall, till heaps of dead alone defend her wall, for thee the soldier bleeds, the matron mourns, and wasteful war in all its fury burns. Ungrateful man, deserves not this thy care, our troops to hearten and our toils to share? Rise, or behold, the conquering flames ascend, and all the Phrygian glories at an end. Brother, tis just, replied the beauteous youth. Thy free remonstrance proves thy worth and truth. Yet charge my absence less, O generous chief, on hate to Troy than conscious shame and grief. Here, hid from human eyes, thy brother sate, and mourned in secret his and Ilion's fate. Tis now enough, now glory spreads her charms, and beauteous Helen calls her chief to arms. Conquest to-day my happier sword may bless. Tis man's to fight, but heaven's to give success. But while I arm, 
contain thy ardent mind, or go, and Paris shall not lag behind. He said, nor answered Priam's warlike son, when Helen thus with lowly grace begun, O generous brother, if the guilty dame that caused these woes deserve a sister's name, would heaven, ere all these dreadful deeds were done, the day that showed me to the golden sun had seen my death? Why did not whirlwinds bear the fatal infant to the fowls of air? Why sunk I not beneath the whelming tide, and midst the roarings of the waters died? Heaven filled up all my ills, and I accursed bore all, and Paris, of those ills the worst, Helen at least a braver spouse might claim, warmed with some virtue, some regard of fame. Now tired with toils, thy fainting limbs recline, with toil sustained for Paris's sake and mine, the gods have linked our miserable doom, our present woe and infamy to come. Why shall it spread and last through ages long? Example sad, and theme of future song." The chief replied, This time forbids to rest. The Trojan bands by hostile fury pressed, demand their Hector, and his arm require the combat urges, and my soul's on fire. Urge thou thy knight to march where glory calls, and timely join me, ere I leave the walls, ere yet I mingle in the direful fray. My wife, my infant, claim a moment's stay. This day, perhaps the last that sees me here, demands a parting word, a tender tear. This day some god who hates our Trojan land may vanquish Hector by a Grecian hand. He said, and passed with sad presaging heart to seek his spouse, his soul's far dearer part. At home he sought her, but he sought in vain. She, with one maid of all her menial train, had hence retired, and with her second joy the young Astinanix, the hope of Troy, pensive she stood on Ilion's towery height, beheld the war, and sickened at the sight, there her sad eyes in vain her lord explore, or weep the wounds her bleeding country bore. But he who found not whom his soul desired, whose virtue charmed him as her beauty fired, stood in the gates and asked what way she bent her parting step, if to the fane she went where late the morning matrons made resort, or sought her sisters in the Trojan court. Not to the court, replied the attendant train, nor mixed with matrons to Minerva's fane, to Ilion's steepy tower she bent her way, to mark the fortunes of the doubtful day. Troy fled, she heard, before the Grecian sword. She heard and trembled for her absent lord. Distracted with surprise, she seemed to fly, fear on her cheek and sorrow in her eye. The nurse attended with her infant boy, the young Astyanax, the hope of Troy. Hector, this heard, returned without delay, swift through the town, he trod his former way, through streets of palaces and walks of state, and met the mourner at the Scaeon gate. With haste to meet him sprung the joyful fair, his blameless wife, Aetion's wealthy heir. Cilician Thebe, great Aetion swayed, and Hippoplacus, wide extended shade. The nurse stood near, and whose embraces pressed, his only hope hung smiling at her breast, whom each soft charm and early grace adorn, fair as the newborn star that gilds the morn. To this loved infant Hector gave the name... Scamandrius, from Scamander's honoured stream. Asteanix, the Trojan, called the boy, from his great father, the defence of Troy. Silent the warrior smiled, and pleased, resigned to tender passions all his mighty mind. His beauteous princess cast a mournful look, hung on his hand, and then dejected spoke, her bosom laboured with a boding sigh, and the big tear stood trembling in her eye. Two daring prince, ah, whither dost thou run? Ah, too forgetful of thy wife and son, and thinkest thou not how wretched we shall be, a widow I, a helpless orphan he? Well, sure, such courage length of life denies, and thou must fall thy virtuous sacrifice. Greece, in her single heroes, strove in vain. Now hosts oppose thee, and thou must be slain. O oh, grant me, gods, ere Hector meets his doom, all I can ask of heaven an early tomb. So shall my days in one sad tenor run, and end with sorrows as they first begun. No parent now remains my griefs to share, no father's aid, no mother's tender care. The fierce Achilles wrapped our walls in fire, laid Thebe waste, and slew my warlike sire. His fate, compassion, in the victor bred, stern as he was, he yet revered the dead. His radiant arms preserved from hostile spoil, and laid him decent on the funeral pile, then raised a mountain, where his bones were burned, the mountain nymphs the rural tomb adorn, Jove's sylvan daughters bade their elves bestow a barren shade, and in his honour grow. 
by the same arm, my seven brave brothers fell, in one sad day beheld the gates of hell, while the fat herds and snowy flocks they fed, amid their fields the hapless heroes bled. My mother lived to wear the victor's bands, the queen of Hippoplasia's sylvan lands. Redeemed too late, she scarce beheld again her pleasing empire and her native plain, when, ah, oppressed by life-consuming woe, she fell a victim to Diana's bow. Yet while my Hector still survives, I see my father, mother, brethren, all in thee, alas, my parents, brothers, kindred, all once more will perish if my Hector fall, thy wife, thy infant, in thy danger share. O oh, prove a husband's and a father's care, that quarter most the skilful Greeks annoy, where yon wild fig-trees join the wall of Troy. Thou from this tower defend the important post, there Agamemnon points his dreadful host, that past Tydides Ajax strived again, and there the vengeful Spartan fires his train. Thrice our bold foes the fierce attack have given, or led by hopes or dictated from heaven, let others in the field their arms employ, but stay my Hector here, and guard his Troy." The chief replied, "'That post shall be my care, not that alone, but all the works of war. How would the sons of Troy in arms renowned, and Troy's proud dames whose garments sweep the ground, attaint the luster of my former name, should Hector basely quit the field of fame? My early youth was bred to martial pains. My soul impels me to the embattled plains. Let me be foremost to defend the throne, and guard my father's glories and my own. Yet come it will, the day decreed by fates, how my heart trembles while my tongue relates the day when thou, imperial Troy, must bend, and see thy warriors fall, thy glories end, and yet no dire presage so wounds my mind, my mother's death, the ruin of my kind, not Priam's hoary hairs defiled with gore, not all my brothers gasping on the shore, as thine, Andromache, thy griefs I dread, I see thee trembling, weeping, captive led, in Argive looms our battles to design, and woes of which so large a part was thine, to bear the victor's hard commands, or bring the weight of waters from Hyperius' spring, there while you groan beneath the load of life, they cry, Behold the mighty Hector's wife, some haughty Greek who lives thy tears to see, embitters all thy woes by naming me. The thoughts of glory past and present shame, a thousand griefs shall waken at the name." May I lie cold before that dreadful day, pressed with a load of monumental clay. Thy Hector, wrapped in everlasting sleep, shall neither hear thee sigh, nor see thee weep. Thus having spoke, the illustrious chief of Troy stretched his fond arms to clasp the lovely boy. The babe clung, crying to his nurse's breast, scared at the dazzling helm and nodding crest. With secret pleasure each fond parent smiled, and Hector hasted to relieve his child. The glittering terrors from his brows unbound, and placed the beaming helmet on the ground, then kissed the child, and lifting high in the air, thus to the gods preferred a father's prayer. O thou, whose glory fills the ethereal throne, and O ye deathless powers, protect my son. Grant him, like me, to purchase just renown, to guard the Trojans, to defend the crown, against his country's foes the war to wage, and rise the Hector of the future age. So when triumphant from successful toils of heroes slain, he bears the reeking spoils, whole hosts may hail him with deserved acclaim and say, This chief transcends his father's fame. While pleased amidst the general shouts of Troy, his mother's conscious heart o'erflows with joy. He spoke, and fondly gazing on her charms, restored the pleasing burden to her arms, soft on her fragrant breast the babe she laid, hushed to repose, and with a smile surveyed, the troubled pleasure soon chastised by fear, she mingled with a smile a tender tear. The softened chief with kind compassion viewed, and dried the falling drops, and thus pursued, Andromache, my soul's far better part, why with untimely sorrows heaves thy heart? No hostile hand can antedate my doom, till fate condemns me to the silent tomb. Fixed is the term to all the race of earth, and such the hard condition of our birth. No force can then resist, no flight can save, all sink alike, the fearful and the brave. No more, but hasten to thy tasks at home. There guide the spindle, and direct the loom. Me, glory summons to the martial scene, 
the field of combat is the sphere for men, where heroes wore the foremost place I claim, the first in danger as the first in fame. Thus having said, the glorious chief resumes his towery helmet, black with shading plumes, his princess parts with a prophetic sigh, unwilling parts, and oft reverts her eye, that streamed at every look, then moving slow, sought her own palace and indulged her woe. There, while her tears deplored the godlike man, through all her train the soft infection ran, the pious maids their mingled sorrows shed, and mourned the living Hector as the dead. But now, no longer deaf to honour's call, forth issues Paris from the palace wall, in brazen arms that cast a gleamy ray, swift through the town the warrior bends his way, the wanton courser thus with reins unbound, breaks from his stall and beats the trembling ground, pampered, and proud he seeks the wanted tides, and loves in height of blood his shining sides, his head now freed, he tosses to the skies, his mane dishevelled o'er his shoulders flies, he snuffs the females in the distant plain, and springs exulting to his fields again, with equal triumph sprightly bold and gay in arms refulgent as the god of day, the son of Priam, glorying in his might, rushed forth with Hector to the fields of fight. And now, the warriors passing on the way, the graceful Paris first excused his stay, to whom the noble Hector thus replied, O chief in blood, and now in arms allied, thy power in war with justice none contest, known is thy courage and thy strength confessed. What pity sloth should seize a soul so brave, or god like Paris live a woman's slave? My heart weeps blood at what the Trojans say, and hopes thy deed shall wipe the stain away. Haste then, in all their glorious labours share, for much they suffer for thy sake in war. These ills shall cease, whene'er by Jove's decree we crown the bold to heaven and liberty, while the proud foe his frustrate triumphs mourns, and Greece, indignant through her seas, returns. The end of Book Six of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope, and read by Rick Tishner for Let It Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book 7. Argument. The Single Combat of Hector and Ajax. The battle renewing with double ardor upon the return of Hector, Minerva is under apprehensions for the Greeks. Apollo, seeing her descend from Olympus, joins her near the Scaean Gate. They agreed to put off the general engagement for that day, and incite Hector to challenge the Greeks to a single combat. Nine of the princes accepting the challenge, the lot is cast, and falls upon Ajax. These heroes, after several attacks, are parted by the night. The Trojans, calling a council, Antenor proposes the delivery of Helen to the Greeks, to which Paris will not consent, but offers to restore them her riches. Priam sends a herald to make this offer, and to demand a truce, the last of which only is agreed to by Agamemnon. When the funerals are performed, the Greeks, pursuant to the advice of Nestor, erect a fortification to protect their fleet in camp, flanked with towers, and defended by a ditch and palisades. Neptune testifies his jealousy at this work, but is pacified by a promise from Jupiter. Both armies pass the night in feasting, but Jupiter disheartens the Trojans with thunder and other signs of his wrath. The three-and-twentieth day ends with the duel of Hector and Ajax. The next day, the truce is agreed. Another is taken up in the funeral rites of the slain, and one more in building the fortification before the ships, so that somewhat about three days is employed in this book. The scene lies wholly in the field. So spoke the guardian of the Trojan state, then rushed impetuous through the Scaean gate. Him Paris followed to the dire alarms, both breathing slaughter, both resolved in arms, as when to sailors labouring through the main, that long have heaved the weary oar in vain, Jove bids at length the expected gales arise. The gales blow grateful, and the vessel flies. So welcome these to Troy's desiring train. The bands are cheered, the war awakes again." Bold Paris first, the work of death begun, on great Menestheus, Arethus's son, sprung from the fair Philomeda's embrace, the pleasing arm was his native place, then sunk Aeonius to the shades below, beneath his steely cask he felt the blow, full on his neck from Hector's weighty hand, and rolled with limbs relaxed along the land. By Glaucus's spear 
the bold infamous bleeds, fixed in the shoulders as he mounts his steeds. Headlong he tumbles, his slack nerves unbound, drop the cold, useless members on the ground. When now Minerva saw her Argives slain, from vast Olympus to the gleaming plain fierce she descends, Apollo marked her flight, nor shot less swift from Ilion's towery height. Radiant they met beneath the beechen shade, when thus Apollo to the blue-eyed maid, What cause, O daughter of almighty Jove, thus wings thy progress from the realms above, once more impetuous thy way, to give to Greece the long-divided day? Too much has Troy already felt thy hate. Now breathe thy rage, and hush the stern debate. This day the business of the field suspend, war soon shall kindle and great Ilion bend, since vengeful goddesses confederate join to raise her walls, though built by hands divine. To whom the progeny of Jove replies, I left for this the counsel of the skies. But who shall bid conflicting hosts forbear? What ought shall calm the furious sons of war? To her, the god, great Hector's soul in sight, to dare the boldest Greek to single flight, to dare the boldest Greek to single fight, till Greece, provoked, from all her numbers, show a warrior worthy to be Hector's foe. At this agreed, the heavenly powers withdrew, sage Helenus their secret counsels knew. Hector, inspired, he sought, to him addressed, thus told the dictates of his sacred breast, O son of Priam, let thy faithful ear receive my words, thy friends and brother here, go forth persuasive, and a while engage the warring nations to suspend their rage, then dare the boldest of the hostile train to mortal combat on the listed plain. For not this day shall end thy glorious date. The gods have spoke it, and their voice is fate. He said. The warrior heard the word with joy, then with his spear restrained the youth of Troy, held by the midst athwart, on either hand the squadrons part, the expecting Trojans stand, great Agamemnon bids the Greeks forbear, they breathe and hush the tumult of the war, the Athenian maid and glorious god of day, with silent joy the settling hosts survey, in forms of vultures on the beach's height, they sit concealed and wait the future fight, the thronging troops obscure the dusky fields, horrid with bristling spears and gleaming shields, as when a general's darkness veils the main, soft zephyr curling the wide watery plain, the waves scarce heave, the face of ocean sleeps, and a still horror saddens all the deeps, thus in thick orders settling wide around. At length composed they sit and shade the ground, Great Hector first, amidst both armies, broke the solemn silence, and their powers bespoke. Here, all ye Trojan, all ye Grecian bands, what my soul prompts, and what some god commands, great Jove, averse our warfare to compose, o'erwhelms the nations with new toils and woes. War, with a fiercer tide, once more returns, till Ilion falls, or till yon navy burns. You then, O princes of the Greeks, appear. Tis Hector speaks, and calls the gods to hear. From all your troops select the boldest knight, and him the boldest Hector dares to fight. Here, if I fall by chance of battle slain, be his my spoil, and his these arms remain. But let my body to my friends return, and Trojan flee be burned, and if Apollo, in whose aid I trust, shall stretch your daring champion in the dust, if mine the glory to despoil the foe, on Phoebus' temple I'll his arms bestow. The breathless carcass to your navy sent, Greece on the shore shall raise a monument, which, when some future mariner surveys, washed by broad Hellespont's resounding seas, thus shall he say, a valiant Greek lies there, by Hector slain, the mighty man of war. The stone shall tell your vanquished hero's name, and distant ages learn the victor's fame. This fierce defiance Greece astonished heard, blushed to refuse, and to accept it feared. Stern, Menelaus, first the silence broke, and, inly groaning, thus opprobrious spoke. Women of Greece, O scandal of your race, 
whose coward souls your manly form disgrace? How great the shame when every age shall know that not a Grecian met this noble foe! Go then, resolve to earth from whence ye grew, a heartless, spiritless, inglorious crew. Be what ye seem unanimated clay, myself will dare the danger of the day. Tis man's bold task the generous strife to try, but in the hands of God is victory. These words, scarce spoke, with generous ardour pressed, his manly limbs in azure arms he dressed. That day Atrides, a superior hand, had stretched thee breathless on the hostile strand. But all at once, thy fury to compose, the kings of Greece, an awful band arose. Even he, their chief, great Agamemnon, pressed thy daring hand, and this advice addressed, Whither, O Menelaus, wouldst thou run, and tempt a fate which prudence bids thee shun? Grieved, though thou art, forbear the rash design. Great Hector's arm is mightier far than thine. Even fierce Achilles learned its force to fear, and trembling met this dreadful son of war. Sit thou secure amidst the social band, Greece and our cause shall arm some powerful hand, the mightiest warrior of the Achaean name, though bold and burning with desire of fame, content the doubtful honour might forego, so great the danger and so brave the foe, he said, and turned his brother's vengeful mind. He stooped to reason, and his rage resigned. No longer bent to rush on certain harms, his joyful friends unbrace his azure arms. He from whose lips divine persuasion flows, grave Nestor then, in graceful act arose. Thus to the kings he spoke, What grief, what shame attend on Greece, and all the Grecian name! How shall, alas, her hoary heroes mourn their sons degenerate, and their race a scorn! What Tears shall down thy silvery beard be rolled, O Peleus, old in arms and wisdom old, once with what joy the generous prince would hear of every chief who fought this glorious war, participate their fame, and pleased inquire each name, each action, and each hero's sire. Gods, should he see our warriors trembling stand, and trembling all before one hostile hand? How would he lift his aged arms on high, lament in glorious Greece, and beg to die? Oh, would to all the immortal powers above, Minerva, Phoebus, and almighty Jove, years might again roll back my youth renew, and give this arm the spring which once it knew when fierce in war, where Jardin's waters fall, I led my troops to Phaea's trembling wall, and with the Arcadian spears my prowess tried, where Celadon rolls down his rapid tide. Where ere Uthelion braved us in the field, proud Ariathus's dreadful arms to wield, great Ariathus, known from shore to shore by the huge knotted iron mace he bore, no lance he shook, nor bent the twanging bow, but broke with this the battle of the foe. Him not by manly force, Lysurgis slew, whose guileful javelin from the thicket th flew, deep in a winding way his breast assailed, nor aught the warrior's thundering mace availed, supine he fell. Those arms which Mars before had given the vanquished, now the victor bore. But when old age had dimmed Lysurgis's eyes, to Eurothalion he consigned the prize. Furious with this he crushed our levelled bands, and dared the trial of the strongest hands— nor could the strongest hands his fury stay. All saw and feared his huge, tempestuous sway, till I, the youngest of the host, appeared, and youngest met whom all our army feared. I fought the chief, my arms Minerva crowned, prone fell the giant o'er a length of ground. What then I was, or, oh, were your Nestor now, oh, not Hector's self should want an equal foe, but warriors, you, that youthful vigour boast, the flower of Greece, the examples of our host, sprung from such fathers who such numbers sway, can you stand trembling and desert the day? His warm reproofs the listening kings in flame, and nine, the noblest of the Grecian name, up started fierce, but far before the rest, the king of men advanced his dauntless breast. Then bold Tydides, great in arms, appeared, and next his bulk gigantic Ajax reared. Oleus, 
followed. Idomen was there, and Marion dreadful as the god of war. With these, Eurypylus and Thoas stand, and wise Ulysses closed the daring band. All these alike inspired with noble rage, demand the fight to whom the Pylian sage, lest thirst of glory your brave souls divide, what chief shall combat? Let the gods decide. Whom heaven shall choose, be his the chance to raise his country's fame, his own immortal praise. The lots produced, each hero signs his own. Then, in the general's helm, the fates are thrown. The people pray with lifted eyes and hands, and vows like these ascend from all the bands. Grant thou, Almighty, in whose hand is fate a worthy champion for the Grecian state. This task let Ajax or Tydides prove, or he, the king of kings, beloved by Jove. Old Nestor shook the cask. By heaven-inspired leaped forth the lot of every Greek desired. This, from the right to left, the herald bears, held out in order to the Grecian peers. Each to his rival yield the mark unknown, till godlike Ajax finds the lot his own. Surveys the inscription with rejoicing eyes, then casts before him, and with transport cries, Warriors! I claim the lot, and arm with joy, be mine the conquest of this chief of Troy. Now, while my brightest arms my limbs invest, to Saturn's son be all your vows addressed. But pray in secret, lest the foe should hear, and deem your prayers the mean effect of fear. Said I in secret? No. Your vows declare in such a voice as fills the earth and air. Lives there a chief whom Ajax ought to dread? Ajax, in all the toils of battle bred? From more like Salamis I drew my birth, and, born to combats, fear no force on earth. He said. The troops with elevated eyes implore the god whose thunder rends the skies. O father of mankind, superior lord, on lofty Ida's holy hill adored, who, in the highest heaven, hast fixed thy throne, supreme of gods, unbounded and alone, grant thou that Telamon may bear away the praise and conquest of this doubtful day, or, if illustrious Hector be thy care, that both may claim it, and that both may share. Now Ajax braced his dazzling armor on, sheathed in bright steel the giant warrior shone. He moves to combat with majestic pace, so stalks in arms the grisly god of Thrace, when Jove to punish faithless men prepares, and gives whole nations to the waste of wars. Thus marched the chief, tremendous as a god. Grimly he smiled, earth trembled as he strode, his massy javelin quivering in his hand. He stood the bulwark of the Grecian band. Through every Argive heart new transport ran, all Troy stood trembling at the mighty man. Even Hector paused, and with new doubt oppressed, felt his great heart suspended in his breast. "'Twas vain to seek retreat, and vain to fear. Himself had challenged, and the foe drew near. Stern Telamon behind his ample shield, as from a brazen tower, o'erlooked the field. Huge was its orb, with seven thick folds o'ercast, of tough bullhides, of solid brass, the last, the work of Tycheus, who in highly dwelled, and in all arts of armory excelled. This Ajax bore before his manly breast, and threatening, thus his adverse chief addressed, Hector, approach my arm, and singly know what strength thou hast, and what the Grecian foe. Achilles shuns the fight, yet some there are not void of soul, and not unskilled in war. Let him, unactive on the sea-beat shore, indulge his wrath, and aid our arms no more. Whole troops of heroes Greece has yet to boast, and sends thee one a sample of her host. Such as I am, I come to prove thy might. No more be sudden, and begin the fight. O son of Telamon, thy country's pride! To Ajax thus the Trojan prince replied, Me as a boy or woman wouldst thou fright, new to the field and trembling at the fight? Thou meetest a chief deserving of thy arms, to combat born and bred amidst alarms. I know to shift my ground, remount the car, turn, charge, and answer every call of war. To right, to left, the dexterous lance I wield, and bear thick battle on my sounding shield. But open be our fight, and bold each blow, I steal no conquest from a noble foe. He said, and rising high above the field, whirled the long lance against the sevenfold shield. 
full on the brass descending from above through six bullhides the furious weapon drove till in the seventh it fixed then ajax threw through hector's shield the forceful javelin flew his corslet enters and his garment rends and glancing downwards near his flank descends the wary trojan shrinks and bending low beneath his buckler disappoints the blow from their board shields the chiefs their javelins drew then close impetuous and the charge renew fierce as the mountain lions bathed in blood or foaming boars the terror of the wood at ajax hector his long lance extends the blunted point against the buckler bends but ajax watchful as his foe drew near drove through the trojan tog the knotty spear it reached his neck with matchless strength impelled spouts the black gore and dims his shining shield yet ceased not hector thus but stooping down in his strong hand upheaved a flinty stone black craggy vast to this his force he bends full on the brazen boss the stone descends the hollow brass resounded with the shock then ajax seized the fragment of a rock applied each nerve and swinging round on high with force tempestuous let the ruin fly the huge stone thundering through his buckler broke his slackened knees received the numbing stroke great hector falls extended on the field his bulk supporting on the shattered shield nor wanted heavenly aid apollo's might confirmed his sinews and restored to fight and now both heroes their broad falchions drew in flaming circles round their heads they flew but then by herald's voice the word was given the sacred ministers of earth and heaven divine tathibius whom the greeks employ and sage idaeus on the part of troy between the swords their peaceful sceptres reared and first idaeus's awful voice was heard forbear my sons your further force to prove both dear to men and both beloved of jove to either host your matchless worth is known, each sounds your praise, and war is all your own. But now the night extends her awful shade, the goddess parts you, be the night obeyed. To whom great Ajax his high soul expressed, O sage, to Hector be these words addressed, let him who first provoked our chiefs to fight, let him demand the sanctions of the night. If first he asked it, I content obey, and cease the strife when Hector shows the way. O oh, first of Greeks, his noble foe rejoined, whom heavens adorns superior to thy kind, with strength of body and with worth of mind, now martial law commands us to forbear. Hereafter we shall meet in glorious war. Some future day shall I lengthen out the strife, and let the gods decide of death or life. Since then the night extends her gloomy shade, and heaven enjoins it, be the night obeyed. Return, brave Ajax, to thy Grecian friends, and joy the nations whom thy arm defends, as I shall glad each chief and Trojan wife who wearies heaven with vows for Hector's life. But let us on this memorable day exchange some gift that Greece and Troy may say, not hate, but glory, made these chiefs contend, and each brave foe was in his soul a friend. With that, a sword with stars of silver graced, the baldric studded, and the sheath and chaste he gave the Greek, the generous Greek bestowed a radiant belt that rich with purple glowed. Then, with majestic grace, they quit the plain. This seeks the Grecian, that the Phrygian train. The Trojan bands, returning Hector, wait, and hail with joy the champion of their state. Escaped great Ajax, they survey him round, alive, unharmed, and vigorous from his wound. To Troy's high gate the godlike man they bear, their present triumph as their late despair. But Ajax, glorying in his hardy deed, the well-armed Greeks to Agamemnon lead, a steer for sacrifice the king designed, of full five years and of the nobler kind. The victim falls, they strip the smoking hide, the beast they quarter and the joints divide, then spread the tables the repast prepare, each takes his seat and each receives his share. The king himself, an honorary sign, before great Ajax placed the mighty chine, when now the rage of hunger was removed, Nestor, in each persuasive art approved, the sage whose counsels long had swayed the rest in words like these his prudent thoughts expressed. How dear, O kings, this fatal day has cost what Greeks are perished, what are people lost, what tides of blood have drenched Scamander's shore, what crowds of heroes sunk to raise no more, 
Then hear me, chief, nor let the morrow's light awake thy squadrons to new toils of fight. Some space at least permit the war to breathe, while we to flames our slaughtered friends bequeath. From the red field their scattered bodies bear, and nigh the fleet a funeral structure rear, so decent urns their snowy bones may keep, and pious children o'er their ashes weep. Here, where on one promiscuous pile they blazed, high o'er them all a general tomb be raised, next to secure our camp and naval powers, raise an embattled wall with lofty towers, from space to space be ample gates around, for passing chariots and a trench profound, so Greece to combat shall in safety go, nor fear the fierce incursions of the foe. "'Twas thus the sage his wholesome counsel moved, "'the sceptred kings of Greece his words approved. "'Meanwhile convened at Priam's palace gate "'the Trojan peers in knightly council sate. "'A senate void of order as of choice, "'their hearts were fearful and confused their voice. "'Antenor, rising, thus demands their ear. "'Ye Trojans, Dardans, and Auxilars, hear! "'Tis heaven the counsel of my breast inspires, "'and I but move what every god requires. "'Let Sparta's treasures... Be this hour restored, and Argive Helen own her ancient lord. The ties of faith, the sworn alliance broke, our impious battles the just gods provoke. As this advice ye practice or reject, so hope success or dread the dire effect. The senior spoke and sate, to whom replied the graceful husband of the Spartan bride, Gold counsels, Trojan, may become the years, but... Sound ungrateful in a warrior's ears, old man, if void of fallacy or art thy words express the purpose of thy heart, thou in thy time more sound advice hast given, but wisdom has its date assigned by heaven. Then hear me, princes of the Trojan name, their treasures I'll restore, but not the dame. My treasures too for peace I will resign, but be this bright possession ever mine. Twas then the glowing discord to compose, Slow from his seat the revered Priam rose. His godlike aspect deep attention drew. He paused, and these pacific words ensue. Ye Trojans, Dardans, and auxiliar bands, Now take refreshment as the hour demands. Guard well the walls, relieve the watch of night, Till the new sun restores the cheerful light. Then shall our herald to the Atrides sent, Before their ships proclaim my son's intent. Next, let a truce be asked, That Troy may burn her slaughtered heroes, And their bones in urn. That done, once more the fate of war be tried, And whose the conquest mighty Jove decide. The monarch spoke. The warriors snatched with haste, each at his post in arms a short repast. Soon as the rosy morn had waked the day, to the black ships Idaeus bent his way. There to the sons of Mars in council found, he raised his voice. The host stood listening round. Ye sons of Atreus and ye Greeks give ear, the words of Troy and Troy's great monarch hear. Pleased may ye hear, so heaven succeed my prayers, what Paris, author of the war, declares. The spoils and treasures he to Ilion bore, oh, had he perished ere they touched our shore. He proffers injured Greece with large increase of added Trojan wealth to buy the peace. But to restore the beauteous bride again this Greece demands, and Troy requests in vain. Next, O oh, ye chiefs, we ask a truce to burn our slaughtered heroes and their bones in urn. That done, once more the fate of war be tried, and who's the conquest mighty Jove decide? The Greeks gave ear, but none the silence broke. At length Tydides rose, and rising spoke. O oh, take not, friends, defrauded of your fame, their proffered wealth, nor even the Spartan dame. Let conquest make them ours. Fate shakes their wall, and Troy already totters to her fall. The admiring chiefs, and all the Grecian name, with general shouts, return him loud acclaim. Then thus the king of kings rejects the peace. Harold, in him thou hearest the voice of Greece. For what remains, let funeral flames be fed with heroes' corpse. I war not with the dead. Go search your slaughtered chiefs on yonder plain, and gratify the manes of the slain. Be witness, Jove, whose thunder rolls on high, he said, 
and reared his scepter to the sky. To sacred Troy, where all her princes lay to wait the event the herald bent his way, he came and, standing in the midst, explained the peace rejected, but the truce obtained. Straight to their several cares the Trojans moved, some searching the plains, some failed the sounding grove, nor less the Greeks, descending on the shore, hewed the green forests and the bodies bore, and now from forth the chambers of the main, to shed his sacred light on earth again, arose the golden chariot of the day, and tipped the mountains with a purple ray, in mingled throngs the Greek and Trojan train, through heaps of carnage searched the mournful plain, scarce could the friend his slaughtered friend explore, with dust dishonoured and deformed with gore, the wounds they washed, their pious tears they shed, and laid along their cause deplored the dead. Sage Priam checked their grief, with silent haste the body's descent on the piles were placed. With melting hearts the cold remains they burned, and sadly slow to sacred Troy returned, nor less the Greeks their pious sorrow shed, and descent on the pile disposed the dead. The cold remains consume with equal care, and slowly, sadly, to their fleet repair. Now, ere the morn had streaked with reddening light, the doubtful confines of the day and night. About the dying flames the Greeks appeared, and round the pile a general tomb they reared. Then, to secure the camp and naval powers, they raised embattled walls with lofty towers. From space to space were ample gates around, for passing chariots, and a trench profound, of large extent and deep in earth below, Strong piles in fixed stood averse to the foe. So toiled the Greeks. Meanwhile the gods above in shining circle round their father Jove, amazed beheld the wondrous works of man. Then he whose trident shakes the earth began, What mortals henceforth shall our power adore, our fanes frequent, our oracles implore, if the proud Grecians thus successful boast their rising bulwarks on the sea-beat coast? See the long walls extending to the main. No god consulted and no victim slain. Their fame shall fill the world's remotest ends, wide as the morn her golden beam extends, while old Laomedon's divine abodes those radiant structures raised by labouring gods shall, raised and lost in long oblivion, sleep. Thus spoke the hoary monarch of the deep. The almighty thunderer with a frown replies, that clouds the world and blackens half the sky. Strong God of ocean, thou, whose rage can make the solid earth's eternal basis shake, what cause of fear from mortal works could move the meanest subject of our realms above? Where e'er the sun's refulgent rays are cast, thy power is honoured and thy fame shall last. But yon proud work no future aid shall view. No trace remain where once the glory grew. The sapped foundations by thy force shall fall, and whelmed beneath the waves drop the huge wall. Vast drifts of sand shall change the former shore, the ruin vanished, and the name no more. Thus they in heaven, while o'er the Grecian train the rolling sun descending to the main, beheld the finished work, their bulls they slew, back from the tents the savoury vapour flew, and now the fleet, arrived from Lemnos' strands, with Bacchus' blessings, cheered the generous bands of fragrant wines, the rich Eunaeus sent a thousand measures to the royal tent, Eunaeus, whom... Hypsipyle of yore to Jason, shepherd of his people, bore. The rest they purchased at their proper cost, and well the plenteous freight supplied the host. Each in exchange proportioned treasures gave, some brass or iron, some an ox or slave. All night they feast, the Greek and Trojan powers, those on the fields, and these within their towers. But Jove averse the signs of wrath displayed, and shot red lightnings through the gloomy shade. Humbled they stood, pale horror seized on all, while the deep thunder shook the aerial hall. Each poured to Jove before the bowl was crowned, and large libations drenched the thirsty ground. Then late, refreshed with sleep from toils of fight, enjoyed the balmy blessings of the night. The End of Book 7 of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope, and read by Rick Kistner for Let to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book 8. Argument. The Second Battle and the Distress of the Greeks. Jupiter assembles a council of the deities and threatens them with the pains of Tartarus if they assist either side. 
Minerva only obtains of him that she may direct the Greeks by her counsels, his balances, the fates of both, and affrights the Greeks with his thunders and lightnings. Nestor alone continues in the field in great danger. Diomed relieves him, whose exploits and those of Hector are excellently described. Juno endeavors to animate Neptune to the assistance of the Greeks, but in vain. The acts of Teusa, who is at length wounded by Hector and carried off. Juno and Minerva prepare to aid the Grecians, but are restrained by Iris sent from Jupiter. The night puts an end to the battle. Hector continues in the field, the Greeks being driven to their fortifications before the ships, and gives orders to keep the watch all night in the camp to prevent the enemy from re-embarking and escaping by flight. They kindle fires through all the fields and pass the night under arms. The time of seven and twenty days is employed from the opening of the poem to the end of this book. The scene here, except of the celestial machines, lies in the field towards the seashore. Aurora, now fair daughter of the dawn, sprinkled with rosy light the dewy lawn, when Jove convened the senate of the skies where high Olympus' cloudy tops arise, the sire of gods his awful silence broke, the heavens attentive trembled as he spoke. Celestial state, immortal gods, give ear, hear our decree, and reverence what ye hear, the fixed decree which not all heaven can move. Thou, fate, fulfill it, and ye powers approve, what god but enters yon forbidden field, who yields assistance, or but wills to yield, back to the skies with shame he shall be driven, gashed with dishonest wounds the scorn of heaven, or far, O oh, far from steep Olympus throne, low in the dark Tartarian gulf shall groan, with burning chains fixed to the brazen floors, and locked by hell's inexorable doors, as deep beneath the infernal centre hurled, as from that centre to the ethereal world, let him who tempts me dread those dire abodes, and know the Almighty is the God of gods. League all your forces, then, ye powers above, join all, and try the omnipotence of Jove. Let down our golden everlasting chain, whose strong embrace holds heaven and earth and main. Strive all, of mortal and immortal birth, to drag by this the thunderer down to earth. Ye strive in vain. If I but stretch this hand, I heave the gods, the ocean, and the land. I fix the chain to great Olympus's height, and the vast world hangs trembling in my sight. For such I reign unbounded and above, and such are men and gods compared to Jove. The Almighty spoke, nor durst the powers reply. Her reverent horror silenced all the sky. Trembling, they stood before their sovereign's look. At length his best beloved, the power of wisdom, spoke. O first and greatest God, by gods adored, we own thy might, our Father and our Lord. But ah, uh, permit to pity the human state, if not to help, at least lament their fate. From fields forbidden, we submiss refrain, with arms unaiding mourn our Argives slain. Yet grant my counsels, still their breasts may move, or all but perish in the wrath of Jove. The cloud-compelling God, her suit approved, and smiled superior on his best beloved, then called his courses, and his chariot took. The steadfast firmament beneath them shook. Wrapped by the ethereal steeds the chariot rolled. Brass were their hooves, their curling manes of gold. Of heaven's undrossy gold the gods' array, refulgent, flashed intolerable day. High on the throne he shines. His courses fly between the extended earth and starry sky. But when to Ida's topmost height he came, fair nurse of fountains and of savage game, where o'er her pointed summits proudly raised, his fane breathed odors and his altar blazed, there from his radiant car the sacred sire of gods and men released the steeds of fire. Blue ambient mists the immortal steeds embraced. High on the cloudy point his seat he placed. Thence his broad eye the subject world surveys, the town and tents and navigable seas. Now had the Grecians snatched a short repast, and buckled on their shining arms with haste. Troy, Roused as soon, for on this dreadful day the fate of fathers, wives, and infants lay, 
the gates unfolding pour forth all their train. Squadrons on squadrons cloud the dusky plain. Men, steeds, and chariots shake the trembling ground. The tumult thickens and the skies resound. And now with shouts the shocking armies closed to lances, lances, shields to shields opposed. Host against host with shadowy legends drew. The sounding darts in iron tempests flew. Victors and vanquished join promiscuous cries. Triumphant shouts and dying groans arise. With streaming blood the slippery fields are dyed, and slaughtered heroes swell the dreadful tide. Long as the morning beams, increasing bright, o'er heaven's clear azure spread the sacred light, commutal death the fate of war confounds, each adverse battle gored with equal wounds. But when the sun, the height of heaven, ascends, the sire of gods his golden scales suspends with equal hand, In these explored the fate of Greece and Troy, and poised the mighty weight. Pressed with its load, the Grecian balance lies low sunk on earth. The Trojan strikes the skies. Then Jove from Ida's top his horror spreads. The clouds burst dreadful o'er the Grecian heads. Thick lightnings flash, the muttering thunder rolls. Their strength he withers and unmans their souls. Before his wrath the trembling hosts retire, the gods in terrors and the skies on fire. Nor great, Edormeneus, that sight could bear, nor each stern Ajax, thunderbolts of war, nor he, the king of war, the alarm sustained, Nestor alone, amidst the storm remained, unwilling he remained, for Paris's dart had pierced his corsal in a mortal part, fixed in the forehead where the springing man curled o'er the brow, it stung him to the brain, mad with his anguish he begins to rear, paw with his hoofs aloft and lash the air, Scarce had his falchion cut the reins, and freed the encumbered chariot from the dying steed, when dreadful Hector, thundering through the war, poured to the tumult on his whirling car. That day had stretched beneath his matchless hand the hoary monarch of the Pelian band. But Diomed beheld. From forth the crowd he rushed, and on Ulysses called aloud, Whither, O oh, whither does Ulysses run? O oh, flight unworthy, great Laertes' son, mixed with a vulgar shall thy fate be found, pierced in the back a vile dishonest wound. O oh, turn and save from Hector's direful rage the glory of the Greeks, the Pelian sage. His fruitless words are lost unheard in air. Ulysses seeks the ships and shelters there. But bold Tydides to the rescue goes, a single warrior midst a host of foes. Before the coursers with a sudden spring he leaped, and anxious thus bespoke the king, Great perils, father! Wait the unequal flight. These younger champions will oppress thy might. Thy veins no more with ancient vigour glow. Weak is thy servant, and thy coursers slow. Then haste, ascend my seat, and from the car observe the steeds of Tros, renowned in war, practised alike to turn, to stop, to chase, to dare the flight, or urge the rapid pace. These late obeyed Aeneas' guiding rein. Leave thou thy chariot to our faithful train. With these... Against yon Trojans we will go. Nor shall great Hector want an equal foe. Fierce as he is, even he may learn to fear the thirsty fury of my flying spear. Thus said the chief, and Nestor, skilled in war, approves his counsel and ascends the car. The steeds he left their trusty servants hold, Eurymedon and Sthenelus the bold. The reverent charioteer directs the course and strains his aged arm to lash the horse. Hector they face, unknowing how to fear. Fierce he drove on, Tydides whirled his spear. The spear with unerring haste mistook its way, but plunged in Inopius' bosom lay. His opening hand in death forsakes the rein. The steeds fly back, he falls and spurns the plain. Great Hector sorrows for his servant killed, yet unrevenged permits to press the field, till, to supply his place and rule the car, rose Archip Ptolemus, the fierce in war. And now had death and horror covered all. Like timorous flocks the Trojans in their wall enclosed had bled. But Jove with awful sound rolled the big thunder o'er the vast profound. Full in Tydides' face the lightning flew. The ground before him flamed with sulphur blue. The quivering steeds fell prostrate at the sight. And Nestor's trembling hand confessed his fright. He dropped the reins and shook with sacred dread. Thus turning warned the intrepid Diomed. O chief! Too daring in thy friend's defence, retire advised, and urge the chariot hence. This day of us the sovereign of the skies assists great Hector, and our palm denies. Some other son may see the happier hour, when Greece shall conquer by his heavenly power. 
"'Tis not in man his fixed decree to move. "'The great will glory to submit to Jove. "'O reverend prince,' Tydides thus replies, "'thy years are awful, and thy words are wise. "'But, ah, what grief, should haughty Hector boast, "'I fled inglorious to the guarded coast. "'Before that dire disgrace shall blast my fame, "'overwhelm me earth, and hide a warrior's shame. "'To whom Gerenian Nestor thus replied, "'Guards, can thy courage fear the Phrygians' pride?' Hector may vaunt, but who shall heed the boast? Not those who felt thy arm, the Dardan host, nor Troy, yet bleeding in her heroes lost, not even a Phrygian dame who dreads the sword that laid in dust her loved, lamented lord, he said, and hasty, o'er the gasping throng, drives the swift steeds. The chariot smokes along, the shouts of Trojans thicken in the wind, the storm of hissing javelins pours behind, then, with a voice that shakes the solid skies, pleased, Hector braves the warrior as he flies. Go, mighty hero, graced above the rest in seats of council and the sumptuous feast. Now hope no more those honours from thy train. Go, less than woman in the form of man, to scale our walls, to wrap our towers in flames, to lead in exile the fair Phrygian dames. Thy once proud hopes, presumptuous prince, are fled. This arm shall reach thy heart and stretch thee dead. Now fears dissuade him and now hopes invite to stop his courses and to stand the fight. Thrice turned the chief, and thrice imperial Jove on Ida's summits thundered from above. Great Hector heard. He saw the flashing light, the sign of conquest, and thus urged the fight. Here every Trojan, Lycian, Dardan, band, all famed in war and dreadful hand to hand, be mindful of the wreaths your arms have won, your great forefathers' glories and your own. Heard ye the voice of Jove, Success and fame await on Troy, on Greece eternal shame. In vain they skulk behind their boasted wall, weak bulwarks, destined by this arm to fall. High o'er their slighted trench our steeds shall bound, and pass victorious o'er the levelled mound. Soon as before, fight each with flames and toss the blazing brand, till their proud navy wrapped in smoke and fires all Greece encompassed in one blaze expires. Furious, he said, then bending o'er the yoke, encouraged his proud steeds while thus he spoke. Now, Xanthus, Aethon, Lampus, urge the chase, and thou, Podargus, prove thy generous race, be fleet, be fearless this important day, and all your master's well-spent care repay, for this high-fed and plenteous stall ye stand, served with pure wheat and by a princess's hand, for this my spouse of great Achon's line, so oft has steeped the strengthening grain in wine, now swift pursue, now thunder uncontrolled. Give me to seize rich Nestor's shield of gold. From Didus' shoulders strip the costly load. Volcanian arms, the labour of a god. These, if we gain, then victory, ye powers. This night, this glorious night, the fleet is ours. That heard, deep anguish stung Saturnia's soul. She shook her throne, that shook the starry pole. And thus to Neptune, thou whose force can make the steadfast earth from her foundations shake. Seest thou the Greeks by fates unjust oppressed, nor swells thy heart in that immortal breast? Yet, Aegea, Helice, thy power obey, and gifts unceasing on thine altars lay. Would all the deities of Greece combine in vain, the gloomy thunderer might repine. So should he sit with scarce a god to friend, and see his Trojans to the shades descend. Such be the scene from his Idaean bower, ungrateful prospect to the solemn power. Neptune, with wrath, rejects the rash design. What rage, what madness, furious queen, is thine? I war not with the highest. All above submit and tremble at the hand of Jove. Now godlike Hector, to whose matchless might Jove gave the glory of the destined fight, squadrons on squadrons drives and fills the fields with close-ranged chariots and with thickened shields, where the deep trench in length extended lay, compacted troops stand wedged in firm array, a dreadful front. They shake the brands and threat with long destroying flames the hostile fleet. The king of men by Juno's self-inspired toiled through the tents, and all his army fired. Swift as he moved, he lifted in his hand his purple robe, bright ensign of command. High on the midmost bark the king appeared. There, from Ulysses' deck, his voice was heard. To Ajax and Achilles reached the sound, whose distant ships the guarded navy bound. O Argives, shame of human race, he cried. The hollow vessels to his voice replied, Where now are all your glorious boasts of yore, your hasty triumphs on the Lemnian shore? 
Each fearless hero dares a hundred foes, while the feast lasts and while the goblet flows. But who to meet one martial man is found when the fight rages and the flames surround? O mighty Jove! O sire of the distressed! Was ever king like me, like me oppressed? With power immense, with justice armed in vain, my glory ravished and my people slain. To thee my vows were breathed from every shore. What altar smoked not with our victim's gore? With fat of bulls I fed the constant flame, and asked destruction to the Trojan name. Now, gracious God, far humbler our demand. Give these at least to scape from Hector's hand, and save the relics of the Grecian land. Thus prayed the king, and heaven's great father heard his vows in bitterness of soul preferred. The wrath appeased, by happy signs declares, and gives the people to their monarch's prayers. His eagle, sacred bird of heaven, he sent. A fawn, his talents trust, divine portent, high o'er the wandering hosts he soared above, who paid their vows to Panomphe and Jove. Then let the prey before his altar fall. The Greeks beheld, and transport seized on all. Encouraged by the sign, the troops revive, and fierce on Troy with doubled fury drive. Tydides, first of all the Grecian force, o'er the broad ditch impelled his foaming horse. "'pierced the deep ranks, their strongest battle tore, "'and dyed his javelin red with Trojan gore. "'Young Agelos, Fradman was his sire, "'with flying coursers shunned his dreadful ire. "'Struck through the back, the Phrygian fell oppressed, "'the dart drove on and issued at his breast. "'Had long he quits the car, his arms resound, "'his ponderous buckler thunders on the ground. "'Forth rush a tide of Greeks, the passage freed. "'The Atridae first, the Ajaces next succeed, Marionis, like Mars in arms renowned, and godlike Edoman, now past the mound. Evaeman's son next issues to the foe, and last young Teucer with his bended bow. Secure behind the Telamonian shield, the skilful archer wide surveyed the field. With every shaft some hostile victim slew, then close beneath the sevenfold orb withdrew. The conscious infant, so when fear alarms, "'retires for safety to the mother's arms. "'Thus Ajax guards his brother in the field, "'moves as he moves, and turns the shining shield, "'who first by Teucer's mortal arrows bled. "'Osilicus then fell, Ormenus dead. "'The godlike Lycophon next pressed the plain, "'with Chromius, Deator, Ophelestes, slain, "'vold Hamopion, breathless sunk to the ground, "'the bloody pile great Melanippus crowned. "'Heaps fell on heaps, sad trophies of his art, a Trojan ghost attending every dart. Great Agamemnon views with joyful eye the ranks grow thinner as his arrows fly. O oh, youth forever dear, the monarch cried, thus, always thus, thy early worth be tried. Thy brave example shall retrieve our host, thy country's saviour and thy father's boast. Sprung from an alien's bed, thy sire to grace, the vigorous offspring of a stolen embrace. Proud of his boy, he owned the generous flame, and the brave son repays his cares with fame. Now hear a monarch's vow, if heaven's high powers give me to raise Troy's long-defended towers, whatever treasures Greece for me design, the next rich honorary gift be thine, some golden tripod or distinguished car, with courses dreadful in the ranks of war, or some fair captive, whom thy eyes approve, shall recompense the warrior's toils with love. To this the chief, with praise the rest inspire, nor surge a soul already filled with fire, what strength I have be now in battle tried, till every shaft in Phrygian blood be dyed. Since rallying from our war we forced the foe, still aimed at Hector have I bent my bow. Eighty forky arrows from this hand have fled, and eight bold heroes by their points lie dead. But sure, some god denies me to destroy this fury of the field, this dog of Troy. He said, and twanged the string. The weapon flies at Hector's breast and sings along the skies. He missed the mark, but pierced Gorgithio's heart, and drenched in royal blood the thirsty dart. Fair Castianera, nymph of form divine, this offspring added to King Priam's line, as full-blown poppies overcharged with rain decline the head and drooping kiss the plain. So sinks the youth, his beauteous head depressed beneath his helmet, drops upon his breast. Another shaft the raging archer drew, that other shaft with erring fury flew, from Hector Phoebus turned the flying wound, yet fell not dry or guiltless to the ground. Thy breast, brave, Octoptolemus, it tore, and dipped its feathers in no vulgar gore. Had long he falls, his sudden fall alarms the steeds that startle at his sounding arms. Hector, with grief, his charioteer beheld, all pale and breathless on the sanguine field. 
Then bids the Briones direct the rain, quits his bright car, and issues on the plain. Dreadfully shouts, from earth a stone he took, and rushed on Tusi with the lifted rock. The youth already strained the forceful yew, the shaft already to his shoulder drew, the feather in his hand just winged for flight, touched where the neck and hollow chest unite. There where the junction knits the channel bone, the furious chief discharged the craggy stone. The bowstring burst beneath the ponderous blow, and his numbed hand dismissed his useless bow. He fell. But Ajax, his broad shield displayed, and screened his brother with a mighty shade, till great Alaster and Mesithius bore the battered archer groaning to the shore. Troy yet found grace before the Olympian sire. He armed their hands and filled their breasts with fire. The Greeks repulsed retreat behind their wall, or in the trench on heaps confusedly fall. First of the foe great Hector marched along, with terror clothed and more than mortal strong, as the bold hound that gives the lion chase with beating bosom and with eager pace, hangs on his haunch or fastens on his heels, guards as he turns and circles as he wheels. Thus oft the Grecians turned, but still they flew. Thus following Hector, still the hindmost slew, when, flying, they had passed the trench profound, and many a chief lay gasping on the ground. Before the ships a desperate stand they made, and fired the troops, and called the gods to aid. Fierce on his rattling chariot Hector came, his eyes like Gorgon shot a sanguine flame that withered all their host. Like Mars he stood, dire as the monster, dreadful as the god. Their strong distress the wife of Jove surveyed, then pensive thus to war's triumphant maid, O oh, daughter of that god, whose arm can wield the avenging bolt and shake the sable shield, now in this moment of her last despair shall wretched Greece no more confess our care, condemned to suffer the full force of fate, and drain the dregs of heaven's relentless hate? Gods! Shall one raging hand thus level all? What numbers fell, what numbers yet shall fall? What power divine shall Hector's wrath assuage? Still swells the slaughter, and still grows the rage. So spake the imperial regent of the skies, to whom the goddess with the azure eyes, long since had Hector stained these fields with gore, stretched by some argive on his native shore, but he above, the sire of heaven withstands, mocks our attempts and slights our just demands. The stubborn god, inflexible and hard, forgets my service and deserved reward. Saved I for this his favorite son distressed, by stern Eurystheus with long labors pressed. He begged with tears, he begged in deep dismay, I shot from heaven and gave his arm the day. Oh, had my wisdom known this dire event, when to grim Pluto's gloomy gates he went. The triple dog had never felt his chain, nor sticks been crossed, nor hell explored in vain. Averse to me, of all his heaven of gods, at Thetis' suit the partial thunderer nods, to grace her gloomy, fierce, resenting son, my hopes are frustrated and my Greeks undone. Some future day, perhaps, he may be moved to call his blue-eyed maid his best beloved. Haste, launch thy chariot, through yon ranks to ride, myself will arm, and thunder at thy side. Then, goddess, say, shall Hector glory then, that terror of the Greeks, that man of men, when Juno's self and Pallas shall appear, all dreadful in the crimson walks of war? What mighty Trojan then on yonder shore, expiring pale and terrible no more, shall feast the fowls and glut the dogs with gore? She ceased, and Juno reined the steeds with care. Heaven's awful empress, Saturn's other heir. Pallas, meanwhile, her various veil unbound, with flowers adorned, with art immortal crowned. The radiant robe, her sacred fingers wove, floats in rich waves and spreads the court of Jove. Her father's arms, her mighty limbs invest, his cuirass blazes on her ample breast. The vigorous power the trembling Carter sends, shook by her arm, the massy javelin bends, huge, ponderous, strong, that when her fury burns, proud tyrants humbles, and whole hosts o'erturns. Saturnia lends the lash, the coursers fly, smooth glides the chariot through the liquid sky. Heaven's gates spontaneous open to the powers, heaven's golden gates kept by the winged hours. Commissioned in alternate watch they stand, the sun's bright portals and the sky's command, close or unfold, the eternal gates of day. Bar heaven with clouds, or roll those clouds away. The sounding hinges ring, the clouds divide, prone down the steep of heaven their course they ride, but Jove, incensed from Ida's top surveyed, and thus enjoined the many-coloured maid. Thor, Mantia, mount the winds and stop their car. Against the highest who shall wage the war? If furious yet they dare the vain debate, thus have I spoke, and what I speak is fate. Their courses crushed beneath the wheels shall lie, their car and fragments scattered o'er the sky. 
My lightning these rebellious shall confound and hurl them flaming headlong to the ground, condemned for ten revolving years to weep the wounds impressed by burning thunder deep. So shall Minerva learn to fear our ire, nor dare to combat hers and nature's sire. For Juno, headstrong and imperious still, she claims some title to transgress our will. Swift as the wind, the various coloured maid from Ida's top, her golden wings displayed, to great Olympus's shining gate she flies, there meets the chariot, rushing down the skies, restrains their progress from the bright abodes, and speaks the mandate of the sire of gods. What frenzy, goddesses! What rage can move celestial minds to tempt the wrath of Jove? Desist, obedient to his high command! This is his word, and know his word shall stand. His lightning your rebellion shall confound, and hurl ye headlong, flaming to the ground. Your horses crushed beneath the wheels shall lie, your car in fragments scattered o'er the sky, yourselves condemned ten rolling years to weep the wounds impressed by burning thunder deep. So shall Minerva learn to fear his ire, nor dare to combat hers and nature's sire. For Juno had strong and imperious still, she claims some title to transgress his will. But thee, what desperate insolence has driven to lift thy lance against the king of heaven! Then mounting on the pinions of the wind, she flew, and Juno thus her rage resigned. O daughter of that god whose arm can wield the avenging bolt, and shake the dreadful shield, no more let beings of superior birth contend with Jove for this low race of earth. Triumphant now, now miserably slain, they breathe or perish as the fates ordain, but Jove's high counsels full effect shall find, and ever constant, ever rule mankind. She spoke, and backward turned her steeds of light, adorned with manes of gold and heavenly bright. The hours unloosed them, panting as they stood, and heaped their mangers with ambrosial food. They are tied, they rest in high celestial stalls, the chariot propped against the crystal walls, the pensive goddesses abashed, controlled, mixed with the gods, and fill their seats of gold. And now the thunderer meditates his flight from Ida's summits to the Olympian height, swifter than thought the wheels instinctive fly, flame through the vast of air and reach the sky, t'was Neptune's charge his courses to embrace, and fix the car on its immortal base. There stood the chariot, beaming forth its rays, till with a snowy veil he screened the blaze. He, whose all-conscious eyes the world behold, the eternal thunderer sat enthroned in gold, high heaven the footstool of his feet he makes, and wide beneath him all Olympus shakes. Trembling afar, the offending powers appeared, confused and silent, for his frown they feared. He saw their soul, and thus his word imparts, Pallas and Juno, say, why heave your hearts? Soon was your battle o'er, proud Troy retired before your face, and in your wrath expired. But no, whoe'er almighty power withstand, unmatched our force, unconquered is our hand, who shall the sovereign of the skies control? Not all the gods that can crown the starry pole. Your hearts shall tremble if our arms we take, and each immortal nerve with horror shake. For thus I speak, and what I speak shall stand. What power soe'er provokes our lifted hand, on this our hill no more shall hold his place cut off and exiled from the ethereal race. Juno and Pallas, grieving, hear the doom, but feast their souls on Ilion's woes to come. Though secret anger swelled Minerva's breast, the prudent goddess yet her wrath repressed. But Juno, impotent of rage, replies, What hast thou said, O tyrant of the skies? Strength and omnipotence invest thy throne. Tis thine to punish ours to grieve alone. For Greece we grieve, abandoned by her fate to drink the dregs of thy unmeasured hate. From fields forbidden we submiss refrain. With arms unaiding see our argives slain. Yet grant our counsels still their breasts may move, lest all should perish in the rage of Jove. The god is thus, and thus the god replies, who swells the clouds and blackens all the skies. The morning sun, awake by loud alarms, shall see the almighty thunderer in arms. What heaps of argives then shall owe the plain? Those radiant eyes shall view and view in vain, nor shall great Hector cease the rage of flight, the navy flaming and thy Greeks in flight. Even till the day when certain fates ordain that stern Achilles, his Patroclus slain, shall rise in vengeance and lay waste the plain, for such is fate, nor canst thou turn its course with all thy rage and with all thy rebel force. Fly, if thy wilt, to earth's remotest bound, where on her utmost verge the seas resound, where cursed Lepetus and Saturn dwell, fast by the brink within the streams of hell. No sun e'er gilds the gloomy horrors there, no cheerful gales refresh the lazy air, 
their arm once more the bold Titanian band, an arm in vain for what I will shall stand. Now deep in ocean sunk the lamp of light and drew beneath the cloudy veil of night. The conquering Trojans mourn his beams decayed, the Greeks rejoicing bless the friendly shade. The victors keep the field, and Hector calls a martial council near the navy walls. These to his commander's bank a part he led, where thinly scattered lay the heaps of dead. The assembled chiefs descending on the ground attend his order, and their prince surround. A massy spear he bore of mighty strength, of ten full cubits was the lance's length. The point was brass, refulgent to behold, fixed to the wood with circling rings of gold. The noble Hector on his lance reclined, and bending forward thus revealed his mind. Ye valiant Trojans, with attention here, ye Dardan bands and generous aids give ear. This day we hoped would wrap in conquering flame, Greece with her ships, and crown our toils with fame. But darkness now to save the cowards falls, and guards them trembling in their wooden walls. Obey the night, and use her peaceful hours, our steeds to forage and refresh our powers. Straight from the town be sheep and oxen sought, and strengthening bread and generous wine be brought wide o'er the field, high blazing to the sky. Let numerous fires the absent sun supply, the flaming piles with plenteous fuel raise, till the bright morn her purple beam displays, lest, in the silence and the shades of night, Greece on her sable ships attempt her flight. Not unmolested let the wretches gain their lofty decks, or safely cleave the main. Some hostile wound let every dart bestow, some lasting token of the Phrygian foe, wounds that long hence may ask their spouse's care, and warn their children from a Trojan war. Now through the circuit of our Ilian wall, let sacred Harold sound the solemn call, to bid the sires with hoary honours crowned, and beardless youths our battlements surround, firm be the guard, while distant lie our powers, and let the matrons hang with lights the towers, lest, under covert of the midnight shade, the insidious foe the naked town invade. Suffice to-night these orders to obey, a nobler charge shall rouse the dawning day. The gods, I trust, shall give to Hector's hand, from these detested foes, to free the land, who ploughed with Fates averse the watery way, what Trojan vultures are predestined to prey. Our common safety must now be the care, but soon as morning paints the fields of air, sheathed in bright arms let every troop engage, and the fired fleet behold the battle rage. Then, then shall Hector and Tydides prove whose fates are heaviest in the scales of Jove. Tomorrow's light, oh haste the glorious morn, shall see his bloody spoils in triumph borne. With this keen javelin shall his breast be gored, and prostrate horses bleed around their lord. Certain as this, O oh, might my days endure, from age inglorious and black death secure, so might my life and glory know no bound, like palace worshipped, like the sun renowned, as the next dawn, the last they shall enjoy, shall crush the Greeks and end the woes of Troy. The leader spoke. From all his host around, shouts of applause along the shores resound, each from the yoke the smoking steeds untied, and fixed their headstalls to his chariot side. Fat sheep and oxen from the town are led with generous wine and all sustaining bread. Full hecatombs lay burning on the shore. The winds to heaven the curling vapours bore, ungrateful offering to the immortal powers whose wrath hung heavy o'er the Trojan towers. Nor Priam nor his sons obtained their grace, Proud Troy they hated and their guilty race. The troops, exulting, sat in order round, And beaming fires illumined all the ground, As when the moon, refulgent lamp of night, O'er heaven's pure azure spreads a sacred light, When not a breath disturbs the deep serene, And not a cloud or casts the solemn scene, Around her throne the vivid planets roll, And stars unnumbered gild the glowing pole, O'er the dark trees a yellow verdure shed, And tip with silver every mountain's head. Then shine the veils, the rocks in prospect rise, A flood of glory bursts from all the skies, The conscious swains rejoicing in the sight, Eye the blue vault, and bless the beautiful light. So many flames before proud Ilion blaze, And light and glimmering Xanthus with their rays. The long reflections of the distant fires gleam on the walls and tremble on the spires. A thousand piles the dusky horrors gild, and shoot a shady luster o'er the field. Full fifty guards each flaming pile attend, whose umbered arms by fits thick flashes send. 
Loud neigh the coursers o'er their heaps of corn, and ardent warriors wait the rising morn. The end of Book Eight of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope, read by Rick Kistner for it to go on the web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book Nine, Argument. The Embassy to Achilles. Agamemnon, after the last day's defeat, proposes to the Greeks to quit the siege and return to their country. Diomed opposes this, and Nestor seconds him, praising his wisdom and resolution. He orders the guard to be strengthened, and a council summoned to deliberate what measures are to be followed in this emergency. Agamemnon pursues this advice, and Nestor further prevails upon him to send ambassadors to Achilles in order to move him to a reconciliation. Ulysses and Ajax are made choice of who are accompanied by old Phoenix. They make, each of them, very moving and pressing speeches, but are rejected with roughness by Achilles, who, notwithstanding, retains Phoenix in his tent. The ambassadors return unsuccessfully to the camp, and the troops betake themselves to sleep. This book, and the next following, take up the space of one night, which is the twenty-seventh from the beginning of the poem. The scene lies on the seashore, the station of the Grecian ships. Thus joyful Troy maintained the watch of night, while fear, pale comrade of inglorious flight, and heaven-bred horror on the Grecian part, sat on each face and saddened every heart. As from its cloudy dungeon issuing forth, a double tempest of the west and north swells o'er the sea, from Thracia's frozen shore heaps waves on waves and bids the Aegean roar. This way and that the boiling deeps are tossed. Such various passions urged the troubled host, great Agamemnon grieved above the rest. Superior sorrows swelled his royal breast. Himself his orders to the heralds bears, to bid to counsel all the Grecian peers. But bid in whispers... These surround their chief in solemn sadness and majestic grief. The king amidst the mournful circle rose, down his wan cheek a briny torrent flows. So silent fountains from a rock's tall head in sable stream soft trickling waters shed. With more than vulgar grief he stood oppressed, words mixed with sighs thus bursting from his breast. Ye sons of Greece, partake your leader's care, Fellows in arms and princes of the war, Of partial Jove too justly we complain, And heavenly oracles believed in vain. A safe return was promised to our toils, With conquest honoured and enriched with spoils. Now shameful flight alone can save the host, Our wealth, our people, and our glory lost. So Jove decrees, almighty Lord of all, Jove, at whose nod whole empires rise or fall, Who shakes the feeble props of human trust, and towers and armies humbles to the dust. Haste then, forever quit these fatal fields, haste to the joys our native country yields, spread all your canvas, all your oars employ, nor hope the fall of heaven-defended Troy. He said. Deep silence held the Grecian band, silent, unmoved, in dire dismay they stand, a pensive scene, till Tadeus' warlike son rolled on the king his eyes and thus begun, when kings advise us to renounce our fame, first let him speak who first has suffered shame. If I oppose thee, prince, thy wrath withhold. The laws of counsel bid my tongue be bold. Thou first and thou alone in fields of flight durst brand my courage and defame my might. Nor from a friend the unkind reproach appeared. The Greeks stood witness, all our army heard. The gods, O chief, from whom our honours spring, the gods have made thee but by halves a king." They give thee scepters and a wide command. They give dominion all the seas and land. The noblest power that might the world control, they gave thee not, a brave and virtuous soul. Is this a general's voice that would suggest fears like his own to every Grecian breast? Confiding in our want of worth he stands, and if we fly, tis what our king commands. Go thou, inglorious, from the embattled plain, ships thou hast store and nearest to the main— a noble care the Grecians shall employ to combat, conquer, and extirpate Troy. Here Greece shall stay, or, if all Greece retire, myself shall stay till Troy or I expire. Myself and Sthenelus 
will fight for fame, and God bade us fight, and twas with God we came. He ceased. The Greeks' loud acclamations raise, and voice to voice resounds Tydides' praise. Wise Nestor, then, his revered figure reared, he spoke, the host in still attention heard. O oh, truly great! in whom the gods have joined such strength of body with such force of mind. In conduct as in courage you excel, still first to act what you advise so well. These wholesome counsels which thy wisdom moves, applauding Greece with common voice approves. Kings thou canst blame, a bold but prudent youth, and blame even kings with praise, because with truth, and yet, those years that since thy birth have run would hardly style thee Nestor's youngest son. Then let me add what yet remains behind, a thought unfinished in that generous mind. Age bids me speak, nor shall the advice I bring distaste the people or offend the king. Cursed is the man, and void of law and right, unworthy property, unworthy light, unfit for public rule or private care, that wretch, that monster who delights in war, whose lust is murder and whose horrid joy, to tear his country and his kind destroy, this night refresh and fortify thy train, between the trench and wall let guards remain, be that the duty of the young and bold, but thou, O king, to counsel call the old, great is thy sway and weighty are thy cares, thy high commands much spirit all our wars, with Thracian wines recruit thy honoured guests, for happy counsels flow from sober feasts." Wise, weighty counsels aid a state distressed, and such a monarch as can choose the best. See what a blaze from hostile tents aspires, how near our fleet approach the Trojan fires. Who can, unmoved, behold the dreadful light? What eye beholds them and can close to-night? This dreadful interval determines all. Tomorrow Troy must flame, or Greece must fall. Thus spoke the hoary sage. The rest obey. Swift through the gates the guards direct their way. His son was first to pass the lofty mound, the generous Thrasymed in arms renowned. Next him, as Caliphus, Ealman stood, the double offspring of the warrior god. Deiparus, Apharius, Marion, join, and Lycomed of Creon's noble line. Seven were the leaders of the knightly bands, and each bold chief a hundred spears commands. The fires they light to short repasts they fall. Some line the trench, and others man the wall. The king of men on public councils bent, convened the princes in his ample tent. Each seized a portion of the kingly feast, but stayed his hand when thirst and hunger ceased. Then Nestor spoke, for wisdom long approved, and slowly rising, thus the council moved. Monarch of nations, whose superior sway, assembled states and lords of earth obey, the laws and scepters to thy hand are given, and millions own the care of thee in heaven. O king, the counsels of my age attend. With thee my cares begin, with thee must end. Thee, prince, it fits alike to speak and hear, pronounce with judgment, with regard give ear, to see no wholesome motion be withstood, and ratify the best for public good. Nor, though Amina give advice, repine, but follow it, and make the wisdom thine. Hear then a thought, not now conceived in haste, at once my present judgment and my past. When from Pelides' tent you forced the maid, I first opposed, and faithful durst dissuade. But bold of soul, when headlong fury fired, you wronged the man, by men and gods admired. Now seek some means his fatal wrath to end, with prayers to move him, or with gifts to bend. To whom the king, with justice hast thou shown a prince's faults, and I with reason own, that happy man, whom Jove still honours most, is more than armies and himself a host. Blessed is his love. This wondrous hero stands. Heaven fights his war and humbles all our bands. Fain would my heart, which erred through frantic rage, the wrathful chief and angry gods assuage. If gifts immense his mighty soul can bow. Here, all ye Greeks, and witness what I vow— ten weighty talents of the purest gold, and twice ten vases of refulgent mould, seven sacred tripods, whose unsolid frame yet knows no office nor has felt the flame, twelve steeds unmatched in fleetness and in force, and still victorious in the dusty course. 
Rich were the men, whose ample stores exceed the prizes purchased by their winged speed. Seven lovely captives of the lesbian line, skilled in each art, unmatched in form divine. The same I chose for more than vulgar charms, when Lesbos sank beneath the hero's arms. All these, to buy his friendship, shall be paid, and joined with these the long-contested maid, with all her charms, Briseis I resign, and solemn swear those charms were never mine. Untouched she stayed, uninjured she removes, pure from my arms, and guiltless of my loves. These, instant, shall be his, and, if the powers give to our arms proud Ilion's hostile towers, then shall he store, when Greece the spoil divides, with gold and brass his loaded navy sides. Besides, full twenty nymphs of Trojan race, with copious love, shall crown his warm embrace, such as himself will choose, who yield to none, or yield to Helen's heavenly charms alone. Yet hear me further, when our wars are o'er, if safe we land on Argo's fruitful shore, there shall he live. My son, our honour share, and with Orestes' self divide my care, yet more, three daughters in my court are bred, and each well worthy of a royal bed, Laodice, and Iphigenia fair, and bright Chrysothemis with golden hair. Her, let him choose whom most his eyes approve. I ask no presents, no reward for love. Myself will give the dowers so vast a store as never father gave a child before. Seven ample cities shall confess his sway. Him, Enope, and Phere, him obey." Cardamile with ample turrets crowned, and sacred Pedasus for vines renowned. Apia fair, the pastures here yields, and rich Anthea with her flowery fields. The whole extent to Pylos's sandy plain, along the verdant margin of the main, there heifers graze and laboring oxen toil, bold are the men and generous is the soil, there shall he reign, with power and justice crowned, and rule the tributary realms around. All this I give, his vengeance to control, and sure all this may move his mighty soul. Pluto, the grisly god who never spares, who feels no mercy, and who hears no prayers, lives dark and dreadful in deep hell's abodes, and mortals hate him as the worst of gods, great though he be, it fits him to obey, since more than his my years and more my sway. The monarch thus. The revered Nestor then, great Agamemnon, glorious king of men, such are thy offers as a prince may take, and such as fits a generous king to make. Let chosen delegates this hour be sent. Myself will name them to Pelides' tent. Let Phoenix lead, revered for hoary age, great Ajax next, and Ithacus the sage. Yet more to sanctify the word you send, let Hodius and Eurybates attend. Now pray to Jove to grant what Greece demands. Pray in deep silence and with purest hands, he said, and all approved. The heralds bring the cleansing water from the living spring. The youth, with the wine, the sacred goblets crowned, and large libations drenched the sands around. The rite performed, the chiefs their thirst allay. Then from the royal tent they take their way. Wise Nestor turns on each his careful eye, forbids to offend, instructs them to apply. Much he advised them all, Ulysses most, to deprecate the chief and save the host. Through the still night they march, and hear the roar of murmuring billows on the sounding shore, to Neptune, ruler of the seas profound, whose liquid arms the mighty globe surround. They pour forth vows their embassy to bless, and calm the rage of stern Aeacides. And now, arrived, where on the sandy bay the Myrmidonian tents and vessels lay, amused at ease the godlike man they found, pleased with the solemn harp's harmonious sound, the well-wrought harp from conquered Thebe came, of polished silver was its costly frame. With this he soothes his angry soul, and sings the immortal deeds of heroes and of kings. Patroclus only of the royal train, placed in his tent, attends the lofty strain. Full opposite he sat, and listened long, in silence waiting, till he ceased the song. Unseen the Grecian embassy proceeds to his high tent. The great Ulysses leads— Achilles, starting as the chiefs he spied, leaped from his seat and laid the harp aside. With like surprise arose Menoetius' son. Pelides grasped their hands and thus begun. Princes, all hail, whatever brought you here, or strong necessity or urgent fear, welcome, though Greeks, for not as foes ye came, 
to me more dear than all that bear them with that the chiefs. Beneath his roof he led, and placed in seats with purple carpets spread. Then thus Patroclus, pure wine, and open every soul, of all the warriors yonder host can send, thy friend most honours these, and these thy friend. He said, Patroclus, o'er the blazing fire, heaps in a brazen vase three chines entire, the brazen vase Automedon sustains, which flesh of porker, sheep, and goat contains, Achilles at the genial feast presides, the parts transfixes, and with skill divides. Meanwhile Patroclus sweats, the fire to raise, the tent is brightened with the rising blaze. Then, when the languid flames at length subside, he strows a bed of glowing embers wide, above the coals the smoking fragments turns, and sprinkles sacred salt from lifted urns. With bread the glittering canisters they load, which round the board Menoetius' son bestowed, himself opposed to Ulysses' full in sight, each portion parts and orders every right. The first fat offering to the immortals due, amidst the greedy flames Patroclus threw, then each indulging in the social feast, his thirst and hunger soberly repressed. That done to Phoenix, Ajax gave the sign. Not unperceived, Ulysses crowned with wine the foaming bowl, and instant thus began his speech addressing to the godlike man. Health to Achilles! Happy are thy guests, not those more honoured whom Atrides feasts, though generous plenty crown thy loaded boards, that Agamemnon's regal tent affords, but greater care sits heavy on our souls, nor eased by banquets or by flowing bowls. What scenes of slaughter in yon fields appear, the dead we mourn, and for the living fear. Greece, on the brink of fate, all doubtful stands, and owns no help but from thy saving hands. Troy and her aids for ready vengeance call. Their threatening tents already shade our wall. Hear how with shouts their conquest they proclaim, and point at every ship their vengeful flame. For them the father of the gods declares theirs are his omens, and his thunder theirs. See, full of Jove, avenging Hector rise. See, heaven and earth the raging chief defies. What fury in his breast, what lightning in his eyes. He waits but for the morn to sink in flame the ships, the Greeks, and all the Grecian name. Heavens, how my country's woes distract my mind, lest fate accomplish all his rage designed, and must we, gods, our heads inglorious lay in Trojan dust, and this the fatal day? Return, Achilles, O, oh, return, though late, to save thy Greeks, and stop the course of fate. If in that heart or grief or courage lies, rise to redeem. Ah, yet to conquer, rise. The day may come when all our warriors slain, that heart shall melt, that courage rise in vain. Regard in time, O prince divinely brave." those wholesome counsels which thy father gave. When Peleus in his aged arms embraced his parting son, these accents were his last. My child, with strength, with glory, and success, thy arms may Juno and Minerva bless. Trust that to heaven, but thou, thy cares, engage to calm thy passions and subdue thy rage. From gentler manners let thy glory grow, and shun contention, the sure source of woe that young and old may in thy praise combine, the virtues of humanity be thine. This now despised advice thy father gave. Ah, oh, check thy anger, and be truly brave, if thou wilt yield to great Atreides' prayers, gifts worthy thee his royal hand prepares. If not, but hear me, while I number o'er, the prophet presence, an exhaustless store, ten weighty talents of the purest gold, and twice ten vases of refulgent mould, seven sacred tripods, whose unsullied frame yet knows no office, nor has felt the flame, twelve steeds unmatched in fleetness and in force, and still victorious in the dusty course, rich were the man whose ample stores exceed the prizes purchased by their winged speed, seven lovely captives of the lesbian line, skilled in each art unmatched in form divine. The same he chose for more than vulgar charms, when Lesbos sank beneath thy conquering arms, all these, to buy thy friendship, shall be paid, and, join with these, the long-contested maid. With all her charms, Briseis, he'll resign, and solemn swear those charms were only thine, untouched she stayed, uninjured she removes, pure from his arms, and guiltless of his loves. These instant shall be thine, and if the powers give to our arms proud Ilion's hostile towers, then 
shalt thou store when Greece the spoil divides with gold and brass thy loaded navy sides. Besides full, twenty nymphs of Trojan race with copious love shall crown thy warm embrace, such as thyself shalt choose, who yield to none, or yield to Helen's heavenly charms alone. Yet hear me further, when our wars are o'er, if safe we land on Argos' fruitful shore, there shalt thou live, his son his honour share, and with Orestes' self divide his care. Yet more, three daughters in his quarter bred, and each well worthy of a royal bed, Laodice and Iphigenia fair, and bright Chrysanthemus with golden hair, her shalt thou wed, whom most thy eyes approve. He asks no presence, no reward for love, himself will give the dower so vast a store as never father gave a child before. Seven ample cities shall confess thy sway, the Enope and Ferry thee obey. Cardamile with ample turrets crowned, and sacred Pedasus for vines renowned. Hey, appear fair, the pastures hyra yields, and rich Antheia with her flowery fields, the whole extent to Pylos' sandy plain, along the verdant margin of the main. There heifers graze, and laboring oxen toil, bold are the men, and generous is the soil. There shalt thou reign, with power and justice crowned, and rule the tributary realms around. Such are the proffers which this day we bring, such the repentance of a suppliant king. But if all this relentless thou disdain. If honour and if interest plead in vain, yet some redress to suppliant Greece afford, and be amongst her guardian gods adored, if no regard thy suffering country claim, hear thy own glory and the voice of fame, for now that chief whose unresisted ire made nations tremble, and whole hosts retire proud Hector, now the unequal fight demands, and only triumphs to deserve thy hands. Then thus the goddess born, Ulysses, hear a faithful speech that knows nor aught nor fear. What in my secret soul is understood, my tongue shall utter, and my deeds make good. Let Greece then know my purpose I retain, nor with new treaties vex my peace in vain. Who dares think one thing and another tell? My heart detests him as the gates of hell. Then thus, in short, my fixed resolves attend, which nor Atrides nor his Greeks can bend, long toils, long perils in their cause I bore, but now the unfruitful glories charm no more, fight or not fight, a like reward we claim, the wretch and hero finds their prize the same, alike regretted in the dust he lies, who yields ignobly or who bravely dies, of all my dangers, all my glorious pains, a life of labours, lo, what fruit remains? As the bold bird her helpless young attends, from danger guards them, and from want defends. In search of prey she wings the spacious air, and with the untasted food supplies her care. For thankless Greece such hardships have I braved, her wives, her infants, by my labour saved. In long sleepless nights in heavy arms I stood, and sweat laborious days in dust and blood. I sacked twelve ample cities on the main, and twelve lay smoking on the Trojan plain. Then, at Atrides' haughty feet, were laid the wealth I gathered, and the spoils I made. Your mighty monarch these in peace possessed. Some few my soldiers had, himself the rest. Some present, too, to every prince was paid, and every prince enjoys the gift he made. I only must refund of all his train, see what preeminence our merits gain." My spoil alone his greedy soul delights, my spouse alone must bless his lustful nights. The woman let him as he may enjoy, but what's the quarrel then of Greece to Troy? What to these shores the assembled nations draws, what calls for vengeance but a woman's cause? Are fair endowments and a beauteous face beloved by none but those of Atreus's race? The wife whom choice and passion doth approve, sure every wise and worthy man will love nor did my fair one less distinction claim. Slave as she was, my soul adored the dame. Wronged in my love, all proffers I disdain. Deceived for once, I trust not kings again. Ye have my answer. What remains to do? Your king, Ulysses, may consult with you. What needs he the defence this arm can make? Has he not walls no human force can shake? Has he not fenced his guarded navy round with piles? with ramparts and a trench profound? And will not these, the wonders he has done, repel the rage of Priam's single son? There was a time, t'was when for Greece I fought, when Hector's prowess no such wonders wrought. He kept the verge of Troy, 
nor dared to wait Achilles' fury at the Scaean gate. He tried it once, and scarce was saved by fate. But now those ancient enmities are o'er. Tomorrow we the favouring gods implore. Then shall you see our parting vessels crowned, and hear with oars the Hellespont resound. The third day hence shall Thea greet our sails, if mighty Neptune send propitious gales. Thea, to her Achilles, shall restore the wealth he left for this detested shore. Thither the spoils of this long war shall pass, the ruddy gold, the steel, and shining brass. My beauteous captives thither I'll convey, and all that rests of my unravished prey. One only valued gift your tyrant gave, and that resumed the fair Leonessian slave. Then tell him, loud, that all the Greeks may hear, and learn to scorn the wretch they basely fear, for armed in impudence mankind he braves, and meditates new cheats on all his slaves. Though shameless as he is, to face these eyes is what he dares not. If he dares, he dies. Tell him, all terms, all commerce I decline, nor share his counsel, nor his battle join, for once deceived was his, but twice were mine. No." Let the stupid prince, whom Jove deprives of sense and justice, run where frenzy drives. His gifts are hateful. Kings of such a kind stand but as slaves before a noble mind. Not though he proffered all himself possessed, and all his rapine could from others rest. Not all the golden tides of wealth that crown the many-peopled Orchomenian town. Not all proud Thebes' unrivaled walls contain. The world's great empress on the Egyptian plain that spreads her conquests o'er a thousand states and pours her heroes through a hundred gates. Two hundred horsemen and two hundred cars from each wide portal issuing to the wars. Though bribes were heaped on bribes in number more than dust in fields or sands along the shore. Should all these offers for my friendship call— "'Tis he that offers, and I scorn them all. "'Atrides' daughter never shall be led "'in the old-matched consort to Achilles' bed. "'Like golden Venus, though she charmed the heart "'and vied with Pallas in the works of art, "'some greater Greek, let those high nuptials grace. "'I hate alliance with a tyrant's race. "'If heaven restore me to my realms with life, "'the reverend Peleus shall elect my wife.' The Salian nymphs there are of form divine, and kings that sue to mix their blood with mine. Blessed in kind love my years shall glide away, content with just hereditary sway. There, deaf forever to the martial strife, enjoy the dear prerogative of life. Life is not to be bought with heaps of gold. Not all Apollo's Pythian treasures hold, or Troy once held in peace and pride of sway can bribe the poor possession of a day." Lost herds, and treasures we by arms regain, and steeds unrivaled on the dusty plain. But from our lips the vital spirit fled, returns no more to wake the silent dead. My fates long since by Thetis were disclosed, and each alternate life or fame proposed. Here, if I stay, before the Trojan town short is my date, but deathless my renown. If I return I quit immortal praise for years on years and long extended days— Convinced, though late, I find my fond mistake, and warn the Greeks the wiser choice to make, to quit these shores their native seats enjoy, nor hope the fall of heaven-defended Troy. Jove's arm displayed asserts her from the skies, her hearts are strengthened, and her glories rise. Go then to Greece, report our fixed design. Bid all your councils, all your armies join, let all your forces, all your arts conspire, to save the ships, the troops, the chiefs from fire." One stratagem has failed, and others will. Ye find Achilles is unconquered still. Go then, digest my message as ye may. But here this night, let Reverend Phoenix stay. His tedious toils and hoary hairs demand a peaceful death in Thea's friendly land. But whether he remain or sail with me, his age be sacred and his will be free. The son of Peleus ceased. The chiefs around in silence wrapped, in consternation drowned, attend the stern reply. Then Phoenix rose. Down his white beard a stream of sorrow flows, and while the fate of suffering Greece he mourned with accent weak, these tender words returned. Divine Achilles, wilt thou then retire, and leave our host in blood, our fleets on fire? If wrath so dreadful fill thy ruthless mind, how shall thy friend, thy Phoenix, stay behind? The royal Peleus, when from Thea's coast he sent thee early to the Achaean host, thy youth 
as then in sage debates unskilled, and new to perils of the direful field, he bade me teach thee all the ways of war, to shine in councils and in camps to dare. Never, ah, never let me leave thy side. No time shall part us, and no fate divide. Not though the God that breathed my life restore the bloom I boasted, and the port I bore, when Greece of old beheld my youthful flames. Delightful Greece, the land of lovely dames. My father, faithless to my mother's arms, old as he was, adored a stranger's charms. I tried what youth could do at her desire, to win the damsel and prevent my sire. My sire with curses loads my hated head, and cries, Ye furies, barren be his bed. Infernal Jove, the vengeful fiends below, and ruthless Prosperpene, confirmed his vow. Despair and grief distract my labouring mind. Gods, what a crime my impious heart designed. I thought, but some kind god that thought suppressed, to plunge the poniard in my father's breast. Then meditate my flight, my friends in vain, with prayers entreat me, and with force detain. On fat of rams, black bulls, and brawny swine, they daily feast with draughts of fragrant wine. Strong guards they placed and watched nine nights entire. The roofs and porches flamed with constant fire. The tenth I forced the gates, unseen of all, and favoured by the night, all leaped the wall. My travels thence through spacious Greece extend. In Thea's court at last my labours end. Your sire received me, as his son caressed, with gifts enriched, and with possessions blessed. The strong Dolopians thenceforth owned my reign, and all the coast that runs along the main. By love to thee his bounties I repaid, and early wisdom to thy soul conveyed. Great as thou art, my lessons made thee brave. A child I took thee. Thy infant breast a like affection showed, still in my arms, a never pleasing load. Or at my knee by Phoenix wouldst thou stand, no food was grateful but from Phoenix's hand. I pass my watchings o'er thy helpless years, the tender labours, the compliant cares, the gods, I thought, reversed their hard decree, and Phoenix felt a father's joys in thee. Thy growing virtues justified my cares, and promised comfort to my silver hairs. Now be thy rage, thy fatal rage resigned, a cruel heart ill suits a manly mind. The gods, the only great and only wise, are moved by offerings, vows, and sacrifice. Offending man their high compassion wins, and daily prayers atone for daily sins. Prayers are Jove's daughters of celestial race. Lame are their feet, and wrinkled is their face. With humble mien and with dejected eyes, constant they follow where injustice flies. Injustice, swift, erect, and unconfined, sweeps the wide earth and tramples o'er mankind while prayers to heal her wrongs move slow behind. Who hears these daughters of Almighty Jove? For him they mediate to the throne above when man rejects the humble suit they make. The sire revenges for the daughter's sake. From Jove commissioned fierce injustice then descends to punish unrelenting men. Oh, let not headlong passion bear the sway. These reconciling goddesses obey. Do honours to the seed of Jove belong. Do honours calm the fierce and bend the strong. Were these not paid thee by the terms we bring? Were rage still harboured in the haughty king, nor Greece, nor all her fortune should engage thy friend to plead against so just a rage? But since what honour asks the general sends, and sends by those whom most thy heart commends, the best and noblest of the Grecian train, permit not these to sue and sue in vain. Let me, my son, an ancient fact unfold, a great example drawn from times of old, Hear what our fathers were, and what their praise, who conquered their revenge in former days. Where Calydon on rocky mountain stands, once fought the Aetolian and Curetian bands, to guard it those, to conquer these advance, and mutual deaths were dealt with mutual chance. The silver Cynthia blade contention rise in vengeance of neglected sacrifice. On Oenus fields she sent a monstrous boar that levelled harvests and whole forests tore. This beast, when many a chief his tusks had slain, great Meliege stretched along the plain. Then for his spoils a new debate arose. The neighbouring nations thence commencing foes, strong as they were, the bold Curetes failed, while Meliage's thundering arm prevailed till rage at length inflamed his lofty breast, for rage invades the wisest and the best. Cursed by Althea, to his wrath he yields, and in his wife's embrace forgets the fields. 
She, from Orpessa sprung, divinely fair, and matchless Ida's more than man in war. The god of day adorned the mother's charms against the god the father bent his arms. The afflicted pair, their sorrows to proclaim, from Cleopatra changed their daughter's name, and called Alcyon a name to show the father's grief, the mourning mother's woe. To her the chief retired from stern debate, but found no peace from fierce Altheus' hate. Altheus' hate the unhappy warrior drew, whose luckless hand his royal uncle slew. She beat the ground and called the powers beneath on her own son to wreak her brother's death. Hell heard her curses from the realms profound, and the red fiends that walked the nightly round. In vain Aetolia her deliverer waits, war shakes her walls and thunders at her gates. She sent ambassadors, a chosen band, priests of the gods and elders of the land, besought the chief to save the sinking state. Their prayers were urgent and their proffers great, full fifty acres of the richest ground, half pasture green and half with vineyards crowned. His suppliant father, aged Oeneus, came, his sisters followed, even the vengeful dame, Althea sues. His friends before him fall. He stands relentless and rejects them all. Meanwhile the victors' shouts ascend the skies. The walls are scaled. The rolling flames arise. At length his wife, a form divine, appears. With piercing cries and supplicating tears, she paints the horrors of a conquered town. The heroes slain, the palaces o'erthrown. The matrons ravished, the whole race enslaved. The warrior heard he vanquished, and he saved. The Aetolians long disdained now took their turn, and left the chief their broken faith to mourn. Learn hence betimes to curb pernicious ire, nor stay till yonder fleets ascend in fire. Accept the presence, draw thy conquering sword, and be amongst our guardian gods adored. Thus he. The stern Achilles thus replied, My second father, and my reverend guide, Thy friend, believe me, no such gifts demands, and asks no honours from a mortal's hands. Jove honours me, and favours my designs. His pleasure guides me, and his will confines. And here I stay, if such his high behest, while life's warm spirit beats within my breast. Yet hear one word, and lodge it in thy heart, no more molest me on Atreides' part. Is it for him these tears are taught to flow, for him these sorrows? For my mortal foe, a generous friendship no cold medium knows, burns with one love, with one resentment glows. One should our interests and our passions be, my friend must hate the man that injures me. Do this, my phoenix, tis a generous part, and share my realms, my honours, and my heart. Let these return, our voyage or our stay, rest undetermined, till the dawning day. He ceased, then ordered for the sage's bed, a warmer couch with numerous carpets spread. With that stern Ajax his long silence broke, and thus impatient to Ulysses spoke. Hence let us go, why waste we time in vain? See what effect our low submissions gain? Liked or not liked his words we must relate. The Greeks expect them, and our heroes wait. Proud as he is that iron heart retains its stubborn purpose, and his friends disdains. Stern and unpitying, if a brother bleed on just atonement we remit the deed. A sire, the slaughter of his son, forgives. The price of blood discharged, the murderer lives. The haughtiest hearts at length their rage resign, and gifts can conquer every soul but thine. The gods, that unrelenting breast, have steeled, and cursed thee with a mind that cannot yield. One woman's slave was ravished from thy arms. Lo, seven are offered, and of equal charms. Then here, Achilles, be of better mind. Revere thy roof, and to thy guests be kind. And know the men of all the Grecian host, who honour worth and prize thy valour most. O soul of battles, and thy people's guide! To Ajax thus the first of Greeks replied, Well hast thou spoke, but at the tyrant's name my rage rekindles, and my soul's on flame. "'Tis just resentment, and becomes the brave, "'disgraced, dishonoured, like the vilest slave. "'Return, then, heroes, and our answer bear. "'The glorious combat is no more my care. "'Not till, amidst yon sinking navy slain, "'the blood of Greeks shall dye the sable main. "'Not till the flames by Hector's fury thrown "'consume your vessels and approach my own. "'Just there the impetuous homicide shall stand. "'There cease his battle, and there feel our hand.' This said, each prince, a double goblet crowned, and cast a large libation on the ground. Then to their vessels, to the gloomy shades, the chiefs return. Divine Ulysses leads, 
Meantime Achilles' slaves prepared a bed, with fleeces, carpets, and soft linen spread. There, till the sacred morn restored the day in slumber, sweet the reverend Phoenix lay. But in his inner tent, an ampler space, Achilles slept, and in his warm embrace fair Diomede of the lesbian race. Last for Patroclus was the couch prepared, whose nightly joys the beauteous Iphis shared. Achilles to his friend consigned her charms when Skyros fell before his conquering arms. And now the elected chiefs whom Greece had sent passed through the hosts and reached the royal tent. Then rising all with goblets in their hands, the peers and leaders of the Achaean bands hailed their return, Atrides first begun. Say what success, divine Laertes' son. Achilles high resolves, declare to all, returns the chief, or must our navy fall? Great king of nations, Ithacus replied, fixed is his wrath, unconquered is his pride. He slights thy friendship, thy proposal scorns, and thus implored with fiercer fury burns. To save our army and our fleets to free is not his care, but left to Greece and thee. Your eyes shall view when morning paints the sky, beneath his oars the whitening billows fly. Us too he bids our oars and sails employ, nor hope the fall of heaven protected Troy. For Jove o'er shades her with his arm divine, inspires her war and bids her glory shine, such was his word. What further he declared, these sacred heralds and great Ajax heard, but Phoenix in his tent the chief retains, save to transport him to his native plains, when morning dawns, if other he decree, his age is sacred and his choice is free. Ulysses ceased. The great Achaean host, with sorrows seized in consternation lost, attend the stern reply. Tydides spoke. The general silence and undaunted spoke. Why should we gifts to proud Achilles send, or strive with prayers his haughty soul to bend? His country's woes he glories to deride, and prayers will burst that swelling heart with pride. Be the fierce impulse of his rage obeyed. Our battles let him, or desert or aid, then let him arm when Jove or he think fit, that to his madness or to heaven commit. What for ourselves we can is always ours. This night let due repast refresh our powers. For strength consists in spirits and in blood, and those are owed to generous wine and food. But when the rosy messenger of day strikes the blue mountains with her golden ray, ranged at the ships, let all our squadrons shine in flaming arms, a long extended line. In the dread front let great Atrides stand, the first in danger as in high command. Shouts of acclaim the listening heroes raise, then each to heaven the due libations pays, till sleep, descending o'er the tents, bestows the grateful blessings of desired repose. The end of Book Nine of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope, and read by Rick Kistner for Let to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, translated by Alexander Pope. Book Ten, Argument, the Night Adventure of Diomed and Ulysses. Upon the refusal of Achilles to return to the army. The distress of Agamemnon is described in the most lively manner. He takes no rest that night, but passes through the camp, awakening the leaders and contriving all possible methods for the public safety. Menelaus, Nestor, Ulysses, and Diomed are employed in raising the rest of the captains. They call a council of war and determine to send scouts into the enemy's camp to learn their posture and discover their intentions. Diomed undertakes this hazardous enterprise and makes choice of Ulysses for his companion— in their passage they surprised Dolon, whom Hector had sent on a like design to the camp of the Grecians. From him they are informed of the situation of the Trojan and auxiliary forces, and particularly of Rhesus and the Thracians who were lately arrived. They pass on with success, kill Rhesus with several of his officers, and seize the famous horses of that prince with which they return in triumph to the camp. The same night continues. The scene lies in the two camps." All night the chiefs before their vessels lay, and lost in sleep the labours of the day, all but the king, with various thoughts oppressed. His country's cares lay rolling in his breast. As when by lightnings Jove's ethereal power foretells the rattling hail or weighty shower, or sends soft snows to whiten all the shore, or bids the brazen throat of war to roar, by fits one flash succeeds as one expires, and heaven flames thick with momentary fires— so bursting frequent from Atrides' breast sighs, following sighs, his inward fears confessed. 
Now all the fields dejected he surveys, From thousand Trojan fires the mounting blaze, Hears in the passing wind their music blow, And marks distinct the voices of the foe. Now looking backwards to the fleet and coast, Anxious he sorrows for the endangered host, He rends his hair in sacrifice to Jove, And sues to him that ever lies above, Inly he groans while glory and despair Divide his heart and wage a double war. A thousand cares his laboring breast revolves. To seek sage Nestor now the chief resolves, With him in wholesome counsels to debate What yet remains to save the afflicted state. He rose, and first he cast his mantle round. Next on his feet the shining sandals bound. A lion's yellow spoils his back concealed. His warlike hand a pointed javelin held. Meanwhile his brother, pressed with equal woes, Alike denied the gifts of soft repose, Laments for Greece, that in his cause before So much had suffered, and must suffer more. A leopard's spotted hide his shoulders spread. A brazen helmet glittered on his head. Thus, with a javelin in his hand, he went to wake Atrides in the royal tent. Already waked, Atrides, he descried, his armor buckling at his vessel's side. Joyful they met, the Spartan thus begun, Why puts my brother his bright armor on? Sends he some spy amidst these silent hours to try yon camp and watch the Trojan powers? But say, what hero shall sustain that task? Such bold exploits uncommon courage ask. Guideless alone, through night's dark shade to go, and midst a hostile camp explore the foe. To whom the king? In such distress we stand, no vulgar counsel our affairs demand. Greece to preserve is now no easy part, but asks high wisdom, deep design, and art. For Jove, averse, our humble prayer denies, and bows his head to Hector's sacrifice. What eye has witnessed, or what ear believed, in one great day, by one great arm achieved, such wondrous deeds as Hector's hand has done? And we beheld the last revolving sun, what honors the beloved of Jove adorn, sprung from no god, and of no goddess born, yet such his acts as Greeks unborn shall tell, and curse the battle where their fathers fell. Now speed thy hasty course along the fleet. There call great Ajax and the prince of Crete. Ourself to hoary Nestor will repair, to keep the gods on duty be his care. For Nestor's influence best that quarter guides, whose son, with Marion, all the watch presides. To whom the Spartan, these thy orders born, say, shall I stay, or with dispatch return? There shall thou stay, the king of men replied. Else may we miss to meet without a guide, The path so many, and the camp so wide. Still, with your voice the slothful soldiers raise, Urged by their father's fame their future praise. Forget we now our state and lofty birth, Not titles here, but works must prove our worth. To labor is the lot of man below, And when Jove gave us life he gave us woe. This said, each parted to his several cares, The king to Nestor's sable ship repairs, The sage protector of the Greeks he found, Stretched in his bed, with all his arms around the various colored scarf, the shield he rears, the shining helmet, and the pointed spears, the dreadful weapons of the warrior's rage, that old in arms disdained the peace of age. Then, leaning on his hand his watchful head, the hoary monarch raised his eyes and said, What art thou speak that on designs unknown, while others sleep, thus range the camp alone? Seekest thou some friend or knightly sentinel? Stand off, approach not, but thy purpose tell." O son of Nellius, thus the king rejoined, pride of the Greeks and glory of thy kind, lo, here the wretched Agamemnon stands, the unhappy general of the Grecian bands, whom Jove decrees with daily cares to bend, and woes that only with his life shall end. Scarce can my knees these trembling limbs sustain, and scarce my heart support its load of pain. No taste of sleep these heavy eyes have known, confused and sad, I wander thus alone, with fears distracted, with no fixed design, and all my people's miseries are mine. If aught of use thy walking thoughts suggest, since cares like mine deprive thy soul of rest, impart thy counsel and assist thy friend. Now let us jointly to the trench descend, at every gate the fainting god excite, tired with the toils of day and watch of night, else may the sudden foe our works invade, so near and favoured by the gloomy shade." To him thus, Nestor, Trust the powers above, nor think proud Hector's hopes confirmed by Jove. How ill agree the views of vain mankind, And the wise counsels of the eternal mind. Audacious Hector, 
if the gods ordain that great Achilles rise and rage again, what toils attend thee, and what woes remain? Lo, faithful Nestor, thy command obeys. The care is next our other chiefs to raise. Ulysses, Diomed we chiefly need, Megis for strength, Oleus famed for speed, some others be dispatched of nimbler feet to those tall ships remotest of the fleet where lie great Ajax and the king of Crete. To rouse the Spartan I myself decree, dear as he is to us and dear to thee, yet must I tax his sloth that claims no share with his great brother in his martial care. Him it behoved to every chief to sue, preventing every part performed by you, for strong necessity our toils demands, claims all our hearts and urges all our hands. To whom the king, with reverence we allow thy just rebukes, yet learn to spare them now. My generous brother is of gentle kind, he seems remiss but bears a valiant mind. Through too much deference to our sovereign sway, content to follow when we lead the way, but now our ills, long ere the the rest he rose and sought my tent. The chiefs you named, already at his call, prepared to meet us near the navy wall. Assembling there between the trench and gates, near the night gods, our chosen council waits. Then none, said Nestor, shall his rule withstand, for great examples justify command. With that the venerable warrior rose, the shining greaves his manly legs enclose, his purple mantle golden buckles joined, warm with the softest wool and doubly lined, then rushing from his tent he snatched in haste his steely lance that lightened as he passed. The camp he traversed through the sleeping crowd, stopped at Ulysses' tent, and called aloud. Ulysses, sudden as the voice was sent, awake, starts up, and issues from his tent. What new distress, what sudden cause of fright, thus leaves you wandering in the silent night? O oh, prudent chief, the Pylian sage replied, wise as thou art, be now thy wisdom tried. Whatever means of safety can be sought, whatever counsels can inspire our thought, whatever methods, or to fly or fight, all, all depend on this important night. He heard, returned, and took his painted shield, then joined the chiefs, and followed through the field. Without his tent, bold Diomed, they found, all sheathed in arms, his brave companions round, each sunk in sleep extended on the field, his head reclining on his bossy shield. A wood of spears stood by, that, fixed upright, shot from their flashing points a quivering light. A bull's black hide composed the hero's bed. A splendid carpet rolled beneath his head. Then, with his foot, old Nestor gently shakes the slumbering chief, and in these words awakes. Rise, son of Tydeus, to the brave and strong rest seems inglorious, and the night too long. But sleepest thou now, when from yon hill the foe hangs o'er the fleet, and shades our walls below? At this soft slumber from his eyelids fled, the warrior saw the hoary chief, and said, Wondrous old man, whose soul no respite knows, though years and honours bid thee seek repose, let younger Greeks our sleeping warriors wake, ill fits thy age these toils to undertake. My friend, he answered, generous is thy care, these toils my subjects and my sons might bear, their loyal thoughts and pious love conspire to ease a sovereign and relieve a sire. But now the last despair surrounds our host. No hour must pass, no moment must be lost. Each single Greek in this conclusive strife stands on the sharpest edge of death or life. Yet if my years thy kind regard engage, employ thy youth as I employ my age. Succeed to these my cares and rouse the rest. He serves me most who serves his country best. This said, the hero o'er his shoulders flung a lion's spoils that to his ankles hung then seized his ponderous lance and strode along. Megis the bold with Ajax famed for speed, the warrior roused and to the entrenchments lead, and now the chiefs approach the knightly guard, a wakeful squadron, each in arms prepared. The unwearied watch their listening leaders keep, and, couching close, repel invading sleep. So faithful dogs their fleecy charge maintain, with toil protected from the prowling train, when the gaunt lioness with hunger bold springs from the mountains toward the guarded fold. Through breaking woods her rustling course they hear, loud and more loud, the clamours strike their ear of hounds and men. They start, they gaze around, watch every side and turn to every sound. Thus watch the Grecians, cautious of surprise. Each voice, 
Each motion drew their ears and eyes. Each step of passing feet increased the affright, and hostile Troy was ever full in sight. Nestor with joy the wakeful band surveyed, and thus accosted through the gloomy shade. "'Tis well, my sons, your nightly cares employ, else must our host become the scorn of Troy. Watch thus, and Greece shall live, the hero said. Then o'er the trench the following chieftains led. His son and godlike Marion marched behind, for these the princes to their council joined. The trenches passed the assembled kings around in silent state the consistory crowned. A place there was yet undefiled with gore, the spot where Hector stopped his rage before, when night descending from his vengeful hand reprieved the relics of the Grecian band. The plain, besides, with the mangled cores was spread, and all his progress marked by heaps of dead. There sat the mournful kings, when Nellis's son, the council opening in these words, begun, is there said he, a chief so greatly brave, his life to hazard and his country save? Lives there a man who singly dares to go to yonder camp, or sees some straggling foe, or favoured by the night approach so near their speech, their counsels, and designs to hear? If to besiege our navies they prepare, or Troy once more must be the seat of war, this could he learn, and to our peers recite, and pass unharmed the dangers of the night." What fame were his through all succeeding days, while Phoebus shines, or men have tongues to praise? What gifts his grateful country would bestow? What must not Greece to her deliverer owe? A sable you, each leader, should provide, with each a sable lambkin by her side. At every right his share should be increased, and his the foremost honours of the feast. Fear held them mute, alone, untaught to fear, Tydides spoke. The man you seek is here— through yon black camps to bend my dangerous way, some god within commands, and I obey. But let some other chosen warrior join to raise my hopes and second my design. By mutual confidence and mutual aid, great deeds are done and great discoveries made. The wise new prudence from the wise acquire, and one brave hero fans another's fire. Contending leaders at the word arose, each generous breast with emulation glows, so brave a task each Ajax strove to share. Bold Marion strove and Nestor's valiant heir. The Spartan wished the second place to gain, and great Ulysses wished nor wished in vain. Then thus the king of men the contest ends. Thou first of warriors, and thou best of friends, undaunted Diomed, what chief to join in this great enterprise is only thine. Just be thy choice, without affection made. To birth or office no respect be paid. Let worth determine here— the monarch spake, and inly trembled for his brother's sake. Then thus, the godlike Diomed rejoined, my choice declares the impulse of my mind. How can I doubt while great Ulysses stands to lend his counsels and assist our hands? A chief, whose safety is Minerva's care, so famed, so dreadful in the works of war, blessed is his conduct. I know aid require wisdom like his might pass through flames of fire. It fits thee not before these chiefs of fame, replied the sage, to praise me or to blame. Praise from a friend or censure from a foe are lost on hearers that our merits know. But let us haste. Night rolls the hours away. The reddening orient shows the coming day. The stars shine fainter on the ethereal plains, and of night's empire but a third remains. Thus having spoke, with generous ardor pressed, in arms terrific their huge limbs they dressed, a two-edged falchion, Thrysimed the brave, an ample buckler to Tydides gave. Then, in a leathern helm, he cased his head, short of its crest and with no plume or spread, such as by youths unused to arms are worn. No spoils enrich it and no studs adorn. Next him Ulysses took a shining sword, a bow and quiver with bright arrows stored, a well-proved cask with leather braces bound. Thy gift, Mariones, his temples crowned, Soft wool within, without, in order spread, A boar's white teeth grinned horrid o'er his head. This from Amnintor, rich or menace's son, Or to Lycus by fraudful rapine won, And gave Amphidamus from him the prize, Molus received the pledge of social ties, The helmet next by Marion was possessed, And now Ulysses thoughtful temples pressed. Thus sheathed in arms the council they forsake, And dark through paths of blight their progress take, just then in sign she favoured their intent a long-winged heron great minerva sent this though surrounding shades obscured their view 
by the shrill clang and whistling wings they knew, as from the right she sword Ulysses prayed, hailed the glad omen, and addressed the maid. O daughter of that god, whose arm can wield the avenging bolt and shake the dreadful shield, O thou, for ever present in my way, who all my motions, all my toil survey, safe may we pass beneath the gloomy shade, safe by thy succour to our ships conveyed, and let some deed this signal night adorn to claim the tears of Trojans yet unborn. Then godlike Diomed preferred his prayer, Daughter of Jove, unconquered Pallas, here, great queen of arms, whose favour Tydeus won, as thou defendest the sire, defend the sun, when, on Esopus's banks, the banded powers of Greece he left and sought the Theban towers, praise was his charge, received with peaceful show. He went a legate, but returned a foe. Then, helped by thee, and covered by the shield, he fought with numbers and made numbers yield. So now be present, O celestial maid, so still continue to the race thine aid. A youthful steer shall fall beneath the stroke, untamed, unconscious of the galling yoke, with ample forehead and with spreading horns, whose taper tops refulgent gold adorns. The heroes prayed in palace from the skies, accords their vow, succeeds their enterprise. Now, like two lions panting for the prey, with dreadful thoughts they trace the weary way. Through the black horrors of the exsanguinated plain, through dust, through blood, o'er arms and hills of slain, nor less bold Hector and the sons of Troy, on high designs the wakeful hours employ. The assembled peers, their lofty chief enclosed, who thus the counsels of his breast proposed. What glorious man for high attempts prepared dares greatly venture for a rich reward? Of yonder fleet a bold discovery make, what watch they keep and what resolves they take. If now, subdued, they meditate their flight, and spent with toil neglect the watch of night, his be the chariot, that shall please him most of all the plunder of the vanquished host, his the fair steeds that all the rest excel, and his the glory to have served so well. A youth there was among the tribes of Troy, Dolon his name, Eumedes' only boy, five girls beside, the reverend Harold told, rich was the sun in brass and rich in gold, not blessed by nature with the charms of face, but swift of foot and matchless in the race. Hector, he said, my courage bids me meet this high achievement and explore the fleet, but first exalt thy scepter to the skies and swear to grant me the demanded prize, the immortal courses and the glittering car that bear Pelides through the ranks of war. Encouraged thus, no idle scout I go, fulfill thy wish, their whole intention know, even to the royal tent pursue my way, and all their counsels, all their aims betray. The chief then heaved the golden sceptre high, attesting thus the monarch of the sky, be witness thou, immortal lord of all, whose thunder shakes the dark aerial hall, by none but Dolan shall this prize be borne, and him alone the immortal steeds adorn. Thus Hector swore, the gods were called in vain, but the rash youth prepares to scour the plain. Across his back the bended bow he flung, a wolf's grey hide around his shoulders hung, a ferret's downy fur his helmet lined, and in his hand a pointed javelin shined. Then, never to return, he sought the shore, and trod the path his feet must tread no more. Scarce had he passed the steeds and Trojan throng, still bending forward as he coursed along, when on the hollow way the approaching tread Ulysses marked, and thus to Diomed, O friend, I hear some step of hostile feet, moving this way or hastening to the fleet, some spy perhaps to lurk beside the main, or knightly pillager that strips the slain, Yet let him pass and win a little space, then rush behind him and prevent his pace. But if too swift of foot he flies before, confine his course along the fleet and shore, betwixt the camp, and him our spears employ, and intercept his hoped return to Troy. With that they stepped aside, and stooped their head as Dolan passed, behind a heap of dead. Along the path the spy unwary flew, soft at just distance both the chiefs pursue. So distant they, and such the space between, as when two teams of mules divide the green, to whom the hind like shares of land allows, when now new furrows part the approaching ploughs, now Dolan, listening, heard them as they passed, Hector, he thought, had sent, and checked his haste, till scarce at distance of a javelin's throw, no voice exceeding, he perceived the foe, as when two skilful hounds the leveret wind, or chase through woods obscure the trembling hind. Now lost, now seen, they intercept his way, 
and from the herd still turn the flying prey. So fast and with such fears the Trojan flew, so close, so constant, the bold Greeks pursue. Now, almost on the fleet, the dastard falls, and mingles with the guards that watched the walls, when brave Tydides stopped, a generous thought inspired by Pallas in his bosom wrought, lest on the foe some forward Greek advance, and snatch the glory from his lifted lance. Then, thus aloud, Whoe'er thou art remain, this javelin else shall fix thee to the plain, he said, and high in air the weapon cast, which willful aired, and o'er his shoulder passed, then fixed in earth. Against the trembling wood the wretch stood propped and quivered as he stood. A sudden palsy seized his turning head, his loose teeth chattered, and his color fled. The panting warriors seize him as he stands, and with unmanly tears his life demands. O oh, spare my youth, and for the breath I owe, large gifts of price my father shall bestow. Vast heaps of brass shall in your ships be told, and steel well-tempered and refulgent gold. To whom Ulysses made this wise reply, Whoe'er thou art, be bold, nor fear to die. What moves thee, say, when sleep has closed the sight, to roam the silent fields in dead of night? Camest thou the secrets of our camp to find, by Hector prompted, or thy daring mind? or art some wretch by hopes of plunder led through heaps of carnage to despoil the dead? Then thus, pale Dolan, with a fearful look, still as he spoke his limbs with horror shook, hither I came by Hector's words deceived, much did he promise, rashly I believed, no less a bribe than great Achilles' car, and those swift steeds that sweep the ranks of war, urged me, unwilling, this attempt to make, to learn what counsels, what resolves you take." If now subdued you fix your hopes on flight, And tired with toils neglect the watch of night. Bold was thy aim, and glorious was the prize, Ulysses with a scornful smile replies, Far other rulers those proud steeds demand, And scorn the guidance of a vulgar hand, Even great Achilles scarce their rage can tame. Achilles sprung from an immortal dame. But say, be faithful, and the truth recite, where lies encamped the Trojan chief to-night? Where stand his courses? In what quarter sleep their other princes? Tell what watch they keep. Say, since this conquest, what their counsels are. Or here to combat from their city far? Or back to Ilion's walls transfer the war? Ulysses thus, and thus Eumedes' son. What Dolan knows his faithful tongue shall own. Hector, the peers assembling in his tent, a council holds at Elis's monument. No certain guards the nightly watch partake, where ere yon fires ascend the Trojans wake. Anxious for Troy, the guard the natives keep, safe in their cares the auxiliary forces sleep, whose wives and infants from the danger afar discharge their souls of half the fears of war. Then sleep those aids among the Trojan train, inquired the chief, or scattered o'er the plain. To whom the spy? Their powers they thus disposed, the Paeons, dreadful with their bended bows, the Carians, Cocons, the Pelasgian host, and Lesleges encamp along the coast. Not distant far lie higher on the land the Lycian, Mycian, and Maeonian band, and Phrygia's horse by Thimbra's ancient wall, the Thracians utmost, and apart from all, these Troy, but lately to her succour won, led on by Rhesus, great Ionius's son, I saw his courses in proud triumph go, swift as the wind and white as winter snow, rich silver plates his shining car enfold, his solid arms refulgent flame with gold. No mortal shoulders suit this glorious load, celestial panoply to grace a god. Let me unhappy to your flute be borne, or leave me here a captor's fate to mourn in cruel chains till your return reveal the truth or falsehood of the news I tell. To this Tydides with a gloomy frown, Think not to live, though all the truth be shown. Shall we dismiss thee, in some future strife, To risk more bravely thy now forfeit life? Or that again our camps thou mayst explore? No, once a traitor thou betrayest no more. Sternly he spoke, and as the wretch prepared With humble blandishment to stroke his beard, Like lightning swift, the wrathful flouchin flew, Divides the neck and cuts the nerves in two, One instant snatched his trembling soul to hell, the head, yet speaking, muttered as it fell. The furry helmet from his brow they tear, The wolf's grey hide, the unbended bow and spear. These great Ulysses, lifting to the skies, To favouring Pallas, dedicates the prize. 
Great Queen of Arms, receive this hostile spoil, and let the Thracian steeds reward our toil. Thee, first of all the heavenly host, we praise. O speed our labours, and direct our ways. This said, the spoils, with dropping gore defaced, high on a spreading tamarisk he placed. Then heaped with reeds and gathered boughs the plain, to guide their footsteps to the place again. Through the still night they cross the devious fields, slippery with blood, o'er arms and heaps of shields, arriving where the Thracian squadrons lay, and eased in sleep the labours of the day, ranged in three lines they view the prostrate band, the horses, yoked beside each warrior stand, their arms in order on the ground reclined, through the brown shade the fulgid weapons shined, amidst lay Rhesus, stretched in sleep profound, and the white steeds behind his chariot bound, the welcome sight Ulysses first descries, and points to Diomed the tempting prize. The man, the courses, and the car, behold, described by Dolan with the arms of gold. Now, brave Tydides, now thy courage try, approach the chariot, and the steeds untie. Or if thy soul aspire to fiercer deeds, urge thou the slaughter while I seize the steeds. Pallas, this said, her hero's bosom warms, breathed in his heart, and strung his nervous arms. Where'er he passed, a purple stream pursued his thirsty falchion, fat with hostile blood, bathed all his footsteps, dyed the fields with gore, and a low groan murmured through the shore. So the grim lion from his nightly den, or leaps the fences and invades the pen, on sheep or goats resistless in his way he falls, and foaming rends the guardless prey nor stopped the fury of his vengeful hand, till twelve lay breathless of the Thracian band. Ulysses, following as his partner slew, back by the foot each slaughtered warrior drew, the milky-white courses, studious to convey. Safe to the ships, he wisely cleared the way, lest the fierce steeds, not yet to battle's bread, should start and tremble at the heaps of dead. Now twelve dispatched, the monarch last they found. Tydides' falchion fixed him to the ground. Just then a deathful dream Minerva sent, a warlike form appeared before his tent, whose visionary steel his bosom tore, so dreamed the monarch, and awaked no more. Ulysses now the snowy steeds detains, and leads them fastened by the silver reins, these with his bow unbent he lashed along, the scourge forgot on Rhesus' chariot hung, then gave his friend the signal to retire, but him, new dangers, new achievements, fire, doubtful he stood, or with his reeking blade, to send more heroes to the infernal shade, drag off the car where Rhesus' armour lay, or he with manly force and lift away. While unresolved the son of Tydeus stands, Pallas appears, and thus her chief commands. Enough, my son, from further slaughter cease, regard thy safety and depart in peace, haste to the ships the gotten spoils enjoy, nor tempt too far the hostile gods of Troy. The voice divine confessed, the martial maid, in haste he mounted, and her word obeyed. The coursers fly before Ulysses' bow, swift as the wind, and white as winter snow. Not unobserved they passed the god of light, had watched his Troy and marked Minerva's flight, saw Tadeus' son with heavenly succour blessed, and vengeful anger filled his sacred breast, swift to the Trojan camp descends the power, and awakes Hippocoon in the morning hour, on Rhesus' side accustomed to attend, a faithful kinsman and instructive friend. He rose and saw the field deformed with blood, an empty space where late the courses stood, the yet warm Thracians panting on the coast, for each he wept, but for his Rhesus most, now, while on Rhesus' name he calls in vain, the gathering tumult spreads o'er all the plain, on heaps the Trojans rush with wild affright, and wondering view the slaughters of the night. Meanwhile the chiefs, arriving at the shade where late the spoils of Hector's spy were laid, Ulysses stopped, to him Tydides bore the trophy dropping yet with Dolan's gore, then mounts again. Again their nibbler feet the courses ply, and thunder towards the fleet." Old Nestor first perceived the approaching sound. Bespeaking thus the Grecian peers around, Methinks the noise of trampling steeds I hear, Thickening this way and gathering on my ear, Perhaps some horses of the Trojan breed. So may ye gods my pious hope succeed. The great Tydides and Ulysses bear, Return triumphant with this prize of war, Yet much I fear, ah, may that fear be vain, The chiefs outnumbered by the Trojan train, Perhaps even now pursued they seek the shore, Or— Oh, perhaps those heroes are no more. Scarcely had he spoke, 
when, lo, the chiefs appear, and spring to earth, the Greeks dismiss their fear. With words of friendship and extended hands, they greet the kings, and Nestor first demands, Say thou, whose praises all our host proclaim, the living glory of the Grecian name, say whence these courses, by what chance bestowed, the spoil of foes or present of a god? Not those fair steeds so radiant and so gay, that draw the burning chariot of the day, old as I am to age I scorn to yield, and daily mingle in the martial field, but sure till now no course has struck my sight like these, conspicuous through the ranks of fight. Some god I deem conferred the glorious prize, blessed as ye are, and favourites of the skies, the care of him who bids the thunder roar, and her whose fury bathes the world with gore. Father, not so— Sage Ithacus rejoined, The gifts of heaven are of a nobler kind. Of Thracian lineage are the steeds ye view, Whose hostile king the brave Tydides slew. Sleeping he died with all his guards around, And twelve beside lay gasping on the ground. These other spoils from conquered Dolan came, A wretch whose swiftness was his only fame. By Hector sent our forces to explore, He now lies headless on the sandy shore. Then o'er the trench the bounding courses flew, the joyful Greeks with loud acclaim pursue, straight to Tydides' high pavilion born, the matchless steeds his ample stalls adorn, the neighing coursers their new fellows greet, and the full racks are heaped with generous wheat. But Dolan's armour to his ships conveyed, high on the painted stern Ulysses laid, a trophy destined to the blue-eyed maid. Now from nocturnal sweat and sanguine stain they cleanse their bodies in the neighbouring main, then in the polished bath refreshed from toil their joints they supper with dissolving oil, in due repast indulge the genial hour, and first to Pallas the libations pour, they sit rejoicing in her aid divine, and the crowned goblet foams with floods of wine. The end of Book Ten of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. And read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book 11, Argument. The Third Battle and the Acts of Agamemnon. Agamemnon, having armed himself, leads the Grecians to battle. Hector prepares the Trojans to receive them, while Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva give the signals of war. Agamemnon bears all before him, and Hector is commanded by Jupiter, who sends Iris for that purpose, to decline the engagement till the king shall be wounded and retire from the field. He then makes a great slaughter of the enemy. Ulysses and Diomed put a stop to him for a time, but the latter, being wounded by Paris, is obliged to desert his companion, who is encompassed by the Trojans, wounded, and in the utmost danger till Menelaus and Ajax rescue him. Hector comes against Ajax, but that hero alone opposes multitudes, and rallies the Greeks. In the meantime, Machaon, in the other wing of the army, is pierced with an arrow by Paris, and carried from the flight in Nestor's chariot. Achilles, who overlooked the action from his ship, sent Patroclus to inquire which of the Greeks was wounded in that manner. Nestor entertains him in his tent, with an account of the accidents of the day, and a long recital of some former wars which he remembered, tending to put Patroclus upon persuading Achilles to fight for his countrymen, or at least to permit him to do it, clad in Achilles' armour. Patroclus, on his return, meets Eurypylus, also wounded, and assists him in that distress. This book opens with the eight-and-twentieth day of the poem, and the same day, with its various actions and adventures, is extended through the twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth, and part of the eighteenth books. The scene lies in the field near the monument of Ilus. The saffron morn with early blushes spread, now rose refulgent from Tythonus' bed, with newborn day to gladden mortal sight, and gild the courts of heaven with sacred light. When baleful Eris sent by Jove's command, the torch of discord blazing in her hand, through the red skies her bloody sign extends, and wrapped in tempests o'er the fleet descends, high on Ulysses' bark her horrid stand she took, and thundered through the seas and land. Even Ajax and Achilles heard the sound, whose ships remote the guarded navy bound, thence the black fury through the Grecian throng, with horror sounds the loud Orthian song, the navy shakes, and at the dire alarm each bosom boils, each warrior starts to arms. No more they sigh, inglorious to return, but breathe revenge, and for the combat burn. The king of men, his hardy host, inspires with loud command, 
with great example fires. Himself first rose, himself before the rest, his mighty limbs in radiant armor dressed, and first he cased his manly legs around in shining greaves with silver buckles bound. The beaming cuirass next adorned his breast, the same which once King Cinerus possessed. The fame of Greece, and her assembled host, had reached that monarch on the Cyprian coast. T'was then the friendship of the chief to gain, this glorious gift he sent, nor sent in vain. Ten rows of azure steel the work enfold, twice ten of tin, and twelve of ductile gold. Three glittering dragons to the gorget rise, whose imitated scales against the skies reflected various light, and arching bowed, like coloured rainbows o'er a showery cloud, Joe's wondrous bow, of three celestial dyes, placed as a sign to man amidst the skies, a radiant baldric o'er his shoulder tied, sustained the sword that glittered at his side. Gold was the hilt, a silver sheath encased the shining blade, and golden hangers graced his buckler's mighty orb was next displayed, that round the warrior cast a dreadful shade. Ten zones of brass its ample brim surround, and twice ten bosses the bright convex crowned, Tremendous gorgon frowned upon its field, and circling terrors filled the expressive shield. Within its concave hung a silver thong, on which a mimic serpent creeps along his azure length, in easy waves extends, till in three heads the embroidered monster ends. Last o'er his brows his fourth-fold helm he placed, with nodding horsehair formidably graced, and in his hands two steely javelins wields that blaze to heaven and lighten all the fields. That instant Juno and the martial maid in happy thunders promised Greece their aid. High o'er the chief they clashed their arms in air, and leaning from the clouds expect the war. Close to the limits of the trench and bound, the fiery courses to their chariots bound, the squires restrained, the foot with those who wield the lighter arms rush forward to the field. To second these in close array combined, the squadrons spread their sable wings behind. Now shouts and tumults wake the tardy sun, as with the light the warrior's toils begun, even Jove, whose thunder spoke his wrath, distilled red drops of blood o'er all the fatal field, the woes of men unwilling to survey, and all the slaughters that must stain the day. Near Ilus' tomb, in order ranged around, the Trojan lines possessed the rising ground. There wise Polydamus and Hector stood, Aeneas honoured as a guardian god, bold Polybus, Agenor the divine, the brother warriors of Antenor's line, with youthful Acamus, whose beauteous face and fair proportion matched the ethereal race. Great Hector, covered with his spacious shield, plies all the troops and orders all the field. As the red star now shows his sanguine fires through the dark clouds, and now in night retires, thus through the ranks appeared this godlike man, plunged in the rear or blazing in the van, while streamy sparkles, restless as he flies, flash from his arms as lightning from the skies, as sweating reapers in some wealthy field ranged in two bands, their crooked weapons wield, bear down the furrows till their labors meet, thick fall the heapy harvests at their feet. So Greece and Troy the field of war divide, and falling ranks are strode on every side. None stooped a thought to base inglorious flight, but horse to horse and man to man they fight. Not rabid wolves, more fierce contest their prey. Each wounds, each bleeds, but none resign the day. Discord with joy the scene of death descries, and drinks large slaughter at her sanguine eyes. Discord alone of all the immortal train swells the red horrors of this direful plain. The gods in peace their golden mansions fill, ranged in bright order on the Olympian hill, but general murmurs told their griefs above, and each accused the partial will of Jove. Meanwhile, apart, superior, and alone, the eternal monarch on his awful throne, wrapped in the blaze of boundless glory, sate, and fixed fulfilled the just decrees of fate, on earth he turned his all-considering eyes, and marked the spot where Ilion's towers arise, the sea with ships, the fields with armies spread, the victors rage, the dying, and the dead. Thus, while the morning beams, increasing bright o'er heaven's pure azure, spread the glowing light, call mutual death the fate of war confounds, each adverse battle gored with equal wounds, but now, what time in some sequestered vale the weary woodman spreads his sparing meal, when his tired arms refuse the axe to rear, and claim a respite from the sylvan war, 
but not till half the prostrate forest lay stretched in long ruin and exposed to day. Then, nor till then, the Greeks' impulsive might pierced the black phalanx and let in the light. Great Agamemnon then the slaughter led, and slew Bienor at his people's head, whose squire, Oleus, with a sudden spring, leaped from the chariot to revenge his king. But in his front he felt the fatal wound, which pierced his brain, and stretched him on the ground. Atrides spoiled, and left them on the plain. Vain was their youth, their glittering armor vain, now soiled with dust and naked to the sky. Their snowy limbs and beauteous bodies lie. Two sons of Priam next to battle move, the product, one of marriage, one of love. In the same car the brother warriors ride. This took the charge to combat, that to guide. Far other task than when they want to keep on Ida's tops their father's fleecy sheep. These on the mountains once Achilles found, and captive led with pliant osiers bound, then to their sire for ample sums restored, but now to perish by Atrides' sword. Pierced in the breast, the base-born Isis bleeds, cleft through the head his brother's fate succeeds. Swift to the spoil the hasty victor falls, and stripped their features to his mind recalls. The Trojans see the youths untimely die, but helpless tremble for themselves and fly. So when a lion ranging o'er the lawns finds on some grassy lair the couching fawns, their bones he cracks, their reeking vitals draws, and grinds the quivering flesh with bloody jaws, the frightened hind beholds and dares not stay, but swift through rustling thickets bursts her way. All drowned in sweat the panting mother flies, and the big tears roll trickling from her eyes. Amidst the tumult of the routed train, the sons of false Antimachus were slain, he who for bribes his faithless counsels sold, and voted Helen's stay for Paris's gold, Atrides mocked, as these their safety sought, and slew the children for their father's fault. Their headstrong horse, unable to restrain, they shook with fear, and dropped the silken rein. Then in the chariot on their knees they fall, and thus with lifted hands for mercy call. O oh, spare our youth, and for the life we owe, Antimachus shall copious gifts bestow. Soon as he hears that, not in battle slain, the Grecian ships his captive sons detain, large heaps of brass in ransom shall be told, and steel well-tempered and persuasive gold. These words, attended with the flood of tears, the youths addressed to unrelenting ears, the vengeful monarch gave this stern reply, If from Antimachus ye spring, ye die. The daring wretch who once in council stood to shed Ulysses and my brother's blood, for proffered peace, and sues his seed for grace, no, die, and pay the forfeit of your race. This said, Pisander from the car he cast, and pierced his breast, supine he breathed his last. His brother leaped to earth, but as he lay, the trenchant falchion lopped his hands away. His severed head was tossed among the throng, and, rolling, drew a bloody train along. Then, where the thickest fought, the victor flew, the king's example all his Greeks pursue. Now by the foot the flying foot was slain, horse trod by horse lay foaming on the plain. From the dry fields thick clouds of dust arise, shade the black host and intercept the skies. The brass-hoofed steeds tumultuous plunge and bound, and the thick thunder beats the laboring ground. Still, slaughtering on, the king of men proceeds. The distanced army wonders at his deeds, as when the winds with raging flames conspire, and all the forests roll the flood of fire, in blazing heaps the grove's old honors fall, and one refulgent ruin levels all. Before Atrides' rage so sinks the foe, whole squadrons vanish, and proud heads lie low, the steeds fly trembling from his waving sword, and many a car now lighted of its lord, wide o'er the field with guideless fury rolls, breaking their ranks and crushing out their souls, while his keen falchion drinks the warriors' lives, more grateful now to vultures than their wives. Perhaps great Hector, then, had found his fate, but Jove and destiny prolonged his date, safe from the darts the care of heaven he stood, amidst alarms and death and dust and blood. Now past the tomb where ancient Ilus lay, through the midfield the routed urged their way, where the wild figs the adjoining summit crown, the path they take, and speed to reach the town, as swift Atrides with loud shouts pursued hot with his toil and bathed in hostile blood, now near the beech-tree and the Scaean gates the hero halts and his associates waits. Meanwhile, on every side around the plain, dispersed, disordered, fly the Trojan train. So flies a herd of beeves that, here dismayed, the lions roaring through the midnight shade. 
On heaps they tumble with successless haste. The savage seizes, draws, and rends the last. Not with less fury stem Atrides flew, still pressed the rout and still the hindmost slew. Hurled from their cause the bravest chiefs are killed, and rage and death and carnage load the field. Now storms the victor at the Trojan wall, surveys the towers, and meditates their fall. But Jove, descending, shook the Idaean hills, and down their summits poured a hundred rills. The unkindled lightning in his hand he took, and thus the many-coloured maid bespoke. Iris, with haste thy golden wings display, to godlike Hector this our word convey, while Agamemnon wastes the ranks around, fights in the front, and bathes with blood the ground. Bid him give way, but issue forth commands, and trust the war to less important hands. But when, or wounded by the spear or dart, that chief shall mount his chariot and depart, then Jove shall string his arm and fire his breast, then to her ships shall flying Greece be pressed, till to the main the burning sun descend, and sacred night her awful shade extend. He spoke, and Iris at his word obeyed. On wings of winds descends the various maid, the chief she found amidst the ranks of war, close to the bulwarks on his glittering car, the goddess then, O son of Priam, here, from Jove I come, and his high mandate bear, while Agamemnon wastes the ranks around, fights in the front, and bathes with blood the ground, abstain from fight, yet issue forth commands, and trust the war to less important hands. But when, or wounded, by the spear or dart, the chief shall mount his chariot and depart, then Jove shall string thy arm and fire thy breast, then to her ships shall flying Greece be pressed, till to the main the burning sun descend, and sacred night her awful shade extend. She said— and vanished. Hector, with a bound, springs from his chariot on the trembling ground. In clanging arms he grasps in either hand a pointed lance, and speeds from band to band, revives their ardor, turns their steps from flight, and wakes anew the dying flames of fight. They stand to arms. The Greeks their onset dare, condense their powers, and wait the coming war. New force, new spirit to each breast returns. The fight renewed with fiercer fury burns. The king leads on, all fix on him their eye, and learn from him to conquer or to die. Ye sacred nine, celestial muses, tell who faced him first and by his prowess fell. The great Iphidamus, the bold and young, from sage Antenor and Theano sprung, whom from his youth his grandsire Sisius bred, and nursed in Thrace where snowy flocks are fed. Scarce did the down his rosy cheeks invest, and early honour warm his generous breast. When the kind sire consigned his daughter's charms, Theano's sister, to his youthful arms, but called by glory to the wars of Troy, he leaves untasted the first fruits of joy. From his loved bride departs with melting eyes, and swift to aid his dearer country flies. With twelve black ships he reached Percopes' strand, thence took the long laborious march by land. Now, fierce for fame, before the ranks he springs, towering in arms, and braves the king of kings. Atrides first discharged the missive spear, the Trojan stooped, the javelin passed in air. Then, near the corslet at the monarch's heart, with all his strength the youth directs his dart. But the broad belt with plates of silver bound, the point rebated and repelled the wound, encumbered with the dart Atrides stands, till, grasped with force, he wrenched it from his hands. At once his weighty sword discharged a wound full on his neck that felled him to the ground. Stretched in the dust the unhappy warrior lies, and sleep eternal seals his swimming eyes. O oh, worthy better fate, O oh, early slain, thy country's friend, and virtuous though in vain, no more the youth shall join his consort's side, at once a virgin and at once a bride, no more with presence her embraces meet, or lay the spoils of conquest at her feet, on whom his passion, lavish of his store, bestowed so much, and vainly promised more, unwept, uncovered, on the plain he lay, while the proud victor bore his arms away. Kuhn, Antenor's eldest hope, was nigh. Tears at the sight came starting from his eye, while pierced with grief the much-loved youth he viewed, and the pale features now deformed with blood. Then with a spear unseen his time he took, aimed at the king, and near his elbow struck. The thrilling steel transpierced the brawny part, and through his arm stood forth the barbed dart. Surprised, the monarch feels yet void of fear. On Kuhn rushes with his lifted spear— his brother's corpse the pious Trojan draws, and calls his country to assert his cause, defends him breathless on the sanguine field, and all the body spreads his ample shield. Atrides, marking an unguarded pot, transfixed the warrior with his brazen dart. Prone on his brother's bleeding breast he lay, the monarch's falchion lopped his head away. 
the social shades, the same dark journey go, and join each other in the realms below. The vengeful victor rages round the fields with every weapon art or fury yields. By the long lance, the sword of ponderous stone, whole ranks are broken and whole troops are yet warm to still the purple flood. But when the wound grew stiff with clotted blood, then grinding tortures his strong bosom rend, less keen those darts the fierce Elithiae send. The powers that cause the teeming matron's throes, sad mothers of unutterable woes, Stung with a smart, all panting with the pain, he mounts the car and gives his squire the rein. Then, with a voice which fury made more strong and pain augmented, thus exhorts the throng: "O oh, friends, O oh, Greeks, assert your honours one. Proceed and finish what this arm begun. Lo, angry Jove forbids your chief to stay and envies half the glories of the day." He said. The driver whirls his lengthful thong. The horses fly, the chariot smokes along, clouds from their nostrils the fierce courses blow, and from their sides the foam descends in snow, shot through the battle in a moment's space, the wounded monarch at his tent they place. No sooner Hector saw the king retired, but thus his Trojans and his aides he fired. Hear all ye Darden, all ye Lycian race, famed in close fight and dreadful face to face. Now call to mind your ancient trophies won, your great forefathers' virtues, and your own. Behold, the general flies, deserts his powers. Lo, Jove himself declares the conquest ours. Now on yon ranks impel your foaming steeds, and short of glory dare immortal deeds. With words like these the fiery chief alarms. His fainting host and every bosom warms, as the bold hunter cheers his hounds to tear the brindled lion or the tusky bear, with voice and hand provokes their doubting heart and springs the foremost with his lifted dart. So godlike Hector prompts his troops to dare, nor prompts alone but leads himself the war. On the black body of the foe he pours, as from the clouds deep bosom swelled with showers, a sudden storm the purple ocean sweeps, drives the wild waves, and tosses all the deeps. Say, muse, when Jove the Trojans' glory crowned beneath his arm, what heroes bit the ground? Asaeus, Dolops, and Artonus died, Opitus next was added to their side, then brave Hipponus, famed in many a fight, Opheltius, Orus, sung to endless night, Asimnus, Agilus, all chiefs of name, the rest were vulgar deaths unknown to fame, as when a western whirlwind, charged with storms, dispels the gathered clouds that notice forms, the gust continued violent and strong, rolls sable clouds in heaps on heaps along, now to the skies, the foaming billows rears, now breaks the surge, and wide the bottom bears, thus raging Hector with resistless hands, or turns, confounds, and scatters all their bands. Now the last ruin the whole host appalls, now Greece had trembled in her wooden walls, but wise Ulysses called Tydides forth, his soul rekindled and awakened his worth. And stand we deedless, O eternal shame, till Hector's arm involved the ships in flame. Haste, let us join in combat side by side. The warrior thus, and thus the friend replied. No martial toil, I shun no danger fear. Let Hector come, I wait his fury here. But Jove, with conquest, crowns the Trojan train, and Jove, our foe, all human force is vain. He sighed. But sighing, raised his vengeful steel, and from his car the proud Thrimbraeus fell. Molion, the charioteer, pursued his lord, his death ennobled by Ulysses' sword. They are slain, they left them in eternal night, then plunged amidst the thickest ranks of fight. So two wild boars outstrip the following hounds, then swift revert and wounds return for wounds. Stern Hector's conquests in the middle plain stood checked a while, and Greece respired again. The sons of Merops shone amidst the war. Towering they rode in one refulgent car. In deep prophetic arts their father skilled had warned his children from the Trojan field. Fate urged them on. The father warned in vain. They rushed to fight and perished on the plain. Their breasts no more the vital spirit warms. The stern Tydides strips their shining arms. Hipparchus by great Ulysses dies, and great Hippodamus becomes his prize. Great Jove from Ide with slaughter fills his sight, and level hangs the doubtful scale of flight. But Tydeus lands, Agastrophus was slain, the far-famed hero of Paeonian strain. Winged with his fears on foot he strove to fly, his steeds too distant and the foe too nigh. Through broken orders, swifter than the wind, he fled, but flying left his life behind. This Hector sees as his experienced eyes traverse the files and to the rescue flies, shouts as he passed the crystal region's rend, and moving armies on his march attend, great Diomed himself was seized with fear, and thus bespoke his brother of the war. Mark 
how this way yon bending squadrons yield. The storm rolls on, and Hector rules the field. Here stand his utmost force, a warrior said. Swift at the word, his ponderous javelin fled, nor missed its aim, but where the plumage danced, raised the smooth cone, and then so blithely glanced, safe in his helm, the gift of Phoebus' hands, without a wound the Trojan hero stands. But yet so stunned that, staggering on the plain, his arm and knee his sinking bulk sustain, o'er his dim sight the misty vapours rise, and a short darkness shades his swimming eyes. Tydides followed to regain his lance, while Hector rose, recovered from the trance, remounts his car, and herds amidst the crowd. The Greek pursues him, and exults aloud, Once more thank Phoebus for thy forfeit breath, or thank that swiftness which outstrips the death. Well by Apollo are thy prayers repaid, and oft that partial power has lent his aid. Thou shalt not long the death deserved withstand, if any god assist Tydides' hand. Fly then, inglorious, but thy flight this day whole hecatombs of Trojan ghosts shall pay. Him, while they triumphed, parricide from far, the spouse of Helen, the fair cause of war. Around the fields his feathered shafts he sent, from ancient Ilus' ruined monument. Behind the column placed he bent his bow, and winged an arrow at the unwary foe, just as he stooped, Agastrophus's crest to seize, and drew the corslet from his breast, the bowstring twanged, nor flew the shaft in vain, but pierced his foot, and nailed it to the plain. The laughing Trojan, with a joyful spring, leaps from his ambush, and insults the king. He bleeds, he cries, some god has sped my dart, would the same god had fixed it in his heart. So Troy, relieved from that wide-wasting hand, should breathe from slaughter and in combat stand, whose sons now tremble at his darted spear as scattered lambs the rushing lion fear. He dauntless thus. Thou conqueror of the fair, thou woman warrior with the curling hair, vain archer, trusting to the distant dart, unskilled in arms to act a manly part, thou hast but done what boys or women can. Such hands may wound, but not incense a man, nor boast the scratch thy feeble arrow gave. A coward's weapon never hurts the brave. Not so this dart, which thou mayest one day feel. Fate wings its flight, and death is on the steel. Where this but lights some noble life expires. Its touch makes orphans, bathes the cheeks of sires, steeps earth in purple, gluts the birds of air, and leaves such objects as distract the fair. Ulysses hastens with a trembling heart, before him steps, and, bending, draws the dart, forth flows the blood, and eager pang succeeds, Tydides mounts, and to the navy speeds. Now on the field Ulysses stands alone, the Greeks all fled, the Trojans pouring on, but stands collected in himself, and whole, and questions thus his own unconquered soul. What further subterfuge, what hopes remain, what shame inglorious if I quit the plain? What danger singly if I stand the ground? My friends all scattered, all the foes around, yet wherefore doubtful? Let this truth suffice. The brave meets danger, and the coward flies. To die or conquer proves a hero's heart, and knowing this I know a soldier's part. Such thoughts, revolving in his careful breast, near and more near, the shady cohorts pressed, these in the warrior their own fate enclosed, and round him deep the steely circle grows. So fares a boar whom all the troop surrounds, of shouting huntsmen and of clamorous hounds. He grinds his ivory tusks, he foams with ire, his sanguine eyeballs glare with living fire. By these, by those, on every part is plied, and the red slaughter spreads on every side, pierced through the shoulder. First, Deopasus fail, next, Anomus and Thune sank to hell. Chersidamus, beneath the naval thrust, falls prone to earth and grasps the bloody dust. Charops, the son of Hippasus, was near. Ulysses reached him with the fatal spear, but to his aid his brother Socus flies, Socus the brave, the generous, and the wise. Near as he drew, the warrior thus began, O great Ulysses, much enduring man, not deeper skilled in every martial sleight than warned at toils and active in the fight. This day, two brothers, shall thy conquest grace, and end at once the great Hippasian race, or thou beneath his lance must press the field, he said, and forceful pierced his spacious shield. Through the strong brass, the ringing javelin thrown, ploughed half his side and bared it to the bone. By Pallas's care, the spear, though deep and fixed, stopped short of life, nor with his entrails mixed. The wound, not mortal, wise Ulysses knew, then furious thus, but first some steps withdrew. Unhappy man, whose death our hands shall grace, fate calls thee hence and finished is thy race. No longer check my conquests on the foe, but, pierced by this, to endless darkness go, and add one spectre to the realms below. He spoke, while Socus seized with sudden fright, trembling gave way, and turned his back to flight. Between his shoulders pierced the following dart, and held its passage through the panting heart. Wide in his breast appeared the grisly wound. 
he falls, his armor rings against the ground. Then, thus, Ulysses, gazing on the slain, Famed son of Hippasus, there press the plain, there ends thy narrow span assigned by fate. Heaven knows Ulysses yet a longer date. Ah, wretch, no father shall thy corpse compose, thy dying eyes no tender mother close, but hungry birds shall tear those balls away, and hovering vultures scream around their prey. Me, Greece, shall honour when I meet my doom, with solemn funerals and a lasting tomb. Then, raging with intolerable smart, he writhes his body and extracts the dart. The dart, a tide of spouting gore pursued, and gladdened Troy with sight of hostile blood. Now troops on troops the fainting chief invade. Forced, he recedes, and loudly calls for aid. Thrice to its pitch his lofty voice he rears. The well-known voice thrice Menelaus hears. Alarmed, to Ajax, Telamon he cried, who shares his labours and defends his side. O friend, Ulysses shouts, invade my ear. Distressed he seems, and no assistance near. Strong as he is, yet one opposed to all, oppressed by multitudes, the best may fall. Greece, robbed of him, must bid her host despair, and feel a loss not ages can repair. Then, where the cry directs his course, he bends, great Ajax like the god of war attends. The prudent chief in sore distress they found, with bands of furious Trojans compassed round, as when some huntsman with a flying spear from the blind thicket wounds a stately deer, down his cleft side, while fresh the blood distills, he bounds aloft and scuds from hills to hills, till life's warm vapour issuing through the wound, wild mountain wolves the fainting beasts surround, just as their jaws his prostrate limbs invade, the lion rushes through the woodland shade, the wolves, though hungry, scour dispersed away, the lordly savage vindicates his prey. Ulysses, thus unconquered by his pains, a single warrior half a host sustains. But soon, as Ajax leaves his tower-like shield, the scattered crowds fly frightened all the field. Atrides arm the sinking hero stays, and saved from numbers to his car conveys. Victorious Ajax plies the routed crew, and first Doriclus Priam's son he slew, on strong Pandocus next inflicts a wound, and lays Lysander bleeding on the ground, as when a torrent, swelled with wintry rains, pours from the mountains o'er the deluged plains and pines, and oaks from their foundations torn, a country's ruins to the seas are born. Fierce Ajax thus o'erwhelms the yielding throng, men, steeds, and chariots roll in heaps along. But Hector, from this scene of slaughter far, raged on the left, and ruled the tide of war, Loud groans proclaim his progress through the plain, and deep Scamander swells with heaps of slain. There Nestor and Idiomenius oppose the warrior's fury. There the battle glows. There, fierce on foot or from the chariot's height, his sword deforms the beauteous ranks of fight. The spouse of Helen, dealing darts round, had pierced Machaon with a distant wound. In his right shoulder the broad shaft appeared, and trembling Greece for her physician feared. To Nestor, then, Idiomenius, begun, glory of Greece, old Nellius' valiant son, ascend thy chariot, haste with speed away, and great Machaon to the ships convey. A wise physician skilled our wounds to heal is more than armies to the public wheel. Old Nestor mounts the seat, beside him rode the wounded offspring of the healing god, he lends the lash, the steeds with sounding feet, shake the dry field and thunder toward the fleet. But now Sabrionis from Hector's car surveyed the various fortune of the war. While here, he cried, the flying Greeks are slain, Trojans on Trojans yonder load the plain. Before great Ajax see the mingled throng of men and chariots driven in heaps along. I know him well, distinguished o'er the field by the broad glittering of the sevenfold shield. Thither, O Hector, thither urge thy steeds, there danger calls, and there the combat bleeds. There horse and foot in mingled deaths unite, and groans of slaughter mix with shouts of fight. Thus having spoke, the driver's lash resounds, swift through the ranks the rapid chariot bounds, stung by the stroke, the courses scour the field, o'er heaps of carcasses and hills of shields, the horses' hoofs are bathed in hero's gore, and dashing purple all the car before, the groaning axle sable drops distills, and mangled carnage clogs the rapid wheels, here Hector, plunging through the thickest fight, broke the dark phalanx and let in the light. By the long lance, the sword or ponderous stone, the ranks he scattered and the troops o'erthrown, Ajax he shuns through all the dire debate, and fears that arm whose force he felt so late. But partial Jove, espousing Hector's part, shot heaven-bred horror through the Grecian's heart. Confused, unnerved in Hector's presence grown, amazed he stood with terrors not his own, o'er his broad back his moony shield he threw, and glaring round by tardy steps withdrew. Thus 
the grim lion his retreat maintains, beset with watchful dogs and shouting swains, repulsed by numbers from the nightly stalls, though rage impels him and though hunger calls, long stands the showering darts and missile fires, then sourly slow the indignant beast retires, so turned, stern impelled, while his swollen heart at every step rebelled, as the slow beast with heavy strength endued, in some wide field by troops of boys pursued, though round his sides a wooden tempest rain, crops the tall harvest and lays waste the plain, thick on his hide the hollow blows resound, the patient animal maintains his ground, scarce from the field with all their efforts chased, and stirs but slowly when he stirs at last, on Ajax thus a weight of Trojans hung, the strokes redoubled on his buckler rung, confining now in bulky strength he stands, now turns, and backward bears the yielding bands, now stiff recedes, yet hardly seems to fly, and threats his followers with retorted eye, fixed as the bar between two warring powers, while hissing darts descend in iron showers. In his broad buckler many a weapon stood, its surface bristled with a quivering wood, and many a javelin, guiltless on the plain, marks the dry dust and thirsts for blood in vain. But bold Eurypylus his aid imparts, and dauntless springs beneath a cloud of darts, whose eager javelin launched against the foe, great Apiseon felt the fatal blow. From his torn liver the red current flowed, and his slack knees desert their dying load. The victor, rushing to despoil the dead from Paris's bow, a vengeful arrow fled. Fixed in his nervous thigh the weapon stood, fixed was the point, but broken was the wood. Back to the lines the wounded Greek retired, yet thus retreating his associates fired. What god, O Grecians, has your hearts dismayed? O oh, turn to arms, tis Ajax claims your aid. This hour he stands the mark of hostile rage, and this the last brave battle he shall wage. Haste, join your forces from the gloomy grave, the warrior rescue, and your country save. Thus urged the chief. A generous troop appears, who spread their bucklers and advance their spears, to guard their wounded friend, while thus they stand with pious care, great Ajax joins the band. Each takes new courage at the hero's sight, the hero rallies and renews the fight. Thus raged both armies like conflicting fires, while Nestor's chariot far from fight retires, his course is steeped in sweat and stained with gore. The Greeks' preserver great Machaon bore. That hour Achilles, from the topmost height of his proud fleet, o'erlooked the fields of fight. His feasted eyes beheld around the plain the Grecian rout, the slaying and the slain. His friend Machaon singled from the rest. A transient pity touched his vengeful breast. Straight, to Manoetius' much-loved son he sent. Graceful as Mars, Patroclus quits his tent. In evil hour, then fate, decreed his doom, and fixed the date of all his woes to come. Why, cause my friend, thy loved injunctions lay, what e'er thy will Patroclus shall obey? O first of friends, Pelides thus replied, still at my heart and ever at my side, that time is come when yon despairing host shall learn the value of the man they lost. Now, at my knees, the Greeks shall pour their moan, and proud Atrides tremble on his throne. Go now to Nestor, and from him be taught what wounded warrior late his chariot brought. For, seen at distance, and but seen behind, his form recalled Machion to my mind. Nor could I, through yon cloud, discern his face, the courses passed me with so swift a pace. The hero said. His friend obeyed with haste. Through intermingled ships and tents he passed, the chiefs descending from their car he found, the panting steeds Remedon unbound, the warriors standing on the breezy shore to dry their sweat and wash away the gore, here paused a moment, while the gentle gale conveyed that freshness the cool seas exhale. Then to consult on farther methods went, and took their seats beneath the shady tent. The draught prescribed, fair Hecamede prepares, Orsinous daughter graced with golden hairs, whom to his aged arms a royal slave, Greece, as the prize of Nestor's wisdom gave, a table first with azure feet she placed, whose ample orb a brazen charger graced, honey new-pressed, the sacred flower of wheat, and wholesome garlic crowned the savoury treat. Next her white hand an antique goblet brings, a goblet sacred to the Pylian kings, from eldest times embossed with studs of gold. Two feet support it, and four handles hold, on each bright handle bending o'er the brink in sculptured gold two turtles seem to drink. A massy weight, yet heaved with ease by him, when the brisk nectar overlooked the brim. Tempered in this, the nymph of form divine pours a large portion of the Pramnian wine. With goat's milk cheese a flavorous taste bestows, and last with flour the smiling surface strows. This for the wounded prince the dame prepares. The cordial beverage reverend Nestor shares, salubrious draughts the warrior's thirsts allay, and pleasing conference beguiles the day. 
Meantime, Patroclus by Achilles sent, unheard approached and stood before the tent. Old Nestor, rising then, the hero, led to his high seat, the chief refused, and said, "'Tis now no season for these kind delays. The great Achilles with impatience stays. To great Achilles this respect I owe, who, asks what hero, wounded by the foe, was borne from combat by thy foaming steeds. With grief I see the great Machion bleeds. This to report my hasty course I bend. Thou knowest the fiery temper of my friend. Can then the sons of Greece,' the sage rejoined, "'excite compassion in Achilles' mind? Seeks he the sorrows of our host to know? This is not half the story of our woe. Tell him not great Machion bleeds alone. Our bravest heroes in the navy groan, Ulysses, Agamemnon, Diomed, and stern Eurypylus, already bleed. But, ah, what flattering hopes I entertain!' Achilles heeds not, but derides our pain. Even still the flames consume our fleet. He stays, and waits the rising of the fatal blaze. Chief after chief the raging foe destroys. Calm he looks on, and every death enjoys. Now the slow course of all impairing time unstrings my nerves, and ends my manly prime. Oh, had I still that strength my youth possessed, when this bold arm the Epian powers oppressed, the bulls of Elysian glad triumph fled, and stretched the great Itiamonius dead. Then from my fury fled the trembling swains, and ours was all the plunder of the plains. Fifty white flocks fool fifty herds of swine, as many goats as many lowing kine, and thrice the number of unrivaled steeds, all teeming females and of generous breeds. These— as my first essay of arms I won, or Nellius gloried in his conquering son, thus Elis forced her long arrears restored, and shares were parted to each Pylian lord. The state of Pyle was sunk to last despair, when the proud Elians first commenced the war, for Nellius' sons Alcides' range had slayed. Of twelve bold brothers I alone remain, oppressed we armed, and now this conquest gained. My sire, three hundred chosen sheep obtained. That large reprisal he might justly claim, for prize defrauded and insulted fame, when Elias' monarch at the public course detained his chariot and victorious horse. The rest the people shared. Myself surveyed the just partition and due victims paid. Three days were passed when Elias rose to war, with many a courser and with many a car, the sons of Actor, at their army's head, young as they were, the vengeful squadrons led. High on the rock, Fair Theroessa stands, our utmost frontier on the Pylian lands. Not far the streams of famed Alpheus flow, the stream they passed and pitched their tents below, Pallas descending in the shades of night, alarms the Pylians and commands the fight. Each burns for fame and swells with martial pride, myself the foremost, but my sire denied. Feared for my youth, exposed to stern alarms, and stopped my chariot and detained my arms. My sire denied in vain. On foot I fled amidst our chariots, for the goddess led. Along fair Arena's delightful plain, soft Minyas rolls his waters to the main. There horse and foot the Pylian troops unite, and sheathed in arms expect the dawning light. Thence, ere the sun advanced his noonday flame, to great Alpheus' sacred source we came. There first to Jove our solemn rites were paid. An untamed heifer pleased the blue-eyed maid, a bull, Alpheus, and a bull was slain to the blue monarch of the watery main. In arms we slept beside the winding flood, while round the town the fierce Appians stood. Soon as the sun, with all revealing ray, flamed in the front of heaven and gave the day, bright scenes of arms and works of war appear. The nations meet. There, Pylos, Elas, here, the first who fell beneath my javelin bled, King Algis's son and spouse of Agamede, she that all simples healing virtues knew, and every herb that drinks the morning dew, I seized his car. The van of battle led. The Epians saw they trembled and they fled. The foe dispersed, their bravest warrior killed. Fierce as the whirlwind, now I swept the field. Full fifty captive chariots graced my train. Two chiefs from each fell breathless to the plain. Then Actor's sons had died, but Neptune shrouds the youthful heroes in a veil of clouds, or happy shields and all the prostrate throng, collecting spoils and slaughtering all along. Through wide Buprasian fields we forced the foes, where o'er the vales the Olenian rocks arose, till Pallas stopped us where Alysium flows. Even there the hindmost of the rear I slay, and the same arm that led concludes the day. Then back to Pylae, triumphant takes my way. There to high Jove were public thanks assigned, as first of gods to Nestor of mankind. Such then I was impelled by youthful blood, so proved my valour for my country's good. Achilles, with unactive fury, glows, 
and gives to passion what to grease he owes. How shall he grieve when to the eternal shade her hosts shall sink, nor his the power to aid? O oh, my friend, my memory recalls the day when, gathering aids along the Grecian sea, I in Ulysses touched at Pythia's port and entered Pelias's hospitable court. A bull to Jove he slew in sacrifice, and poured libations on the flaming thighs, thyself Achilles, and thy reverend sire Menoetius turned the fragments on the fire. Achilles sees us to the feast invites, so shall we sit and share the genial rites. We then explained the cause on which we came, urged you to arms, and found you fierce for fame. Your ancient father's generous precepts gave. Peleus said only this, my son, be brave. Menoetius thus, though great Achilles shine in strength superior and of race divine, yet cooler thoughts thy elder years attend. Let thy just counsels aid and rule thy friend. Thus spoke your father at Thessalia's court. Words now forgot, though now of vast import. Ah, try the utmost that a friend can say. Such gentle force the fiercest minds obey. Some favoring God Achilles' heart may move. Though deaf to glory, he may yield to love. If some dire oracle his breast alarm, if aught from heaven withhold his saving arm, some beam of comfort yet on Greece may shine, if thou but lead the Myrmidonian line, clad in Achilles' arms. If thou appear, proud Troy may tremble and desist from war. Pressed by fresh forces, her oar laboured train shall seek their walls, and Greece respire again. This touched his generous heart, and from the tent along the shore with hasty strides he went, soon as he came where on the crowded strand the public mart and courts of justice stand, where the tall fleet of great Ulysses lies, and altars to the guardian gods arise, there, sad, he met the brave Uemon's son, large painful drops from all his members run, an arrow's head yet rooted in his wound, the sable blood in circles marked the ground, as faintly reeling he confessed the smart, weak was his pace, but dauntless was his heart. Divine compassion touched Patroclus's breast, who, sighing, thus his bleeding friend addressed, Ah, hapless leaders of the Grecian host, thus must ye perish on a barbarous coast? Is this your fate, to glut the dogs with gore far from your friends and from your native shore? Say, great Eurypylus, shall Greece yet stand? Resist she yet the raging Hector's hand? Or are her heroes doomed to die with shame, and this the period of our wars and fame?' Eurypylus replies, No more, my friend. Greece is no more. This day her glory's end. Even to the ships victorious Troy pursues, her force increasing as her toil renews. Those chiefs that used her utmost rage to meet lie pierced with wounds and bleeding in the fleet. But thou, Patroclus, act a friendly part. Lead to my ships and draw this deadly dart. With lukewarm water wash the gore away. With healing balms the raging smart allay. Such as sage Chiron, sire of pharmacy, once taught Achilles, and Achilles thee, of two famed surgeons, poor delirious stands, this hour surrounded by the Trojan bands, and great Machaon wounded in his tent, now wants that succour which so often he lent. To him the chief, what then remains to do? The event of things the gods alone can view. Charged by Achilles' great command, I fly, and bear with haste the Pylian king's reply— but thy distress this instant claims relief, he said, and in his arms upheld the chief. The slaves, their master's slow approach surveyed, and hides of oxen on the floor displayed, there stretched at length the wounded hero lay. Patroclus cut the forky steel away. Then, in his hands, a bitter root he bruised, the wound he washed, the styptic juice infused, the closing flesh that instant ceased to glow, the wound to torture, and the blood to flow." The end of Book 11 of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Read by Rick Kishner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book 12. Argument. The Battle at the Grecian Wall. The Greeks having retired into their entrenchments, Hector attempts to force them, but, it proving impossible to pass the ditch, Polydamus advises to quit their chariots and manage the attack on foot. The Trojans follow his counsel, and, having divided their army into five bodies of foot, begin the assault. But upon the signal of an eagle with a serpent in his talons, which appeared on the left hand of the Trojans, Polydamus endeavors to withdraw them again. This Hector opposes and continues the attack, in which, after many actions, Sarpedon makes the first breach in the wall. 
Hector, also casting a stone of vast size, forces open one of the gates and enters at the head of his troops, who victoriously pursue the Grecians even to their ships. While thus the hero's pious cares attend the cure and safety of his wounded friend, Trojans and Greeks with clashing shields engage, and mutual deaths are dealt with mutual rage. Nor long the trench or lofty walls oppose, with gods of earth the ill-fated works arose, their powers neglected, and no victim slain, the walls were raised, their trenches sunk in vain. Without the gods, how short a period stands the proudest monument of mortal hands. This stood while Hector and Achilles raged, while sacred Troy the warring hosts engaged. But when her sons were slain, her city burned, and what survived of Greece to Greece returned, then Neptune and Apollo shook the shore, then Ida's summits poured their watery store, Rhesus and Rhodius then unite their rills, Saresus roaring down the stony hills, Aesepus, Granicus with mingled force, and Xanthus foaming from his fruitful source, and Golfi Simwa rolling to the main, helmets and shields and godlike heroes slain. These, turned by Phoebus from their wonted ways, deluged the rampire nine continual days. The weight of water saps the yielding wall, and to the sea the floating bulwarks fall, incessant cataracts the thunderer pours, and half the skies descend in sluicy showers. The god of ocean marching stern before, with his huge trident, wounds the trembling shore. Vast stones and piles from their foundation heaves, and whelms the smoky ruin in the waves. Now, smoothed with sand, and levelled by the flood, no fragment tells where once the wonder stood. In their odd old bounds the rivers roll again, shine twixt the hills, or wander o'er the plain. But this the gods in later times perform, as yet the bulwark stood, and braved the storm. The strokes yet echoed of contending powers, war thundered at the gates, and blood disdained the towers. Smote by the arm of Jove with dire dismay, close by their hollow ships the Grecians lay. Hector's approach in every wind they hear, and Hector's fury every moment fear. He, like a whirlwind, tossed the scattering throng, mingled the troops, and drove the field along. So, midst the dogs and hunters' daring bands, fierce of his might, a boar or lion stands, armed foes around a dreadful circle form, and hissing javelins rain an iron storm. His powers untamed their bold assault defy, and where he turns the rout disperse or die. He foams, he glares, he bounds against them all, and if he falls, his courage makes him fall." With equal rage encompassed Hector glows, Exhorts his armies, and the trenches shows. The panting steeds impatient fury breathe, And snort and tremble at the gulf beneath, Just at the brink they neigh and paw the ground, And the turf trembles, and the skies resound. Eager they viewed the prospect dark and deep, Vast was the leap, and headlong hung the sheep, the bottom bare, a formidable show, and bristled thick with sharpened stakes below. The foot alone this strong defence could force, and try the pass impervious to the horse. This saw Polydamus, who wisely brave, restrained great Hector, and this counsel gave. O thou bold leader of the Trojan bands, and you confederate chiefs from foreign lands, what entrance here can cumbrous chariots find the stakes beneath the Grecian walls behind? No pass through those— without a thousand wounds, no space for combat in your narrow bounds. Proud of the favours mighty Jove has shown on certain dangers we too rashly run. If tis will our haughty foes to tame, oh, may this instant end the Grecian name. Here, far from Argos, let their heroes fall, and one day great destroy and bury all. But should they turn and here oppress our train, what hopes, what methods of retreat remain? Wedged in the trench by our own troops confused, in one promiscuous carnage crushed and bruised, all Troy must perish if their arms prevail, nor shall a Trojan live to tell the tale. Here then, ye warriors, and obey with speed. Back from the trenches let your steeds be led. Then all alighting, wedged in firm array, proceed on foot, and Hector lead the way. So Greece shall stoop before our conquering power, and this, if Jove consent, her fatal hour. This counsel pleased the godlike Hector, sprung swift from his seat, his clanging armor rung. The chief's example, followed by his train, each quits his car and issues on the plain. By orders strict, the charioteers enjoined compel the courses to their ranks behind. The forces part in five distinguished bands, and all obey their several chief's commands. The best and bravest in the first conspire, pant for the fight— 
and threat the fleet with fire, great Hector, glorious in the van of these Polydamus and brave Cebrionis, before the next the graceful Paris shines, and bold Alcalthus and Agenor joins, the sons of Priam with the third appear, Deiphobus and Helenus the seer, in arms with these the mighty Asius stood, who drew from Hyrtacus his noble blood, and whom Arisba's yellow coursers bore, the coursers fed on Selle's winding shore. Antenor's sons, the fourth battalion guide, and great Aeneas, born on Fountal Ide, divine Sopidon, the last band obeyed, whom Glaucus and Asteropius aid, next him the bravest at their army's head, but he more brave than all the hosts he led. Now, with compacted shields in close array, the moving legions speed their headlong way, already in their hoops they fire the fleet, and see the Grecians gasping at their feet. While every Trojan thus and every aid the advice of wide Polydemus obeyed, Asius alone, confiding in his car, his vaunted courses urged to meet the war, unhappy hero and advised in vain, those wheels returning ne'er shall mark the plain. No more those courses with triumphant joy restore their master to the gates of Troy. Black death attends behind the Grecian wall, and great Idomeneus shall boast thy fall. Fierce to the left he drives, where from the plain the flying Grecians strove their ships to gain. Swift through the wall their horse and chariots passed, the gates half open to receive the last. Thither, exulting in his force, he flies, his following host with clamours rend the skies, to plunge the Grecians headlong in the main, such their proud hopes, but all their hopes were vain. To guard the gates two mighty chiefs attend, who from the Lapith's warlike race descend. This... Polypoetus, great Perithus heir, and that Leontius, like the god of war, as two tall oaks before the wall they rise, their roots in earth, their heads amidst the skies, whose spreading arms with leafy honours crowned forbid the tempest and protect the ground, high on the hills appears their stately form, and their deep roots forever brave the storm. So grateful these, and so the shock they stand of raging Asius and his furious band, Orestes, Acamas in front appear, and Onomos and Thune close the rear. In vain their clamours shake the ambient fields, in vain around them beat their hollow shields. The fearless brothers on the Grecians call to guard their navies and defend the wall. Even when they saw Troy's sable troops impend, and Greece tumultuous from her towers descend, forth from the portals rushed the intrepid pair, opposed their breasts, and stood themselves the war. So two wild boars spring furious from their den, roused with the cries of dogs and voices of men. On every side the crackling trees they tear, and root the shrubs and lay the forest bare. They gnash their tusks with fire, their eyeballs roll, till some wide wound lets out their mighty soul. Around their heads the whistling javelins sung, with sounding strokes their brazen targets rung. Fierce was the fight, while yet the Grecian powers maintained the walls and manned the lofty towers. To save their fleet, their last efforts they try, and stones and darts in mingled tempests fly. As when sharp Boreas blows abroad and brings the dreary winter on his frozen wings, beneath the low-hung clouds the sheets of snow descend and whiten all the fields below. So fast the darts on either army pour, so down the rampires rolls the rocky shower, heavy and thick resound the battered shields, and the deaf echo rattles round the fields. With shame repulsed, with grief and fury driven, the frantic Asius thus accuses heaven, and powers immortal, who shall now believe? Can those two flatter, and can Jove's deceive? What man could doubt but Troy's victorious power should humble Greece and this her fatal hour? But like when wasps from hollow crannies drive to God, the entrance of their common hive darkening the rock, while with unwearied wings they strike the assailants and infix their stings, a race determined that to death contend, so fierce these Greeks their last retreats defend. Gods! Shall two warriors only guard their gates, repel an army, and defraud the fates? These empty accents mingled with the wind, nor moved great Jove's unalterable mind. To godlike Hector and his matchless might was owed the glory of the destined fight. Like deeds of arms through all the forts were tried, and all the gates sustained an equal tide. Through the long walls the stony showers were heard, the blaze of flames, the flash of arms appeared. The spirit of a god, my breast inspire, to raise each act to life and sing with fire. While Greece unconquered kept alive the war, secure of death, confiding in despair, and all her guardian gods in deep dismay with unassisting arms deplored the day. Even yet the dauntless Lapithae maintained the dreadful pass, and round them heaped the slain, first Damasus, by Polypoetus steel, pierced through his helmet's brazen visor, fell. The weapon drank the mingled brains and gore. The warrior sink, tremendous now no more. Next, 
Orimenus and Pylon yield their breath. Nor less Leontius strews the field with death. First through the belt Hippomachus he gored, then sudden waved his unresisted sword. Antiphatis, as through the ranks he broke, the falchion struck, and fate pursued the stroke. Iamenus, Orestes, men on bled, and round him rose a monument of dead. Meantime the bravest of the Trojan crew, bold Hector and Polydamus pursue, fierce with impatience on the works to fall, and wrap and rolling flames the fleet and wall. These on the farther bank now stood and gazed, by heaven alarmed, by prodigies amazed. A single omen stopped the passing host, their martial fury and their wonder lost. Jove's bird on sounding pinions beat the skies, a bleeding serpent of enormous size. His talons trussed alive and curling round, he stung the bird, whose throat received the wound. Mad with a smart, he drops the fatal prey. In airy circles wings his painful way, floats on the winds, and rends the heaven with cries. Amidst the host the fallen serpent lies. They, pale with terror, mark its spires unrolled, and Jove's portent with beating hearts behold. Then first Polydamus the silence broke, long weighed the signal, and to Hector spoke. How oft, my brother, thy reproach I bear, for words well meant and sentiments sincere, True to those counsels which I judge the best, I tell the faithful dictates of my breast. To speak his thoughts is every freeman's right, in peace, in war, in counsel, and in fight. And all I move, deferring to thy sway, but tends to raise that power which I obey. Then hear my words, nor may my words be vain. Seek not this day the Grecian ships to gain, for sure to warn us Jove his omen sent, and thus my mind explains its clear event. The victor eagle, whose sinister flight retards our host and fills our heart with fright, dismissed his conquest in the middle skies, allowed to seize but not possess the prize. Thus, though we gird with fires the Grecian fleet, though these proud bulwarks tumble at our feet, toils unforeseen and fiercer are decreed. More woes shall follow, and more heroes bleed. So bolds my soul, and bids me thus advise, for thus a skilful seer would read the skies." To him, then, Hector with disdain returned, fierce as he spoke, his eyes with fury burned. Are these the faithful counsels of thy tongue? Thy will is partial, not thy reason wrong. Or if the purpose of thy heart thou vent, sure heaven resumes the little sense it lent. What coward counsels would thy madness move against the word, the will revealed of Jove, the leading sign, the irrevocable nod, and happy thunders of the favouring God? These shall I slight, and guide my wavering mind by wandering birds that flit with every wind? Ye vagrants of the sky, your wings extend." or where the suns arise or where descend, to right, to left, unheeded, take your way, while I the dictates of high heaven obey. Without a sign his sword the brave man draws, and asks no omen but his country's cause. But why shouldst thou suspect the war's success? None fears it more as none promotes it less. Though all our chiefs amidst yon ships expire, trust thy own cowardice to escape their fire. Troy and her sons may find a general grave, but thou canst live, for thou canst be a slave. Yet, should the fears that wary mind suggests spread their cold poison through our soldiers' breasts, my javelin can revenge so base a part, and free the soul that quivers in thy heart. Furious he spoke, and rushing to the wall, calls on his host, his hosts obey the call, with order follow where their leader flies. Redoubling clamours thunder in the skies, Jove breathes a whirlwind from the hills of Ide, and drifts of dust the clouded navy hide. He fills the Greeks with terror and dismay, and gives great Hector the predestined day. Strong in themselves, but stronger in his aid, close to the works, their rigid siege they laid. In vain the mounds and massy beams defend, while these they undermine, and those they rend. Upheaved the piles that prop the solid wall, and heaps on heaps the smoky ruins fall. Greece on her ramparts stands the fierce alarms, the crowded bulwarks blaze with waving arms, shield touching shield, a long refulgent row, whence hissing darts, incessant rain below, the bold Agassiz fly from tower to tower, and rouse with flames divine the Grecian power, the generous impulse every Greek obeys, threats urge the fearful and the valiant praise, fellows in arms, whose deeds are known to fame, and you whose ardour hopes an equal name, since not alike endued with force or art, behold a day when each may act his part, a day to fire the brave and warm the cold, to gain new glories or augment the old, urge those who stand and those who faint excite, drown Hector's vaunts in loud exhorts of fight, conquest, not safety, till the thoughts of all seek not your fleet, but sally from the wall. So Jove once more may drive their routed train, and Troy lie trembling in her walls again. 
Their ardor kindles all the Grecian powers, and now the stones descend in heavier showers, as when high Jove his sharp artillery forms and opes his cloudy magazine of storms, in winter's bleak uncomfortable rain, a snowy inundation hides the plain. He stills the winds and bids the skies to sleep, then pours the silent tempest thick and deep, and first the mountain tops are covered o'er, then the green fields and then the sandy shore, bent with it weight the nodding woods are seen, and one bright waste hides all the works of men. The circling seas, alone absorbing all, drink the dissolving fleeces as they fall, show from each side increase the stony rain, and the white ruin rises o'er the plain. Thus, godlike Hector and his troops contend to force the ramparts and the gates to rend. Nor Troy could conquer, nor the Greeks would yield, till great Sarpedon towered amid the field. For mighty Jove inspired with martial flame his matchless son, and urged him on to fame. In arms he shines, conspicuous from afar, and bears aloft his ample shield in air, within whose orb the thick bull hides were rolled, ponderous with brass, and bound with ductile gold, and while two pointed javelins arm his hands, majestic moves along, and leads his Lycian bands. So, pressed with hunger from the mountain's brow, descends a lion on the flocks below. So, stalks the lordly savage o'er the plain in sullen majesty, and stern disdain, in vain loud mastiffs, bay him from afar, and shepherds gall him with an iron war. Regardless, furious, he pursues his way, he foams, he roars, he rends the panting prey. Resolved alike, divine Sarpedon glows with generous rage that drives him on the foes. He views the towers, and meditates their fall, to sure destruction dooms the aspiring wall. Then casting on his friend an ardent look, fired with the thirst of glory, thus he spoke, Why boast we, Glaucus, our extended reign, where Xanthus streams enrich the Lycian plain? Our numerous herds that range the fruitful field, and hills where vines their purple harvest yield, our foaming bowls with purer nectar crowned, our feasts enhanced with music's sprightly sound. Why, on those shores are we with joy surveyed, admired as heroes and as gods obeyed, unless great acts superior merit prove, and vindicate the bounteous powers above? "'Tis ours the dignity they give to grace, "'the first in valour as the first in place, "'that when with wandering eyes our martial bands "'behold our deeds transcending our commands, "'such they may cry, deserve the sovereign state, "'whom those that envy dare not imitate. "'Could all our care elude the gloomy grave "'which claims no less the fearful and the brave? "'For lust of fame I should not vainly dare "'in fighting fields, nor urge thy soul to war. "'But since, alas, ignoble age must come,' Disease and death's inexorable doom, the life which others pay, let us bestow, and give to fame what we to nature owe. Brave though we fall, and honoured if we live, or let us glory gain or glory give. He said. His words the listening chief inspire, with equal warmth, and rouse the warrior's fire. The troops pursue their leaders with delight, rush to the foe, and claim the promised fight. Menestheus, from on high the storm beheld, threatening the fort and blackening in the field. Around the walls he gazed to view from far what aid appeared to avert the approaching war, and saw where Teucer with the Ajaces stood, of fight insatiate prodigal of blood. In vain he calls, the din of helms and shields rings to the skies and echoes through the fields. The brazen hinges fly, the walls resound, heaven trembles, roar the mountains, thunders all the ground. Then thus to Thus. Hence with speed, he said, and urge the bold Ajaces to our aid. Their strength united best may help to bear the bloody labours of the doubtful war. Hither the Lycian princes bend their course, the best and bravest of the hostile force. But if too fiercely there the foes contend, let Telamon at least our towers defend, and Teucer haste with his unerring bow to share the danger and repel the foe. Swift at the word, the herald speeds along the lofty ramparts, through the martial throng, and finds the heroes bathed in sweat and gore, opposed in combat on the dusty shore. Ye valiant leaders of our warlike bands, your aid, said Thus, Patius' son demands, your strength united best may help to bear the bloody labours of the doubtful war. Thither the Lycian princes bend their course, the best and bravest of the hostile force. But if too fiercely here the foes contend, at least let Telamon those towers defend, and Teucer haste with his unerring bow to share the danger and repel the foe. Straight to the fort great Ajax turned his care, and thus bespoke his brothers of the war. Now, valiant Lycomede, exert your might, and brave Oleus, prove your force in fight, to you I trust the fortune of the field, till by this arm the foe shall be repelled. 
That done, expect me to complete the day. Then, with his sevenfold shield, he strode away. With equal steps, bold Tusa pressed the shore, whose fatal bow the strong Pandion bore. High on the walls appeared the Lycian powers, like some black tempest gathering round the towers. The Greeks, oppressed, their utmost force unite, prepared to labour in the unequal fight. The war renews, mixed shouts and groans arise, tumultuous clamour mounts, and thickens in the skies. Fierce Ajax, first the advancing host invades, and sends the brave Epicles to the shades, Sarpedon's friend. Across the warrior's way, rent from the walls, a rocky fragment lay. In modern ages not the strongest swain could heave the unwieldy burden from the plain. He poised, and swung it round, then tossed on high it flew with force, and laboured up the sky, full on the Lycian's helmet thundering down, the ponderous ruin crushed his battered crown. As skilful, diverse from some airy steep, headlong descend, and shoot into the deep, so falls Epicles, then in groans expires, and murmuring to the shade the soul retires. While to the ramparts daring Glaucus drew, from Teus's hand a winged arrow flew, the bearded shaft the destined passage found, and on his naked arm inflicts a wound, the chief— who feared some foe's insulting boast might stop the progress of his warlike host, concealed the wound, and leaping from his height, retired reluctant from the unfinished fight. Divine Sarpedon, with regret, beheld disabled Glaucus slowly quit the field. His beating breast with generous ardor glows, he springs to fight and flies upon the foes. Alcmeon first was doomed his force to feel. Deep in his breast he plunged the pointed steel, then from the yawning wound with fury tore the spear, pursued by gushing streams of gore. Down sinks the warrior with a thunderous sound, his brazen armor rings against the ground. Swift to the battlement the victor flies, tugs with full force, and every nerve's off plies. It shakes the ponderous stone's disjointed yield. The rolling ruins smoke along the field, a mighty breach appears, the walls lie bare, and like a deluge rushes in the war. At once, bold Tusa draws the twanging bow, and Ajax sends his javelin at the foe. Fixed in his belt the feathered weapon stood, and through his buckler drove the trembling wood. But Jove was present in the dire debate, to shield his offspring and avert his fate. The prince gave back, not meditating flight, but urging vengeance and severer fight. Then, raised with hope and fired with glory's charms, his fainting squadrons to new fury warms, O oh, where, ye Lycians, is the strength you boast, your former fame and ancient virtue lost? The breach lies open, but your chief in vain attempts alone the guarded past again. Unite, and soon that hostile fleet shall fall. The force of powerful union conquers all. This just rebuke inflamed the Lycian crew. They join, they thicken, and the assault renew. Unmoved, the embodied Greeks their fury dare, and fixed support the weight of all the war. Nor could the Greeks repel the Lycian powers, nor the bold Lycians force the Grecian towers. As on the confines of adjoining grounds two stubborn swains with blows dispute their bounds, they tug, they sweat, but neither gain nor yield, one foot, one inch of the contended field. Thus obstinate to death they fight, they fall, nor these can keep, nor those can win the wall." Their manly breasts are pierced with many a wound. Loud strokes are heard, and rattling arms resound. The copious slaughter covers all the shore, and the high ramparts drip with human gore. And when two scales are charged with doubtful loads, from side to side the trembling balance nods, while some laborious matron, just and poor, with nice exactness, weighs her woolly store, till poised aloft the resting beam suspends each equal weight, nor this nor that descends. So stood the war, till Hector's matchless might, with fates prevailing, turned the scale of fight. Fierce as a whirlwind, up the walls he flies, and fires his host with loud repeated cries. Advance, ye Trojans, lend your valiant hands, haste to the fleet, and toss the blazing brands. They hear, they run, and, gathering at his call, raise scaling engines and ascend the wall. Around the works a wood of glittering spears shoots up, and all the rising host appears. A ponderous stone bold Hector heaved to throw, pointed above and rough and gross below. Not two strong men the enormous weight could raise, such men as live in these degenerate days. Yet this as easy as a swain could bear, the snowy fleece he tossed and shook in air. For Jove upheld and lightened of its load, the unwieldy rock, the labour of a god. Thus armed, before the folded gates he came, of massy substance and stupendous frame, with iron bars and brazen hinges strong, on lofty beams of solid timber hung. Then, thundering through the planks with forceful sway, drives the sharp rock, the solid beams give way, the folds are shattered from the crackling door, leap the resounding bars, the flying hinges roar. Now rushing in, the furious chief appears, gloomy as night, and shakes two shining spears. A dreadful gleam from his bright armor came, and from his eyeballs flashed the living flame. 
He moves, a god resistless in his course, and seems a match for more than mortal force. Then, pouring after through the gaping space, a tide of Trojans flows and fills the place. The Greeks behold, they tremble, and they fly. The shore is heaped with death, and tumult rends the sky. The End of Book Twelve of the Iliad by Homer As translated by Alexander Pope Read by Rick Kishner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book 13. Argument. The fourth battle continued, in which Neptune assists the Greeks. The Acts of Idomeneus. Neptune, concerned for the loss of the Grecians upon seeing the fortification forced by Hector, who had entered the gate near the station of the Ajaces, assumes the shape of Calchas and inspires those heroes to oppose him, then, in the form of one of the generals, encourages the other Greeks, who had retired to their vessels. The Ajaces form their troops in a close phalanx and put a stop to Hector and the Trojans. Several deeds of valor are performed. Mariones, losing a spear in the encounter, repairs to seek another at the tent of Idomeneus, this occasions a conversation between those two warriors, who return together to the battle. Idomeneus signalizes his courage above the rest. He kills Orothonius, Asius, and Alcathus. Deophobus and Aeneas march against him, and at length Idomeneus retires. Menelaus wounds Helenus and kills Pisander. The Trojans are repulsed on the left wing. Hector still keeps his ground against the Ajaces, till, being galled by the Locrian slingers and archers, Polydamus advises to call a council of war. Hector approves of his advice, but goes first to rally the Trojans, upbraids Paris, rejoins Polydamus, meets Ajax again, and renews the attack. The eighth and twentieth day still continues. The scene is between the Grecian Wall and the seashore. When now the thunderer on the sea-beat coast had fixed great Hector and his conquering host, he left them to the fates in bloody fray to toil and struggle through the well-fought day. Then turned to Thracia from the field of fight those eyes that shed insufferable light, to where the Mycians proved their martial force, and hardy Thracians tamed the savage horse, and where the far-famed Hippomolgian strays, renowned for justice and for length of days, thrice happy race, that innocent of blood, from milk and oxus, seek their simple food. Jove sees delighted, and avoids the scene of guilty Troy, of arms and dying men. No aid, he deems, to either host is given, while his high law suspends the powers of heaven. Meantime, the monarch of the watery main observed the thunderer, nor observed in vain. In Samothracia, on a mountain's brow, whose waving woods o'erhung the deeps below, he sat, and round him cast his azure eyes, where Ida's misty tops confusedly rise. Below fair Ilion's glittering spires were seen, the crowded ships and sable seas between. There from the crystal chambers of the main emerged, he sat, and mourned his argive slain. At Jove, incensed with grief and fury stung, prone down the rocky steep he rushed along, fierce as he passed, the lofty mountains nod, the forest shakes, earth trembled as he trod, and felt the footsteps of the immortal god. From realm to realm three ample strides he took, and at the fourth the distant Aegea shook. Far in the bay his shining palace stands, eternal frame not raised by mortal hands. This having reached his brass-hoofed steeds, he reigns, fleet, as the winds, and decked with golden manes, refulgent arms, his mighty limbs enfold, immortal arms of adamant and gold. He mounts the car, the golden scourge applies, he sits superior, and the chariot flies. His wheeling wheels, the glassy surface sweep, the enormous monsters rolling o'er the deep, gamble around him on the watery way, and heavy whales in awkward measures play. The sea, subsiding, spreads a level plain, exults, and owns the monarch of the main. The parting waves before his courses fly, the wandering waters leave his axle dry. Deep in the liquid regions lies a cave between where Tenidos, the surges, lave, and rocky Imbus breaks the rolling wave. There the great ruler of the azure round stopped his swift chariot and his steeds unbound, fed with ambrosial herbage from his hand, and linked their fetlocks with a golden band, infrangible, immortal. There they stay. The father of the floods pursues his way where, like a tempest darkening heaven around, or fiery deluge that devours the ground, the impatient Trojans in a gloomy throng embattled rolled as Hector rushed along. 
To the loud tumult and the barbarous cry, the heavens re-echo and the shores reply. They vow destruction to the Grecian name, and in their hopes the fleets already flame. But Neptune, rising from the seas profound, the god whose earthquakes rock the solid ground, now wears a mortal form like Calchas seen, such his loud voice and such his manly mien, his shouts incessant every Greek inspire, but most the Ajaces adding fire to fire. "'Tis yours, O warriors, all our hopes to raise. O oh, recollect your ancient worth and praise. "'Tis yours to save us if you cease to fear. "'Flight more than shameful is destructive here. "'On other works, though Troy with fury fall, "'and pour her armies o'er our battered wall, "'there Greece has strength, but this, this part o'er thrown, "'her strength were vain. "'I dread for you alone. "'Here Hector rages like the voice of fire, "'vaunts of his gods, and calls high Jove his sire.' If yet some heavenly power your breast excite, Breathe in your hearts and string your arms to fight, Greece yet may live, her threatened fleet maintain, And Hector's force and Jove's own aid be vain. Then with his scepter that the deep controls, He touched the chiefs and steeled their manly souls. Strength not their own, the touch divine imparts, Prompts their light limbs and swells their daring hearts. Then, as a falcon from the rocky height, her quarry seen impetuous at the sight, forth springing instant darts herself from high, shoots on the wing and skims along the sky. Such and so swift the power of ocean flew, the wide horizon shut him from their view. The inspiring god, Oleus's active son, perceived the first and thus to Telamon, Some god, my friend, some god in human form, favoring descends and wills to stand the storm. Not couches this, the venerable seer, Short as he turned, I saw the power appear. I marked his parting, and the steps he trod. His own bright evidence reveals a god. Even now some energy divine I share, and seem to walk on wings and tread in air. With equal ardor, Telamon returns, my soul is kindled and my bosom burns. New rising spirits all my force alarm, lift each impatient limb and brace my arm. This ready arm, unthinking, shakes the dart. The blood pours back, and fortifies my heart, singly methinks yon towering chief I meet, and stretch the dreadful Hector at my feet. Full of the god that urged their burning breast, the heroes thus their mutual warmth expressed. Neptune, meanwhile, the routed Greeks inspired, who, breathless pale, with length of labors tired, pant in the ships, while Troy to conquest calls, and swarms victorious o'er their yielding walls, trembling before the impending storm they lie, while tears of rage stand burning in their eye. Greece, sunk, they thought, and this their fatal hour. But breathe anew courage as they feel the power. Teucer and Laetus first his words excite, then stern Penelius rises to the fight. Thoas, Deparis in arms renowned, and Marion next the impulsive fury found. Last Nestor's son the same bold ardor takes, while thus the god the martial fire awakes. O lasting infamy, O dire disgrace, to chiefs of vigorous youth and manly race, I trusted in the gods and you to see brave Greece victorious and her navy free. Ah, no, the glorious combat you disclaim, and one black day clouds all her former fame. Heavens! What a prodigy these eyes survey, unseen, unthought till this amazing day! Fly we at length from Troy's oft conquered bands, and falls our fleet by such inglorious hands, a rout, undisciplined, a straggling train, not born to glories of the dusty plain, like frighted fawns from hill to hill pursued, a prey to every savage of the wood. Shall these so late who trembled at your name invade your camps, involve your ships in flame? A change so shameful, say, what cause has wrought, the soldier's baseness or the general's fault. Fools, will ye perish for your leader's vice, the purchase infamy, and life the price? Tis not your cause Achilles' injured fame. Another's is the crime, but yours the shame. Grant that our chief offend through rage or lust. Must you be cowards if your king's unjust? Prevent this evil, and your country save. Small thought retrieves the spirits of the brave. Think and subdue. On dastards, dead to fame, I waste no anger, for they feel no shame. But you, the pride, the flower of all our host, my heart weeps blood to see your glory lost, nor deem this day, this battle, all you lose. A day more black, a fate more vile ensues. Let each reflect who prizes fame or breath on endless infamy, on instant death. For lo, the fated time, the appointed shore, hark, the gates burst, 
The brazen barriers roar, impetuous Hector thunders at the wall, the hour, the spot, to conquer or to fall. These words the Grecians' fainting hearts inspire, and listening armies catch the godlike fire. Fixed at his post was each bold Ajax found, with well-ranged squadrons strongly circled round, so close their order, so disposed their fight, as Pallas' self might view with fixed delight, or— had the god of war inclined his eyes, the god of war had owned a just surprise. A chosen phalanx, firm, resolved his fate, descending Hector and his battle weight. An iron scene gleams dreadful o'er the fields, armor in armor locked, and shields in shields, spears lean on spears, on targets targets throng, helms stuck to helms, and man drove man along. The floating plumes unnumbered wave above, as when an earthquake stirs the nodding grove, and leveled at the skies with pointing rays, their brandished lances at each motion blaze. Thus, breathing death in terrible array, the close compacted legions urged their way. Fierce they drove on, impatient to destroy. Troy charged the first, and Hector first of Troy, as from some mountain's craggy forehead torn, a rock's round fragment flies with fury borne, which from the stubborn stone a torrent rends, precipitate the ponderous mass descends, from steep to steep the rolling ruin bounds, and every shock the crackling wood resounds, still gathering force it smokes, and urged amain whirls, leaps, and thunders down, impetuous to the plain, there stops so Hector, their whole force he proved, resistless when he raged, and when he stopped unmoved. On him the waters bent, the darts are shed, and all their falchions wave round his head. Repulsed he stands, nor from his stand retires, but with repeated shouts his army fires. Trojans, be firm, this arm shall make your way through yon square body in that black array. Stand, and my spear shall rout their scattering power, strong as they seem, embattled like a tower. For he that Juno's heavenly bosom warms, the first of the gods this day inspires our arms. He said and roused the soul in every breast. Urged with desire of fame beyond the rest, forth marched Deiphobus, but marching held before his wary steps his ample shield. Bold Marion aimed a stroke, nor aimed it wide. The glittering javelin pierced the tough bullhide, but pierced not through, unfaithful to his hand. The point broke short and sparkled in the sand. The Trojan warrior, touched with timely fear, on the raised orb to distance bore the spear. The Greek, retreating, mourned his frustrate blow, and cursed the treacherous lance that spared a foe. Then to the ships with surly speed he went, to seek a surer javelin in his tent. Meanwhile with rising rage the battle glows, the tumult thickens and the clamour grows. By Teusa's arm the warlike Imbrius bleeds, the son of Mentor, rich in generous steeds, ere yet to Troy the sons of Greece were led, in fair Pedaeus's verdant pastures bred, the youth had dwelt remote from war's alarms, and blessed in bright Medesicaste's arms. This nymph, the fruit of Priam's ravished joy, allied the warrior to the house of Troy. To Troy, when glory called his arms, he came, and matched the bravest of her chiefs in fame. With Priam's sons, a guardian of the throne, he lived beloved and honoured as his own. Him, Teuser pierced between the throat and ear, he groans beneath the Telamonian spear. As from some far-seen mountain, airy crown, subdued by steel, a tall ash tumbles down, and soils its verdant tresses on the ground. So falls the youth, his arms, the fall resound. Then, Teusa, rushing to despoil the dead, from Hector's hand a shining javelin fled. He saw and shunned the death, the forceful dart sung on and pierced Ampomachus's heart. Satiatus, the son of Neptune's forceful line, vain was his courage and his race divine. Prostrate he falls, his clanging arms resound, and his broad buckler thunders on the ground. To seize his beamy helm the victor flies, and just had fastened on the dazzling prize when Ajax's manly arm a javelin flung. Full on the shield's round boss the weapon rung. He felt the shock. No more was doomed to feel, secure in mail, and sheathed in shining steel. Repulsed he yields. The victor Greeks obtain the spoils contested and bear off the slain. Between the leaders of the Athenian line, Stichus the brave, Menestheus the divine, deplored, Amphimachus' sad object lies. Imbrius remains the fierce Ajaces' prize. As two grim lions bear across the lawn, snatched from devouring hounds a slaughtered fawn, in their fell jaws high lifting through the wood, and sprinkling all the shrubs with drops of blood, 
So these, the chief, great Ajax, from the dead, strips his bright arms. Oleus lops his head, tossed like a ball, and whirled in air away. At Hector's feet the gory visage lay. The god of ocean, fired with stern disdain, and pierced with sorrow for his grandson slain, inspires the Grecian, hearts confirms their hands, and breathes destruction on the Trojan bands. Swift as a whirlwind rushing to the fleet, he finds the lance-famed Ilumen of Crete. His pensive brow, the generous care expressed, with which a wounded soldier touched his breast, whom in the chance of war a javelin tore, and his sad comrades from the battle bore, him to the surgeons of the camp he sent. That office paid, he issued from his tent, fierce for the fight, to whom the god begun in Thoas's voice, and Draemon's valiant son, who ruled where Caledon's white rocks arise, and Pleuron's chalky cliffs emblaze the skies. Where is now the imperious vaunt, the daring boast, of Greece victorious and proud Ilion lost? To whom the king, on Greece no blame be thrown, arms are her trade, and war is all her own. Her hardy heroes from the well-fought plains nor fear withholds, nor shameful sloth detains. Tis heaven, alas, and Jove's all-powerful doom, that far, far distant from our native home wills us to fall inglorious. Oh, my friend! Once foremost in the fight, still prone to lend, or arms, or counsels now perform thy best, and what thou canst not singly urge the rest. Thus he, and thus the god, whose force can make the solid globe's eternal basis shake, ah, never may he see his native land, but feed the vultures on this hateful strand, who seeks ignobly in his ships to stay, nor dares to combat on this signal day. For this, behold, in horrid arms I shine, and urge thy soul to rival acts with mine. Together let us battle on the plain. Two, not the worst, nor even this succour vain. Not vain the weakest, if their force unite, but ours the bravest have confessed in fight. This said, he rushes where the combat burns, swift to his tent the Cretan king returns, from thence two javelins glittering in his hand, and, clad in arms that lightened all the strand, fierce on the foe the impetuous hero drove, like lightning bursting from the arm of Jove, which to pale man the wrath of heaven declares, or terrifies the offending world with wars, in streamy sparkles, kindling all the skies, from pole to pole the trail of glory flies, Thus his bright armour, o'er the dazzled throng, gleamed dreadful as the monarchs flashed along. Him, near his tent, Marionis attends, whom thus he questions. Ever best of friends, O oh, say in every art of battle skilled, what holds thy courage from so brave a field? On some important message art thou bound, or bleeds my friend by some unhappy wound? Inglorious here my soul abhors to stay, and glows with prospects of the approaching day. O oh, prince, Marionis replies, whose care leads forth the embattled sons of Crete to war. This speaks my grief, this headless lance I wield, the rest lies rooted in a Trojan shield. To whom the Cretan? Enter and receive the wanted weapons those my tent can give, spears I have store, and Trojan lances all, that shed a luster round the illumined wall, though I disdainful of the distant war nor trust the dart, nor aim the uncertain spear, yet hand to hand I fight and spoil the slain, and thence these trophies and these arms I gain, enter, and see on heaps the helmets rolled, and high-hung spears, and shields that flame with gold. Nor vain, said Marion, are our martial toils, we too can boast of no ignoble spoils, but those my ship contains whence distance far, I fight conspicuous in the van of war, what need I more? If any Greek there be who knows not Marion, I appeal to thee. To this, Idomeneus, the fields of fight have proved thy valour, an unconquered might, and were some ambush for the foe's design, even there thy courage would not lag behind. In that sharp service, singled from the rest, the fear of each or valour stands confessed. No force, no firmness, the pale coward shows— he shifts his place, his colour comes and goes. A dropping sweat creeps cold on every part. Against his bosom beats his quivering heart. Terror and death in his wild eyeballs stare. With chattering teeth he stands in stiffening hair, and looks a bloodless image of despair. Not so the brave, still dauntless, still the same, unchanged his colour and unmoved his frame. Composed his thought, 
determined is his eye, and fixed his soul to conquer or to die. If aught disturb the tenor of his breast, tis but the wish to strike before the rest. In such assays thy blameless worth is known, and every art of dangerous war thy own. By chance of fight, whatever wounds you bore, those wounds were glorious all and all before. Such as may teach, t'was still thy brave delight to pose thy bosom where thy foremost fight. But why, like infants, cold to honour's charms, stand we to talk when glory calls to arms? Go from my conquered spears the choicest take, and to their owners send them nobly back. Swift at the word, bold Marion snatched a spear, and, breathing slaughter, followed to the war. So Mars, omnipotent, invades the plain, the wide destroyer of the race of man. Terror, his best-beloved son, attends his course, armed with stern boldness and enormous force, the pride of haughty warriors to confound and lay the strength of tyrants on the ground. From Thrace they fly, called to the dire alarms of warring phlegians and Ephyrian arms, invoked by both, relentless they dispose. To these glad conquest murderous rout to those, so marched the leaders of the Creighton train, and their bright arms shot horror o'er the plain. Then first spake Marion, Shall we join the right or combat in the centre of the fight, or to the left our wanted succour lend? Hazard and fame all parts alike attend. Not in the centre, Idomen replied. Our ablest chieftains, the main battle guide, each godlike Ajax makes that post his care, and gallant Teucer deals destruction there, skilled or with shafts to gall the distant field, or bear close battle on the sounding shield. These can the rage of haughty Hector tame. Safe in their arms the navy fears no flame, till Jove himself descends, his bolts to shed and hurl the blazing ruin at our head. Great must he be, of more than human birth, nor feed like mortals on the fruits of earth. Him neither rocks can crush, nor steel can wound, whom Ajax fells not on the exsanguined ground. In standing fight he mates Achilles' force, excelled alone in swiftness in the course. Then to the left our ready arms apply, and live with glory, or with glory die, he said. And Marion to the appointed place, fierce as the god of battles urged his pace. Soon as the foe the shining chiefs beheld, rush like a fiery torrent o'er the field, their force embodied in a tide they pour. The rising combat sounds along the shore, as warring winds in serious sultry rain, from different quarters sweep the sandy plain. On every side the dusty whirlwinds rise, and the dry fields are lifted to the skies. Thus by despair, hope, rage together driven, met the black hosts, and meeting, darkened heaven. All dreadful glared the iron face of war, bristled with upright spears that flashed afar. Dire was the gleam of breastplates, helms, and shields, and polished arms emblazed the flaming fields. Tremendous scene that general horror gave, but touched with joy the bosoms of the brave. Saturn's great sons in fierce contention vied, and crowds of heroes in their anger died. The sire of earth and heaven, by Thetis won to crown with glory, Pallas' godlike son, willed not destruction to the Grecian powers, but spared awhile the destined Trojan towers, while Neptune, rising from his azure main, warred on the king of heaven with stern disdain, and breathed revenge, and fired the Grecian train, gods of one source of one ethereal race, alike divine and heaven their native place, but Jove the greater, firstborn of the skies, and more than men or gods supremely wise, for this of Jove's superior might afraid, Neptune in human form concealed his aid. These powers enfold the Greek and Trojan train, in war and discord's adamantine chain. Indissolubly strong the fatal tie is stretched on both, and close compelled they die. Dreadful in arms, and grown in combats grey, the bold Idomeneus controls the day. First by his hand, Erythronius was slain, swelled with false hopes, with mad ambition vain, called by the voice of war to martial fame. From high, Cabesus's distant walls he came. Cassandra's love he sought with boasts of power, and promised conquest was the proffered dower. The king consented by his vaunts abused, the king consented, but the fates refused. Proud of himself, and of the imagined bride, the field he measured with a larger stride. Him, as he stalked, the Creighton javelin found. Vain was his breastplate to repel the wound. His dream of glory lost, he plunged to hell. His arms resounded as the boaster fell. The great Idomeneus bestrides the dead, and thus he cries, Behold thy promise sped. 
Such is the help thy arms to Ilion bring, and such the contract of the Phrygian king. Our office now, illustrious prince, receive, for such an aid what will not Argos give, to conquer Troy with ours thy forces join, and count Atrides' fairest daughter thine. Meantime, on further methods to advise, come, follow to the fleet thy new allies. There, hear what Greece has on her part to say. He spoke, and dragged the gory course away. This Aesius viewed, unable to contain, before his chariot warring on the plain, his crowded courses to his squire consigned, impatient, panted on his neck behind. To vengeance, rising with a sudden spring, he hoped the conquest of the Cretan king. The wary Cretan, as his foe drew near, full on his throat, discharged the forceful spear. Beneath the chin the point was seen to glide, and glittered, extant, at the further side, as when the mountain oak or poplar tall or pine fit mast for some great admiral groans to the oft-heaved axe with many a wound, then spreads a length of ruin o'er the ground, so sunk proud Aesius in that dreadful day, and stretched before his much-loved courses lay. Do it, do it, do it. He grinds the dust disdained with streaming gore, and fierce in death lies foaming on the shore. Deprived of motion, stiff, with stupid fear, stands all aghast his trembling charioteer, nor shuns the foe, nor turns the steeds away, but falls, transfixed an unresisting prey. Pierced by Antilochus, he pants beneath the stately car, and labors out his breath. Thus Aesius' steeds, their mighty master gone, remain the prize of Nestor's youthful son. Stabbed at the sight, Dephobus drew nigh, and made with force the vengeful weapon fly, the Cretan saw, and stooping, caused to glance from his slope shield the disappointed lance, beneath a spacious targe, a blazing round, thick with bull hides and brazen orbits bound, on his raised arm by two strong braces stayed. He lay collected in defensive shade, o'er his safe head the javelin idly sung, and on the tinkling verge more faintly rung, even then the spear the vigorous arm confessed, and pierced obliquely King Hypsenor's breast. Warmed in his liver to the ground it bore, the chief his people guardian now no more. Not unattended, the proud Trojan cries, nor unrevenged lamented Aesius lies, for thee through hell's black portal stand displayed, this mate shall joy thy melancholy shade. Heart piercing anguish at the haughty boast, touched every Greek but Nestor's son the most, grieved as he was his pious arms attend, and his broad buckler shields his slaughtered friend till sad Mesistheus and Alastor bore his honoured body to the tented shore. Nor yet from fight Idomeneus withdraws, resolved to perish in his country's cause, or find some foe whom heaven and he shall doom to wail his fate in death's eternal gloom. He sees Alcathus in the front aspire, great as Yetis was the hero's sire, his spouse Hippodame, divinely fair, and Keesh's eldest hope and darling care, who charmed her parents and her husband's heart with beauty, sense, and every work of art. He, once of Ilion's youth, the loveliest boy, the fairest she of all the fair of Troy. By Neptune now the helpless hero dies, who covers with a cloud those beauteous eyes, and fetters every limb, yet bent to meet his fate he stands, nor shuns the lance of Crete, fixed as some column or deep-rooted oak, while the winds sleep, his breasts receive the stroke. Before the ponderous stroke his corslet yields, long used to ward the death in fighting fields, the riven armour sends a jarring sound, his labouring heart heaves with so strong a bound, the long lance shakes and vibrates in the wound. Fast flowing from its source as prone he lay, life's purple tide impetuous gushed away. Then Edoman, insulting all the slain, behold Deiphobus, nor vaunt in vain, see, on one Greek three Trojan ghosts attend, this my third victim to the shades I send, approaching now thy boasted might approve, and try the prowess of the seed of Jove. From Jove enamoured of a mortal dame, great Minos, guardian of his country, came. To Kellian, blameless prince, was Minos heir, his firstborn, I, the third from Jupiter, or spacious Crete, and her bold sons I reign, and thence my ships transport me through the main. Lord of a host, o'er all my host I shine, a scourge to thee, thy father and thy line. The Trojan heard, uncertain, or to meet, alone, with venturous arms, the king of Crete, or seek auxiliar force at length decreed to call some hero to partake the deed, for with Aeneas rises to his thought. 
For him in Troy's remotest lines he sought, where he, incensed at partial Priam, stands, and sees superior post in meaner hands. To him, ambitious of so great an aid, the bold Deiphobus approached and said, Now, Trojan prince, employ thy pious arms, if e'er thy bosom felt fair honour's charms. Alcathus dies, thy brother and thy friend. Come, and the warrior's loved remains defend. Beneath his cares thy early youth was trained. One table fed you, and one roof contained. This deed to fierce Idomeneus we owe haste and revenge it on the insulting foe. Aeneas heard, and for a space resigned to tender pity all his manly mind. Then rising in his rage he burns to fight. The Greek awaits him with collected might. As the fell boar on some rough mountain's head, armed with wild terrors and a slaughter bred, when the loud rustics rise and shout from far, attends the tumult and expects the war, o'er his bent back the bristly horrors rise, fires stream in lightning from his sanguine eyes, his foaming tusks both dogs and men engage, but most his hunters rouse his mighty rage. So stood Idumeneus, his javelin shook, and met the Trojan with a lowering look, and Telochus, Deopyrus were near, the youthful offspring of the god of war, Marion, and Apharius, in field renowned. To these the warrior sent his voice around. Fellows in arms, your timely aid unite. Lo, great Aeneas rushes to the fight, sprung from a god, and more than mortal bold. He, fresh in youth, and I in arms grown old. Else should this hand, this hour, decide the strife, the great dispute of glory or of life. He spoke, and all as with one soul obeyed. There lifted bucklers cast a dreadful shade around the chief. Aeneas, too, demands the assisting forces of his native bands. Paris, Deiphobus, Agenor join, co-aids and captains of the Trojan line. In order follow all the embodied train, like Ida's flocks proceeding o'er the plain. Before his fleecy care, erect and bold, stalks the proud ram, the father of the bold. With joy the swain surveys them as he leads to the cool fountains through the well-known meads. So joys Aeneas as his native band moves on in rank and stretches o'er the land. Round, dread, Alcathius, now the battle rose. On every side the steely circle grows. Now battered breastplates and hacked helmets ring, and o'er their heads unheeded javelins sing. Above the rest two towering chiefs appear. There, great Idumeneus, Aeneas here, like gods of war dispensing fate, they stood, and burned to drench the ground with mutual blood. The Trojan weapon whizzed along in air, the Cretan saw, and shunned the brazen spear, sent from an arm so strong the missive wood stuck deep in earth and quivered where it stood. But, oh, enormous, received the Cretan stroke, the forceful spear his hollow corslet broke. It ripped his belly with a ghastly wound, and rolled the smoking entrails on the ground. Stretched on the plain he sobs away his breath, and, furious, grasps the bloody dust in death. The victor from his breast the weapon tears. His spoils he could not for the shower of spears. Though now unfit an act of war to wage, heavy with cumbrous arms, stiff with cold age, his listless limbs unable for the course, in standing fight he yet maintains his force, till, faint with labour, and by foes repelled, his tired slow steps he drags from off the field. Deiphobus beheld him as he passed, and fired with hate a parting javelin cast. The javelin erred, but held its course along, and pierced, Ascalaphus, the brave and young, the son of Mars, fell gasping on the ground, and gnashed the dust all bloody with his wound. Nor knew the furious father of his fall, high throned amidst the great Olympian hall, on golden clouds the immortal synod sate, detained from bloody war by Jove and fate. Now where in dust the breathless hero lay, for slain Ascalaphus commenced the fray, Deiphobus, to seize his helmet flies, and from his temples rends the glittering prize. Valiant as Mars, Marionus drew near, and on his loaded arm discharged his spear. He drops the weight, disabled with the pain. The hollow helmet rings against the plain. Swift as a vulture leaping on his prey, from his torn arm the Grecian rent away that reeking javelin, and rejoined his friends, his wounded brother, good Paulites, tends. Around his waist his pious arms he threw, and from the rage of battle gently drew, him his swift courses, on his splendid car, wrapped from the lessening thunder of the war. To Troy they drove him, groaning from the shore, and sprinkling as he passed the sands with gore. Meanwhile fresh slaughter bathes the sanguine ground, heaps fall on heaps, and heaven and earth resound. Bored, Apharius, by great Aeneas bled, as 
Toward the chief he turned his daring head. He pierced his throat, the bending head depressed beneath his helmet, nods upon his breast. His shield reversed, o'er the fallen warrior lies, an everlasting slumber seals his eyes. Antilochus, as Thun turned him round, transpierced his back with a dishonest wound. The hollow vein that to the neck extends along the chine, his eager javelin rends, supine, he falls, and to his social train spreads his imploring arms, but spreads in vain. The exulting victor, leaping where he lay from his broad shoulders, tore the spoils away. His time observed, foreclosed by foes around, on all sides thick the peals of arms resound. His shield embossed, the ringing storm sustains, but he impervious and untouched remains. Great Neptune's care preserved from hostile rage this youth, the joy of Nestor's glorious age. In arms intrepid with the first he fought, faced every foe and every danger sought. His winged lance, resistless as the wind, obeys each motion of the master's mind. Restless it flies, impatient to be free, and meditates the distant enemy. The son of Asius, Adamus, drew near, and struck his target with the brazen spear, fierce in his front, but Neptune wards the blow and blunts the javelin of the eluded flow. In the broad buckler half the weapon stood, splintered on earth, flew half the broken wood. Disarmed, he mingled in the Trojan crew, but Marion's spear o'ertook him as he flew, deep in the belly's rim an entrance found where sharp the pang and mortal as the wound. Bending he fell, and doubled to the ground, lay panting. Thus an ox in fetters tied, while death's strong pangs distend his laboring side. His bulk enormous on the field displays, his heaving heart beats thick as ebbing life decays. The spear the conqueror from his body drew, and death's dim shadows swarm before his view. Next, brave Deipyrus in dust was laid. King Helenus waved high the Thracian blade, and smote his temples with an arm so strong the helm fell off and rolled amid the throng. There, for some luckier Greek, it rests a prize, for dark in death the godlike owner lies. Raging with grief, great Menelaus burns, and, fraught with vengeance, to the victor turns, that shook the ponderous lance in act to throw, and this stood adverse with the bended bow. Full on his breast the Trojan arrow fell, but harmless, bounded from the plated steel, as on some ample barn's well-hardened floor, the winds collected at each open door, while the broad fan with force is whirled around. Light leaps the golden grain, resulting from the ground, so from the steel that guards Atrides' heart, repelled to distance flies the bounding dart. Atrides, watchful of the unwary foe, pierced with his lance the hand that grasped the bow, and nailed it to the yew. The wounded hand trailed the long lance that marked with blood the sand. But good Agenor, gently from the wound, the spear solicits, and the bandage bound, a sling soft wool snatched from a soldier's side, at once the tent and the ligature supplied. Behold! Pisander, urged by the fate's decree, springs through the ranks to fall and fall by thee, great Menelaus, to enchant thy fame. High towering in the front the warrior came. First the sharp lance was by Atrides thrown. The lance far distant by the winds was blown. Nor pierced Pisander through Atrides' shield. Pisander's spear fell shivered on the field. Not so discouraged to the future blind, vain dreams of conquest swell his haughty mind. Dauntless he rushes where the Spartan lord, like lightning, brandished his far-beaming sword. His left arm high opposed the shining shield, his right beneath the covered pole-axe held, and olive's cloudy grain the handle made. Distinct with studs and brazen was the blade. This on the helm discharged a noble blow. The plume dropped, nodding to the plain below, shorn from the crest. Atrides waved his steel, deep through his front the weighty falchion fell. The crashing bones before its force gave way. In dust and blood the groaning hero lay. Forced from their ghastly orbs and spouting gore, the clotted eyeballs tumble on the shore. And fierce hatreds spurned him as he bled, tore off his arms, and loud exulting said, Thus, Trojans, thus at length be taught to fear, O race perfidious who delight in war. Already noble deeds ye have performed, a princess raped transcends a navy stormed, in such bold feats your impious might approve. Without the assistance or the fear of Jove, the violated rites, the ravished dame, our heroes slaughtered and our ships on flame, crimes heaped on crimes shall bend your glory down, and whelm in ruins yon flagitious town. O oh, thou great father, lord of earth and skies, above the thought of man supremely wise, if from thy hand the fates of mortals flow, from whence this favour to an impious foe, a godless crew abandoned and unjust, 
Still breathing, rape, pain, violence, and lust, the best of things beyond their measure, cloy, sleeps, balmy blessing, loves, endearing joy. The feast, the dance, whate'er mankind desire, even the sweet charms of sacred numbers tire. But Troy, for ever, reaps a dire delight in thirst of slaughter and in lust of fight. This said, he seized, while well, yet the caucus heaved, the bloody armour which his train received, then sudden mixed among the warding crew, and the bold son of Pylaemenes slew Harpelion, had through Asia travelled far, following his martial father to the war. Through filial love he left his native shore, never, ah, never to behold it more. His unsuccessful spear he chanced to fling against the target of the Spartan king, thus of his lance disarmed from death he flies, and turns round his apprehensive eyes, him through the hip transpiercing as he fled, the shaft of Marion mingled with the dead. Beneath the bone the glancing point descends, and driving down the swelling bladder rends, sunk in his sad companion's arms he lay, and in short pantings sobbed his soul away, like some vile worm extended on the ground, while life's red torrent gushed from out the wound. Him on the car, the Paphlagonian train in slow procession bore from off the plain. The pensive father, father now no more, attends the mournful pomp along the shore, and unavailing tears profusely shed, and unrevenged deplored his offsprings dead. Paris, from far, the moving sight beheld, with pity softened and with fury swelled. His honoured host, a youth of matchless grace, and loved of all the Paphlagonian race, with his full strength he bent his angry bow, and winged the feathered vengeance at the foe. A chief there was, the brave Eucanor named, for riches much, and more for virtue famed, who held his seat in Corinth's stately town, Polydus' son, a seer of old renown. Oft had the father told his early doom, by arms abroad or slow disease at home, he climbed his vessel prodigal of breath, and chose the certain glorious path to death. Beneath his ear the pointed arrow went, the soul came issuing at the narrow vent, his limbs unnerved, drop useless on the ground, an everlasting darkness shades him round. Nor knew great Hector how his legions yield, wrapped in the cloud and tumult of the field, wide on the left the force of Greece commands, and conquest hovers o'er the Achaean bands, with such a tide superior virtue swayed, and he that shakes the solid earth gave aid. But... In the centre Hector fixed remained, where first the gates were forced and bulwarks gained. There, on the margin of the hoary deep, the naval station where the Ajaces keep, and where low walls confine the beating tides, whose humble barrier scarce the foe divides, where late in fight both foot and horse engaged, and all the thunder of the battle raged, there joined the whole Boeotian strength remains. The proud Ionians, with their sweeping trains, Locrians and Phythians and the Apean force, but joined repel not Hector's fiery course. The flower of Athens, Stetius, Phoebus, led Bias and great Menestheus at their head. Megus the strong, the Apean bands controlled, and Dracius prudent and Amphion bold. The Phians, Medon, famed for martial might, and brave Podarces active in the fight. This drew from Phylacus his noble line. If Phyclus' son, and that, O oh, Lys thine, young Ajax's brother by a stolen embrace, he dwelt far distant from his native place, by his fierce step-dame from his father's reign, expelled in the exiled for her brother slain. These rule the Phthians, and their arms employ, mixed with Boeotians on the shores of Troy. Now side by side, with like unwearied care, each Ajax laboured through the field of war, so when two lordly bulls with equal toil forced the bright ploughshare through the fallow soil, joined to one yoke, the stubborn earth they tear, and trace large furrows with a shining share. O'er their huge limbs the foam descends in snow, and streams of sweat down their sour foreheads flow. A train of heroes followed through the field, who bore by turns great Ajax's sevenfold shield. Whene'er he breathed, remissive of his might, tired with the incessant slaughterers of the fight, no following troops his brave associate grace, in close engagement and unpractised race. The Locrian squadrons nor the javelin wield, nor bear the helm, nor lift the moony shield, but skilled from far the flying shaft to wing, or whirl the sounding pebble from the sling. Dexterous with these they aim a certain wound, or fell the distant warrior to the ground. Thus in the van the Telamonian train, thronged in bright arms, a pressing fight maintain, 
Far in the rear the Locrian archers lie, whose stones and arrows intercept the sky. The mingled tempest on the foes they pour, Troy's scattering orders open to the shower. Now, had the Greeks eternal fame acquired, and the gold Ilians to their walls retired, but sage Polydemus, discreetly brave, addressed great Hector, and this counsel gave. Though great in all, thou seemest averse to lend impartial audience to a faithful friend. To gods and men thy matchless worth is known, and every art of glorious war thy own. But in cool thought and counsel to excel, how widely differs this from warring well. Content with what the bounteous gods have given, seek not alone to engross the gifts of heaven. To some the powers of bloody war belong, to some sweet music and the charm of song. To few and wondrous few has Jove assigned a wise, extensive, all-considering mind. Their guardians these, the nations round confess, and towns and empires for their safety bless. If heaven have lodged this virtue in my breast, attend, O Hector, what I judge the best. See as thou movest on dangers, dangers spread, and war's whole fury burns around thy head. Behold, distressed within yon hostile wall, how many Trojans yield, disperse, or fall. What troops outnumbered scarce the war maintain, and what brave heroes at the ships lie slain? Here, cease thy fury, and the chiefs and kings convoked to counsel weigh the sum of things, whether the gods succeeding our desires to yon tall ships to bear the Trojan fires, or quit the fleet and pass unhurt away, contented with the conquest of the day. I fear, I fear, lest Greece not yet undone pay the large debt of last resolving son, Achilles, great Achilles yet remains on yonder decks, and yet o'erlooks the plains. The council pleased, and Hector with a bound leaped from his chariot on the trembling ground. Swift as he leaped his clanging arms resound, to guard this post, he cried, thy art employ, and here detain the scattered youth of Troy, where yonder heroes faint, I bend my way, and hastened back to end the doubtful day. This said, the towering chief prepares to go, shakes his white plumes that to the breezes flow, and seems a moving mountain topped with snow. Through all his host, inspiring force, he flies, and bids anew the martial thunder rise, to Panthus' son, at Hector's high command, haste the bold leaders of the Trojan band. But round the battlements and round the plain, for many a chief he looked, but looked in vain. Dear Phobus, nor Helenus the seer, nor Asius' son, nor Asius' self appear, for well, these were pierced with many a ghastly wound, some cold in death, some groaning on the ground, some low in dust, a mournful object lay, high on the wall, some breathed their souls away. Far on the left amid the throng he found, cheering the troops and dealing deaths around, the graceful Paris, whom with fury moved, opprobrious thus the impatient chief reproved, ill-fated Paris, slave to womankind, as smooth of face as fraudulent of mine, where is Deophobus? Where Asius gone, the godlike father and the intrepid son, the force of Helenus dispensing fate, and great Orithronius so feared of late? Black fate hangs o'er thee from the avenging gods, imperial Troy from her foundations nods, whelmed in thy country's ruin, shalt thou fall, and one devouring vengeance swallow all? When Paris thus, my brother and my friend, Thy warm impatience makes thy tongue offend. In other battles I deserve thy blame, though then not deedless nor unknown to fame. But since yon rampart by the arms lay low, I scattered slaughter from my fatal bow. The chiefs you seek on yonder shore lie slain. Of all those heroes, two alone remain, Deophobus and Helenus the seer, each now disabled by a hostile spear. Go then, successful, where thy soul inspires. This heart and hand shall second all thy fires. What with this arm I can prepare to know, till death for death be paid and blow for blow? But tis not ours, with force is not our own to combat, strength is of the gods alone. These words the hero's angry mind assuage, then fierce they mingle where the thickest rage, around Polydemus, distrained with blood, Sebleon, Phalces, stern Hortheus stood, Palmus, with Polypoetus the divine, and two bold brothers of Hippotion's line who reached fair Ilion from Ascania far, the former day, the next engaged in war. As when, from gloomy clouds, a whirlwind springs that bears Jove's thunder on its dreadful wings, wide o'er the blasted fields the tempest sweeps, then gathered, settles on the hoary deeps, the afflicted deeps, tumultuous, mix and roar, the waves behind impel, 
the waves before, wide rolling, foaming high, and tumbling to the shore, thus rank on rank the thick battalions throng, chief urged on chief, and man drove man along, far o'er the plains in dreadful order bright, the brazen arms reflect a beamy light, full in the blazing van great Hector shine like Mars commissioned to confound mankind. Before him, flaming his enormous shield, like the broad sun illumined all the field, his nodding helm emits a steamy ray, his piercing eyes through all the battle stray, and while beneath his targe he flashed along, shot terrors round that withered e'en the strong. Thus stalked he, dreadful, death was in his look, whole nations feared, but not an argive shook. The towering Ajax, with an ample stride, advanced the first, and thus the chief defied, Hector, come on! Thy empty threats forbear, tis not thy arm, tis thundering Jove we fear. The skill of war to us not idly given, lo, Greece is humbled not by Troy but heaven. Vain are the hopes that haughty mind imparts. To force our fleet the Greeks have hands and hearts, long ere in flames our lofty navy fall. Your boasted city and your god-built wall shall sink beneath us, smoking on the ground, and spread along unmeasured ruin around. The time shall come. When chased along the plain, even thou shalt call on Jove and call in vain. Even thou shalt wish to aid thy desperate course. The wings of falcons for thy flying horse shalt run forgetful of a warrior's fame, while clouds of friendly dust conceal thy shame. As thus he spoke, behold, in open view, on sounding wings a dexter eagle flew. To Jove's glad omen all the Grecians rise, and hail with shouts his progress through the skies, far-echoing clamours bound from side to side. They ceased, and thus the chief of Troy replied. From whence this menace, this insulting strain, enormous boaster, doomed to vaunt in vain? So may the gods on Hector life bestow, not that short life which mortals lead below, but such as those of Jove's high lineage born, the blue-eyed maid, or he that gilds the morn. As this decisive day shall end the fame of Greece, and Argos be no more a name, and thou, imperious, if thy madness wait the lance of Hector, thou shalt meet thy fate. That giant corse, extended on the shore, shall largely feast the fowls with fat and gore. He said, and like a lion stalked along with shouts incessant earth and ocean rung, sent from his following host the Grecian train with answering thunders filled the echoing plain, a shout that tore heaven's concave and above shook the fixed splendors of the throne of Jove. The end of Book 13 of The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Read by Rick Kistner for Let to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book 14. Argument. Juno deceives Jupiter by the girdle of Venus. Nestor, sitting at the table with Machaon, is alarmed with the increasing clamor of war, and hastens to Agamemnon. On his way he meets that prince with Diomed and Ulysses, whom he informs of the extremity of the danger. Agamemnon proposes to make their escape by night, which Ulysses withstands, to which Diomed adds his advice, that, wounded as they were, they should go forth and encourage the army with their presence, which advice is pursued. Juno, seeing the partiality of Jupiter to the Trojans, forms a design to overreach him. She sets off her charms with the utmost care, and, the more surely to enchant him, obtains the magic girdle of Venus. She then applies herself to the god of sleep, and with some difficulty persuades him to seal the eyes of Jupiter. This done, she goes to Mount Ida, where the god at first sight is ravished with her beauty, sinks in her embraces, and is laid asleep. Neptune takes advantage of his slumber, and succors the Greeks. Hector is struck to the ground with a prodigious stone by Ajax, and carried off from the battle. Several actions succeed, till the Trojans, much distressed, are obliged to give way. The lesser Ajax signalizes himself in a particular manner. But not the genial feast, nor flowing bow, could charm the cares of Nestor's watchful soul. His startled ears the increasing cries attend, then thus, impatient to his wounded friend, What new alarm, divine Machaon, say, what mixed events attend this mighty day? Hark, how the shouts divide, and how they meet! And... How, now, comes fool and thicken to the fleet? Here, with a cordial draught, dispel thy care. Let Hecamede thy strengthening bath prepare. 
refresh thy wound and cleanse the clotted gore, while I the adventures of the day explore, he said, and seizing Thrasymedes' shield, his valiant offspring, hastened to the field. That day the son his father's buckler bore, then snatched a lance and issued from the door. Soon as the prospect opened to his view, his wounded eyes the scene of sorrow knew, dire disarray, the tumult of the fight, the wall in ruins and the Greeks in flight, and when old ocean's silent surface sleeps, the waves just heaving on the purple deeps, while yet the expected tempest hangs on high, weighs down the cloud, and blackens in the sky, the mass of waters will no wind obey, Jove sends one gust and bids them roll away, while wavering counsels thus his mind engage, fluctuates in doubtful thought the pillion sage, to join the host, or to the general haste, debating long, he fixes on the last, yet as he moves, the sight his bosom warms, the field rings dreadful with a clang of arms, the gleaming falchions flash, the javelins fly, blow, echo blows, and all, or kill or die. Him in his march the wounded princes meet, by tardy steps ascending from the fleet, the king of men, Ulysses the divine, and who to Tydeus owes his noble line. Their ships at distance from the battle stand, in lines advanced along the shelving strand, whose bay the fleet unable to contain at length, beside the margin of the main, rank above rank, the crowded ships they moor, who landed first lay highest on the shore, supported on the spears they took their way, unfit to fight, but anxious for the day. Nestor's approach alarmed each Grecian breast, whom thus the general of the host addressed. O grace and glory of thy Achaean name, what drives thee, Nestor, from the field of fame? Shall then proud Hector see his boast fulfilled, our fleets in ashes and our heroes killed? Such was his threat, ah, now too soon made good, on many a Grecian bosom writ in blood, is every heart inflamed with equal rage against your king, nor will one chief engage? And have I lived to see with mournful eyes in every Greek anew Achilles rise? Gerenian Nestor then. So fate has willed, and all confirming time has fate fulfilled. Not he that thunders from the aerial bower, not Jove himself upon the past has power. The wall, our late inviolable bound, and best defence lies smoking on the ground. Even to the ships their conquering arms extend, and groans of slaughtered Greeks to heaven ascend. On speedy measures, then, employ your thought in such distress. If counsel profit aught, arms cannot much. Though Mars our souls in sight, these gaping wounds withhold us from the fight. To him the monarch. That our army bends, that Troy triumphant our high fleet ascends, and that the rampart, late our surest trust and best defence, lies smoking in the dust, all this from Jove's afflictive hand we bear, who, far from Argos, wills our ruin here. Past are the days when happier Greece was blessed, and all his favour, all his aid confessed. Now, heaven averse, our hands from battle ties, and lifts the Trojan glory to the skies. Cease we at length to waste our blood in vain, and launch what ships lie nearest to the main. Leave these at anchor till the coming night. Then, if impetuous Troy forbear the fight, bring all to sea, and hoist each sail for flight. Better from evils will foreseen to run, than perish in the danger we may shun. Thus he. The sage Ulysses thus replied, while anger flashed from his disdainful eyes. What shameful words, unkingly as thou art, fall from that trembling tongue and timorous heart! Oh, where thy sway the curse of meaner powers, and thou the shame of any host but ours, a host by Jove endued with martial might, and taught to conquer or to fall in fight, adventurous combats and bold wars to wage, employed our youth and yet employs our age, and wilt thou thus desert the Trojan plain? and have whole streams of blood been spilt in vain? In such base sentence, if thou couch thy fear, speak it in whispers, lest a Greek should hear, lives there a man so dead to fame who dares to think such meanness, or the thought declares, and comes it even from him whose sovereign sway the banded legions of all Greece obey. Is this a general's voice that calls to flight, while war hangs doubtful while his soldiers fight? What more could Troy? What yet their fate denies thou givest the foe. All Greece becomes their prize, no more the troops. Our hoisted sails in view, themselves abandoned, shall the fight pursue. But thy ships, flying with despair, shall see and owe destruction to a prince like thee. By just reproofs, Atrides calm replies, like arrows pierce me, 
for thy words are wise. Unwilling as I am to lose the host, I force not Greece to quit this hateful coast. Glad I submit, who e'er or young or old ought more conducive to our weal unfold. Tydides cut him short, and thus began. Such counsel, if you seek, behold the man who boldly gives it, and what he shall say. Young, though he be, disdain not to obey. A youth, who from the mighty Tydeus springs, may speak to councils and assembled kings. Hear then in me the great Oneidius' son, whose honoured dust his race of glory run, lies whelmed in ruins of the Theban wall, brave in his life and glorious in his fall, with three bold sons was generous. Prothus, blessed, who Pluron's walls and Calydon possessed, Melus and Agrius, but who far surpassed the rest in courage. Oeneus was the last, from him my sire, from Calydon expelled, he passed to Argos and in exile dwelled, the monarch's daughter there, so Jove ordained, he won and flourished where Adrastus reigned. There, rich in fortune's gifts, his acres tilled, behold his vines their liquid harvest yield, and numerous flocks that whitened all the field, such Tydeus was, the foremost once in fame, nor lives in Greece a stranger to his name. Then what for common good my thoughts inspire, attend, and in the sun respect the sire, though sore of battle, though with wounds oppressed, let each go forth and animate the rest, advance the glory which he cannot share, though not partaker, witness of the war, but lest new wounds on wounds or power us quite beyond the missile javelin sounding flight, safe let us stand, and from the tumult far inspire the ranks and rule the distant war. He added not. The listening kings obey, slow moving on. Atrides leads the way. The god of ocean, to inflame their rage, appears a warrior furrowed o'er with age. Pressed in his own the general's hand he took, and thus the venerable hero spoke. Atrides, lo, with what disdainful eye Achilles sees his country's forces fly, blind, impious man, whose anger is his guide, who glories in unutterable pride. So may he perish, so may Jove disclaim the wretch relentless, and all whelm with shame. But heaven forsakes not thee, or yonder sands soon shall thou view the scattered Trojan bands fly diverse, while proud kings and chiefs renowned, driven heaps on heaps with clouds involved around of rolling dust their winged wheels employ to hide their ignominious heads in Troy. He spoke, then rushed amid the warrior crew, and sent his voice before him as he flew, loud as the shout and countering armies yield, when twice ten thousand shake the laboring field. Such was the voice, and such the thundering sound, of him whose trident rends the solid ground. Each argive bosom beats to meet the fight, and grisly war appears a pleasing sight. Meantime, Saturnia, from Olympus's brow, high throned in gold, beheld the fields below, with joy the glorious conflict she surveyed, where her great brother gave the Grecians aid. But placed aloft on Ida's shady height, she sees her Jove, and trembles at the sight. Jove, to deceive, what methods shall she try? What arts to blind his all-beholding eye? At length she trusts her power, resolved to prove the old yet still successful cheat of love." "'against his wisdom to oppose her charms, "'and lull the lord of thunders in her arms. "'Swift to her bright apartment she repairs, "'sacred to dress and beauty's pleasing cares, "'with skill divine, had Vulcan formed the bower, "'safe from access of each intruding power, "'touched with her secret key the doors unfold, "'self-closed behind her shut the valves of gold, "'here first she bathes, "'and round her body pours soft oils of fragrance "'and ambrosial showers.' The winds perfumed, the balmy gale convey, Through heaven, through earth, and all the aerial way, Spirit divine, whose exhalation Greets the sense of gods with more than mortal sweets. Thus, while she breathed of heaven, With decent pride her artful hands the radiant tresses tied, Part on her head in shining ringlets rolled, Part o'er her shoulders waved like melted gold, Around her next a heavenly mantle flowed, that, rich with palaces, laboured colours glowed. Large clasps of gold the foldings gathered round, a golden zone her swelling bosom bound. Far beaming pendants tremble in her ear, each gem illumined with a triple star. Then, o'er her head, 
She cast a veil more white than new fallen snow, and dazzling as the light. Last, her fair feet celestial sandals grace. Thus, issuing radiant with majestic pace forth from the dome, the imperial goddess moves, and calls the mother of the smiles and loves. How long, to Venus thus apart, she cried, shall human strife celestial minds divide? Ah, yet will Venus aid Saturnia's joy, and set aside the cause of Greece and Troy? Let heaven's dread empress, Cytherea said, speak her request, and deem her will obeyed. Then grant me, said the queen, those conquering charms, that power which mortals and immortals warms, that love which melts mankind in fierce desires, and burns the sons of heaven with sacred fires, for, lo, I haste to those remote abodes where the great parents' sacred source of gods, Ocean and Tethys, their old empire keep, on the last limits of the land and deep. In their kind arms my tender years were past, what time old Saturn from Olympus cast, of upper heaven to Jove, resigned the rain, whelmed under the huge bass of earth and main, for strife I hear has made the union cease, which held so long that ancient pair in peace. What honour and what love shall I obtain if I compose those fatal feuds again? Once more their minds in mutual ties engage, and what my youth has owed repay their age, she said. With awe divine the queen of love obeyed the sister and the wife of Jove, and from her fragrant breast the zone embraced with various skill and high embroidery graced, and this was every art and every charm, to win the wisest and the coldest warm, fond love, the gentle vow, the gay desire, the kind deceit, the still reviving fire, persuasive speech, and the more persuasive sighs, silence that spoke and eloquence of eyes. This on her hand the Cyprian goddess laid, take this and with it all thy wish, she said. With smiles she took the charm, and smiling pressed the powerful cestus to her snowy breast. Then Venus to the courts of Jove withdrew, whilst from Olympus pleased Saturnia flew. O'er high Pyaria, thence her course she bore, o'er fair Emethia's ever-pleasing shore, o'er Hemus hills with snow's eternal ground, nor once her flying foot approached the ground. Then taking wing from Athos' lofty steep, she speeds to Lemnos o'er the rolling deep, and seeks the cave of death's half-brother sleep. Sweet-pleasing sleep! Saturnia thus began, who spreadest thy empire o'er each god and man, if e'er obsequious to thy Juno's will, O power of slumberers, hear and favour still, shed thy soft dews on Jove's immortal eyes, while sunk in love's entrancing joys he lies, a splendid footstool, and a throne that shine with gold unfading, somnus shall be thine, the work of Vulcan, to indulge thy ease when wine and feats thy golden humours please. Imperial dame, the balmy power replies, Great Saturn's heir and empress of the skies, O'er other gods I spread my easy chain, The sire of all old ocean owns my reign, And his hushed waves lie silent on the main. But how, unbidden, shall I dare To steep Jove's awful temples in the dew of sleep? Long since too venturous at thy bold command, On those eternal lids I laid my hand, what time deserting Ilion's wasted plain, his conquering son Alcides ploughed the main, when, lo, the deeps arise, the tempests roar, and drive the hero to the Cohen shore. Great Jove, awaking, shook the blessed abodes with rising wrath, and tumbled gods on gods, me, chief, he sought, and from the realms on high had hurled indignant to the nether sky. But gentle knight, to whom I fled for aid, the friend of earth and heaven, her wings displayed, empowered the wrath of gods and men to tame, even Jove revered the venerable dame. Vain are thy fears, the queen of heaven replies, and speaking rolls her large majestic eyes. Thinkest thou that Troy has Jove's high favour won, like great Alcides, his all-conquering son? Hear and obey the mistress of the skies, nor for the deed expect a vulgar prize, for know thy loved one shall be ever thine, the youngest grace, Pasithe the divine. Swear then, he said, by those tremendous floods that roar through hell and bind the invoking gods, let the great parent earth one hand sustain, and stretch the other o'er the sacred main. Call the black titans that with Kronos dwell, to hear and witness from the depths of hell, that she... My loved one shall be ever mine, the youngest grace, Pasithe, the divine. 
the queen assents, and from the infernal bowers invokes the sable sub-Tartarian powers, and those who rule the inviolable floods, whom mortals name the dread Titanian gods. Then swift as wind, o'er Lemno's smoky isle, they wing their way in Imbrus sea-beat soil, through air unseen involved in darkness glide, and light on Lectos, on the point of Ide mother of savages, whose echoing hills are heard resounding with a hundred rills, fair Ida trembles underneath the god, hushed are her mountains, and her forests nod. There, on a fir whose spiry branches rise, to join its summit to the neighboring skies, dark and embowering shade, concealed from sight, sat sleep, in likeness of the bird of night. Chalcis his name by those of heavenly birth, but called Simindis by the race of earth. To Ida's top successful Juno flies. Great Jove surveys her with desiring eyes. The god, whose lightning sets the heavens on fire, Through all his bosom feels the fierce desire. Fierce, as when first by stealth he seized her charms, Mixed with her soul and melted in her arms. Fixed on her eyes he fed his eager look, Then pressed her hand, and thus with transport spoke. Why comes my goddess from the ethereal sky, and not her steeds and flaming chariot nigh? Then she, I haste to those remote abodes, where the great parents of the deathless gods, the revered ocean and grey Tethys reign. On the last limits of the land and main, I visit these to whose indulgent cares I owe the nursing of my tender years, for strife, I hear, has made that union cease, which held so long that ancient parent peace. The steeds prepared my chariot to convey o'er earth and seas, and through the aerial way wait under Ida of thy superior power. To ask consent I leave the Olympian bower, nor seek unknown to thee the sacred cells deep under seas where hoary ocean dwells. For that, said Jove, suffice another day, but eager love denies the least delay. Let softer cares the present hour employ, and be these moments sacred all to joy." Ne'er did my soul so strong a passion prove, or for an earthly or a heavenly love, not when I pressed Ixion's matchless dame, whence rose Perithus like the gods in fame, not when fair Danae felt the shower of gold stream into life, whence Perseus brave and bold, not thus I burn for either Theban dame, Bacchus from this, from that Alcides came, nor Phoenix's daughter, beautiful and young, whence godlike, Radamanth and Maino sprung, not thus I burn for fair Latona's face, nor comely Osiris more majestic grace, not thus even for myself I felt desire, as now my veins receive the pleasing fire. He spoke. The goddess with the charming eyes glows with celestial red, and thus replies, Is this a scene for love, on Ida's height, exposed to mortal and immortal sight, our joys profaned by each familiar eye, the sport of heaven and fable of the sky? How shall I e'er review the blessed abodes, or mix among the senate of the gods? Shall I not think that with disordered charms all heaven beholds me recent from thy arms? With skill divine has Vulcan formed thy bower, sacred to love and to the genial hour, if such thy will, to that recess retire, in secret there indulge thy soft desire. She ceased, and smiling with superior love, thus answered mild the cloud-compelling Jove, nor God nor mortal shall our joys behold, shaded with clouds and circumfused in gold, not even the sun, who darts through heaven his rays, and whose broad eye the extended earth surveys. Gazing he spoke, and kindling at the view, his eager arms around the goddess threw. Glad earth perceives, and from her bosom pours unbidden herbs and voluntary flowers, thick newborn violets a soft carpet spread, and clustering lotus swelled the rising bed, and sudden hyacinths the turf bestrow, and flamy crocus made the mountain glow. There golden clouds conceal the heavenly pair, steeped in soft joys, and circumfused with air. Celestial dews descending o'er the ground perfume the mount, and breathe ambrosia round. At length, with love and sleep's soft power oppressed, the panting thunderer nods and sinks to rest. Now to the navy borne on silent wings, to Neptune's ear soft sleep his message brings. Beside him, sudden, unperceived he stood, and thus with gentle words addressed the god. Now, Neptune, now the important hour employ, to check awhile the haughty hopes of Troy, while Jove yet rests, while yet my vapours shed the golden vision round his sacred head, for Juno's love and Somnus' pleasing ties, 
have closed those awful and eternal eyes. Thus having said the power of slumber flew, on human lids to drop the balmy dew, Neptune with zeal increased, renews his care, and towering in the foremost ranks of war, indignant thus, O oh, once of martial fame, O oh, Greeks, if yet ye can deserve the name, this half-recovered day shall Troy obtain, shall Hector thunder at your ships again, lo, still he vaunts, and threats the fleet with fires, while stern Achilles in his wrath retires, one hero's loss too tamely you deplore, be still yourselves, and ye shall need no more, O oh, yet if glory any bosom warms, brace on your firmest helms, and stand to arms, his strongest spear, each valiant Grecian wield, each valiant Grecian seize his broadest shield. Let to the weak the lighter arms belong, the ponderous torch be wielded by the strong. Thus armed, not Hector, shall our presence stay, myself, ye Greeks, myself will lead the way. The troops assent. The martial arms they change, the busy chiefs their banded legions range. The kings, though wounded and oppressed with pain, with helpful hands themselves assist the train. The strong and cumbrous arms the valiant wield, the weaker warrior takes a lighter shield. Thus sheathed in shining brass, in bright array the legions march, and Neptune leads the way. His brandished falchion flames before their eyes, like lightning flashing through the frighted skies. Clad in his might, the earth-shaking power appears. Pale mortals tremble and confess their fears. Troy's great defender stands alone unawed, arms his proud host and dares oppose a god. And lo, the god and wondrous man appear, the sea's stern ruler there and Hector here. The roaring main at her great master's call rose in huge ranks and formed a watery wall around the ships. Seas hanging o'er the shores, both armies join, earth thunders, ocean roars, not half so loud the bellowing deeps resound, when stormy winds disclose the dark profound, less loud the winds that from the Aeolian hall roar through the woods, and make whole forests fall, less loud the woods, when flames and torrents pour, catch the dry mountain and its shades devour, with such a rage the meeting hosts are driven, and such a clamour shakes the sounding heaven. The first bold javelin, urged by Hector's force, directed Ajax's bosom, winged its course. But there, no pass the crossing belts afford. One braced his shield, and one sustained his sword. Then, back, the disappointed Trojan drew, and cursed the lance that unavailing flew. But scaped not Ajax his tempestuous hand, a ponderous stone upheaving from the sand, where heaps laid loose beneath the warrior's feet, or served to ballast or to prop the fleet, tossed round and round the missive marble flings, on the raised shield the fallen ruin rings, full on his breast and throat, with force descends, nor deadened there its giddy fury spends, but whirling on with many a fiery round, smokes in the dust and ploughs into the ground, as when the bold red hissing from above darts on the consecrated plant of Jove, the mountain oak in flaming ruin lies, black from the blow, and smokes of sulphur rise, stiff with amaze the pale beholders stand, and own the terrors of the almighty hand. So lies great Hector prostrate on the shore, his slackened hand deserts the lance it bore, his following shield the fallen chief o'erspread, beneath his helmet dropped his fainting head, his load of armour sinking to the ground clanks on the field a dead and hollow sound. Loud shouts of triumph fill the crowded plain, Greece sees in hope Troy's great defender slain, all spring to seize him, storms of arrows fly, and thicker javelins intercept the sky. In vain an iron tempest hisses round. He lies protected, and without a wound. Polydromus, Agenor the divine, the pious warrior of Anchises line, and each bold leader of the Lycian band with covering shields a friendly circle stand, his mournful followers with assistant care, the groaning hero to his chariot bear, his foaming courses swifter than the wind speed to the town and leave the war behind. When now they touched the mead's enamelled side, where gentle Xanthus rolls his easy tide with watery drops, the chief they sprinkle round, placed on the margin of the flowery ground, raised on his knees, he now ejects the gore, now faints anew, low sinking on the shore, by fits he breathes, half views the fleeting skies, and seals again by fits his swimming eyes. Soon as the Greeks the chief's retreat beheld, with double fury each invades the field, only in Ajax first his javelin sped, pierced by whose point the son of Enops bled, Satnius the brave, whom beauteous Nais bore amidst her flocks on Satnius' silver shore, struck through the belly's rim the warrior lies supine, and shades eternal veil his eyes. An arduous battle rose round the dead, by turns the Greeks, by turns the Trojans bled. 
fired with revenge, Polydemus drew near, and at Pultheonor shook the trembling spear, the driving javelin, through his shoulder thrust, he sinks to earth and grasps the bloody dust. Lo, thus, the victor cries, we rule the field, and thus their arms the race of Panthus wield. From this unerring hand there flies no dart, but bathes its point within a Grecian heart. Propped on that spear to which thou owest thy fall, go, guide thy darksome steps to Pluto's dreary hall, he said, and Sauro touched each Argive breast. The soul of Ajax burned above the rest. As by his side the groaning warrior fell, at the fierce foe he launched his piercing steel. The foe, reclining, shunned the flying death. But fate, Archilochus, demands thy breath. Thy lofty birth no succor could impart. The wings of death or took thee on the dart. Swift to perform heaven's fatal will, it fled full on the juncture of the neck and head, and took the joint, and cut the nerves in twain. The dropping head first tumbled on the plain. So just the stroke, that yet the body stood erect, then rolled along the sands in blood. Here, proud Polydemus, here, turn thy eyes, the towering Ajax, loud insulting cries, say, is this chief extended on the plain, a worthy vengeance for Pothin or slain? Mark well his port, his figure and his face, nor speak him vulgar, nor the vulgar race. Some lines, methinks, may make his lineage known, Antenor's brother, or perhaps his son. He spake, and smiled severe, for well he knew the bleeding youth. Troy saddened at the view, but furious Acamas avenged his cause. As Promachus his slaughtered brother draws, he pierced his heart, such gives destined by our arms to fall. Not Troy alone, but haughty Greece, shall share the toils, the sorrows, and the wounds of war. Behold your Promachus deprived of breath, a victim owed to my brave brother's death. Not unappeased he enters Pluto's gate, who leaves a brother to revenge his fate. Heart, piercing anguish, struck the Grecian host, but touched the breast of bold Penelus most. At the proud boaster he directs his course, the boaster flies and shuns superior force, but young Ilioneus received the spear, Ilioneus, his father's only care, Phorbus the rich, of all the Trojan train, whom Hermes loved, and taught the arts of gain, fool in his eye the weapon chanced to fall, and from the fibre scooped the rooted ball, drove through the neck, and hurled him to the plain, he lifts his miserable arms in vain, swift his broad falchion fierce penniless spread, and from the spouting shoulders struck his head, to earth at once the head and helmet fly, the lance yet sticking through the bleeding eye, the victor seized, and as aloft he shook the gory visage, thus insulting spoke, Trojans, your great Ilioneus, behold, haste to his father, let the tale be told, let his high roofs resound with frantic woe, such as the house of Promachus must know, let doleful tidings greet his mother's ear, such as to Promachus' sad spouse we bear, when we victorious shall to Greece return, and the pale matron in our triumphs mourn. Dreadful he spoke, then tossed the head on high, the Trojans hear, they tremble and they fly, aghast they gaze around the fleet and wall, and dread the ruin that impedes on all. Daughters of Jove that on Olympus shine, ye all beholding all recording nine, O oh, say, when Neptune made proud Ilion yield, what chief, what hero first embrued the field? Of all the Grecians what immortal name, and whose blessed trophies will ye raise to fame? Thou first, great Ajax, on the unsanguined plain laid Hertius, leader of the Mycian train, Phalces, and Murmur, Nestor's son or through, bold Marion, Morris, and Hippotion slew, strong Paraphatius, and Prothoon bled, by Teusa's arrows mingled with the dead, pierced in the flank by Menelaus' steel, his people's pastor, Hyperenor fell, eternal darkness wrapped the warrior round, and the fierce soul came rushing through the wound, but stretched in heaps before Oelis' son, four mighty numbers, Mighty numbers run, Ajax the less, of all the Grecian race, skewed in pursuit, and swiftest in the chase. The end of Book 14 of the Iliad, by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Read by Rick Kistner, for lit to go on the web at fcit.usf.edu.